Hello, everyone, and welcome in to the Pure Storage 24-Hour Kyle Ami in partnership with Solidarity E-Race and powered by Race Face. You're currently watching some of, or will be watching, some of the best sim racers in the world, South African, European, American, pretty much everywhere that you can think of along the world. We are going to have some fantastic racing for 20 four hours at the South African circuit. My name is Mike Jones. I'm the producer for the broadcast today. Joining with me today will be an absolute roster of commentators, both from RCI, who uh, is, is the organization that I'm from, as well as, of course, if you recognize off to my right, Mr. Greg Maloney joining us as well. George Smith, Ryan Gill, Jesse Lee, and Mike Jones all joining you in the box at some point point today and uh guys of course the super poll last week was fantastic you guys uh were both here for that killian ryan mean and george booth being the side max motorworks 96 of course took that poll position but however what i've been told is jordan shirat and the gtwr team is going to be giving them a run for their money i spoke with jordan very briefly he's hyped up he's excited he does not want side max to get out ahead and get uh and and get p1 at the end of this 24-hour race we're going to go live with the green flag at about uh, 12 p.m. Uh, local time in ZA, approximately about nine minutes from that. We're watching the free practice session here in the background at the moment. The car is getting out on track. I'm going to be behind the cameras for the first four hours, and I'm going to toss over to Mr. Maloney to head on off uh, to the hey. track here very shortly. <laughs> hey, Mike, good to have you here, buddy. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from the U.S. of A. I believe it's about... <clears throat> 3 30 in the morning there so uh, you've had a busy time so far and uh, looking forward to bringing all the action now from the race face and solidarity e-race pure storage of course have joined us along with nec data sciences corporation oxide amd supermicro rci and of course our partnership with uh, the solidarity e-race and race face joining me in the commentary for the first uh, couple of hours is going to be mr gmax himself george smith you've joined us all the way from the u the uk so we're definitely making this an international race of note here, not only on track in terms of the teams, but in terms of our production team as well, Georgie. Yeah, we are. It's, it's very cool. Everybody coming together to produce this, get behind what will be a very cool 24-hour race. Uh, it's going to be very busy for all of us, of course, as commentators, but I think our competitors have a long race ahead of them. They've got a lot of uh, preparation that they've put in. They want to try and uh, get the best results that they can. And of course, they're trying to scoop some of the money from their prize pool uh, well, from our prize pool they want to take some of that home so it's not like it's just a race for pride a lot of uh, sim racing events are just that just a, a race for pride as we start to go live towards the last bits of our free practice of course after this we go on to the stationary grid walk and then we'll go on to the formation lap and then we'll go green flags racing for 24 hours greg i mean you've done some 24 hour races yourself this is going to be this is going to be something special yeah, it is. It's the first time ever in South Africa that we've got a 24-hour in terms of an e-race or a, a sim race, which is fantastic. Um, here at Kyle Army, of course, the home of South African motorsport. Most people will be uh, sort of uh, arguing about that if you come from the Western Cape or you've come from Pretoria West. But uh, needless to say, this is where most of the international um, duties have been done in terms of World Superbikes, MotoGP, Formula One, uh, sports cars, you name it. They've all raced at this very famous circuit. And we're here now today with Pure Storage's 24 Hours of Kyle Army. Great to have that partnership, as I said, between Solidarity E-Race and Raceface. We saw that start, George, between you and I, um, with our our little uh, sort of interactions that we've had, uh, joining us as part of the commentary team, being one of the uh, the commentators found during the uh, the E-Races that we did in lockdown. But that whole lockdown pr um, process has basically brought about a massive resurgence in South African sim racing. Yeah, not, not just in South Africa. I mean, uh, you know, going across the board, it's been incredible to just see how many of our drivers have managed to uh, get themselves more committed to the sim racing side um you know real life drivers getting the opportunities to return back to their real racing where they can but uh you know the sim racing side has just continued to thrive it was what the goal was always meant to be was to highlight just how cool uh, sim racing is and uh, i've only just seen it go from strength to strength so last week we saw the super pole side of things that was a very cool shootout for the top 10 teams of course side max Motorsports, that number 96, taking home the pole position spot. Followed up with PWSR in second, a local team, Patterson Works Sim Racing, GTWR, bit of a mixed international team. They've got Jordan Sherritt, but they've got a host of international drivers. Toro, a local team, placing fourth. Arashi Racing in fifth, sixth. 
was uh, all in racing. Seventh, Sidemax Motorsports, the number 97. Rigoli Racing EGA getting that eighth position spot. Ninth was Racing Line Motorsports. And in 10th place, the Jana Lacey Esports Academy team. So as you can see, a mixed grid, uh, both international competitors as well as uh, some local teams too. So this is going to be a cool mix up. It, it's always the thing that, that I always drove home was that, you know, you can't just stay within a bubble. You can't just compete against other people in your own country. If you want to be, you know, worldwide and, and recognize worldwide, you need to start attacking the other teams that are also doing these kind of things on a, on a day in day out basis. And this event is, is just that side max themselves have entered two 24 hour Kyle Army events and won both of them. This will be the third mm. time that they're competing. So they're looking to make it a hat trick. They're looking to take that money and the prize funds that are available, courtesy of all our sponsors and, and a massive welcome to all the sponsors. They'll be joining us during the first couple of hours for a couple of chats between our guys. Let's have a look at the grid there. They are lined up, ready to go here. Uh, yes, and there are spectators on the game, but there's actually no spectators allowed at motorsport just yet in, in the real life world. But uh, fantastic to see that we've got such an array of vehicles as well. Most of them coming out of the Assetto Corsa Competizione GT Series. And it's great to see that a couple of guys have gone with different options. I know there were a couple of umming and ahhing about what car to be with and which car would be the best. Between you and I, during the Super Bowl, we spoke about the fact that probably Audi or Porsche would be the one to uh, to be in by the time you get to the end of the 24 hours. But you never know. Things can go right and so wrong in a 24 hour. And I mean, I've seen it for myself on a, on my own racing in 24 hours, but I've also seen it in the, in the karting and other 24 hour events I've been involved in. And of course, the two international uh, GT races that happen here at Kyle Army in the real racing world with the Kyle Army 9 hour. So there's just so many things that can be thrown in. The one factor that a lot of people won't be realizing is in the Assetto Corsa Competizione game, uh, the weather factor is a major one. And we're going to chat about that throughout the, 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 the broadcast. But of course, it is on dynamics. So that means that anything can happen in terms of the weather. And of course, if you were in South Africa this morning, a lot of these drivers would have been majorly concerned because there was a massive downpour between about nine o'clock and uh, the race start time. So if they were actually physically racing at the Kyle Army Grand Prix circuit now, there'd be some chopping and changing as to what is going to happen with tire choice today. You are not wrong, Greg. And uh, you touched on a very good point. We saw that the the best uh, sort of cars for the Super Pole side were either the Audis or the Porsches. But when it comes to a race stint and an enduro stint, you want something that's going to be comfortable, something that all your drivers can adapt to. We know that the Bentleys have a great fuel capacity and the ability to uh, do great stints with their fuel loads. And then, of course, the Aston Martins, also just a, a very stable, good pick of a car, good all-rounder. And we see quite a lot of the Aston Martins join the grid as well. So there are plenty of cars on this grid. It's going to be exciting to see who shows what? We've got some Lexuses. Uh, I think we've got the Ferraris here, Aston Martins, Bentleys. It, it really is a, a whole variety, even uh, a BMW who, you know, is not uh, not really a car that I would favor for Kyle Army, but uh, they, they're coming out as well. Um, Lamborghini's going to be here too. So it, it really is a whole host of cars on the grid. And our competitors getting themselves out for that formation lap. Of course, this formation lap, Greg, just time to uh, pump some warmth and uh, into the tires and the brakes. And then from there, it's, uh, it's green lights are racing. The first lap, the cars are definitely not up to temperature. And with 47 cars on the grid, it is going to be all about managing those positions, making sure that you get away cleanly. And uh, the, the, the start of the race, you, you can't win a race in a 24-hour in the first corner, but you certainly can lose it. Yeah, you can. That's the big issue. And I mean, if you look at the Kyle Army 9 hour, the championship leader two years ago came out of uh, the uh, barbecue um, hairpin, or barbecue sweep, and basically headed up onto the back straight and uh, had a problem on the engine. And it blew his chances of taking the championship in the Mercedes Benz AMG. So things can go wrong right at the start if you're not careful. And that's exactly what these guys are going to be doing. You picked up on a very, very vital point we need to bring in right from the word go is if you've never watched an e-race before, if you've never seen sim racing before, um, all of the stuff that you're seeing on screen is exactly what would be happening in a race car on track as well. So as you heard from what George just said now, you have to get heat into the brakes. You've got to get heat into the tires. You've got to make sure that the setup is right. Everything is 100% um, you know, compatible to what you would see in a normal race on a real race track at Kyle Army in the real world. And that's the the actual beauty of what we're doing here in terms of the uh, sim racing uh, world and what we've done with the partnership between Solidarity E-Race 
and with Race Face Pro and all, of course, Racing Club Internationals competitors and broadcast team. Because this also is something completely different to what you'd see in the real world. In the real world at Kyle Army, you have about 17 cameras available to you to do a broadcast. Here, if I'm not mistaken, we're close to 200 cameras that uh, our broadcast team of Mike Jones and his, his team can go to at any point in time to give us the visuals that you're going to see over the next 24 hours. It's going to be wild. Our drivers now starting to form themselves up into that two by two grid formation. Greg making their way out of the crocodiles on the approach to Cheetah. This is an incredible sight to see having so many GT3 cars on the grid. And of course, uh, each of these cars piloted by some very talented drivers, some big names in sim racing and a whole mixture of skill groups. You know, we've got people coming in into this race who have not done these kind of endurance races, And then we've got uh, drivers that are, are doing this on a daily or weekly basis. So yeah. I'm going to hand over to you as they come into Ingwe for the start of the Pure Storage 24-hour Kyle Army. Yeah, side Max alongside PWSR. Then you've got GTWR Racing Team Taro there in the fourth spot. Arashi ahead of All In Racing. Then the second Side Max car, Ragioli Racing. Racing Line Motorsport, John Alesi Esports Academy, and we're about to go racing. It is uh, on 12 o'clock, and we started. And as we head across the line, let's see who's going to have what it takes to take that uh, first lap. And, of course, across the line, well, it looks like they're just slowing slightly there. Quite sure if they've been given the green flag there or not. Yes, there we go, green flag, and now we're racing. Down towards the first corner, Crowthorn Corner. Very famous racing corner here at Kailami. Looks like Side Max are going to hang on for the whole shot down into turn one, and they've got it all sorted out. Yes, they do. Big move on the inside coming out of GTWR. Good move there as well as they came through. That's exactly what we kind of expected. And watching in the background, you can see guys just taking it a little bit more gingerly than what they would normally do if this was a sprint race or a Super Bowl scenario. But exactly what we kind of expected. Cymax Motorworks, they've had two races at Kailami. They've won both of those 24 hours in the international side of things. And they're now looking to do it here in South Africa at the first option of the uh, pure storage and solidarity e-race 24 hour of Kailami. Absolutely amazing stuff here from the start. It's exactly what I kind of expected, but you can see in the background, a couple of chops and changes that have happened in that mid-pack and expect to see that happening for the first couple of minutes as everybody tries to settle down and get into the rhythm, George. You are not wrong. A good start coming out from Side Max there. Killian Ryan Meenan right up at the front in his Audi. It looks like PWSR in their Porsche losing out quite heavily in the first complex of corners. They've uh, they've obviously lost out that position. They started second on the grid. And Tobias, or sorry, uh, Jason Absmeyer in that Toro Porsche getting through, as well as Tobias Pfeffer in the 157 Audi getting through. So uh, a good start coming out for the Toro boys, the 696. Mm. Good local representation up towards the front of the order. And uh, I know that the push is going to be on. We see David Chisse in the racing line Motorsport 192, a name we're very familiar with in the endurance sim racing side. They're holding on to position. They started in ninth. They're still holding on to ninth, just sitting on the back of Cruz in that number 11 uh, Audi. And you can see in the background, there are people chopping and changing, trying to find a line down into turn two. Crowthorn, such a, a, a tricky breaking point. You mess that up, you ruin your entire momentum and run through the Yuxke sweep. And if you're put on the wrong side of those apexes, you just get bullied out of position as the 777 of Quaid Klaassen comes through, also doing a good job at just uh, trying to give the space necessary to his fellow competitors. And you can see on the timing sheet, or should I say not the timing sheet, but the, the live track feed on, on the right side of the screen, you can see that there's a whole host of cars sort of getting caught out early on. They're sitting towards the back of the field and the leaders are starting to put those legs between them. So we can expect a lot of blue flag conditions as this race goes on. And that's going to be critical for these teams is how they navigate that traffic on the field you can you can quite easily lose a race doing a pass that uh, you, you're just trying to get past the blue flag car who may be not quite aware of, of where you're trying to pass and it's all going to be done safely to ensure that your car gets the checkered flag you certainly do we're watching a couple of cars coming through there as well but see you're making some big maneuvers at the front end there in the bentley we saw that big bentley trying to get to the front of super pole on sunday night and now it's all to be done on the track. Uh, Porsches at the front end with a Bentley on the tail. That's uh, kind of what we expected with the Audis leading out the two Porsches. We've got two Audis, two Porsches, a Bentley, then a, an array of the uh, Vorsprung Dirk Technik machines. Leading out the second Bentley there in 10th place with Daniel Rowe. Now, Daniel Rowe, I believe, uh, also taking uh, one of the uh, championships overnight and uh, over the last couple of days as well, doing a super job there. Not only uh, on track himself as part of the Volkswagen South African motorsport racing team, 
but uh, as part of his own e-racing team as well. And the, the sim racing guys have come all out. We've got uh, real races and sim races mixed up in teams as well, which is good to see. We've got guys who've made it big in both the uh, sim racing and real racing world that have combined now into uh, this 24 hour. And you can see things just starting to settle down ever so slightly in this first couple of cars. But in the background, that's where there's been a lot of action. There's been a lot of chopping and changing. Watching in that background action that we saw earlier on, a couple of the Lamborghinis trying to squeeze through there. Oh, a little running wide there from the Audi. I think that might have been Kroblo who ran a little bit wide coming out of Sunset Corner. Just putting a wheel on the dirt. You don't want to be doing that too often because uh, they do run on Pirelli rubber, these cars, as per the uh, Assetto Corsa Competizione uh, version of the GT racing that we've got here, the Intercontinental GT racing series. And, of course, these cars are all coming out of that. But you, you, exactly what we said in terms of real racing, you can't afford to make any mistakes on the circuit that you would do even in a real race because they will affect your car's handling ability. They will affect the, the tire duration. Kyle Army's surface, fortunately, it's very good on tires, so uh, there's not a lot of tire degradation other than the fact that you're going to be out there for such a long time. And uh, now we need to sort of bring in the fact that uh, at this at this point in time of the race, there's not going to be any worries about pit lane or pit lane activity unless something major goes wrong. But those strategies have all been worked out over the last couple of days, haven't they, George? They have indeed, and uh, you don't want to be putting too early, and we will see a Bentley actually peeling in there, so maybe a, uh, a bit of damage actually coming out for one of the cars. Looking at Attila Denks in this number 41 Aston Martin, he's out of position. The Jean Lacey Esports Academy starting in 10th place, but dropping down to 14th, so they were caught up in some of that chaos that we talked about on the opening lap, jumping on board as Attila Denks tries to navigate through what would be a field of slower cars based on pure qualifying pace alone. But it's so difficult to overtake it, Kyle Army. It's all about consistency. And I suppose it's all about keeping that pressure on to the cars around you, forcing them to make the mistake, you know, maybe outbreak themselves, run a little bit wide so that you can then get some advantage to yourself. And Attila Denks doing a good job then to just start uh, putting that pressure onto the back of a local Quaid Classens in that 777 Audi. And just in front of them, you've got Kiebel and Classens, uh, or Kiebel and uh, Fazicus also putting pressure onto one another. So as you look from the back of Simon Keeble's 962 Aston Martin, you can see that battle between Klaassen's and Denks and a nice little view from the rear, uh, the rear facing cam. You can get the, uh, the, the view of sort of the, the height of coming up to the top of Leocorp as well. You can just see that change in elevation and uh, a circuit that when I've spoken to fellow international racers, they're all very appreciative of, and they probably wouldn't have had so much experience with it if it hadn't come through to the sim. So a big shout out to Kunos and uh, Seto Corsa Competition for including our local track in their lineup. And of course, uh, it's very cool that we get something just as accurate as this in a sim. Uh, the accuracy on this game is absolutely phenomenal. We saw that in the very first e-race we did during the lockdown, and uh, both Sasha Martinenga and myself were blown away at the details. I mean, even when you're driving along here and you, and you see the guys standing on the pit wall, and there's a couple of guys who look exactly like the marshals or medics that would be standing there as well. Bit of a battle on here for the lead. You can see uh, Pfeffer starting to put the pressure on there. And I think uh, Ryan Meeson could be in a bit of trouble here because there is a lot more pressure than what was expected probably from the word go. And uh, the two Audis now starting to, well, they're kind of like working together here, to be honest with you. Well, um, it's a, it's you know, a, it's there a, might be... Sorry, Greg. Uh, I was going to say, yeah. it's, a battle of, it's a battle of some big hitters. I mean, GTWR currently sitting in second place. Tobias Fair for piloting that Audi. They won the SimGrid 12 hour of Kyle Army. And then, of course, Sidemax up at the top. We mentioned it at the start. They've gone back to back winning two 24 hour Kyle Army events themselves. So, some big international heavy hitters taking, uh, taking a fight up towards the front of the order. Uh, it's incredible to see that uh, the battle is so hard and fast from the word go. You kind of didn't expect that. Uh, that's, that's how close and personal it can get. <laughs> Literally right up the tailpiece and in the exhaust pipes there from Pfeffer trying to put the pressure on. Maybe trying to force a mistake. You know, uh, an early mistake from one of these cars could be costly. Uh, we've seen it in the past in various forms of motorsport, that, uh, particularly in endurance racing, that an early mistake could be uh, something that throws you right back and loses you a lot of time in pit lane. Fortunately, the Bentley that went into pit lane seems to be back out on circuit and has uh, returned to the front end or to the back end of the race, but he's quite a way down. If you look at the, the map on the right-hand side of the screen there and you can see the leaders coming across the line, the two last cars on track of the 47 cars competing here are literally coming out of Yuxke and Barbecue and onto the back straight. So there's probably about a third of a lap 
as to, and that's exactly where we're going. Great stuff there from Mike. Thanks for that, Mike. Just showing you that those Bentleys could be in a bit of trouble and could be the first back markers for these two Audis to contend with. It's not a place that you want to find yourself so early in a race as well, because uh, when you are getting blue flagged, the, uh, the race rule is that you have to stay predictable, but allow those race leaders to come through. You're not allowed to, uh, you know, compromise their race. And when you do have a big pack of cars coming like this to get through, it's not just one car that you're then letting through. It's the entire field. And that puts you another lap down behind where you need to go. And uh, you're going to have to rely on your other drivers to unlap themselves at some point in the next 23 hours and 50 minutes. I mean, that's an incredible thing to say in itself. 23 hours and 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> left of this race until we see who we're going to crown as our champion yeah it's amazing and we're going to be chatting about that all through the, the next 24 hours or 23 and 50 minutes because every time you look up at that clock you're going to go well hang on a second there's still 16 hours to go there's still eight hours to go the worst part about it for uh, for anybody who's driven in a, or ridden uh, in a 24-hour race is probably the last hour the last hour you are literally just hanging on for dear life survival mode has kicked in I remember that uh, during the 24-hour uh, Red Star Raceway, I actually couldn't even twist my wrist to, to turn the motorcycle's accelerator for myself. I was actually using my, my elbow to try and get uh, the accelerator to work. So you, you literally get to a point where you, you, you start to feel the effects of 24 hours of racing. You made a couple of mentions on, on Twitter and on social media over the last sort of 48 hours talking about guys that uh, have cramp in their toes, cramp in their feet, <laughs> cramp in their bodies from sitting in their race rigs the whole time. Uh, all of that comes into play. And of course, it's the same kind of thing you would experience, but on a lot less um, uh, harsh conditions as if you'd be in the actual race car. But take nothing away from it. If you're sitting in a race rig and some of these guys will probably be looking to do two to three hour stints, you're going to start to feel the effects of it. There's no doubt about it. It does start to, uh, it does start to take its toll. And I think that's why these, these driver teams paired themselves up between three, four, and five drivers in a car, just so that you can take a break, you can get yourself a little bit of rest in. Otherwise, that fatigue just builds up, and it makes it a, an incredibly difficult race. I know a lot of these drivers can do long stints themselves. They've uh, you know, kind of got accustomed to it. I think your point on it being different to what you're doing in a real car is very much valid. Uh, but at the same time, the, the fatigue that comes through Certainly something that's very different to a lot of other esports that are out there in the world where you might uh, do a competitive game, you might play uh, five maps in a game of Counter-Strike. Uh, you know, those, those things don't last 24 hours. So this is, this is incredible to see. It's both single driver skill related as well as team related uh, on yeah. the same time. So when you're in the, in the car, it's, it's all up to you. You've got your teammates uh, playing spotters and, and just giving you some feedback. You're trying to relay information about your tire temperatures and pressures, as well as uh, the, the, the feel of what the car is doing. If you go and hit into the wall and you start losing time out on the circuit, you need to make a call. Do we stay out, try and get this timed in with when we need to go into the pits and make a driver swap and do a repair then? Or do we need to jump in now because we're losing too much time? It's all stuff that has to be calculated on the fly. And having other drivers in your team just uh, sort of assists with that process certainly does the more the merrier i would say I, mean, I know that from the 24 hours that i've been involved in i did them all on my own but you had an opportunity of doing up to six riders on those 24 hours that happened at red star raceway um just picking up on some of the comments that are flying through on our live stream feed coming out of the facebook solidarity e-race page a big welcome to yuri absmeyer he's shouting out there for jason absmeyer uh, emil tiny brand has joined us as well all the way from cape town uh, diane king is there of course that's clark's mom and we've got uh, Foley Faree, Luke uh, Lucchesi is there too, and Ryan, uh, Ryan van der Bosch all joining us. We're throwing in a couple of comments here and there. And please keep those comments coming right the way through. I just want to say a shout out to everybody out on YouTube. Thanks for all your support, guys. Please like and share the posts on both of those social media channels so we can try and grow this as big and as wide as possible. Because if you look at 47 cars at Kyle Army, uh, even uh, the SRO weren't able to do that in, the, in their first attempts to do uh, the intercontinental gt championship here with a two car army nine hours so uh, it is a massive amount of work that's gone in behind the scenes from the, uh, the rci side of things uh, uh, mike and his team and of course uh, ross and the whole team behind solidarity e race and Batis coming in from race face your side g and of course all of our sponsors who we're going to be uh, chatting with in a couple of minutes time as well we're going to be jumping in with a couple of the sponsors interviews just to pick up on why they're involved with this event and, and why this event is so big on their calendars and it's probably become, hopefully, an annual event because if it's uh, as successful as it is, we 
we've seen international drivers already showing interest in Kyle Army 24 here that we're doing as part of Solidarity Each Race. There's certainly a big, big opportunity to carry this on and make it a, an annual event. Tingo van der Felder in that uh, Sidemax Motorsports. This is their second car, the number 97. Also putting pressure onto Krubler. Going to take an inside line coming down into Crowthorn. Nicely on the inside of the Apex. Going to get that move done, in fact, and promote the uh, Sidemax Motorworks number 97 up into sixth place. It's a, it's a long race, Greg. There's going to be positional swaps throughout the entire duration of the next 23 hours and 45 minutes. I, you know, I just got to say it because it's, uh, it's something that I don't get to say enough when I'm doing commentary. It always feels like it runs out too quick. And this time around, we, uh, we're certainly not going to be there. But you, you touched on some good points. You know, big collaborative effort coming in between Solidarity E-Race and Raceface. Big shout out to the sponsors, Pure Storage, NEC, Data Sciences, Oxide, uh, AMD, Supermicro, They've all done their part to get involved behind this. And then, of course, uh, the broadcasting side and the commentary. I've worked a lot with the Racing Club International team. It was something that uh, found in its way into my heart as we look at Util on the inside line here, trying to take that position off of PWSR. That's Leslie Olifant in the yellow Porsche at the top of Leocorp. And position done. I think we'll get an action-packed replay here as well. We can see that run coming out of the S's, sitting in the slip as uh, Leslie goes for the outside line to break, allows Util to come on the inside. I think uh, Leslie spotting that move coming out, knowing it's a long race, not wanting to go hard defense and put his car at risk of being hit, taking both of them out of the running and uh, just doing the smart thing to just allow uh, the number 367 Bentley to slot on past. Yeah, 367 getting the 101 there from Leslie Willifant on how to uh, survive the first hour of racing in a 24 hour. You were talking about touching on your heart. Well, uh, of course, with Solidarity E-Race, uh, all of the Solidarity E-Races that have happened right from the word go last year in April of 2020 and lockdown full here in South Africa and all around the world. Um, we put in a huge amount that uh, all the driver proceed, uh, proceeds would go towards the Solidarity Fund. This time out, though, we have uh, joined in a partnership with the Quad Para Association of South Africa. And because, of course, over 60% of people that have quadru quadrupedic or paraplegic um, conditions are caused by motor accidents. So uh, all the donations that have been given through there will be put through. And if you want to donate more, um, we will put up a, a link on the page to uh, let you know that there is uh, the Quad Para Association South Africa and their NetBank account here. You guys can put in some more if you want to help out towards that or if you feel that uh, um, what we're doing here is, is a worthwhile cause in supporting the Quad Power Association of South Africa as well. And we wish um, we could do a lot more to ensure that those kind of people could be involved. We actually had, just as an interesting point, and I don't know if Ross realized that, but uh, the, the last race we did where we were in, where were we the last time, George Max, G Max? We were in the United States of America um, at, I think it was at uh, Laguna Seca. At the Laguna Seca round of the uh, the e-race that we did, we actually yeah. had Mark Whittington who is a quadriplegic himself uh, as one of the drivers involved and in racing that series with his rig at home. He's had a specially made rig for his um, his abilities and he actually raced the Laguna Seca round with us. Uh, so Mark Whittington now, of course, um, concentrating on uh, making it through to the Olympics in his race chair. So he's actually going to be participating as one of the South African Olympic hopefuls for the next round of the Paralympics. So there you have it. Uh, not only are we seeing the guys being supported from the the generous um, donations given by the drivers and the proceeds from the driver entries, but also we're getting guys actually involved in events like this itself. It's so cool. It's uh, you know it's a cause that's very close to my heart. The uh, Quad Para Association of South Africa. I did a very cool bike ride that I think you'll appreciate. The uh, Quads for Quads ride about five or six times on my mm. dirt bike, which is a ride down from Belito or from uh, Carnival City down to Belito all in yeah. the name for raising funds for the charity and of course riding alongside riders that uh, did have disadvantages compared to me as an able-bodied individual and i just couldn't believe the uh, the bravery and the skill levels that uh, some of those individuals had uh, there were parts of that race where i felt like uh, i was just um, it wasn't even a race it's more of a just a, a fundraiser but fun event but you're still pushing yeah. yourself you're still doing things that uh, are, are quite terrifying to do and i had to keep reminding myself that uh, there's there's lesser fortunate people that are able to uh, to do these things and it was good motivation for me to to just push myself to the end um but yeah good cause i'm well behind it as uh, we see that that lead of killian ryan mead and in that side works motorsports number 96 has been taken over gtwr 
our current race leaders for the Kyalami 24 hour. And this is so, so, so cool to see because it's not just a small gap that GTWR has picked up. It's two seconds behind. So possibly a big mistake coming out from Sidemax previously. And uh, that's related or that's sort of put them in a position now that uh, has allowed the GTWR team to get ahead. But uh, Sidemax, they are not to be written off until the end of that checkered flag. They'll be pushing and fighting. Chisia from Racing Line Motorsport also looking to take a position off of the likes of uh, JC Krobler in that number 100. We've seen him get bullied out of the sixth position spot by Tingo van der Felder in that number 97. And uh, Krobler starting to feel a little bit of pressure coming out from the Racing Line Motorsport entry as well. Now, Cruz is behind them as well, and so is uh, the only Ferrari I see in that top 20. So incredible to see that uh, Jose Georges is up there too. So nice bit of maneuvering there from uh, the Ferrari fans' point of view, moving that Ferrari into the top 10. We didn't have a Ferrari in the Super Bowl. Uh, we just lost out in terms of the Ferraris, but you can see that Ferrari is now starting to make its way to the front end. We did mention the fact that there's possibly a good, a good fight on um, that is going to be happening for the next 23 hours and 40 minutes between the Audis and Porsches. We've got a Bentley thrown in there as well. We've got a couple of Bentleys just outside of the top 10, but uh, by the end of the race in uh, that uh, time period of 23 and 39 minutes, I can tell you there's going to be some, some chopping and changing in terms of the manufacturers at the front end too. We'll wait and see who's going to have what it takes here. Great to see some more interaction coming on our live stream as well. Jimmy Sean Winner has joined us. Good to have him here. Steve Koenig is here too. Of course, a man who uh, does what you and I are doing at the moment on a, on a part-time basis, climbs on a microphone and talks about motorsport. But uh, this weekend is part and parcel of one of the teams that's out there too. So a big welcome to him. He's watching at this stage, but I know he's going to be behind the wheel at some point in time with his team. So a uh, big welcome to those guys that have joined us on our live stream feed. Hope you've enjoyed what you've seen so far. And as I said, please like and share this and pass this on to all your friends, fans and family so that we can grow this and uh, show people exactly what uh, sim racing is all about. I mean, we've seen it over the last couple of uh, sim races that we've done with Solidarity E-Race. We've seen it in the leagues that run um, every single week. We've seen it with the amount of effort that you and uh, the RCI team have put together, what Race Face has put together, and all of the racing leagues in South Africa. It really is turning into something pretty spectacular. And you mentioned it earlier as well, George, uh, um, the international aspect has grown dramatically as well, not only here in South Africa, but all around the world. And with the likes of lockdown, it's actually not been a bad thing for sim racing because the sim racers or the real racers have had an opportunity to now join that sim racing world and keep their, their eyes in. Yeah, I can't, I mean, I can't discount just how big the followings are of the real world racers. And, uh, you know, all of those sort of uh, aspects do allow for us to get more, more uh, eye time onto what our passion is about in the sim racing community um you know it's it's been thriving for a while before lockdown happened when i say thriving it's been you know people have been entering and doing events uh, in in those times but once once we had that hard lockdown which was very tough for a lot of people it did just highlight just how cool this whole space is and it brought more eyes in it brought more sponsors in and um, I, I would be uh, completely wrong to discount just what real life drivers have done for promoting sim racing. There's been some epic events, of course, uh, taking place that just had real life drivers in them, some good mixtures of, of, of events with the, the, the combination of real life and uh, sim drivers, you know, the top of their, their individual respective fields, getting out onto the circuit, partnering up together to do races. And that's what it all is about, you know, to me, is to, to grow the space. Uh, I, I have done a lot of uh, commentary on gaming in the past. You know, esports was something that I got into almost four or five years ago. And uh, it's, it's only increased and improved as things have gone on. And for me, that's what I, that's what I set out to. That was my goal when I decided, you know, no more uh, first-person shooters and uh, MOBA games. I want to get into racing. I just wanted to oh, see it grow. Don't knock the shooter guys, eh? Don't knock the shooter guys. <laughs> no, you know, the, no, no knocking the shooter guys at all. It's something that I still enjoy doing in my part time. You know, I, I enjoy gaming as a whole. Um, but, uh, you know, when it, when it comes into it, I just, I wanted to find something else that was out there. I would found sim racing. I was uh, streaming and, and having fun. And, and ironically, it never started in the competitive grip racing side. I was a big fan of drifting and I was, uh, I'm still a big fan of drifting. And uh, I found that I could do, you know, some, some virtual drifting. That's what I started out with. 
and uh, it just sort of progressed from there. I decided, you know, let me use the skill sets, uh, the ability to use my voice uh, to give a little yeah. bit of an interesting side to the viewers. Started doing some uh, some cool things out with the Monday Night Racing side of things. You know, we just built up a, a, a whole host of drivers to start to, uh, you know, enjoy the sim. And um, from there, leagues had formed up and started to look outside of that, look at the international scene and see where we could get involved. We see Brits on the uh, inside, well, now will be the outside into Clubhouse, trying to take that position off of Denshim side by side through Clubhouse. And uh, perhaps a little touch between them almost, but uh, Denshim going to lose that position out and Brits going to come through. So that's the Power Rangers racing team. I saw them uh, putting out a nice, uh, a nice little poster. We get a race replay of what's happened to Altman Buerta here. Oh, big a little touch between them. You know, yeah, it's, a little uh, touch between them. I think the stewards might be having a chat about that one. <laughs> I mean, I think the stewards will be having a big something to look at there. And uh, importantly to note as well, just having to wait for the correct time to rejoin the circuit, make sure that uh, their new Racing Works 242 wasn't going to rejoin the circuit with other cars around. Had to let another driver through before rejoining. And that's all the sportsmanship side that has to be followed here you know these guys are following a strict rule set as well in terms of, of how they behave on the circuit and that gives us the viewers and as commentators something to actually enjoy and watch you know if there was no rules and it could just be reckless bumper cars you would uh, you would really find yourself at a place where it wouldn't be an enjoyable competitive environment so it has to be governed Look at the onboard now with the leader as well, and uh, great, great, great stuff so far from uh, Otel. As I said, he's uh, putting a little bit of pressure there onto Jason Absma. We go on board here with the leader, absolutely hauling through you and uh, putting in some really good lap times as well, setting consistent lap times, which is exactly what you need to do. You can see as he comes round out of Ingwe, let's go and have a look at it uh, from a from a whole lap point of view from our leader. A uh, bit of clear traffic for him. He might get a little bit of traffic uh, halfway through this one, but as he crosses across the line, they go through the kink. Um, not really a, a turn as such, it's just a kink, but they do name it turn one in terms of the marshalling points that Kyle Army marshals would put you. This is turn two into Crowthorn. You mentioned earlier on there uh, how big Crowthorn is. It's a wide circuit. At that point of the track, I think it's just over 18 meters wide. So there's such a, uh, uh, an awesome opportunity to get a couple of lines through there and possibly find some overtaking maneuvers. They head through Yuxke and Barbecue up onto the back straight. That's the old main straight away from the previous version of Kyle Army. We're not going to see it just yet, but a little bit later on in the afternoon, we'll realize why this corner is called Sunset, because as the sun dips, you basically get that sun straight into the visor of your uh, helmet. And then you come through Clubhouse, a short straight again, into the S's. Very tricky, off camber, downhill to the left, and then uphill to the right, um, using the curbs if you can. Not too much of the curbs, because it can be uh, pretty offsetting in terms of the car's uh, ability to go through a very fast lap. Then it's up to a triple apex left-hander, uh, currently known as Leokop, of course, the famous name there for a while was West Bank Corner. As they come now onto the mine shaft, one of the, the fastest parts of the circuit, not the fastest part, of course, it's the second fastest part as you go through, but definitely the fastest corner as they go through the sweep at the end of the mine shaft and then down towards Crocodiles. It's basically down to, I think, about probably second gear coming out of Crocodiles. Uh, a little sweep through Crocodiles and up towards uh, the right hander, which is known as Cheetah. We're onto the splitter cam now. And you can see just how awesome that is as they come down to complete the lap. This is what Kyle Lamy looks like on board there with Pepper, the lead car at the Kyle Lamy 24 hour, the pure storage Kyle Lamy 24 hour. Absolutely brilliant stuff. And great to have that opportunity to see what the cars can do around this track. Tobias Pfeffer really starting to put some good ground and distance between uh, themselves and that number 96 Sidemax Motorsports uh, team. And of course, uh, Roman Util in the all-in racing Bentley going to be making a move now on the inside as they come through into uh, the turn for Crowthorn and going alongside as well as Tinko van der Felder in that number 97 Steinmax team. So uh, Jason giving a little bit of room to those drivers and uh, just getting to a position where, again, we said it before, you don't want to be making mistakes. You don't want to... Uh, ruin your race with 23 hours to go. So uh, just uh, being gentlemanlike and uh, giving the space required out to those other two teams, they get themselves through. So All In Racing jumps up. Toro now under pressure from Leslie Oliphant in that number 101 as uh, PWSR versus Toro, two local racing teams. And uh, I mean, Toro, I don't even know if I can sort of classify it as uh, a local team. I know that they've uh, they've got some international uh, teammates as well. Um, 
of course, Alaric Enslin starting that team up, and uh, he's got some great connections out to the sim racing world. Yeah, that is for sure. And of course, the man who won the very first Solidarity race we put together here at Kailami. So certainly knows the way around here, as does Uli Funt and Jason Absmeyer. Absmeyer, I remember, had some issues with the technical uh, side of his equipment during some of our uh, previous versions of the Solidarity race, but it looks like he's got all that uh, now sorted out and dialed in. I also just got a message in from, uh, from our boss man, Ross, saying that uh, if you want to check out the, uh, the banking details there for the uh, Quad Strategic uh, Association and uh, any of the uh, donations that need to be made, they've just put a post up onto Facebook and you can check out exactly what that's all about. And if you are feeling generous and you want to add to what the drivers have already done, giving some of their proceeds towards the Quad Quad and Paraplegic Association of South Africa, you're more than welcome to jump in there. The post has gone live on Facebook. You can check out all the banking details on our Facebook page on Solidarity E-Race. I think it's a, it's a great thing if people do have the ability to donate to a great cause to go and do so. Um, I think uh, there's there's a lot to be said for people that, that are able to uh, just uh, spend a little bit of bucks in, in promoting things like that and being able to uh, contribute to it. Just here, while we say that, that is all over the back end of Krubler coming into sunset. Lots of pressure being mounted up. And Jose George's behind there as well in that Ferrari, front running Ferrari, starting to benefit from the scraps that are taking place on the circuit in front when you do have pressure and you are defending, you are losing time and uh, the cars behind you can spot those gaps out. They can see their delta times uh, improving to catching up and uh, we'll be looking for the opportune moment to uh, take a move onto them or oh, a little bit deep coming down into the top of Leucorp. That's allowed Chisia uh, to uh, to kind of get closer to Hrubler, but it's also allowed Jose George's in that 258 Ferrari to hunt down. Now they're going to go side by side into Crocodile and the inside line being taken out by the number one, number 100 round the outside. They're going to try. You can't go two cars wide through the likes of Cheetah. Well, you can, but it's treacherous and dangerous and they think better of it starting back into that train formation. But this is a, a battle heating up. And of course, this is for P7 overall. And these new drivers all pushing it to the limits. Oh, they certainly are. You can see things are starting to get a little bit more heated now as we're into uh, just over the half hour period of 24 hours. So 23 and a half hours still to go. And uh, things starting to get a little bit more heated, a little bit more serious out there. Guys realizing that uh, opportunities may be uh, you know, presenting themselves and if those opportunities are worthwhile taking, exactly what they're trying to do here. Great on board here from the Ferrari's point of view, coming out of your and barbecue and then of course heading up towards the very famous sunset corner uh, in, a, in a GT car, it's basically just a lift off here and then you'll basically start to plant it halfway through the corner to get the ability of those wings and slicks that are available on these cars to work to the optimum side of things. On board the splitter cam here from JC Krupp's point of view, you can see he's trying to push hard in the Audi to get away from those two, but uh, the pressure is certainly on him. I think uh, JC could start to feel the effects here of that pressure. Maybe he just wants to ease off a little bit, give them a run at the front. It's a, a lot of times that's what happens is the guys will just uh, allow the car behind to get through and then resume the or, 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 or give a, a similar kind of pressure to what they've been experiencing for the last couple of laps and return the favor. Basically get onto the back end of that wing and uh, start to put the pressure onto the driver who was in front of you and is now behind you or vice versa. That's uh, kind of how this game is played. I, uh, I don't think it's bad advice at all is to uh, kind of just, if there is too much pressure coming on, just uh, find yourself slotting behind, playing that role of uh, follow the leader, let them sort of dictate the race pace whilst uh, you just uh, maintain and, and, and cruise along in their slipstream, some fuel saving that you can do as well. You can just kind of ease it up, but then it, it also can uh, backfire on you. You can start to lose your focus points of you and you're trying to, um, you know, you're trying to navigate uh, the traffic behind and in front of you at the same time, but getting caught up by people behind. So, uh, you know, it's, it's all about just managing those positions. If you do back off, you obviously can be a little bit easier on your tires. You've got to manage those tires for as long as you can. And uh, right now, people that aren't easy enough to buy is fifth in GT, T, GTWR, 6.3 seconds ahead of the car in second place and uh, absolutely flying out there. They don't care about their tires. They've obviously... Uh, planned out just how hard they need to push and where they need to push and they're looking to get themselves a good gap to start things out before they start heading into the pits 
exactly that. So uh, let's have, have a look and see what's happening a bit further back there. You can see Densham in a little bit of pressure as well. Starting to feel the effects of uh, the pressure being applied there by Heidemann. You've got Isherwood and Brits just behind that. This the, the second Ferrari. Too far off the front end of that field too. But great to see that um, the battles... Oh, and that is a superb shot that we went to there. Perfect timing from Mike Jones' point of view. Side by side, Aston Martin's coming out of Ingwe Corner. Usually ends up in tears, but uh, this time out, fortunately, they both got through and uh, slot in. But uh, there was a little bit of uh, pressure on here as Densham starts to feel it. And you can see he's uh, looking for an opportunity. Jason Isherwood also looking for a chance now to maybe capitalize on that. He throws the Bentley in amongst the Ferrari and the two bent, uh, two Aston Martins that are fighting hard. And you can see, ooh, that's a good move. Oh, he runs a little bit wide. Gets a little bit out of shape there. And I think he might just have caught it. But could possibly have spoiled his uh, run through Barbecue and Yuxka. Yes, it has. He's lost some ground there. But uh, very lucky to survive that because he did put a wheel on the curb. And as I said, touching the curbs at Kyle Army sometimes is fine. But there are certain curbs that you don't want to go anywhere near. Let's have a look at that from a replay point of view as they came up and uh, into uh well from yuxka into barbecue barbecue into yuxka i should say other way around and as they come up there you get, oh it actually was a little bit of a tap there was a little bit of assistance there on the ferrari so uh oh, stewards could be having a little chat to those two i think uh scotty was uh, very lucky there there was some curb involved but there was definitely uh, a little tap from behind as well so uh, possibility of a little chat with the stewards there to say listen guys let's keep it uh, good clean and uh, fun racing out there I think uh, the stewards box is going to be quite busy for the next day as uh, of course the the full live stewarding team are going to be joining us for that entire duration or the entire duration of this race which is incredible so big shout out to the stewards uh, for for being here and just uh, regulating the races and making sure that people are behaving themselves on the circuit i mean there are battles across the field it doesn't matter where you look whether it's at the top of the order mid pack or down towards the bottom. Everybody out here trying to stamp their mark on this 24-hour race. And, uh, you know, you, you don't always just have to compete to get into that prize pool uh, lineup. You're trying to also just uh, get yourself done as a team, complete a 24-hour on your checklist. It's always something cool as a team to be able to uh, say, well, you know what? We managed, to, um, we managed to do something quite cool today. We managed to actually get through and, um, you know, complete a, a race with driver swaps. Uh, with our strategy, we uh, we maybe ended a couple of laps behind the leaders, but for us, it's uh, it's a good showing because we've never done a race like that. So I think it's cool that we've got uh, some very skilled drivers from both South Africa and across the the rest of Europe, and then we've also got some people that are are entering into this for the sake of them being able to say, well, you know, this is what we managed to do this weekend uh, when their bosses asked them on Monday. Oh, exactly. <laughs> That's what a lot of guys don't fail to realize is that uh, 24 hours of racing will take its toll. And then most of these guys will have uh, maybe you know a couple of hours to, to recover. Um, there'll be a little bit of celebration between the teams that are close to each other. And then, of course, it's a, a little bit of a, a kip. Um, but not for our team, not for the RCI team. Or well, I think you may be involved as well. I'm not quite sure if you are. But there's a six-hour at Bathurst straight after this, which Mike Jones is going to have to do as well. So uh, <laughs> some of them are going to get some rest before they go to work on Monday. Some are not. <laughs> I, 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 luckily, um, I luckily managed to get myself out of doing any of the racing side because I actually don't have my sim racing rig here in the UK with me. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously uh, sort of, I did this transition over quite last minute and without too much planning. So I had, to, I had to wait till I had permanent accommodation before I could ship all of my belongings over. So I pretty much live out of a suitcase with a laptop, a microphone and a webcam. And uh, that, that's how I've been living for the last couple of months. So uh, until that's all sorted out, I do not have to participate with my teammates that uh, to do these endurance races. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm heavily involved with the Racing Club International team. Uh, I do a lot of the commentary with them. Uh, I don't really do too much outside of that. I think they, they've realized that I'm not too good at doing the admin side. I, I don't have the patience. Uh, to deal with, um, you know, all the, the intricacies that go down into organizing races like this or any of the other endurance or sprint races that Racing Club International do. But uh, I, do, I do contribute with my voice and uh, I think that's, that's where I can add some value. The value is very huge. So we appreciate all the effort that you do put in from the entire RCI team as well as all of our team behind Solidarity E-Race and the Race Face Pro guys. Absolutely brilliant stuff. But uh, we're seeing a, a proper pro race on here between two of SA's finest. 
Abs Meyer and Ulifant going at it and uh, matching each other sort of uh, corner for corner, mano a mano, in those two Porsches as they come into the S's. So it's a, it's a tight little fight there between the two of them and uh, literally sitting at about uh, 0.4 of a second gap between those two Porsches. We're on board with Ulifant as he goes up towards Leopold. And looking in the rearview mirror, he's uh, starting to pull a bit of a gap now over the Ferrari, but good to see the progress of that Ferrari of Jose Georges, who's made his way through into that top seven now. So, uh, oh, a little bit of runoff there. Somebody's run off wide. I'm not quite sure who he picked up there, but definitely a problem. Yeah, I think it might have been uh, Van Afelder. Van Afelder might have made a mistake there, and it's allowed no, Abzmeyer a chance Greg. to have a look here. No, it a Greg, these are, these, are, these are back markers that back are markers, coming through. Part, part, yeah, that's for Nico. Oh, so I mean, we said it. You you gotta uh, you gotta be respectful to oh, Willy oh, oh, oh. a lot of curb taken out from the sausage, and uh, almost loses the back end of that Porsche. We know with it being a rear engine car, that that weight distribution is so difficult when it gets into that tack slapper position. You've got to uh, you've got to just get off and make sure that you can uh, you can save it. And that was a good save coming out from Lizzie Oli fans. But it is going to cost him that progress that he made onto the back of the Totoro team. Currently with Jason Absmeyer at the wheel. But uh, knowing Leslie, I mean, we saw his pace coming out from Super Bowl. We saw his pace just uh, when it when it came down to almost the, the hot lap sessions to set the qualification for Super Bowl. That he is one of the quicker car uh, drivers, if not the quickest in that GRP uh, uh, Patterson Works racing team. So uh, it's a good driver to have up towards the front. Chisia is uh, still trying to make process uh, progress through the field. They uh, find themselves in P10, currently uh, just battling it out, getting past Denks. That was uh, a battle for 11th and 10th. That's Denks behind in that number 41, Aston Martin, and the two of them going nose to tail. Lots of pressure coming through. Sideways out uh, or alongside out through barbecue, and then just settling in through the mid sector, just uh, trailing behind a little bit is Denks now as they make their way through the S's. But uh, it's all pressure, and it's all about making sure that you can get these cars to the checkered flag. It doesn't matter at what part of the race you are choosing to take your battles. Uh, whether it's at the start now in the middle of the uh, the nighttime side. I mean, you touched on it. We're going to get a nice sunset view a little bit later on through sunset as that uh, race time progresses almost one o'clock coming out in the uh, sim racing time. And then it's going to go into a nighttime session too. So it's going to get really dark on the circuit. And all these drivers uh, have, have been putting that kind of effort in. You know, they, they, they've been practicing driving in the nighttime, practicing during the daytime, practicing in the wet. At the moment, we've just got partly cloudy conditions for the next 30 minutes. No sign of uh, rain coming up just yet. But as it stands, I mean, that could that could just change in an instant. We could uh, get notification that rain is coming. And then the drivers and their management, oh, look how scrappy that is coming <laughs> out. And oh, line, yeah. into oh, the wall. Yeah, I thought about getting yeah, shape there. There were, there were a lot of cars next to one another there and uh, a big crash coming down i think that might have even been uh util in the uh bentley that uh, got out of shape there we'll get a race replay uh, re race replay of altman buerta here we'll be able to maybe see what quite happened there but uh, a lot of cars in a very narrow part of the circuit uh, coming out of this you can see just the inside uh, it's okay not a major but uh it was there yeah, that was running wide but the, the, the accident actually happened just ahead of that and there you can see both those cars getting back on track and uh, going again. Well, one has. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's a green flag there. It should be a yellow flag there. But anyway, <laughs> that's uh, where we are. Um, we'll try and pick up on that replay if we can find it. Uh, coming into pit lane, though, is the uh, that's Palsa. Palsa in uh, the 41 car. Unfortunately, he's the guy who was involved. Here we go. You can see the inside line being taken by one of the cars. And unfortunately, just as he came across, just tagging the car and the two of them coming together and hitting the sidewall and uh, crashing into that sidewall of the uh, old back straight. So both those cars possibly gonna have to go back into pit lane for some repair work, which is uh, costly. It, it, any any kind of repair work in a 24 hour is uh, stuff that you don't wanna be doing. Thanks still continuing to uh, put the pressure onto the back end here of uh, Chisia, but also just picking up on something that uh, you were mentioning during your, your little stint there as well, um, Georgie. The cool thing about what we're doing here on a sim race and an e-race is the ability to go to various forms of media and i'm talking social media streaming all bits and pieces that happen around the world which you don't necessarily have when you're in the real racing world and the one thing is uh coming up on our on our um, 
uh, comments that have been flying through here on the people that are watching on the Solidarity E-Race Facebook page. Previous partner of ours in the Solidarity E-Race, Vanna Hina from True Sport has just joined us saying, you know, how many laps are we expecting to do here? He would be, be, be sort of being a kind of a prediction on the race when we were involved with him at the, in the previous time with uh, True Race and True Sport. But um, Mike Rowe from Volkswagen Motorsport has just joined us here from South Africa as well. And then getting information coming thrown at me from Ross Crichton, our boss man, saying that he was watching Boothby's stream and there was a bit of a pickup on Boothby's stream saying that Cybex 96 car possibly having a little bit of problems because of their setup. And now, uh, oh, speaking of setup, there's a big mistake at the top of Leocop. Somebody out of shape at the top of Leocop there. But uh, just before we pick up on that car, to finish my thought pattern, is that they are having some very big tire wear issues because the Sidebacks 96 Audi has not been set up as, as well as what they'd hoped. So that's, uh, that, that's what it comes down to um, when, you, when you are sort of preparing yourself for a race. We are going to see Gary Richardson with that off, just uh, getting that car. Oh, unfortunately. Ooh. Oh, three cars. I mean that that is a uh, that is a poor that is a poor sort of uh, situation to be in because the uh, the, oh, the Richardson another big car there. another big oh. one down at Crocodiles that was a huge one. So uh, Richardson, that's, that's Richardson rolling back on track. Yeah, the, the 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 they obviously had an off coming to the top of Leucorp, but. Uh, rolled back onto the racing line and caused a massive, massive crash with a whole bunch of other cars. And then going back to live, we see them still involved with the uh, the same sort of scenario. And they now are just in a terrible position. This is something that the stewards are gonna have to make a call on. This this driver needs to be de queued from the race, almost in my opinion, uh, causing so much havoc, havoc out on the circuit, Nigel Richardson, going to be rolling into the pit box. There'll be a lot of repairs, regardless of uh, what scenario they find themselves in. But I think that's a big call that needs to be made from the stewards. As uh, I mean, that's that's race-ending stuff, Greg. Yeah, there were about six or seven cars involved in that incident. In fact, as we, as we saw the replay there, which uh, Mike gave us, you actually got an opportunity to see some of the lead cars coming through there. I think Jason Absmeyer was very lucky to avoid the spinning Audi in front of him. So. Uh, couple of cars that uh, survived that were of course some of our lead cars a couple of cars that were involved in that though were definitely affected uh, we saw Utiel having to go onto the outside line and around the grass to avoid the spinning Audi so uh, it, this is what can happen though um, you have a small mistake on track a little lapse in concentration and uh, it does affect uh, the ability of your car to go forward and also it starts to affect the race like we're seeing there oh Starting to see some action here. Things are starting to get a little bit uh, more uh, uh, gritty and uh, and involved here, George. It's um, 23 minutes and 13, uh, 23 hours and 13 minutes still to go, and all of a sudden we're seeing a little bit of uh, rubbing is racing out there. Oh, I mean, we, we're seeing more than a little bit of rubbing is racing. We're seeing some uh, some big elbows up stuff coming down, and I'm not quite sure what is happening with a lot of these drivers at the moment. Uh, you know, there's, there's some very strange occurrences that seem to be taking place and stuff that you wouldn't normally see in a sim race uh, with some of these contacts. Sure, we do see them, but uh, there are some crazy impacts going down and, and that's going to affect the entire way that these drivers uh, handle the rest of this race. So um, with 23 hours and 13 minutes on the clock, not the way that you want to see things going, especially knowing that we've got so much racing ahead of us and for a lot of these teams, those those incidents are going to be very costly to them in, in their progress to getting into the checkered flag. Well, we're talking about uh, the checkered flag in about 23 hours and 12 minutes time. In about uh, 12 minutes time, though, we are expecting to jump in with uh, Alex McMullen from Pure Storage. He, of course, is the CTO from uh, Pure Storage. And I believe he's jumped into Discord, so I'm going to just give Mike a heads up on that and Batis just to bring him in so when he's ready to go, we can bring him in for uh, his live interview as our headline sponsor of the 24-hour Kyle Army. Pure Storage, of course, uh, being involved with the uh, Solidarity E-Race literally from the word go as well. So great to have Alex here. He'll be joining us in about 12 minutes' time to have a chat about their involvement and why they've taken this as a, as a keynote uh, event for their company. Um, we'll be looking forward to seeing him uh, in, the, in a couple of weeks, well, actually seeing him and possibly chatting to him as well, more than seeing him as we watch race action. And the race action continues here. You're going to see a change up here between uh, Utiel and Ulifant. Ulifant about to lose some ground here, not only to the Porsche of Absmeyer, but now to the Bentley as we see some maneuvering and some changes in that top 10. 
I wonder if Oli Funt has got a bit of an issue there and maybe starting to feel it. He's got a bit of damage there. There's definitely some damage on that car and uh, possibly may need to go in for a bit of uh, damage control. Uh, not expected, I don't think, at this point in time for that car. But as I said, those sort of four, five, six, seven, and eight cars were all involved in evasive maneuvers to miss the spinning car that was up at Leocorp. I mean, you are right. You've picked up on that damage on that number 101 PWS SAR entry. And uh, of course, Leslie Oliphant piloting at the moment. But the back end looking like uh, maybe they've had a shunt from behind, perhaps, or uh, a spin coming into the uh, into one of the corners. But it uh, doesn't look too impacted all around. But from behind, certainly looks like there's been a heavy contact that's come down. Mm. Yeah, I have to agree, the back end of the car looks a little bit more damaged than the front. Uh, unfortunately, it's not like a, a real race car where you can visibly see the damage, um, usually a bit more than what you can see in a, in a sim world. But uh, certainly, maybe just uh, trickling around a little bit more daintily than what he would like to. And it'll be interesting to see whether or not he peels into the pit lane to do those necessary repairs, or is he going to try and make a plan to uh, try and survive out there. But you know, the survival rate, unfortunately, is now gonna cost him because he's got pressure now coming from Cruz in the Audi right on his tail. So it may be a better opportunity for him to dive into pit lane. He's gone in, there you go. He's gone in and those repairs will be done. So uh, that's, a, that's a good move in my, in, in my opinion. Yeah, just, uh, you know, maybe just too costly to stay out the entire time and uh, lose out on the time that they're losing with that damage to the car. So uh, making the call to come in and uh, make those repairs up towards the front. We still see that battle going down be be between the likes of Chisia and Krubler. Tobias Pfeffer for GTWR just really making work of that Audi. They've got a great gap now. Uh, we, we talked about it. We mentioned it. The Side Max number 96 being picked up from their stream entry. You can just see that uh, Killian Ryan Meenan struggling a little bit for pace, and that could be setup related. And then, of course, sitting in third place, the other uh, entry from Sidemax coming through, making their way up through the order. Then Toro sitting in fourth and doing a good job at it. Util doing a good job in that Bentley to be the front running uh, entry in that three, six, seven, just to find themselves in fifth place. Then we've got the uh, the number 11. Can I Audi jump in there quickly, George, before you second. carry on? Yeah. Just want to jump in. Uh, uh, the one fact you need to take into account there with the guys in fifth, and then if you go, we go down to seventh. Oh, eighth place, I should say, and then a bit further down to 11th place. Three drivers per those three teams I've just mentioned. So a little bit of a, a bit more difficult um, scenario to run with with those kind of guys when you've only got three drivers in your car as opposed to the four or five in the other teams. It's a big factor that will come into play over the next 24 hours. Yeah, that's true. You've uh, you've got to time your stints differently. You're going to have a lot more driving being done between a three-man team compared to a five-man team. But uh, also maybe a little bit less variability in those drivers. Uh, it's always hard to find uh, teammates that uh, sort of complement one another out on the circuits. And, you know, if you only have to find two others to, to suit a driving style, it means that your setup can be a lot more standardized. When you do have more entries into it, it means a lot more adaptive driving to, towards that setup or a lot more setup work to find something that is a balance between them all. So, yeah, you, you've got more driving to do in a three-man team, but uh, you also can have a, a, a much more uh, sort of uh, an easier setup process in preparation for the race, not having mm -hmm. to find teammates that are all on that same uh, same sort of level. Yeah, I think it'll be pretty interesting to look at the way that those teams have decided to run with each other. Um, you know, if, when you look at uh, the real racing world, you try and find drivers of a similar height, uh, a similar stature and a similar weight um, so that the, the ease of getting in and out of the car is so much better um, and of course not having to change seat positions and, and seat heights etc etc it might just be a cushion thrown in here or there that would uh, give the ability of one driver to change to the other and that's what we saw at uh, the Kyle Army 9 hour and at other events that I'm involved with on an endurance point of view with the South African endurance series as, as an example um, you have got guys though that uh, have got variances in terms of their height and weight where you've got guys over six foot and partnering up with guys that are sort of you know five foot makes a massive difference whereas here fortunately that's not a major factor but what is a major factor of course is their ability to run similar lap times on the car setup and i think that's possibly what we're going to see when the drivers start to change up we haven't had any driver changes just yet i don't think that i can see from the guys who started things out but when those driver changes happen are they going to be able to handle 
any of the damage that might be on the car, first of all. And if not, are they going to be able to handle the, the type of condition and terrain that's out there at the stage where they set up in terms of where they started the race and where they currently are when they take over from their, their first driver's stint? Oh, I mean, it's uh, it's all to play for. And although, like you said, there's no physical difficulty or differences between drivers that take effect in these cars, um, it's, it's an enduring and, and grueling process trying to get your team to the checkered flag. Uh, you know, race race endurance lengths can, can vary. You can enter yourself into a three hour, a five hour, a six hour, uh, you know, 12 hour event to take place. But a 24 is, is sort of the peak of uh, putting your team to the test and seeing where you actually uh, stack up against the other teams and drivers. So hey. it's just it's just amazing to see all these entries coming through and uh, sort of the, the driver skill variance is, is most apparent. You, you can see that there's uh, teams that are less experienced, slower drivers, but maybe more uh, clean and consistent. They're just uh, trying to keep themselves out of trouble and get to the line waiting for other people to make mistakes. And then you've got just powerhouse teams that do have those alien drivers in them as well. Yeah, I like the way you put that, the alien drivers, the guys that are not from this world. <laughs> we have the ability exactly. to stay out there for like six hours and do whatever they need to do. <laughs> exactly the exactly the way that it needs to be. Yeah, exactly, and that's 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 where some of these guys are going to have their uh, work cut out for them over the next uh, 23, and a half, uh, 23 hours and five minutes. Uh, about five minutes time, we are going to be joined by Alex McMullen. He's going to join us from Pure Storage for a little interview as to uh, why they've got involved with this event, and they're busy setting him up in the background as we speak. But uh, the pressure is still on you. Denks is applying that pressure onto the back end of Probler. Probler has not... Uh, buckled under that pressure just yet and actually what i was seeing here to be honest with you between the audi the aston martin and the ferrari is they're kind of working together here to try and close that gap, gap down on uh, gsa and cruise so uh, three cars going through uh, a slipstream and through the air a lot quicker than one car can um, what you tend to find is if you're stuck out on your own sometimes the mistakes start to happen there's not pressure on you so all of a sudden you ease up a little bit more than what you'd like to and all of a sudden that uh, concertina effect is uh, pretty huge and, and you get, you get uh, drawn in and reeled in a lot quicker than what you expected. You are not wrong. You are not wrong. There is just so much right now that drivers are sort of calculating and trying to, uh, trying to uh, put themselves through. Looking at Sean Mumford in the White Rabbit Gaming Academy 714. This is a, a team that I'm obviously a part of. I'm the team principal for White Rabbit Gaming made it very clear on my uh, social post that I was sad to see yeah, my yeah. boys <laughs> raping out in an Aston Martin, not a, not a Porsche. But um, you know what, Greg, um, I'm very proud of, of all the boys driving in this car. Um, they've, they've managed to just uh, got themselves into a place that, uh, you know, they've, they've improved. They, they came over from, like I said, the, uh, the shooter games. That's where they were competitive. And they've made the transition over into uh, sim racing and uh, I'm just proud that they, uh, they, they're taking it seriously. They've got themselves into a car that they're all comfortable driving and uh, finding themselves within the top 20 at this stage of the race is, is awesome for my White Rabbit gaming team. So if I, I do sound a bit biased, uh, that is because I am the team principal of the team, but um, it's, it's made it a little bit easier to not be biased because they didn't pick a Porsche. Yeah, I was going to say that. Hey, they're supposed to go out in a Porsche, but uh, we won't mention the fact that they've changed up to uh, another really awesome piece of machinery. Hey, Mike Jones, Aston Martin, it's pretty good. I just thought they'd run 007 as opposed to 714 on the slide. We um, we we uh, we see. Well, there you got the Audi back on track. Yeah, sorry to jump in there, Georgie. Richardson no, no. back on track. Looks like he's got it all sorted out, and uh, hopefully this time I'm going to stay on the black stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, they, they were causing a lot of chaos out there. So I think the, uh, the stewards maybe uh, didn't turn a blind eye, but looked at the, the causation and the effects there and uh, perhaps made a ruling on it that uh, they are allowed to continue racing. Again, this is why I'm a commentator and not a steward, because uh, for me, there was uh, grounds for a disqualification for that, that entry based on the way that uh, they were behaving on the circuit. Um, you know, rolling back across a racing line after you've had an, an off and uh, being in the way of traffic is just something not to be there. And then, uh, you know, it wasn't just once, but twice that they were almost parking on the apex after being damaged, limping back to the pits and uh, just not being predictable to, to me. I thought, uh, you know, those were things for a grounds for a disqualification. The steward team, they're responsible for making those cars. Uh, calls we are safe to walk back to our cars after we finish here i'm not going to be uh, i'm not going to be 
uh, in any danger of, of upsetting yeah, anybody. Yeah, they're going to get you in the you know? UK, man. <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, you know what? You can fly over. You can fly over. Come. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I'm not making those calls. That's what we've got the uh, the stewards to do. But uh, so far, the Pure Storage Kyle Army 24 hour in uh, sponsorship by NEC Data Sciences, Oxide, AMD, and Supermicro has just been great. I've, I've really enjoyed the racing so far. I think uh, these guys are all doing a good job. They certainly are. Hey, Klaassen's and uh, pushing hard there to try and get onto the back end of the Ferrari now. So Klaassen's looking to get into single digits if he can in the Audi, the 777 Audi. They're doing a super job so far for Klaassen's. And it looks like uh, he's pushing hard. But speaking of pure storage, uh, we've got Alex McMullen, who's already lined up for us uh, from Pure Storage. He's going to be joining us. And uh, we're going to have race action in the background while we chat to him, I'm sure. But uh, we're also going to get an opportunity to bring uh, Alex onto screen and have a quick chat with him find out uh, all about pure storage and uh, the reason that they've stuck with solidarity e-race and uh, the partnership that they've had so uh, looking forward to that as we uh, click over into one hour completed with 43 seconds still to go but, uh, it is definitely uh, awesome to have mr alex mcmullen uh, the cto of uh, pure storage coming to join us alex uh, i can i can see you in the box there and i'm going to ask mike if he wouldn't mind to uh, Bring, him up, bring us up on uh, onto screen if possible as well to have a quick chat with the man from Pure Storage, our headline sponsor. You can see him loading in the, uh, the sidelines there. Fantastic. So there we go. Alex McMullen's joining us uh, on the sideline, as you can see there. A massive thanks for joining us there, Alex. And uh, thank you so much for uh, the time that uh, we've got to spend with you. And uh, of course, the massive uh, support that you've given to the 24 Hours of Kyle Army. Um, from our side, it's uh, fantastic to keep the uh, pure storage uh, side of things going. It's been a long-standing relationship with Solidarity E-Race and a big welcome to you, sir. Looks like we've got a little bit of issues there with the mic on Alex's side. We're going to get a hold of him and uh, get that uh, mic all sorted out. But uh, just bringing in the fact that Pure Storage have been involved with almost every single one of the Solidarity E-Races right from the word go at the Kyle Army uh, race in the beginning of lockdown. It was fantastic to have them on board. Let's see if Al's got his uh, uh, mic sorted out. Alex, are you there? Go, go, go. Still not, it looks like, Greg. He's still not yeah. picking, uh, picking Alex up here. Let's see if we can get that all sorted out. But while we're waiting to pick up on Alex, we'll go to some, some live footage there of uh, what's happening out on track. But uh, the action continues here with uh, the, uh, the, the Kyle Army 24 hours. We've gone into the first hour completed, George. And uh, things I was going to say are going to start settling down with an hour to go. But actually, with an hour, an hour gone, they've started to pick up and there's been a bit of action on track. There has been there has been a lot of uh, action on track, and uh, for some teams it will be uh, a bit of a sad story, a sad state of, of the way that the race has gone. For other teams, they've had a monumental start. They've managed to get themselves into a good running order. Uh, if you want, Greg, I can uh, I can quickly go and try and sort out uh, Alex's uh, mic side. Oh, I think that'll be a great idea box. if you can, George. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll leave go. you to it and keep, I'll stick with uh, the action on track. When you're ready to go, just uh, whisper in my ear that we're good to go. Sweet. Fifth is still leading out. I'll come back and try and sort it out for you. Fantastic, buddy. Thank you so much. Ryan Meenan in third. And then, of course, you've got Util and Absmeyer, the top five. We've got uh, three Audis, Bentley, and a Porsche making up those top five. And then uh, behind them, Cruz, Chisia, Denks, and George's, Jose George's in the Ferrari. Great classes with another Audi in the top. Uh, Fazikas and Kibo. Jose Jorge. Sorry, Jose Jorge. Thank you for that, Mike. It's the, uh, it's the South African trying to pronounce a Mexican surname. You know what I'm saying? But the American jumps in, it just gives it straight to me. I love that word. Parsons, I want you to try and pronounce that one for me. <laughs> They're in 10th place. Yeah, Fazika's there in 11th and ahead of Keeble and a good run there from them. Uh, Heron and uh, Ryan Ottens, Ottens, Ottens in 14th place. It's of course a man who spent uh, a little time on two wheels at Car Army as opposed to uh, in an e-race and sim racing world and one of SA's finest superbike riders involved in the Car 14. We're going to be watching him heading down towards Sunset Corner and uh, pushing his uh, little Aston Martin to the limit there too. On board with uh, Mr. Ottens, Ottens, Ottens. I don't know if that cockpit is big enough for Ryan Ottens though. We'll have to wait and see. Looks like he's uh, controlling things quite nicely at the moment ahead of Buck and Radloff, Chris Radloff, all the way from East London here in South Africa on the East Coast. He's in 16th place. 
Deer in 17th and a good run there so far from Mumford in the uh, White Rabbit Gaming Academy car. Uh, Miller is in 19th and Burta in 20th place. That's our top 20 as it stands. And nice to see Miller in the BMW to the top 20. So we didn't expect to see that BMW uh, uh, at the front end of the field, but you never know. By the end of 24 hours, very good possibility that uh, we're going to see that BMW in the front as well. Looks like we might be able to get back to Alex McMullen now from Pure Story. Just have a quick jump across and see if we were able to pick up with him. And hopefully George has got him back up on screen to have a quick chat. Thank you for that, George, if you have. Just waiting for his uh, team to pick up. And as soon as I see him, I'll, we'll go across. Mike will take us straight across to that. But He's not going to be on camera, but we will hear him in the background and get an opportunity to have a chat to the man from Pure Storage and find out exactly what it's all about from Pure Storage's point of view and uh, how they've gone about uh, their their uh, partnership here with us at the Solidarity E-Race. Now with Raceface, powered by Raceface, of course, uh, and of course the headline sponsors, a global CTO there, Mr. Alex McMullen. I think I'm back now, Greg. Good afternoon. Here he is. Here is there. How are you doing, Al? Um, big welcome to you here in South Africa. Um, where are you coming to us from, by the way? Coming to you from the very sunny and very dry United Kingdom today. So looking forward to a good conversation. Oh, brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. So I mean, just down the road from uh, GMAX. So it looks like George could have actually gone there and sorted you out in person, never mind via the, uh, the stream that we we're on. Yeah, he just popped around my house and plugged in a cable and we're all magically back again. Oh, yeah, that, that, was exactly, that was exactly what we did. I'm, I'm pretty quick. I, I did a quick jog. Uh, I'm, I'm suitably impressed, Mr. G. Max Smith. I'm suitably impressed. Leaders are into the pit lane just while we're chatting to Alex. So I'll, um, during the interview, of course, if any action does happen, we may just jump to the action and come back to you. But uh, Alex, uh, a massive thank you to you and to the entire Pure Storage team. Um, the association and partnership here with Solidarity E-Race seems to be uh, just being extended slightly now with the headline sponsorship of this event. So we're very proud to be back again. It was a very successful event last year. We talked then about some of the benefits, of course, in terms of pure being a technology company, but also you know, supporting small business in South Africa. And of course, now you're going much more widely into Europe. It's a great way for us to talk to those esports folks that we love and all know as well, of course. So, yeah, looking forward to it. I think uh, from our side of things, you know, the, the association that we've had with the company here in South Africa and with the international side of things has been a big one. Um, and, and, and if you look at the, the sort of hit rate that we've had and the return on investment for the, uh, the, the amount of money being spent by the sponsors involved, it looks like uh, the, the, the format that we've got here is certainly working. Yes, it is. I mean, Pure is a technology company, of course. We've had that long relationship with the Mercedes F1 team, and that's what's helped us see the, you know, the real benefits of technology and motorsport. We've been working with them since 2014. We've been racing with them since 2015. And you know, that's helped us develop our product and we hope it's made their engineers a little bit more productive every day and it's made their cars a little faster every day. And we'll get into some of the stories about that as we talk through the hour. Yeah, I'm loving, I'm loving the fact that you've got those kind of stories to throw in. And of course, watching those kind of stories unfold on track as we see our leaders coming in for a pit stop there as well. Pfeffer bringing the Audi in. There's the BMW I was mentioning a bit earlier on. The lone BMW out there at this point in time with Miller behind the wheel. You see, of course, uh, second place, Ryan Meenan in the pit, pit box as well now getting a quick chat and uh, a possibility of uh, a pit, bits, bits and pieces being changed up on that car from pure's point of view um the involvement with mercedes-benz and of course that f1 team um how does that how does that help the the, the company in terms of um, developing product and developing product that can be used by me as an end user so the you know the great story about formula one is that it's a trickle down technology and everybody will tell you about fuel injection and anti-lock braking and power steering all those kind of things were developed for the sport originally which then made it into our road cars later but it's much more sophisticated than that now and we're also seeing again something we'll talk about later is the rise of you know the formula e and battery powered racing that's fairly controversial for us that you know we love our v8s and v10s but it's certainly a, a bigger part of this sport now is sustainability and how we're making it more environmentally friendly. So another great topic for us, Greg. Yeah, I, I actually, I love the fact that there, there is a, a big resurgence, or not a resurgence, a big uh, turnaround in terms of the, the thinking of, of motorsport in general worldwide. Um, having been involved with a couple of the Formula One races here at Kyle Army, myself as a commentator, having seen the development in, in terms of Formula E, as well as the, uh, the E bikes that are racing, not only at MotoGP, but also at the Isle of Man, um, there's definitely massive technolo 
technological uh, maneuvers and, and advancements happening in that world. And of course, with a techni technical company like yours, you must be pretty excited. Although, as a petrol head, I always love to hear the, the you know the rattle and scream of a V8 or V12 or possibly a thousand cc in full flight. But uh, there's definitely uh, big changes on the horizon. It may not be over the next sort of you know five or ten years, but um, there is certainly some some big changes expected in the world of motorsport. And of course, that will always um, come from the likes of uh, companies like yourselves. Yes, it will. I mean. Pure as a company, we make a data storage and retrieval platform that's based on very high performance flash drives. And what that really does is it helps Mercedes engineers in a number of different ways. They take our technology to the racetrack as well as having it back in the factory. And that's quite a, a big logistical challenge for them, obviously, because all those pieces of technology go in a crate, just like the cars do, they fly around the world. They go to all these strange places. Some of them are high up like Mexico at 7,000 feet. Some of them Singapore, incredibly humid. It has to work, has to be reliable. But what that really means is it allows the engineers to look at how to make the car better on an hourly, even by minute basis. It's not just the guy behind the wheel that makes the difference, it's the engineers that give them the great platform to go racing with. You know, simulation's a big part of that. We talk a lot about digital twins. It's a big hot topic this year as well, of course. But you know, the rise of simulation is really one of the huge advantages that's come from more Formula One, but also has now made its way into our daily life. Everything from social media, through the way we use our telephones and even you know down to the very basics of how we're farming how we drive our trucks how we drive our tractors those are all things that are benefiting from that again that same trickle down simulation technology grid so it's fascinating and it certainly is yeah i'm about to jump in there to say that uh, we've got to change up between the two teammates there the 97 car now being piloted by crazer has now moved up ahead of ryan mean so a little change up there between the two audis from uh, sidebox a little change up in that pit stop strategy, which has helped them out. Simeone has taken over the, the lead there, so we'll keep an eye on that as we as we chat to uh, our global CTO, Alex McMullen from Pure Storage. Um, I love the fact that you brought in tractors, um, and I'm sure with uh, Mike Jones in my ear here, he'll probably uh, attest to this uh, living in the States. And we've got it here in South Africa as well. The technology that is behind uh, a current form of tractor, in other words, uh, your John Deere or your Case or your Ford or whatever it is, and the ability to sort of climb in as, as a pilot, you're not even a driver anymore, push the computer on and hit go. And there is a pre-programmed scenario for that tractor to go out and do the duty it has to do on these massive farms in South Africa and in the States. Yeah, it is. And if you think about it, it's all being driven by GPS, which is only, well, the non-military version is good for you know, 10 meter resolution. But what you find in some of the big farms is that the farmers actually invest in their own GPS station so the tractor knows to the millimeter where it is on each field, not a 10, mil 10 meters either way. So that, as you say, gives it that best way of driving, plowing, rotivating, tilling, and harvesting as well. So I don't anticipate that farmers will be sitting with their feet up on the wheel, sipping their coffees, watching the world go by, but it helps them to be more and more efficient. You know, as we come under more pressure for resources and water and things like that, it's an increasingly important part of the technology story. So yeah, as you say, everybody doesn't have a John Deere, they're a very expensive piece of equipment. So everybody wants to leverage that the most effective way they can. And again, simulation technology, making that all easier. Unbelievable to think that that's how it's come. And the technology that's involved in a, in a Formula One race could be translated into something that would be running on the side of a, of a massive farm that of course is supplying food to uh, you know huge amounts of people that are, that are relying on that kind of technology to, to get the job done. Um, from Pure's point of view, that's, that's exactly how you would sort of uh, progress from the you know the racetracks of the world into the real world and and we love the fact that that's that's how it's how, how it's going i mean it's just it's it's a mind-boggling concept but of course um the the amount of time and effort that gets put in from your team to get all that right must be uh pretty daunting it is but it's one of the things that keeps us you know at the forefront of technology as we are we love working with our customers because Many of them are you know, researchers, scientists, engineers, people trying to solve really hard problems. And some of that rubs off on us. But also, one of the things we talked about last year is that some of our customers in the aerospace or the space industry have very common tool sets, software, hardware that can be used in other things as well. So, you know, the same materials in a Formula One car are those that are on a space rocket, for example. So that always plays across really nicely. And what that means is we all get better together. And that's what's a really big outcome. If you work with the Mercedes team, for example, for any length of time, you, one of the first things you appreciate is just how good a team they are. If you put aside the technology and the smarts, 
they all work together so well. It's, it's ballet, it's so beautifully orchestrated and managed. Nothing is left to chance. They're pretty relentless in their search for improvement in everything, from sleep patterns to diet, to the weight of the socks the drivers wear. I'm not even kidding on that. Nothing Crazy, is ever eh? left to chance. It's fantastic. Speaking of crazy and speaking of fantastic, a little bit of action on track there as well, which I'm sure Mike is going to give us. Uh, Leslie Oliphant having a little bit of a battle on here with uh, Steel Vassen. The two of them going at it, but actually a car spinning out just in front of them as well as they came up on one of the back markers. Another back marker about to be caught past there as well as they go through. No issues at all for them to get through on that one. But coming into the Ingwe corner, there was definitely some action. And I'll uh, look to see if Mike can pick up on that uh, replay if he can. If there's a no problem, no problem. We, we were having a look to see if we got one. We didn't get one that time out, but there was definitely big action, which has changed up the position here between the Aston Martin and the Porsche. So Olifant now dropping down into lucky number 13. Back to you, Alex. In terms of uh, that technology, were you guys involved in the uh, the uh, broadcast uh, and the live stream broadcast of Coldplay coming from, the, from, from, from space? This is the guy I think who spun out uh, just in that incident, if I'm not mistaken. So it looks like uh, Franco Joubert with some problems there on the 29 car. Going to have to come in there. The Flying Gypsies machine. Uh, Going to just cut across, hopefully just in front of the Bentley and not affect the Bentley's run. But he's definitely out to peel into pit lane to get that sorted out. As he missed the pit box, I think he has. He's actually missed the opportunity to go into pit lane there. So you'll have to just circulate and try and stay out of harm's way. That's not an easy thing to do at this point in time because uh, you've got a... Uh, four and a half k's of track to negotiate try and stay out of harm's way and not get involved in any of the accidents or incidents that may be out there as well so going back to my, my, my previous comment there as we're watching uh, uh, martin rautenbach diving through and looking for a chance now as well uh, to change his uh, position up ever so slightly um the comment was that uh, we're speaking of space and the technology that's been used in space was that uh, part of the uh, pure storage event uh, getting uh, coldplay to uh, to uh, broadcast directly from space so one of the nice things and one of the frustrations for us at Pure is that most of our customers are very shy and they don't want us to talk about it in public. I think it's a very safe bet to assume that Chris was singing some of it on its way from space to your ears passed through Pure technology. As it's happening it. today, watching the live streaming, you can be very sure that some of this is passing through Pure tech as well in exactly the same way. Right? Oh, we love it. That's 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 the reason why we've got you involved and why we, we love having you as our, our headline sponsor, Alex. Um, from your side of things, uh, just uh, a, a final word, because uh, we do have a race action and, of course, a couple of other interviews that have been set up in the background as well. Um, your involvement here, uh, you're happy with the, the, the platform we've given you and, and what we're giving you in terms of the action on track? Yes, I was just watching the, you know, the damaged car touring back there. But yes, the, you know, for us, the message here is very clear. You know, Pure is a technology company. We love working with people trying to solve hard problems, people who are pushing out. But one of the things we haven't really talked about yet is, you know, is STEM. And I guess my closing message here is, you know, the world's changing very quickly. We need more scientists, engineers, technologists. So, you know, if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you want to get involved in STEM, those are the sort of people that we need. Come help us fix the big problems, be part of the tech world. In 10 years time, the world's going to be so incredibly different. So come help us fix that. Pure is here to help innovators. You know, we want to be successful. Uh, it's one of the many joys that gets me out of bed every morning. So please come, please be a scientist. That's my big message here, Greg. And that's what Pure is here to bring that home, not just to esports, but to all sports. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. And I'm actually going to send you my son's CV because he's uh, looking seriously at going down this line. So I'm going to throw in a punt there for uh, Deegan Maloney and possibly joining the Pure Storage team at some point in his career. But uh, once again, Alex, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for spending a bit of time with us here during the race as well and uh, enjoying what has been an incredible start to this one with uh, 22, 22 hours and 42 minutes of racing still to go. And uh, from our side, please pass on all our massive thanks to the entire Pure Storage team. Will do, Greg. Thanks a ton. Take care. See all you guys the very soon. Best, man. Thank you, Alex. Alex McMullen there, the CTO, global CTO of Pure Storage, joining us as part of our commentary team for a quick interview there. And uh, you can see the insight that comes from Pure Storage's point of view with their involvement at the, the highest level of real racing, not only in the real world, but of course here now in the sim racing world as well as we uh, step things up here from... No problem. It looks like I'm going to be joined uh, by my uh, producer in my ear. It's uh, Mike Jones. He's joining me in the, in the commentary booth now as well as uh, producing. So doing dual duties there. 
as uh, most of us have to do as a commentator, don't we, Mike? Uh, we absolutely do, Greg. And uh, unfortunately, GMAX had to step out for just a few minutes dealing with some administrative issues. Uh, I'll be obviously in the box uh, through the night stint with Mr. Jesse Lee and Nick Setnick uh, doing broadcasting and commentary at the same time as well. So I figured GMAX was out, uh, didn't want to leave you stranded all alone. Uh, for the moment. However, what I was noticing while you were talking with, uh, of course, Mr. Uh, Mr. Alex over at Pure Storage, the 96 Audi, even though he was back a few seconds, Greg, after they came out of the pit lane, is all over the back of his teammate. Killian Ryan Meenan wants that P2 back and tries to, he basically, he needs to get up to Sim Simonini at this point because Simonini has dusted the rest of this field at this point and Killian Ryan Meenan's got to kick it into gear. They certainly have. I was actually watching that as well and seeing the progress of the 9.6 on the 9.7 there. So big moves there from Ryan Meenan to catch up on the back end of Crazy. And Crazy, I think, could be in a bit of trouble. Do you think when they went into the pit box, they may have changed the settings? Because uh, you would have heard in the commentary between G and I um, stating that there was a, a, a bit of a setup issue that they were battling with there on the first car, of course, the, the 96 car of that team. And uh, would they have had an opportunity to change that setup slightly? to increase their ability to use the tires better because they were saying the tire wear despite the surface being so good was starting to be a big factor for them so uh unfortunately not here within this particular simulation as we're watching util and grobler fight back and forth side by side coming into uh, out of leacock sorted it out before they got out onto the straight getting into mine shaft and through the crocodiles uh, the Bentley falling back behind the Audi briefly, but no, Greg, to answer your question, you cannot make any setup changes once you are out on the track. The only thing you can adjust are your electronics, your brake bias, your traction control, as well as your um, uh, anti-lock brake uh, and the tire pressures. That is it. So there's no, you can't adjust the toe, the camber, the wing, the roll bars. Nothing yeah. like that can be done. So they will not be able to change anything. If they're struggling with setup issues early, that 96 side max team is going to have to settle with that for the remainder of the race, unfortunately. But uh, they seem to be doing pretty well. Again, they came out of the pits. Maybe it was a tire pressure issue. Maybe they can catch up to the 97. Maybe Simonini might have a bit of a problem in that 157, and they'll make up that gap. Yeah, the factor, of course, is... Um what we, we've spoken about with G earlier on is is the, the real racing world and the sim racing world are identical when we talk about this particular format that we're using ACC um, and and tire wear is a big factor what tires have they got to play with oh speaking of playing with oh that's a little bit out of shape there yeah the 42 a little bit car. of a push there from UTL uh, getting up to the 42 car have a look at that coming up you know Romain just coming up on the back end of a of a slower car trying to use that slower car to his advantage to get through possibly on the two Audis but then slower car doing the right thing that's exactly what a, a back yep. marker should do hold your line uh, don't change position it's up to the quicker driver to find a way through and unfortunately there was a tag there from Utiel so I wonder if he might be called in for that and uh, a little uh, warning given to him from the stewards because the the driver that he tagged the 42 car unfortunately uh, ended up worse for wear yeah, of course, the stewards will look at that. In the end, you know, like you said, that is he did the right thing, right? He was on the outside line. He held it. He took to the outside. He was trying to let the guys by. In the end, the Bentley wanted to take advantage. The UTL in that 367 Bentley Continental is just not able to get it done at that time. Breaks as late as he was trying to to get past the Audi in front. That mistake's going to happen. Probably going to cost him a bit of a penalty here in a little bit once the stewards start handing their decisions down. We're now almost an hour and a half into this race at this point and the stewards have uh, got a bit of a backlog of penalties. They will be issuing those, though, throughout the race. We do have that live shooting team in place, as we've spoken about. But for the moment, the 367 back out on track, chasing down the two Audis in front. you got Classens and Grobler out ahead. And, of course, up at the front, I was just noticing the 96 has indeed slid past. I think I have a bit of a replay of it. I'm going to try and catch it here. Right. Uh, this was just after, there, just yeah. after the overtake, just unfortunately. But, again, Killian yeah, Ryan Mina right. gets out in front. Uh, I wonder if they're going to start working together now. There's a good possibility there'll be communication between those two teams, I'm sure, for the team principal saying, listen, okay, guys, let, let Ryan Ke let Killian through. Let him go because you seem to be holding him up. His lap time seems mm -hmm. to be a little bit better, uh, despite the issues they were having earlier on. And if they've gone in with that tire change, possibly the, the fresh rubber is going to help him out a little bit as well as he gets into the thick of it now and tries to close that gap down on Simeone. He's had a phenomenal run in that Audi at the front end. 17 seconds up the road. That's a big margin at this point in time. And if it could, continues to grow um, in the way that a 24-hour race and an endurance race can, 
with the ability to get through traffic, um, there's a very good possibility that that could grow unless Ryan Meenan or Crazer start to put the pressure onto him. Yeah, and you know, so here's the thing, right? Uh, RCI obviously hosted our 24 Hours of Kyalami semi recently for our World Tour Championship that we were doing. And of course, the Sidemax 96 took that victory during that race, as well as having that victory at the Real Race Club uh, 24 Hours of Kyalami late last year. So the 96 team has plenty of experience making it through these long endurance races. They were not, they were not, I'm going to repeat that again, at the front of the field the entire race. The 157 GTWR team was actually ahead of them in our race for quite a while. Different cars, granted. The GTWR team's running the Lamborghini in our World Tour Endurance Championship, but at the end of the race, that 96 Sidemax team really brought it home. Granted, it rained a lot during that race, and they were really strong in the rain, that Sidemax team was. So the question is, can they do? It's looking dry so far. 27 out on the ambient, 34 out on the track as we're approaching 1.30 p.m. It's moderate clouds in the air, as we can tell. It's definitely pretty cloudy, but no sign of rain so far, hour and a half into this race. And as you said, Simonini has checked out. GTWR is known to be a very consistent team, and their fastest driver hasn't even got in there. And that's saying something, because Simonini is about as fast as it gets. But Jordan Sherat is about as quick as you can get, and he still hasn't even gotten the car yet. A little bit of a dive here, maybe going into Leo Cop, but not quite. Util backs out at the last second, but he is, <laughs> Greg, he is, he's done with this 100 being in front of him. He's He wants to, yeah, see, he wants to see an Audi in his mirror. The pressure's on there, and I think uh, we spoke about it earlier on as well between myself and G, saying, you know, sometimes what will happen is that uh, pressure starts to mount up too much. You'll let the driver through and then apply the pressure yourself and return the favor to see if you can make a mistake. It's not a bad strategy to have to try and ensure that you stay at the front end, but of course, uh, you don't want to lose ground. Now, I just mentioned the fact that 96 and 97 could be working together. It looks exactly like that's the case. They're going to try and push each other here to try and close that gap down. It's uh, 17.6 seconds. It's gone up by 0.3 of a second. So 0.3 of a second over the next hour could possibly get them into uh, mm-hmm. you know, a 30 or 40 second lead. That's going to be a hard one to catch. There's a lot of time still to go though. So we don't need, no one needs to panic and they don't need to get into any panic stations just yet. But, uh, certainly, I think uh, maneuvering that car into second and uh, giving the opportunity for the 96 car in that team to move up ahead was probably a good call there from the team principal's point of view. Moving back a little bit there, uh, you can see uh, Jose George is yeah, having a phenomenal run in the Ferrari. I've got to say, hats off to the man who's flying one of my favorite cars, of course, in the, in the Ferris point of view, um, and, the, and the, the lead Ferrari at this point as well. But uh, I'm not holding any thumbs for a for Ferrari victory. <laughs> But uh, if it so, does no. happen, I am going to take all the accolades for calling it, okay? <laughs> with, a, with an you, you hour and a half gone. <laughs> I'm going to take all the accolades if that happens, all right? You, you, and then you, George, you got it. Emacs Smith is going to be concerned. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he will definitely be concerned because he wants to see a Porsche, of course, up at the top. But if we're looking yeah. through right now, here's our lead Porsche at the moment. His uh, One of his old drivers, uh, Jason Asmeyer, drives a Toro at this time in P5. Not doing too bad, granted. But, you know, if you look at the top 10, uh, what are we counting there? Eight Audis, seven Audis in the top 10? You know, the Audi uh, seems to be dominating here at Kailami, which, if I'm not mistaken, you've probably been out um, – on, on well, at, at least once, obviously. You've been out multiple times out to the Kailami circuit, out for the nine hour. These GT3 cars, these Audis, seem to do really well here in the real series as well in the Intercontinental GT Challenge. You know, the Audi is just so strong here at Kailami. It's hard to beat. It was very hard to beat. Of course, Porsches have taken the victory in both of the nine hours on the return of the nine hour back to Kailami with the Intercontinental GT Championship. But, in fact, last year, if we, if we look at the one that happened, uh, the previous the previous version, the very first nine hour we had here, torrential uh, downpours from about four o'clock in the afternoon that literally went all the way through until the end of the race at 11 o'clock at night, um, caused some massive issues for a lot of teams. And uh, as I said, even for the AMG Mercedes-Benz team, who uh, were leading the championship coming into that round and broke literally where we're coming through right now, had to pull to the left-hand side and out of harm's way at the end of the basically where that truck is parked on the right-hand side of your screen mm-hmm. right now, saw their championship fall to pieces with a lap into the race. Absolutely, you know, mind-blowing with, the, with that championship and what they expected to happen with the Porsches then taking the victory. But Audi and Porsche certainly have been the cars to beat in the real world here in terms of Intercontinental GT Championship. So, yeah, that's definitely what we're going to be expecting to be at the front end. But take nothing away. They've got some very seasoned campaigners in some Bentleys out there. A couple of Astons that could throw in a, a, a little bit of a Vixen. Hey, 
let's uh, throw one out there for the Mexicans in the Ferrari as well, okay? Yeah, exactly. I mean, Daniel Jose Jorge, a very strong driver inside of RCI. He drives in our split one of our Friday championship, which we had round one of yesterday. It was fantastic. Uh, he likes that Ferrari. He's very consistent in it. He's very quick. Uh, unfortunately, even though the Ferrari doesn't have that fantastic bump as much as, say, the Audi or even the Porsche here at Kailami, he's still going to push it to the best of his ability to get up there. Obviously, he had some earlier issues that dropped him back to that P20 as he was up near these guys right here that we've been watching, monitoring this battle for quite a while. Jose Jorge was kind of fighting for this a little bit earlier. They've had some issues since the pit stops. They've dropped back a little bit. 22 and a half hours ago, you've got plenty of time to make that up. We've been watching Util even on the last lap there he again the 100 little bit of the dirt there on the right as he came out of i believe it was uh i believe it was coming into the s's on the last lap and util he looked wasn't able to get it done again but he's just keeping that pressure on keeping it known that 100 filling up his mirror with that big massive bentley and if there's a bad mistake that happens he's going to get past him and put the pressure again on Classens in the 777. And I'm curious to see, uh, Greg, if either of these guys get out ahead of that 777, can they take off? Because he seems to be maybe holding them up a little bit. But here it is right here. He's going to go for the outside again as there's just a little bit of slowness coming out of Sunset, but he's not able to, again, get that nose underneath him uh, before they come into the corner. He's going to have to cycle back one more time as they come through the S's. Lap 52, by the way, that we're on. Doesn't seem like it's been that long. Yeah, 52 laps around Kyle Army. I can tell you, you'll start to feel it in the real world. But uh, here in the sim world, you're going to start to feel it in terms of uh, how, how your uh, lower extremities are feeling in the seat of your rig. If you're sitting in a rig, if you're sitting at the desk, how it's starting to feel. Are those toe cramps coming in that uh, George G. Max Smith was talking about <laughs> in some of his tweets earlier on in the day? Uh, they're all going to start to feel it. Of course, with some driver's changes that have already happened, um, it's all... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of maneuver. I was just watching there for Absmeyer. Coming under a little bit of pressure there with some back markers, and fortunately, uh, getting through on those back markers. Also, just picking up on uh, some of the uh, the comments flying back and forth. Uh, we've got, uh, of course, Francois Remy Monnier joining us from NEC soon. We've got uh, Gerald Almon coming from Data Sciences. They're getting set up in the background, I'm sure, by our uh, our team in the background to get them up for the next couple of interviews. Francois Remy Monnier has actually just sent me a message saying, you know, how awesome it is, and uh, thanks so much for uh, everything that's happened so far. He wants to know what room he's going to join, so I'll send him a message now. But then uh, I just got a message from Daniel Texera as well here from Pure Story South Africa saying, um, Alex McMullen was loving life so much he'd like to come back and join us for a bit more commentary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's how much fun he was having on our stream. And that's brilliant because if we keep a sponsor happy like that, that he wants to stay on and be part of the team. Well, then we've done our job right, haven't so, we? So 24 hours of what? Uh, Silverstone next next week, George? Or Greg? Oh, why not? Uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. it you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good hey, to go, man. Yeah, we, go. We, we, we might as well, man. I mean, sitting here, I mean, this is this is, this is is what we love to do. You know, I mean, this is this is something that, uh, you know, we, we um, obviously we have the sponsors here for this, and that's fantastic. But, you know, a lot of us uh, in commentary, you know, we do this just for the fun. You know what I mean? Like, we enjoy the commentary. We enjoy the racing, you know, and we want to do this. And, you know, a lot of the times, of course, you know, hey, getting paid for it. I'm not going to complain, right? But in the end, I'll still come out here and calm some races every once in a while for fun. Like, let's go. You know, it's it's a blast to come out here and do this. And 20, 24 hours of racing is is nothing, nothing to shout home about, whether you are racing in it or – uh, or you know, out here commentating it as well as you, as you mentioned earlier, because we were talking about a pre-stream. Uh, after this, our three of our commentators from RCI that are here are racing in the six hours of Bathurst with another community. So we've got a very short break out into there. So you know, we're doing the best of both worlds this weekend. We're racing and commentating and broadcasting and a little bit of everything. Exactly. And then, uh, you know, yeah, in South Africa, we've got to throw in a little, a little mix for the guys that are driving from our South African point of view. All of them got to wake up tomorrow morning and still wish their moms happy Mother's Day as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't don't forget that because uh, you might be in the middle of a race, That's buddy, but you ain't going to be That's much later. <laughs> yeah, you ain't going to be in a race much longer <laughs> if you don't wish mom a happy Mother's Day before you, uh, you know, before you jump back in the rig, right? Like, you send that text exactly. message, make that phone call, whatever you need to do, and, uh, you know, mo otherwise mom's going to be banging down the door on plugging your internet you know <laughs> that's that's the one i was about to say can you imagine the message doesn't come through happy mother's day next thing there's a whatsapp going through from uh, jason abs mom <laughs> is the wi-fi down is yeah. the wi-fi down mom exactly <laughs> it's the only time you see jason abs come through to the lounge 
that our oh, Wi-Fi is down. What's the problem with the fiber? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, look, he's in the thick of it right now. He's having a little bit of a fight, but there is a big fight on. This is brilliant to see, actually. Yeah, two cars. Oh, oh the Audi in the background. The... There goes Vasquez around. We're going to catch a bit of a replay of that. <laughs> what happened? We're going to find out. Milt Steel Vasten fighting the triple six. They're coming uh, up to the S's here. They catch a little bit of the dirt and the curb on the way out. Let's see what happened. We get Milt Steel Vasten in the background. The triple six again catches just a little bit wide and Vassin pushes him around into the S's, tags the wall. That's going to be a hard tag. He's going to have to come into the pit lane to get that thing repaired, if I'm not mistaken. Vassin does stop, lets him back pass, realizes that he gets that tap on him and makes sure that you know the triple six can't get out, but that is going to be unfortunate. That's going to put quite a bit of look at that thing. The front end of that and the rear end of that's pretty damaged. He's not coming to the pits, though. Not yet. He's deciding he wants to try it and see how this is going to work. But yeah, that's just this close racing that we've seen this entire exactly. race. And a little bit of tap, man, here at Kyalami. You can really throw you off circuit, especially in the S's. Such a dangerous section to go off track there. Sort of the S is definitely a big problem. We've seen some massive crashes there in the past in the real world of racing, I can tell you. Um, and there's been some big ones down at Crowthorn, of course. We actually saw a Ferrari at one of the uh, Festival of Motoring Days and a, and a Lamborghini end up in the in the wall just on the exit of that turn coming down there. And that's the fastest uh -oh, part of the uh -oh. circuit, remember. Oh, and there's still some tagging going on here. It's not over yet. <laughs> still got some big maneuvers as Utio looks on the inside. Oh, it's going to get real close here. Trying to find a way through there, but it's on here between Krubler, Utio, and Glasson's just ahead, staying out of harm's way oh, for now. Oh, where was that? What was that maneuver? Too I think he caught the, the grass. Not going to make Clubhouse Corner ever. Yeah, across he, and then straight across. Uh, yeah, Util and and Oliphant there, or Gra yeah, Oliphant rather, um, behind in the Porsche, uh, I, right there in the background was trying to catch up, but unfortunately, Grobler and Util getting side by side, trying to get the Lexus. You know, which way the Lexus do you go? Left, right, left, right, left, right, and the Lexus just had nowhere to go. Caught the curb, caught the grass, throws himself off the track, and that's gonna. You know, luckily, I don't think cause any damage to the Lexus. It did, however, cost UTL about a second off the back of Grobler. And by the way, look at uh, Klausitz. He's now a second ahead as well. He's gapped it a little bit with all this fighting going on behind him. He's loving it. He's looking at that mirror going, yes, keep fighting, boys. I'm loving this. Give me some breathing room. Give me a little Ferrari between us as well. A little bit of uh, breathing room and uh, another competitor between myself and you. Okay, not for much longer, but uh, certainly the Ferrari was in the mix there for a while. Just to give a little bit of extra space there for... Uh the uh, Glassens car to get through and away and out of harm's way. They managed to get through there and uh, sort things out, but it, it took a while. It was not the ideal scenario to be in. Up with Jason Absmeyer as he starts to close in. Looks like he's got a bit of a, a bit more pressure onto the back end of Cruz now, and I think Cruz could be in a little bit more of a, a little bit more trouble here from the Porsche as they come through into Sunset Corner and uh, look to find a way through. Yeah, he's going to look for it, you know, Jason Asmeyer in this Toro 696. He's been all over the back of this number 11 Audi R8, piloted currently by Cruz for quite a while, has not been able to try and get past him yet. I think at this point, he's, I think they're about as matched on pace as they're going to be, and I don't think this Porsche is true. Ooh, yeah, a little late on the brakes there. The back marker Ooh. slowing them up just slightly, I think, and that really threw Jason offline there. Good job by him, though, to release the brakes, realize he needed to cut over to the right. That back marker slowing him down just a bit. You know, and that's the that's kind of the downside to having this this. You know, even though on the left side of the screen there on the on the stack you're seeing uh, every dress or every driver classified as silver. All these drivers are reasonably different pace. We've got our aliens, we've got our pros, we've got our silvers, and even a couple of ams up in the race. So you know, some of these guys aren't normal pace as to you know comparatively to Mr. Asmeyer or Samini or Ryan Meenan or any of these guys that are quite as alien like. Exactly. They break a little bit earlier. They they don't take the ideal line as consistent. You know, uh, whenever I get out on track, that is exactly who I am. You know, I'm the one who's breaking a little earlier, running about a second, <laughs> se 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 second under. You know, what are you going to do? You know, you just try your best to make sure you get out of the way and hope that the, uh, you know, hope that the guys behind can keep it clean. And Jason doing a fantastic job at that. But, yeah, I think, I think at this point, I don't think he's too worried about getting past Cruz. He'll take the opportunity, of course. It's a racing driver. You see a car ahead of you, it don't matter who it is you want past, right? But I think he's reasonably happy with his position uh, at the moment. 22 and a half hours left. He's got time. Just keep it steady. Don't burn your tires off. And, you know, keep that fuel as long as you can. Obviously, with the stint timer in place, you do, you know, you want to try and run up against that as much as possible. Uh, so, you know, you want to make sure you do that. Uh, speaking of which, there is what looks to be another accident coming into T2. The number seven.
70 car off. Uh, I'm trying mm. to catch that on the replay board, Greg. Uh, let's see if we can find that. Brolin, you, you try and pick that up, and I'll watch the action here between Absmeyer heading up towards uh, Leo Kopp, trying to find a way through there on Cruz. Cruz is keeping him at bay for now. And uh, with the traffic that they're having to deal with, and of course it is traffic that is now going to be uh, consistently in your way all race long. And there's going to be hardly any time or opportunity for you to get a clear lap in where you're not going to have anybody to negotiate or try and find a way through on. So it's kind of going to be uh, the set way of handling things for the next uh, 22 hours and 21 minutes of race action. We, we're looking to close in, of course, in about uh, nine minutes' time to catch up with uh, Jared Ullman from the Data Science Corporation. He's our next uh, interview that's lined up. But uh, as we're watching the action out on track and uh, Mike looking for that, uh, that replay, we'll see if we can pick up on that. But Ulifant also starting to close things down there ever so slightly, moving up from 13th place up to the 11th spot now. After that little bit of chopping and changing that happened with the, the racing and the bumping that was happening in that little pack of cars. A bit further back there, Michael Appleton. The, this, was the car, this was the car that was off. Unfortunately, the replay machine did not pick it up, but I can tell that there is a little bit of damage on that car. I think he went off just a touch uh, coming into T2. There, the replay machine didn't pick it up, which means I don't think there was any contact uh, at the very least, but he's definitely fallen back down, back towards the back of the field. Uh, and Incredible so, to see that those, those yeah. are two cars that have been involved in the incident. Yes, so the 57 there. That's involved, Gary Richardson, the 57 Audi that was involved in that big incident earlier on in the race. And now fighting with another car that uh, came to, had another coming together and a little incident off circuit. So uh, those are the guys you're speaking about. Those are the guys that are your mm -hmm. amateur racers that are here for the fun, that have been part and parcel of a lot of what we've seen so far in Solidarity E-Race and the amount of uh, amateurs and pros that have got together in these uh, race formats. But it's the standard rule. Uh, the same rule that would apply when, you, when you're dealing with the, the real world of racing as you're watching Arno Versace there in the South African livery, uh, the South African flag livery on the side of his Bentley. Um, if you are a slower driver and you're an amateur driver and you've got an alien or a pro behind you, the idea is that you hold your line, don't make any evasive maneuvers, and let the faster driver find a way through on you. And that's where we saw a bit of problems there with Whittier, where he made that mistake and it dropped him down a bit further back. He's made the gap, the, the gap up again, as you can see, straight back at Grobler, and now JC's going to have to just uh, watch those rearview mirrors all the time again for the next couple of laps. Yeah, and the thing is, is that's the beautiful thing about sim racing, in in particular with sim racing, right? I mean, it is not cheap or easy to necessarily get yourself out and in a proper car, you know, in the real world, uh, you know, and, and get out racing, right? There's a lot of licensing you have to have. There's a lot of money that you could potentially throw down as well. I mean, even some of the cheaper series, you're still probably spending a few grand at least, you know, to really get out there. And I'm talking a few grand in U.S., uh, or, or, or Euros, you know, obviously it's a, the drastic comparison to what it would be in Rands out there in South Africa is just massive, it's a right? hundred thousand. Yeah, okay. exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and that's the thing is, realistically, I mean, you could go drop $300, if that, on, on a wheel uh, here, you know, at go over to Best Buy, go over to Amazon, go over to, you know, wherever your local shop is and get yourself like a Logitech G29 or something, perfectly good little wheel for, for, for what it is. And, you know, you spend a couple hundred bucks on that thing and all of a sudden, hey, you're sim racing, right? That's all you need. You need a desk exactly. with a monitor and a, and a wheel and not even a wheel for some of these guys. A lot of these guys out here, maybe not in, in a set of course of competition as much because this is a really, you know, simulation. Uh, but, you know, there are so many games out there that are proper to play with a, with a controller even. Grab your Xbox controller, plug it into your computer, go grab GT Sport, go grab, you know, iRacing, R Factor 2, go grab Race Room, whatever it is, and jump in and race. And that's what this is. You know, you can pick up a community, you can find a league to race with, you can find people to race with. Uh, you know, that is that is what the beauty of sim racing is. And it's fantastic to see these guys out here in 24-hour race with these AM drivers out here, uh, as well as these pro drivers like we're watching at the moment. Util not able to quite get that nose underneath again. Man, he is just, he is trying so hard to get his nose under Grobler, and he just cannot do it yet. Yet. <laughs> he's really pushing hard. He's pushing hard, but he hasn't found a way through, as you said, yet. But uh, that is the optimum word, yet. And, of course, uh, that could turn around at any second now. Speaking of any second now, we've got about uh, about two minutes to go before we jump in with uh, Jared Ullman from uh, Data Sciences Corporation. I believe he's in the... Uh, the room with us and is going to join us uh, shortly to catch up with uh, the man from Data Sciences Corporation. He's part of parcel of our associate sponsors and we're going to be chatting to all of our associate sponsors here today, uh, representatives of each of them. Francois Remy Monnier are going to be joining us all the way from France as well from NEC Corporation and JP de Villiers from Supermicro and he'll be representing AMD as well, their uh, partner of course in this event. 
but uh, that'll be in a few minutes time but watching the action out on track and uh, listening to the comments that you've been making in the background there Mike as you've been listening in here I'll tell you something things are starting to heat up a little bit amongst the action with back markers coming into play now and of course uh, not only are we seeing action at the front and in the mid pack sort of the top 10 top 20 drivers there's actually action all the way through because you've got drivers of similar um, competitive natures or lap times that are now coming together and uh, this is a prime example thank you for that Thomas Edwards in uh, the 30th place in one of the lone Lamborghinis out there this is actually one of my Working staff members by the way Greg there we go yeah so, so showing you that, that mm -hmm. those are the guys that can so, sort of run with the guys that run on similar lap times so you may not be able to put in the 39s around the circuit that we saw in Super Bowl but you can put in consistent 50 laps you know one minute 50 laps around here and those are the guys that are going to get together and fight for 24 mm -hmm. hours that's really what it is i mean looking up and down the timings board right now you know we're seeing the leaders uh all be doing you know 41s low 42s looking down at you know where we're looking at right now for example ted edwards his best time through the race has been a 43 7. not the fastest lap in the world even i can run a faster lap than that at some point but could i run that you know a 42 a 41 consistently heck no you know, but I can come out here and run some 43s, 44s all, all day long, and that's exactly what you just said, right? Ted is out here doing that. He's on the back of the 505 Bentley of Erasmus, uh, and, you know, he's about a second off, and these guys aren't racing, uh, you know, any differently than these guys here as we switch back over to Util, you know, same race, just a different position, right? And you're kind of realizing that, you know, even though all the cars are, are out on track, you might be in P30, but you're kind of realizing where that cutoff is. It's like, okay, all the guys up to about P20, I don't have a chance against realistically, but what I'm going to fight for is I'm going to fight for that P20, and that's a win to me, right? And that's and sure. that's what those guys look at. That's exactly it. Oh, speaking of winning, getting a winning formula like this together, we've got to bring in a whole bunch of sponsors. And, of course, uh, the man behind finding all of our sponsors for this event as we oh. sing a bit of maneuvering there. And eventually, Utiel diving through. What a move there from him. Just squeezing out Robler and uh, moves up into single digits. Finally. Uh, so we joined a in the commentary that, booth. Real quick. Let's have a quick look at that replay, that one. Yeah, so no, let's no watch problem. this be we before we come in. So they're coming into the corner here. We're going to see the Audi out in front. He's going to catch the grass there on the right. The Bentley gets hard on the brakes, tries to avoid him, goes down to the outside, inside, outside, inside, catches the inside curb. No, a little bit of contact there between the two of them, but he manages to get it straightened backed out. The Audi, you can see him flashing lights there a little bit. He wasn't quite happy with it, but in the end, he got a little loose too. I'm sure the stewards will take a look at it, but, uh, you know, that is finally that 367 getting past. For, again, and I'm going to say this. I feel like I'm going to say this again for the next 22 and a half hours. For now. <laughs> for now, that's for sure. And exactly. Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, I believe we have a guest. For Romain Rutiel as he comes in. Yes, our other guest has just joined us, Gerard Ullman from Data Sciences Corporation. Gerard, how are you doing, buddy? Hi there, Greg. Hey, good yourself, man. Ah, oh, fantastic, man. Have you enjoyed all the action so far? Because, I mean, you come straight into the thick of it right now. I'm just looking at that little map on the side and just seeing how many cars is on there. Um, it's uh, for the back markers. It must be quite scary with all of these guys passing you the whole time. That's no, pretty spectacular stuff out there. You've got traffic non-stop now for the next 22 hours and 13 minutes, Gerard. But uh, from your side, Data Sciences Corporation also been involved right from the word go with the uh, Solidarity E-Race. Um, how awesome is this new platform? We've got uh, collaboration between technological advanced companies like yourselves and your partners. We've got collab between the, the race face guys and Solidarity E-Race and the whole communities come together for this 24 hour international I'm talking about. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, it's been great to see how far it's come. Uh, I think we've had on, on some of the races, we've, we've struggled to actually get participants. And uh, speaking to Ross this week, there was actually a couple of teams that uh, were on waiting lists because there's just not enough spaces for for guys to join so it's great to see uh the interest that's actually uh pulled by the platform and the amount of people, participants and teams um that's that's joined from from all over the international side of things has definitely stepped up what we've seen so far we did uh, kind of look at it uh, from the word go at kyle army's initial solidarity e-race that kicked this all off as the partnership started to be uh, formed and uh, the friendship started to be formed but from your side you've brought in almost every single one of our associate sponsors including pure storage and nec oxide uh, all part and parcel of, of of the deal that's been put together for this one as well 
Yes, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to see all of our partners participating, or Francois from, from NEC, uh, and uh, with, with Peer Storage, well, Alex, uh, he's been in South Africa a couple of times, uh, he loves the country as well, and, and uh, he's quite passionate about, about uh, the technology, but also passionate about racing, so it's, it's great to see all of our partners coming in with us to support the Solidarity E-Race. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, from Data Sciences Corporation's point of view, though, you must be pretty ecstatic with the amount of uh, coverage that's been given to the company, and as well as uh, you know the, the leverage you were able to, to play around with, uh, with the, the technological advancements that have happened over the lockdown period, seeing some racing grow in such a big way. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, if I look at uh, our customers, also a lot of our engineers, uh, you know, all of the youngsters are, are all involved in, in, in gaming, a lot of them in sim racing. Um, so it's good to actually get those guys together. Um, we were even thinking about setting up uh, our own team to participate. Um, but I think uh, looking at these guys' lap times, there's uh, uh, no chance that we would have been able to come close. <laughs> Listen, never say never, but never say never. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you had a slow, fat guy on a, on a Triumph and a Suzuki at the Red Star Raceway for four 24 hours on his own, and he managed to finish all four of them. So you never you never say die. And it'll be awesome to see, you know, you guys putting your money where your mouth is, but also getting out on track as well. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gerard, from, so, uh, uh, from, from, the, from a new company getting involved, Jeff, as part and parcel of, of your whole uh, setup, Oxide have joined us. Take us through uh, that that relationship. Yeah, so uh, um, I mean, working with our technology partners like NEC and Pure Storage, uh, we we support a lot of the big enterprises, big banking and insurance companies in South Africa to run you know, the core of their data centers to make sure that you know, when when you put petrol at a petrol station, that you're able to pay for your your petrol without the systems going down. So, so we work in quite a stressful data center environment where you know uptime is, is key um, what we found is 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 a lot of the you know mid market customers the smaller smaller you know business owners you know are, are forced to use the you know traditional uh, cloud companies like amazon or you know, the traditional internet service providers and uh, now they don't necessarily give the same level of support if you need that sort of highly available platforms uh, but it also makes life quite difficult if you want to, you know, as a say a small business owner, you want to have a little website that you can sell your products online. Uh, you know, as we've seen, you know, the market moving with, with online purchases, um, it makes it a lot more difficult. So, so what we've effectively done with Oxide is, is really created a new sort of platform as a service, reusing the same technologies uh, from our partners, NEC, um, uh, super micro gear storage on the back end of this platform, but really delivering a platform that, that uh, you know, these small business owners can really easily go and, and uh, deploy their, their website or, or their e commerce platform uh, with the same level of highly available support that uh, we can offer to our enterprise uh, financial customers. Just watching on uh, some big action at the moment there, and a little bit of action. That's uh, uh, it's just to keep an eye on Jason Absma under a bit of pressure there. And sorry to jump in and out, but as you know, we are live with the race as well, Gerard. So we've got to give you a bit of the action there. GS is starting to put the pressure a little bit more onto the back end of that Porsche, and the two of them slowly but surely closing on Cruz in the, the fourth Audi on track, sitting in fourth place at the moment. So the battle for fourth place coming up on uh, some back markers, and that could possibly change things up as well as we're watching UTL starting to make his way through now from ninth place to eighth place. So since he's got into single digits, he's moved up nicely. All right, back to you. Another question from our side of things, of course, is um, from your team. I was, you mentioned it earlier on, but there are a lot of young guys involved in your company, and uh, all of them uh, kind of looking to go the same kind of route as what most of these guys on track are doing. They're either involved in some form of sim racing or some kind of gaming at some point in their in their career. So the uh, the relationship and the partnership that's been grown here between Solidarity E-Race and you guys at Data Sciences Corporation must be good for the morale of the company as well if they're all getting involved. We're seeing some massive action on track as well. Sorry to jump in and out, but it is really fun. And the big pressure there from the Audi. So there's a big move there. He tries to get through on Kropla. Kropla keeps him out for now. 
But Grobler in, uh, oh yeah, there you can see some lights flashing as Leslie Ulipan is not too happy with that maneuver that was just pulled on him. And the reason being, he's got uh, Steel Varsen on his tail. And, uh, sure, a huge fight on here for what is going to be uh, for the top 10. Let me reiterate that question as you're watching that fight there, please, Gerard. Sorry to jump in and out, as I said, but we are live with action, as you know. But uh, the morale from the company's point of view with the youngsters involved in your in your side of things must be pretty cool when you're involved in an event like this. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I've had a couple of questions with uh, the engineers saying that we must put a, put a little sim seat in the office uh, so that the guys can go and play around. Um, it's quite good. I mean, it, it, it gives a nice work work-life balance. Um, but uh, if, if you let the, the reins loose, they'll, they'll, they'll spend 24 hours racing and not doing their work. <laughs> what do we want them to do? Come on now, what's wrong with you, Gerard? <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think it's a good idea to have a sim seat at the office. I'm just going to throw that out there. I think it's a phenomenal idea. I think it's the greatest <laughs> idea that, that a company has ever thought about. I think uh, I, I may be sending my, my CV out that way. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've normally had these type of things over December periods when uh, you know, it's, it's data center freezes and people are on leave. We normally do that at the office. Uh, the last year has been a little bit more difficult with lockdown as, as we weren't fully back at the office yet. But uh, I think definitely we should we should actually do that um, and, and, and participate in more of these type of events. I, I mean, I, I would even encourage you guys to, to form up that sim racing team that you, uh, you sort of hinted at earlier and uh, start to start to uh, you know you can get a cool livery made out you can advertise on the side and you know it doesn't it doesn't really matter if uh, you know you're not uh, as i referred to earlier alien like pace you know you can just be a regular driver consistency wins championships anyway it doesn't mean it doesn't matter how quick you, you hot lap out on the circuit but um it really does build good camaraderie and it's and it's cool to see uh, more teams entering into the arena so i would i would encourage you to, to look towards that avenue and uh, you know when once your team starts to get going you you can start to uh, you know bring in other drivers from other teams uh, you know poach them that's what i like to uh, you know refer to it as and and um, exactly. you know, build up you know if you offer you offer more as a team than the other the other team does to their drivers well you know that's the way the cookie crumbles and then you can find your car towards the front end of the field yeah, so perhaps on our next interviews uh, part of the questions will be what's your lap times around <laughs> what, what? I was about to say, can you know, you... I, can, I can do a 39 around here if you're looking for a team driver, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Gerard, thank you so much for joining us, buddy, and, and please enjoy the rest of the race action that's going to be happening over the next 22 hours or so. It's uh, fantastic to have Data Sciences and, of course, Oxide joining us, and uh, thanks so much also from your effort for bringing in all of our uh, technologically advanced companies involved in this uh, e-race and of course in the 24 hours of car Army. and we'll we'll catch up with you yeah. again real soon okay it's a pleasure and uh, good luck to all the teams i hope it uh, all ends up in a nice clean race thanks gerard, gerard. awesome stuff there gerard yeah. allman from data data sciences corporations joining us here and the second interview for uh, the day g max you're back in the house uh, all your technological side of things sorted out now uh, never ever is it ever going to be completely <laughs> sorted out. It's a, it's a 24 hour race and uh, there's so many entries and participants that uh, it, it's something that is going to be wild, not just on the, uh, the front end for the live stream, but uh, on the back end of us uh, just uh, kind of maintaining and making sure that things run as smoothly as they can. It's going to be crazy. So um, yeah, I, I'd like to say that all the, the technical sides of mine are, are done and dusted, but I would just be lying to everybody watching. <laughs> Krobler into pit lane there for a little bit of a probably scheduled stop for him. Maybe just trying to get out of that fracas he was involved in there with uh, Fazekas Ulifant and of course Heron now involved in that little one too. Quade Glasson's definitely the man to uh, capitalize out of that, getting two and a half seconds up the road there from that little battle. Give himself a little bit of breathing room. He's still got to find about seven seconds to catch up on Dex in the uh, car in seventh place. So that's how things stand at this point in time. You've got Simeone 15 seconds up the road. They've made about two seconds up there in, in your absence. Would have seen uh, Crazer came out just ahead of Ryan Mina and then eventually I think some uh, team tactics came into play there, telling the 9-7 car to give way and let Ryan Mina through again. So Killian Ryan Mina now up in a second place, looking to close that 15 seconds or so down on Simeone who leads out. Cruz in fourth and uh, cruising quite well at this point in time ahead of Jason Absmeyer. Seeing Absmeyer now close that gap down on the back end of Cruz. So it could be a possibility of a fight here for the top five. 
here is our official standings as it comes through. Thanks so much, uh, Mike Jones, for that. Um, sitting, as I said, abs mine five, Chiesa in six, X is in seventh in the Aston Martin Vantage. You've got Utiel and Klaassen's there in eight and nine and 10th place is another Aston Martin there in the hands of uh, Steel Varsen. As you can see, things starting to sort of settle down in that mid pack as well for the sort of 15th, 16th to 24th place. Not too many battles of, of note there. But uh, in your absence as well, G, but you probably were watching while you were sorting things out. I was just saying to Mike how things get pretty riled up at the sort of front end. Then it opens up a little bit. All of a sudden, you get a little bit of traffic that slows things down or, or speeds things up again. And then all of a sudden, you, uh, you find that you're in a battle with cars that are fighting on a similar lap time. It makes Correct. it very difficult to try and find a way through on that battle if you're a lone car or even if you're two or three of the lead cars coming up on another battle. Correct, correct, correct. It was uh, sort of what I said at the start when we, we came into it, right? Is, uh, it, it's one thing just being able to lap at your own pace or with similar cars on the same sort of pace level. But when you do start to come up to those blue flagged cars, it's all about traffic management, finding a place that you can pass safely. And uh, hopefully the, the blue flag car is going to yield the position in a safe manner, be predictable. Um, and just stick to, to, to something that is a, a predictable race line. A lot of the cars, uh, you know, might just jump out of the way for drivers to come through. Some of the drivers prefer if uh, they just kind of hold their line and just ease off of the throttle, allow for an easy overtake if they need to. But it's, uh, you know, you've got different drivers in different cars. They're going to handle the situations differently. The race in the race, uh, pre-race briefing kind of touched on, on, on the preferred method for, uh, you know, ways to, to have it done. And then there was, there was always feedback from drivers saying, oh, no, don't do that. Just be predictable down the line but but we've seen it that that traffic can cause such chaos when when you look at the bigger picture i've also got a little bit of feedback into we, we can see some of those timing uh, penalties coming out on the timing sheet that little oh, red indicator. Big, big hit that's coming out up by Chiesa. Chiesa taking out my outgoing i think that's out of barbecue that so was that was a, a big move big hits and the Toro team will get a, a replay of this coming down as Chisia then making contact with Jason Abs. So we ride on board with Chisia as they make their way down, going onto the uh, the inside line at uh, Crowthorn. And uh, Jason Abs might kind of reading that move coming down, the, the two of them uh, going almost side by side and uh, just a little bit of overlap there going to cause that. Jason going to get spun around. Taro, uh, who was having a good race so far, will uh, have to pick up the pieces. And unfortunately for them, that is going to cost them the position out to the likes of Attila Denks as well in that number 41 in front of them now. So they've got, uh, well, it's not even the, the, the car directly in front of them. That's a blue flagged Aston in front of them. And uh, just going out the exit on the way down to Mineshaft would be Chissier. But I wanted to just touch on those penalties as well, Greg, just to uh, oh, sort of uh, keep do. you up to date. So uh, just a little run through of the penalties that we've seen. The 962 getting a 10 second penalty for an avoidable contact on lap 12. At turn nine, the number 738 getting a 10 second penalty also for avoidable contact on lap 13. The number 121 has a five second time penalty also for avoidable contact. The 192 avoidable contact with a 10 second penalty. The 969, 10 seconds for blocking the leading car under blue flags. We talked about the blue flags. The number 42 got 20 seconds for ignoring blue flags completely on lap 25 the number 520 a 10 second penalty for avoidable contact the number 57 got a 10 second time penalty for ignoring blue flags and the number 42 once again getting another 20 seconds for ignoring blue flags and a warning so uh Stuart out in full force trying to regulate and make sure that people are behaving themselves on the circuit greg and we said that is needed you need regulation you need to 100%. have a, con a consistent rule set otherwise things can just go out of control Speaking of the rules, though, um, those penalties will only be implied at the end of the 24 hours. Is that right? No, they, they can actually, when they go in to do their, their, their pit stops, they can actually serve okay. that penalty out. So, so they, they can just, serve that penalty uh, out, extra 10 seconds correct. in pit lane, for instance. All right, cool. Absolutely. Another, another, another big question that, that I've been thinking about and uh, has come to mind as well. Uh, we spoke about earlier on the, the three-man and up to five-man team, depending on the minimum and maximum allowed for the event. Three was the minimum. I think five was the maximum. Um, do all the drivers have to put in a certain amount of laps? And if that, if so, do you know how many that is? 
Uh, no, there's there's actually no limit to how far the drivers uh, can drive in their entirety. They do have a stint limit, which uh, they can't exceed. But um, when it comes to max driving time, it, it's all down to your team and how you want to structure it. So if you've got a hard carry driver that puts in good times and has lots of consistency, you can um, have them running the, the majority of your racing sort of participation time. But uh, each driver has a minimum of, of just doing one lap on, on throughout the 24 hour. And from there, uh, you can just sort of stack it up and see. So if you do have a driver that's struggling out there, you can, you can so kind if, of... So if you've got, you got a driver like Mike and myself, we just got to put in one lap and we're done. We're happy. Mike is... Mike is surprisingly, <laughs> Mike is Mike is surprisingly quick. It's uh, it's it's someone like myself um, that that hasn't been able to, to drive. So you and you and myself, Greg, would uh, we just have to do one lap yeah, and yeah, let I'm the just, aliens I'm, I'm having a go at my American friend now. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Just give you a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of feedback from my side. But yeah, no, well, that's good to know because I think people that are watching and and are, and are seeing what's happening out on track at the moment will we'll be asking those kind of questions. You know, how many. How many laps is each driver allowed to do? What is the, the stint limit? Is it, is it an hour and a half? Is it two hours before you go to change drivers? All of those are big factors when it comes to the strategy of winning this race. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's 75 minutes um, stint limits that these guys are going to going to do. So, I mean, you've got a, you've got 75 minutes that you can do at a single time before you have to go back into the pits and just reset that, uh, that stint limit warning. And from there, it's uh, you know it's anybody's game on how you want to structure the race. But that that was kind of the the main aim of, of the way that things were set up here is that there wasn't too much regulation. You, know, you don't have mandatory numbers of pit stops that the cars have to do. You've got infinite amount of tire sets, which is uh, is certainly going to work in, in in a lot of people's favor. I've seen a lot of um, different leagues running different rule sets on that. You can limit the number of tire sets that, that people can use, which I think uh, adds to an element of, of realism out there. But it's all... Oh, speaking it's, of realism, a shape a in the background spin. there. I think that might have been Dinks. Dinks playing out there, possibly. Was it? No. It wasn't it's it. Dinks still... Uh, another, another light blue Aston Martin it's a, it's getting It's the light blue uh, Aston Martin, yeah. But uh, we've seen, uh, we've seen some victims. Early fans in going to be uh, that's I mean that's quite a long stint coming out for a lot of these these first drivers um, to do their driver swaps etc. So uh, quite a long time behind the wheel for a lot of drivers and just trying to um, obviously maximise the the availability to make up positions in the start of the race. Greg, as far as uh, I understand, we are going to we're about go to take over a little break, to... bit of a break, and we'll see you soon. And I'm going to head across to uh, pick up on uh, Francois Remy Monia, who's going to join us for an interview. But also joining us in commentary will be uh, our young protege, which we found during our commentator search for uh, the second version of Solidarity e Race, and that's uh, Clark King. He'll be joining me now for commentary. Georgie, you enjoy your break. We'll see you in a couple of minutes' time. And thanks so much for the insight so far. And hopefully we can get uh, Francois Remy Monia in here and Clark King coming to join me.
Alright. For the small comms break there, we just uh, got a chance for our uh, production team to have a little bit of a relief break and uh, maybe get some stuff into uh, our mouths just to keep us going. But uh, speaking of mouths, the, the youngest mouth of our team is Clark King, who's joined us now as part of our commentary team. Welcome, Clark King. Uh, it's great to be here again. Um, it's been an incredible past week, obviously the Super Bowl. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, uh, also, all the viewers, welcome to uh, the new uh, phase, I guess you could say, in e-racing. 24 hours, the first ever 24-hour race, uh, e-race in South Africa. It's incredible to be here. Uh, how are you guys? Well, we've been good so far. You've been watching in the background. I know you've been in the room the whole time, seeing the action that has uh, happened out on circuit uh, at this point in time. So it's uh, non-stop so far. And uh, what we thought would be sort of uh, an ease into this race has certainly uh, caught a lot of us off guard. And I'm sure watching from the sidelines, from, uh, from a young racer's point of view, you must be thinking to yourself, hang on a second, guys, there's 24 hours to go here. Okay, we've got about 22 hours to go at the moment, but certainly uh, a lot of work to be done still. And they can't be racing this hard uh, at this stage of the race, surely. I mean, um, there's one main thing about 24-hour racing. You, you don't want another car to break into your... I guess I, I, I call it a bubble. You don't want them to cut into that bubble because if they do, then they're going to be under a lot of pressure. And it's 24 hours. One little mistake can cost you that prize money. That's your position more importantly at that stage and then the prize money at the end. And that's exactly why these guys are taking it a little bit gingerly. You're seeing guys like this man on screen at the moment, Dwayne Hall, fighting with uh, LaRue just ahead there in the Lexus, one of the lone Lexus machines out on track. And right on his tail in uh, the Porsche is uh, D'Souza. And as, as I said to George, um, what, you, what you find and what you would have found in your own racing careers, you find guys that have, that have got a similar lap time or a, a similar skill set. And those are the guys you actually want to be fighting with. Those are the guys you want to be having a little bit of a battle with. You may not be able to run with these top 10, you know, and as, as George calls them, the aliens of the world, because they, they're just in another zone. They're in another uh, maneuver that uh, most of us can't even come close to. Yeah, there's, there's always a, a goal of where you want to finish. And obviously, your, your thinking is, uh, maybe I can get to 10, maybe I can fight. But then as you start to ease into the, the race, you start to re realize that, okay, maybe I must fight with these guys of, the, of my, of my school, set, uh, school set. Because if you do, then I think, I think there'll be a lot less pressure on you. Uh, not just you fighting for the top 10, or just you fighting and thinking about uh, everyone who's ahead of you and, and who's your school set exactly that and that's exactly what these guys are doing they're fighting <coughs> in amongst guys and girls of a, of a similar skill set which is a nice way of putting it that is for sure i know we are setting up uh, the interview with francois remy monia and with uh, jp de villiers they'll be joining us shortly uh, from nec and from supermicro and amd yep. but um looking at the way things have gone at the moment uh, and particularly in that top 10 there's been a couple of uh, crucial changes the uh, biggest one at the moment we're seeing of course is the battle right now between absma and Utiel. And Utiel is starting to put a bit more pressure on to Jason Absmeyer. There's already been some rubbing between them. So whether or not we're going to see a little bit more of it heading down towards Crocodiles. All right. Um, Jason Absmeyer, he had a uh, collision with a car behind him in uh, through a dusky uh, sweep, if you uh, remember, if I remember correctly. And now this back yep. is getting in the way. You don't want those back to get in your way because that's just going to force you to push harder and as I said you don't want other drivers to cut into your bubble that's exactly what he's trying to avoid and now made a little bit of ground up using those back markers to his advantage uh, a couple of guys coming out of pit lane as well after some uh, much needed uh, pit lane activity and uh, maybe some scheduled stops there the M Sport BMW that's of course I think that's one of the South African flag livery cars there coming back on track great to see that too Tinky van der Felder just in the mix there as well and the 404 car coming through there too. Nice bit of maneuvering from them. Um, also picking up on a couple of guys. I think we've had our first retirement. I did hear Mark in my ear. Sorry, Mark. I just missed the, the team that went out there. But it uh, looks like we've had our first retirement. PWSR is out. The yellow portion of Leslie Oliphant. That, yeah. that is a massive, massive loss to this event. If they've had an issue that's uh, caused them to retire, it must have been something terminal. And... Uh, from, from your experience, uh, Clarky, involved in these in these sim races before, what could possibly have gone wrong? I mean, there's a there's a, a various amount of difficulties that you uh, have to uh, f or, or forced to uh, face with in the online world. 
so i mean there could have been like i don't know game crashing or the servers just not working because I, I was i was a little bit worried when i was watching um in the room here just uh, looking at the racing he was he was in the pits for a a uh, for a long time i was extremely confused at the time and now uh, it's, it's sad to see um that porsche go well as the porsche goes and uh, a porsche is under pressure here from the bentley uh joining us i'm not quite sure where in uh, europe he is at the stage where well, he just joined us and then he he jumped back out again i'm waiting for him to come join us again uh, is uh, our good friend Francois Remy Monnier from NEC Corporation. As he's back into our chat channel, we'll bring him up onto uh, Mike and he can have a chat about what's happening on track as well as what's happening from NEC's point of view. Great to have him as part of our associate sponsors again. But um, this battle is certainly starting to put a bit more pressure onto Jason Absmeyer. There you go. Francois Remy Monnier, a massive welcome to you, sir. And uh, where are you joining us from at this stage? I don't think he's put his mic on. I'll just let him, as we see the, the leader, Giorgio Simeone, pulling into pit lane and uh, having to do the, the scheduled stop. They could possibly see Ryan Meenan and uh, Chiesa go one and two here. Depending on the gap that was there, it's, I think there's going to be a possibility that even Ryan Meenan might come in. Is that Meenan coming in there? Very good chance that Meenan has yes, come in yeah. at the same time. Yeah, so so strategy is working almost uh, in, in cahoots here between those two teams. I think as soon as uh, Simeone came in, uh, the side max team might have said to uh, Killian, come in, because the leader's in, and we might be able to get him in pit lane and do the overtaking maneuver we need to make in the pit box. No, not that's the case, we'll wait and see. Simeone about to make his way back on track. Tobias Pfeffer in the pits as well. Possibility of him moving up uh, slightly. He dropped out of it uh, for a while. That was Simonini, of course, and Pfeffer, yeah, now taking over from uh, Simonini. And, uh, well, he, he wasn't overtaken in terms of the leader of the race because Ryan Meenan tried to do that and possibly his team didn't quite get the strategy right there. He makes his way back on the track now with uh, George Boothby yeah. at the wheel. So, as we see our two leading cars make their way back onto the circuit here at Kyle Army, uh, they may not cross over the white line. Let's have a look and see where you pick up on uh, Francois Remy Monnier all the way from... Where are you at the moment, sir? I'm in France, in Paris. Bonjour, bonjour, and a big welcome to you, sir. Bonjour to you guys. So it's fantastic to ha have you back again, Francois, and uh, thanks so much for taking time out of your day. I hope you've enjoyed all the action so far. I did. I um, it was very interesting to uh, to see the race and the different strategies from the team. Um, really, something very nice to enjoy to watch uh, to look at. I, I know that you, you're kind of pressed for time, so we'll we'll kind of get to the nitty gritty right from the word go. <laughs> uh, once again, NEC are, are part of our associate sponsors, but you've been involved in almost every single version of the Solidarity E-Race. We have now stepped up the game here in South Africa, bringing an international field of drivers and an international event. Did that uh, mean that NEC has got a, a, a bigger platform to play on here in terms of leveraging your sponsorship with our, with our uh, event? So of course, I mean, it's uh, at the end of the day, what is really interesting is for people from different places around the world to gather around the passion, um, the joy of living, the joy of doing some sim race and uh, to do everything for a good cause. And uh, it's really matched with um, the values of the company, which is to find ways to bring people together uh, close to a uh, the passion they, uh, they, they would like to expand. And of course, uh, partnering up with uh, partners that are in South Africa as well, from NEC's point of view, must be uh, a good way to sort of keep those partnerships in a, in a happy medium. Exactly, because um, again, uh, as we are speaking from South Africa, France and other places in the world, at the end of the day, uh, the core of the core of the business of NEC is around telecommunication. So as we speak, uh, basically we are using uh, um, equipment from NEC, going from submarine cable from uh, Europe to Africa to uh, maybe satellites to uh, working with uh, Vodafone, Vodafone or different carriers. So basically, it's also uh, for us to be able to be uh, the glue of such type of, uh, of events, but also such type of new way of uh, collaborating, which is key for us, bringing people together. 
We certainly have brought a, a massive field of drivers together. We've got 47 teams involved, and I think it's just over 210 competitors in total, plus all of the background activity that happens from uh, the Racing Club International team, from the Solidarity E-Race team, and from the Race Face team joining our partners. So uh, we've, we've hit the nail on the head there in terms of uh, the, the motto of your company and bringing people together. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I look back one year ago when we uh, did sponsor with you guys the first uh, sim race, I mean, the, uh, the achievement are huge. And, and again, thank you for you and all the team and to you, Greg, as well, to be such a, a wonderful uh, commentator or speaker uh, who gives everything in terms of meaning to the shape of race. Appreciate the kind words, sir. But I have a young man that we found at uh, your event who has now joined us as full team member of our commentary team. And I'm sure Clark would love to ask you a few questions uh, from, from a 12-year-old's point of view and uh, what uh, the involvement from NECs is. Clarky, over to you, buddy. All right. I, I kind of only have one question. It it's a bit of a weird question, but since you're from France and, you know, it's kind of cool to have uh, international... Uh, people uh, here with us to sponsor us and all that. <laughs> Just a suggestion. What is the your favorite French food? <laughs> so, yeah, it's 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 a good, very very good question. Um, my favorite French food. So it's not food; it's wine. But otherwise, otherwise. Otherwise, the, the, the famous French uh, baguette, which is a, a type of bread, is really something which is a bit unique to France. Um, and this is something which is uh, close to my heart. But, uh, yeah, just to jump in quickly there, Mike. Sorry, you yep. see the action in the background. A couple of cars coming together there. Fraser Cooper being one of the cars involved. The BMW of Miller, I think, is the second car there. It's the only BMW on track. And it uh, looks like it could possibly be one of the... Aston, yeah, there you go. That's the other car that's involved there. So it looks like a little bit of action that uh, happened while we were chatting. As I said, Francois, unfortunately, we do have action on track that we have to jump to yep. and interrupt you just for a few seconds. But uh, let's have a look. We just saw the replay of that. And uh, as they came through uh, Sunset, we're back live with them through Sunset. And still issues there coming through backmarkers. And it's kind of what we expect to see for uh, the entire duration of the race now. With 47 cars out on track, 46 of them still participating. We've only had one retirement so far. Incredible to think that uh, in a normal 24-hour race, uh, in uh, let's take Le Mans as a good example with Francois with us at the moment, we have a lot more uh, attrition rate uh, with the amount of cars uh, having issues by this stage of the race. Uh, Francois, from, from your side, have you ever been to a, a real endurance race like Le Mans? Yes, I've uh, been once to Le Mans. And it's a great experience to have, not only to watch the race, but everything that goes along or alongside the race. I mean, the, the atmosphere, the ambience is something which uh, is very enjoyable to, uh, to experience. And uh, yeah, so for me, it's the only limit to sim race is the uh, whole experience, the smell of the bourgeois, the smell of the beer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what you'd expe be experiencing if you were sitting uh, around Kyle Army right uh, now, wouldn't you? Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, but uh, well, let, let's see in 20 years if people would have been able to invent uh, like a smell on your phone so you can enjoy the, uh, the true experience of a sim race with uh, everything that goes along. If, if anybody can do it, any C can. So we'll, we'll leave yeah, that uh, it, bit of pressure in your hands, okay, sir? So, thank you so much for this. <laughs> <laughs> François Rémy Monnier, merci, uh, merci beaucoup for all of your time and uh, please enjoy the rest of your weekend and uh, jump in at any stage to come and watch what's happening here at Kyle Army. We do. Good luck, guys. Bye-bye. Yes, sir. All the very best. We're looking forward to seeing him. He'll be uh, back in South Africa pretty shortly as well and hopefully be doing some kind of motorsport as well as we get him involved there. But uh, how awesome is that, Clark? It's great to have uh, sponsors that uh, not only... Uh, you know, live and breed what we what we enjoy and as our passion, but uh, put their money where their mouths are and support uh, our, our, our events in such a big way. Yeah, and not only are we are we just racing, we're, uh, we're racing for a good cause. Um, obviously, the um, we're ra uh, all the driver reg registration fees will be donated to the Quad Para Association of South Africa and uh, GTWR. They have a disabled driver, um, Yvonne, I think. 
is what the, the name is, who uh, races for their academy team and is a Olympic archer. Unbelievable. And, yeah. yeah, so so you're, you're speaking about Yvonne there and the GTWR team, and we mentioned the fact that we had Mark Whittington, um, one of our uh, possibilities of South Africa's representative at the next Paraplegic Games, uh, Olympic Games, uh, as as a as a sprinter and as as well as a marathon man on his in his in his race chair, who participated at the Laguna Seca round of Solidarity E Race. So it's great to have the association with Quad Para, but it's fantastic to have people with disabilities participating in our events as well. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, you see, that's, that's, uh, that just puts a point that uh, no matter what has happened to you, if you've gone leg amputated, you, you, you can do even more things and you can come out of that situation stronger. You certainly can. I mean, just look at some of the, the race drivers in the real world that have had massive accidents and have returned to do incredible things in the likes of the paraplegic games and Special Olympics and, and the likes thereof. So uh, hats off to those drivers that are, that are out there. Uh, we've got a couple actually participating in South Africa, Car Care Clinic, Triple uh, One Sports and Saloons, and the Car Care Clinic Super Hatch category had uh, Matt Cohen, a freestyle motocross rider who had a massive accident and lost uh, the ability to use his legs. And he participated in a specially built Volkswagen Polo, which Volkswagen Motorsport, one of our uh, um, partners from previous events, uh, actually got built at Nathan's Motorsport for him to use uh, just hand control. So his braking and his acceleration is via hand control alongside the steering wheel. And he participated, I think, in three seasons. So, yeah, exactly what Clark is saying. No matter what your uh, disability is or uh, you think you're facing some hardships in life, there is always a way and means of uh, outgunning those hardships and uh, becoming the, the better person for it and showing the rest of the world that, that it can be done. Yep. Um, yeah, obviously, a, a massive hats off to them. Um, I think, I think they're one of the one one of the most incredible people to talk to, uh, especially if they share their stories and what's happened to them in the past. It's certainly one of the interesting stories we can pick up on there. Maybe Mike can get G Max or um, Batters to get Yvonne to come and join us at some point in the broadcast to chat about her disability and the fact that she's involved be really cool to have a chat not right now but during the during the event at some stage i think mike that'll be really awesome if we can get that right uh, I, I may even get a a call out to uh to mark and see if he's available to join us just for a, a little chat if he needs to see how things are going for his uh, his olympic aspirations that's one of sa's finest uh, marathon um wheelchair uh, athletes and the sprint athletes as well but speaking of sprinting Things seem to be uh, starting to heat up a little bit here, uh, Clark. Top 10 battle is certainly yep. where we are concentrating because it has been such a great battle so far. Yes, it really has. And there's yellow flags at, uh, at sunset. I think a car has gone off. We may get uh, a, a replay on that, maybe. Um, but yeah, this is incredible. I, a 24-hour race, uh, <laughs> well, not really 24 hours, 21 hours until we get to see who is crowned the champion of the, the first ever pure storage uh, 24 hour uh, 24 hours at Kai Alami. Um, I, one one uh, pers uh, one car that stands out there, Crunau, um, uh, which is honestly he's doing incredibly well to be in be in the Bentley, or some people call it the boat. And I, I honestly, I, I'm a massive fan of Bentleys. <laughs> random reason, but yeah, I'm a massive fan of the Bentleys. Well, I can tell you something. The Bentley at uh, the Car Army 9 hour led for a huge amount of time before it got overtaken by the Honda. And those are two cars that we sort of haven't really mentioned yet. That's the man we're talking about right now. And, uh, Sebastian having a superb run. But remember, at the previous version of the Car Army 9 hour in 2020, at the end of lockdown, when we opened things up for the very first time, and it was the only international event that happened in, in South African motorsport last year. Let's have a quick look at that replay for the overtake while I'm talking about that diving on the inside and finding a line and actually using the back marker to an Pretty advantage well. there so good move uh, yeah Milton Vass Steel Vassen just uh, setting things up there to get through and uh, find a way past but uh, some great driving there and you can see that battle is not done yet with vessels at the wheel he's going to try and come back at him he's lost a little bit of ground though having to try and avoid the slower cars there and the back markers that were involved so going back to that thought you were talking about Bentleys the Bentley that led, remember, was piloted by South Africa's very own Jordan Pepper and his teammates. Pepper, yeah. So the Bentley around this circuit is very good in the real race. 
I mean, if you talk to G Max or you talk to Mike, they might disagree with you and say maybe the Porsche and the Audi are probably better to have in the sim racing world. We have got a Bentley in the top five. Top yeah, seven, and sorry. also, top seven. and also on the topic of uh, the Porsches, obviously, uh, Kailami I mean, not just being the home of, of the motorsport in South Africa, also uh, Porsche South Africa uh, is where uh, the uh, Kailami is based. Only one Porsche in 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 top in the top ten, which is quite a uh, obscene to see because well obviously the, the very unfortunate retiring of the um, uh leslie olifant's team there's only a taro in the taro team in the top ten uh, in the top ten hour and the man behind the wheel the local hero uh Al alaric Ensler. our very first e-race winner from solidarity e-race yes. so uh, definitely a man to uh, watch out for and a man to uh, keep an eye on as he starts to make his way through the field possibly start to make that eight into a seven, seven into a six and into the top five in a very short space of time. Speaking of short space of time, I know we are uh, hooking up our next interview as well in the background to uh, see if we can find uh, JP de Villiers from Supermicro. He's going to come and chat to us about Supermicro and also represent uh, their partners AMD. So I'm just going to wait for him to come and join us and then we'll, we'll get him on mic. But going back to the race action on track. Okay, I'm just getting in my ears as well. Yvonne looks like she could possibly be jumping in with us as well, which would be very good. But uh, 27th place on track at the moment. We've got Rodeau there in uh, Bentley. A bit of a fight of his own. And the fight he's having right now is with uh, Daly in the Lamborghini just ahead of him. Just behind him. I think it's also in a Bentley. Uh, no, it's not just behind him. It's actually quite a way back. I was just uh, looking at the gap there. I thought it was, I thought it was a lot closer, but it actually isn't. But, uh, Daniel Rowe. South African Global Touring Car Champion uh, and uh, competitor there as well in 28th place and of course a winner of a, of a race only uh, a night ago in the Racing Club International uh, um, streams that went out uh, on various other um, avenues that we play in and of course and leagues that we play in here in the sim racing world but uh, that was great to hear um, I love I love this format of the sport Ooh. as well and uh, I mean I can hear Mike in the background as we get a little bit of action there from the Lambo getting out of shape and uh, Daly making a small mistake there, allowing Rodeau through. The pressure was starting to be felt then. I think Daly might have just felt too much pressure. And uh, maybe get a replay of that. They come out of Crocodiles. See him climb on the accelerator. Go on board here with Jordan Daly. I think he might just take a little bit more to curb. Yeah, too much curb. Into the dirty stuff and into the kitty litter. Fortunately, back on track. Only loses one position. But uh, his tyres will be affected for probably the next uh, corner or so. But actually not very lucky to to have gone off there because he gets the entire straight and kink to get those tires clean again so it shouldn't have affected him too badly and i think he'll stay just behind rodeau there in the bentley for 26th place we are with uh, skulk pinar he's in the ferrari so i need to push his way through and pinar fighting with uh, fraser cooper who's just ahead of him there and behind that you've got uh, that battle we just watched out for so uh, nice little battles sort of in the top 20 here and midway through the top 20, also starting to rage at the front end too. Nice number on that car as well, 274. It's one of the race numbers I used to run. My uh, my initial race, my original race number, of course, is 27. But if I can't run 27, I always run 74. So 274 Ferrari. I'm going to say it once again, Mike Jones. It's another Ferrari that could possibly be at the front end at the end of this race. Hey? If it's the 274 car, you know I'm going to make lots of noise. <laughs> uh... Anyway, Clocky. Yep. Yeah. Power, Power Rangers Racing is that's that's the team. It's it's oh man, that's so good. That's it's oh, a, that also is... right down my alley. I mean, you've seen you've seen my collection in the background of some of the shots we've done in the yeah. past. Like you know that I'm a big uh, figurine and uh, and comic fan. So uh, Power Rangers, you go boys. Love your work. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt. You're like a massive fan of the kind of comic uh, co uh, comics world and superhero world and all that. Um, also to touch on the track a little bit. Obviously, uh, with daily going off, there's some parts of the track we mentioned at the, at the beginning of the when we were doing the track walk. There's some curves at Kyle Omi you would that you don't need to necessarily hit, but there is curves that you definitely do not want to hit. And one of them, and that one at Cheetah, what uh, of which daily hit is definitely not one of those. 100% right. There are certain curves that you can use to your advantage, and there are certain curves that are going to be your enemy. You stay away from oh. them as much as possible. Maybe, like we've just seen there, coming back on track. Was that the BMW? I think it may have been. It's a little bit of a slow car on that. 
Oh, okay. Alright. So getting in our ears there from Mike, just uh, telling us that there is a, a track limit warning on the leader at this point in time. So a very good possibility that if they do transgress that rule one more time, they'll get a drive-through penalty. Could possibly see the change up in the lead. We're seeing a bit of a change up here as well as Pinar starts to get to the thick of it and uh, use some back markers to his advantage in the Ferrari. Yes. Just staying uh, ahead of Cooper, getting ahead of Cooper, in fact. I didn't actually uh, realize that. I was a. Uh, 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 I didn't realize that, anyways. So, uh, as I was uh, we were talking about uh, track limits here. There's also some drivers that are going completely off the track onto the grass. I think the, the main thing that the people that are racing, like, probably like the top 10. They do not want that car to drag dust onto the track because that could affect their tires at grip and, and that could possibly uh, uh, turn them turn that into a mistake. And that's that prize money gone. Have a look at that. There's a good example of the balance of performance coming into play there. Cars of similar nature, uh, different manufacturers, but uh, the ability to sort of keep at each other's throats and uh, make it entertaining racing. That's exactly what we're seeing right now as uh, all of a sudden, to the mix comes the lead car. Feffa into that little battle that we've been watching for the last couple of laps. Now trying to find a way through there on the, yeah, coming through there on the, to ninth place by the looks of things. Coming up into the top 10. So uh, an incredible drive there out of Feffa. And uh, so far so good for uh, that side of things in terms of the lead of this race. Definitely starting to become a, a big factor now as they, they, they'll probably get through to, I would say the top eight. I don't know if they'll go any higher than that unless there's problems in that top eight. But uh, looking at the way things have changed up in terms of cars on track as well, you've got Pfeffer in the lead car, you've got Boothby in the side max car, you've got Funnefelda in the second side max car. She is now joined up in fourth place in the Audi. Uh, Shimantinsky is up into fifth. Honorati is into sixth place. And then you've got uh, Kral, who's up there in the Bentley. And as we said, Ulrich Enslin in the Porsche in eighth so uh, this is where things could possibly change up in terms of um the strategies of this teams of these teams and how they're going to try and play things out now because they're now starting to play in lapping single digit cars so uh is, is there a is there a possibility that they ease up slightly or do they just keep the hammer down the entire time uh, something that you don't want to happen obviously you're saying that they could come up to the the cars that are single digits now. The worst thing is for, for the leader, Feffler, if he comes across them really soon, you can see the gaps here. Anselin is, is, is right up the gearbox of uh, Cronau. So that could uh, that could be horrible uh, horrible for Feffler because you don't want to join a situation, a, a, a blue flag situation where there's uh, two cars battling each other and then you have to deal with them and those two, and then Anselin and Cronau have to give way. And it just, it doesn't mix really well at all. Yeah, that's a, that's the point I was trying to make and get through is that the fact that you're coming up on single digit numbers and single digit cars in the standings means that you're coming up on drivers that are of a similar ability to you. So you're looking at your, as George calls them, the aliens and pros who are now going to start lapping each other. Now, do you give that up? And uh, the, the rules stipulate that you have to, if you've got blue flags waving, I think there's a certain amount of blue flags that you, that, that you have to abide by before you have to give that position up. But now it, it changes your whole strategy because you think to yourself, hang on a second, I can run at the same pace as that guy. So do I let him through and maybe just stick with him and let him tow me around the track to make up the ground on the other cars that I'm trying to catch? Uh, you shouldn't probably risk yourself getting penalized. I mean, if, if you are in a racing situation, you don't want to get a penalty for, for uh, just not letting that leader through and you're trying to fight with him i mean we saw at what 2019 into lagos where um Ocon, um no not 20 i think maybe 2018 where verstappen and Ocon uh, came together at turn uh, one two and three where Ocon tried to unlap himself from max verstappen yep. and it ended up in both of them spinning and lewis hamilton took the took uh, picked up the pieces and won that race sorry i don't know who that other driver is that you mentioned i know Ocon and i know verstappen what's the other guy's name again i can't remember <laughs> Lewis Hamilton. That's the very guy, yeah. We don't mention him. Yeah. Man. Remember, that's that's a that's a mom's the word there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that number ninety three in MotoGP. No, oh yeah. Okay, yeah. don't talk about him. All right. Talk about anybody else. Oh. Don't talk about him. I'm joking. There's a lot of Lewis <laughs> Hamilton fans and uh, Mark Marquez fans out there that'll be shouting at me right now. We've got a lot of fans watching us <laughs> yeah. as well. Right. Uh, I think. 
uh, cool. I think what we'll do is if uh, I, can, I hear Mike in my, in my ears as well saying that Yvonne might be ready, but uh, I do know that JP is standing by as well from Super Micro. Maybe we can get JP on quickly, and then once we're done with uh, JP, I can finish off my stint and Clark's stint with an interview quickly with, uh, with Yvonne and chat about uh, the disability and the fact that she's participating with a disability in an event like this and such a prestigious event to be involved in as well. Big fights continuing. I would say that would be great. About uh, about 10, well, 15, 20 minutes would be fantastic. It'll, it'll finish off our stint, and we can then hand, of course, across to you and to GMAX to take us through the next couple of hours of racing. But uh, I am also standing by to sort of get JP De Villiers from Supermicro uh, into the studio with us as well, if he's ready to go. I have sent a message through to our broadcast team to see if they can get that sorted out, and I'm sure that they're going to get them on track as soon as possible. As we continue action here between Rideau and Pinar, Ferrari and Bentley going at it here, and it's a great little fight here, in fact, between these two one of the, the closest fought battles that we've got on track at the moment with only 0.1 of a second between them clock yeah uh, that is it's very nice to see uh battling like this i mean <laughs> 24 hours is basically just endless rush hour traffic on the n1 and it, except from there's there's basically no rules to the road and and the cars are much wider yeah, they are a little bit wider and they've got a little bit more power to play with as well. But uh, they have got a slightly wider track to play on than the normal dual carriageways. Unless you're on that M1, as you've spoken about. <laughs> six lanes of traffic, but uh, you may need six lanes around here to find a way past, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so the battle continues here between Bentley and Ferrari. And uh, the Power Rangers team pushing hard on the back end of all-in racing. Speaking of on the back end, Ulrich Enslin feeling a little bit of pressure too. Back like Enslin might be uh, feeling the effects of uh, having to get into the car second. Abzmeyer did an amazing job at the front end to uh, keep that Porsche in the top 10. But Ulrich's now got to do all the work to try and get back into the top five where they started things out earlier on in the day. So the tough ask there for the Porsche team, but uh, let's see whether or not the Tara boys can do anything about uh, the, the men out front. The men out front at this point in time also to pick up on uh, the teams involved here. And if I'm not mistaken, and uh, I'm sure that Michael jump in my ears if I am, uh, mistaken but the top seven teams are all of our international boys and girls that are fighting there we don't have any sa teams at this point in time the first sa team is Ulrich Enslin. our p1 beg your pardon jordan sherrett is part of the p1 team so we do have a we have a south african representative but it is an international team the jordan sherrett would be the next driver into that car but uh, of course he's on an international squad he's not on a on a, uh, a south african squad other thing i want to try and find out if i can mike and i'm sure you can pull it up for us too there's a lot of guys that are watching um, on our live stream feed are asking lap times. Is there any possibility we can have a look at some lap times and to see what the quickest lap time is so far uh, from drivers out there? On that quickly. Uh, the long comms chat, if we can see, and if I can pick that up, that'll be great. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let Clark do that because I'm I'm just not even getting close to getting that. Clark, you find out. You go and find that, man. I'm not I'm not getting involved. You, you're the you're the IT genius. I'm the guy who just talks in the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's have a look. You guys could come up. You can like continue. I'm gonna have a look real quick. Okay, cool. So while Clark is looking at this, it's not normally what I do here, by the way, Mike, just to give you an insight down there, you can hear me in the background there. Uh, my normal way of doing commentary is I will stand on the side of a racetrack and uh, talk about what's happening uh, from a commentary booth, or I uh, do some live stream commentary where we've got a full production team and cameramen that are out there, and I look at a screen with uh, live timing alongside like we've got here. Um, the other way of doing it, of course, is when I go to a motocross track and there is no form of uh, communication or, and at this point in time in South Africa, no spec that is allowed. And I'll take a little um, uh, DGI Osmo, put my camera phone onto that and do what I call live on the drive, where I literally do the commentary, the filming, the producing and the timekeeping all on two devices while watching the racing transpire in front of me and give you as much of the action as I can. So slightly different way of doing it here today with all of the technical advancements that I've got in front of me, including my brand new microphone and uh, webcam, which is spectacular. Thank you, Ross, for that. <laughs> have you found some time for us, Clark? Yes, I have. Uh, the fastest lap is uh, the, the car number 157. He's currently in the lead with a 141.172, which is what's like two, three tenths quicker than anyone else. Uh, George Boothby's team, 
uh, coming in with a 141.415. And also, interesting information here, um, uh, the number 11, the car number 11, the last pit stop was on lap 38. And that, that is, that is, that is uh, some, uh, he's, sure. yeah, that's, he's going to have some cramping hands soon. <laughs> he's going to certainly feel it yeah, a little bit there, I'm sure. You see at the wheel of that car 11 right now, there it is. It's the gold Audi. And hanging on to fourth place at this point in time. But interesting to see 141s coming out of the top cars. Uh, qualifying was uh, 32 cars in the 139 bracket. So uh, they've gone slightly slower than their qualifying in Super Bowl times. So the 39s have not come to the fore just yet, but those possibly could come into play later on in this race. Um, you're gonna have to get the quicker drivers into those cars, the Jordan Shirts of the world. Um, and of course, the teammates to the drivers in those cars right now. Take nothing away from Pfeffer, Boothby, Fadafelder, Risi, uh, Shumansky, uh, Shumantinsky, uh, Onanati, and uh, Krural. Those are the guys who are going to have to uh, just keep the, the pace uh, consistent. But if necessary, there's a possibility, and we heard from GMAX and uh, via Mike as well, um, that when needed, the faster drivers might be put into the cars to go and do some quick stints. To try and make up some ground if necessary. Yeah. Um, wait, can, can you repeat your question real quick? No, I was just, I was, it was not a question. I'm just stating the fact that right. the guys are, are, are currently lapping in the 41s. And if necessary, uh, the quicker drivers could be put into the car to try and make up some ground if possible. And uh, basically, you're going to have the, those opportunities to those drivers, like the likes of Jordan Sherrod, for instance. If that lead car fell into trouble, they might throw Jordan in earlier to try and get quicker lap times in there because he's got the ability to lap in the 39s consistently. Yeah, also consistency comes into play. So uh, if you have a very consistent driver, you may have to st may stick him in there uh, just to force less mistakes and uh, less issues for the team. So we're into another battle here between Jordan Daly and the Lamborghini and he's fighting hard on Fraser Cooper's tail again. Those two have not given up uh, that little fight for what is 25th place on track. Top 25 in a 24 hour might not be a bad place to be. I don't know if you guys have, no, they've just got a little bit of a glitch there, but uh, back again. Uh, my, my screen just went gray for about a second and then came back again. So uh, we're back in it again. Yeah, and uh, we're at Kailami, it's a 24 hour, the pure storage Kailami 24 hour. In partnership with Solidarity E-Race and powered by Raceface in association with NEC Corporation, Data Sciences Corporation, Oxide, Racing Club International, Supermicro, and AMD. And we are racing in Assetto Corsa Competizione. It's Greg Maloney, the voice of choice with you at the moment. And we've got Clark King, our young protege from the Solidarity E-Race commentator search in the studio with me at the moment. And Clark, things going pretty much according to plan, I would say, for most of the teams. There are a couple of guys who are concerned. We've had only one retirement at this point in time, which is a good sign. Yes, uh, because it's the, the the virtual world, you could push your car much more because there's less risks of injury and all that. So you can you could have some uh, some uh, little paint uh, paint sharing and all of that. I mean, it's, it's it's incredible to see these guys these guys come out here at uh, at uh, our local track here in South Africa, the world of motorsport Kailami and just watching this action-packed um, as I said earlier rush hour traffic uh, for for the next uh, couple of hours yeah, I'm loving the fact if you look on the right hand side of your screen you can see that track map with all the uh, cars in full flight at different parts of the circuit there is literally no longer an opportunity for a clear lap if you're in a lead car you're gonna have traffic on every single pass of the circuit and uh, we have now completed a, a, a huge amount of laps as well, which is great to see. I was, I was speaking about it earlier on, and I'm not quite sure if Mike uh, heard me when I mentioned it a bit earlier on. But uh, there is a couple of guys who are predicting over 800 laps of racing in the next 24 hours or next 21 and a, hours and 11 minutes. It'll be incredible to find that out if you can, Mike. That'll be great. But uh, there are a couple of guys that, that are starting it on our on our live stream feed and saying, you know, possibilities of over 800 laps completed by the time we finish this up, that would be absolutely incredible. Yeah, that would be incredible. Um, well, just uh, some information. We're about to head into the 100th lap. The leader, 
uh, George Boothby has just completed the 98th lap. We are extremely close to getting to that 100 lap mark. That'll be good. 100 laps and uh, 21 hours still to go. That's pretty much good timing. Yep. They're in for a chance of possibly over that. Uh, Mike, you got some information? Oh, 800 and... RCI 24 hour. Lots of rain. Still got 816 laps in. With no rain at this point, and doesn't look like any rain going to be predicted for the next couple of minutes, couple of hours, there's a good possibility that we uh, could still be in with a chance of over 816 laps in the dry. Uh, and also, uh, I think I think something that we need to bring up here, as it's a 24-hour race, there's, as soon as they hit the nights, then you do not want your teammate to crash on the nights that because you're probably resting your body, you're starting to relax and everything, and then boom, something happens to your team and you have to get all energized and everything, and that is never a good thing to do. I, told, um, I know that from my side of things, uh, I kind of lived for 24 hours on bar one, which is a, a chocolate bar here in South Africa for Mike's uh, edification. And uh, their, their payoff line is uh, for a 25-hour day. So you have bar ones is what I would have on the sideline, along with uh, some energy drinks. Uh, Monster was normally the, the option that I would go with. But uh, when I'm actually racing, uh, there's nothing better than uh, the mixture of uh, the stock standard Coca-Cola and water. It gives you the, the liquid that required to replenish your liquids and, of course, gives you the sugar that you need to keep your energy levels up. Yeah, for sure. And also now, just halfway through the lap, <laughs> Uh, of uh, halfway through the 99th lap, so close to reaching that 100 uh, lap mark. And also, as you said, uh, it's 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 uh, it's a bit different to race. Uh, it's a bit, it's quite different to race in the virtual world and in the real world. The the kind of uh, differences between the drinks you'll get. Obviously, sometimes you'll have a, your girlfriend or something waiting in the house to give you a nice cup of hot chocolate or some coffee. <laughs> exactly. Or your wife will bring you a cup of tea and a hot dog for lunchtime. Right, so it looks like JP de Villiers is coming to join us there from Super Micro. Uh, JP, you in the studio with us? Okay, Afternoon to you, bud. Uh, massive thanks for your time and uh, for joining us as part and parcel of our associate sponsorship for this event. Um, the biggest question I've got for you right from the word go, and I'm going to throw it out to you, is I had no idea, and I'm sure that a lot of people don't know, what is Super Micro? Yeah, so Super Micro is a, a leading innovator in high performance, high efficiency server technology. You know, we, we provide end-to-end -end, uh, computing, green computing to, uh, for the data center, um, cloud computing, enterprise IT, uh, big data, H and embedded markets. So that's that's quite a quite a mouthful. And we, we also provide high performance workstation and gaming solutions you know, for accelerated work. This, this platform is literally right down your alley then, isn't it? Most certainly. Um, I mean, we, we are a hardware designer and, and manufacturer at heart. You know, our CEO and, and founder, he's still with the company and, you know, he, he's still involved in, in, the designing, in the designing process. So um, we, we're not involved in these type of platforms directly necessarily, but so many of our partners use our technology whether it be for for gaming themselves you know a lot of guys buying our gaming products or in the cloud so there's so many data data centers and environments that use our technology um, to build these type of platforms of course one of your partners being involved with this event as well is amd how does that partnership work between the two companies yeah so amd is is one of our, our great partners and I mean, they they so so innovative um, these days, and and really growing from from strength to strength. Um, so we you know we work very closely with them um, to design GPU servers uh, and normal normal compute servers, um, you know, to be the top of the line, the top of the range.
Uh, JP, mm -hmm. JP, I think we lost you there. We'll try and get you back on. I, I think you're back again. Just to continue on your thoughts there. The uh, the two uh, the two companies coming together and working together as a, as a partnership. Yeah, so I mean, we we see see that the demand for for high GPU performance is growing, and larger scale multiplayer games is is so demanding, and there's there's low latency needed for these things, and um, you know the the high graphics is becoming ever more lifelike. So Supermicro and AMD are so so excited to lead lead the industry in, in innovation. So um, you know streaming games will become much more mainstream and virtual reality uh, will most probably increase fivefold over the, the next five years. So we, we're so, so keen to be involved in, in these type of projects, events. Uh, have you ever been involved in, in an endurance race in the past or in, in real racing before as well? That's a, that's a good question. So, um, you know, do, do the 24-hour Lamar's scale electric races that, that I'm my cousin's kids had in my parents' living room. Does that count as a as a endurance? Of course it does. <laughs> of course it does. You're talking to a man who has a massive model collection, and all my scale electric cars are right in front of me as we speak. That counts more than most. <laughs> yeah, we, uh. we, we we absolutely love that. So that's that's more old school, if I can call it that. That wasn't that wasn't gaming, um, you know, on the console or in these sim kits or or rigs that the guys have these days. But you know. Um, Many many moons ago, I did actually go to Kailami with my dad. I, I can't quite remember which which races it was. I mean, it was a it was a small lad, but I absolutely absolutely loved it. And I, I wish I could go back um, at this stage. But the solidarity e race is so realistic. I mean, it it absolutely makes up for the fact that I can't be trackside. We definitely are pushing those the envelope of, of the reality side of things when it comes to the sim format and the, and the collaboration between our partners and our, our broadcast team that are involved here. And, of course, the ability that uh, Assetto Corsa Competizione gives us from a broadcast aspect. You know, there are a lot of games out there. There are a lot of uh, versions of sim racing that happen. But uh, I, I certainly have seen various options that are available. And, and one of the best in terms of a broadcast ability is, is the ACC version. Um, we would love to have you, of course, on the sideline of, of Kyle Army or any of the racetracks around the country. And, of course, as soon as, as uh, spectators are allowed back, I'm sure that Ross and the team from Solidarity are going to invite some of the sponsors to come and be part and parcel of events like this. Um, we were just watching Ulrich Gensen, and we still are watching Ulrich Gensen, um, and Clark just watching uh, from, from a commentary point of view. Ulrich get through that pack, as I expected which is really cool to see. Oh. But remember, Auric Enslin won the first uh, Kyle Army event and, of course, has now got an opportunity to test with Universal Motorsport. So we're seeing uh, the, the collaboration between sim racing and real racing from your side, JP, um, now coming into to, to actual real-life racing and opportunities for these guys who are involved in the sim racing world to possibly put their skills into a real race car as well. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think it's, it, like I said, it's so realistic. I mean, I think it transfers back and forth. Some some guys that are involved in the, the racing uh, fraternity can go into the sim racing and, like you said, the other way around uh, as well. So the guys have the, the ability. They, they know where the apex is and where to take the corner. So it's, it's absolutely cool to see how, you know, they go back and forth in the different platforms. Yeah, and you can see how close it's getting right now between this little battle we're watching as uh, Ensign starts to put the pressure onto the back end of the Bentley and try and find a way through there on Crow. It's going to be a tight little battle between them, I'm sure, and maybe some back markers may just come into uh, the assistance of Ulrich Enslin. Uh, final question from, from our side of things. Uh, um, who's your favorite in this race? Well, it's, it, it's a tough one. So AMD, uh, who we, we're partnering with for, for this race, you know, they they involved with Mercedes F1 team. So I'd love to say Mercedes, but looking at the, the race, most of the teams either pick Porsche, Audi, or, or Aston by the looks of things. So I can't really say Mercedes, but uh, I think in this case, I'm going to say uh, Tauro for two reasons. Um, number one, it's a really cool name, like Moby or Deadman, you know, just a one-liner, simple and to the point. Mm. Um, and then and secondly, I've always had a soft spot for, for Paul. 
So let's hope the, the 991 GT3 can bring home the bacon. Oh, magic stuff, man. JP De Villiers, thank you so much for your time, bud. And uh, please pass on all our massive thanks to Supermicro and AMD for the partnership and uh, associate sponsors here with our Solidarity E-Race. The Pure Storage Kyle Army 24-hour in association with Solidarity E-Race and powered by Raceface. We'll see you soon, and uh, thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of the, the next 21 hours. Awesome stuff. Thanks a lot, Greg. Yeah, we, we're having a Brian watching the race. It's, it's super epic, man. Lovely stuff, buddy. That's, that's exactly what you need to be doing. If you were at Kyle Army, you'd be on the sidelines and uh, Brian on the sidelines and watching all the race action. Uh, Clark, we've got another hour of racing to go, but uh, I believe that we've been able to get hold of Yvonne. And uh, Mike, if you can bring her in, that'll be really cool. Um, she's coming across Yvonne. Hello. First of all, one of our only lady drivers of the event. More importantly, ma'am, I am absolutely astounded to hear that you are a driver with a small disability. And I say a small one because disabilities can have <laughs> major impacts or minimum impacts. I'm never going to put a, a, a quantity on on, the, on that uh, disability, but I believe there is a disability involved. Yeah, that's true. Well, it's a little bit of a dis disability. I can't feel my feet or my under legs. So, um, yeah, I'm driving with pedals and see on my other screen what I'm doing. That is incredible. So, so take us through the setup. What does it What does it look like from your side of things? What have you got in front of you? What are you What are you using as as your rig for this event? Uh, well, I have um, a 49 inch screen, and uh, above I have another screen, and uh, there I have a special hut on to see what I'm doing uh, with my pedals and the tire temperatures and the fuel. Everything is on it, so I'm always uh, good prepared, and. Um, I'm driving with a uh, bit of Fanatec stuff. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask the question because I have no qualms in asking this kind of question to uh, people with disabilities. What 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 happened? How, how did you end up with a disability? Uh, well, I uh, had a back surgery and uh, then it happened. So there was a complication in that back surgery, yeah. and that's, that's what ended up. Okay. Yeah. And 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 from the accent, uh, I, I, I hate giving this one because this is the one that always gets me into trouble. Uh, German or Austrian? No, from the Netherlands. Oh, oh exactly. Wow. See, that's why I don't want to go that route. <laughs> I can't so, speak German. Oh, I can't. I know. Just the accent. The accent was what, what was getting me. So from the Netherlands, of course. Um, must be a Verstappen fan. Then. He's good. Yeah, we are uh, very excited about it when he uh, was joining uh, Formula One. And I like to watch it already before, I think already for 20 years. But it's more alive in the Netherlands now than it was before. So that's a good thing. Yeah, I'm sure. And it, it really is cool. Uh, Clark, from your side of things, I know you wanted to ask a few questions. So uh, jump mm -hmm. in, buddy. So, uh, so obviously you have that dif dis uh, disability. Uh, did you know that that uh, was that was going to be a complication with the back surgery? Uh, yeah, it could be. Yes. But uh, if I didn't have it, then I probably wasn't here anymore. So, yeah, I'm glad. To... <laughs> I believe uh, there's another sport that uh, has um, your general interest as well. Um, a bow and arrow or, a, a, or some kind of nature. Um, take us through uh, how that's gone so far in your career. Well, it's going well. Everything is now a bit complicated to the COVID uh, rules. But uh, hopefully in the end of the year, I'm back at the competition. And uh, I will try to go for Paris 2024. The Paralympics. Well, we, we've, got, we've got a man here. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's me. Yeah, I'm lagging a little bit here. Sorry, Mike, apologies for that. I'm not quite sure what went down there, but it uh, looks like there might have been a little interference there. I, I did catch the gist of that, so thank you, Yvonne. Um, are, are you uh, wheelchair bound at this stage, or do you have the ability to still um, get around on, on crutches and stuff, or is it full time in a wheelchair? Uh, no, I'm uh, walking a little bit. Well, walking uh, kind of, <laughs> and uh, it's going okay. And uh, also with the wheelchair, but uh, it's no problem. I can do everything I want to do, and 
that's the most important thing. Well, that's that's the reason I wanted I wanted to ask that question. Um, racing with the GTWR team, and also of course doing your uh, your Olympic hopes uh, in the archery side of things. Um, you know, our our proceeding our proceeds from the driver registration fees for this event are going to South Africa's quadriplegic and paraplegic association. And all the monies that will be raised, of course, go towards purchasing wheelchairs for people that are less fortunate. So to have somebody of, of your caliber and your ability in the car, as well as, of course, uh, possibly going to be representing uh, the Netherlands at, uh, in, in Paris, um, we wish you all the very best. And, and thank you for your thank time you. and spending a bit of extra time with us to, to tell us your story. Yeah, I would like to. Thank you. Magnificent. We wish you all the very best. Good luck with the rest of the race, and uh, we can't Thank wait to you. see you out on Good track. Good luck as well. Yeah, can't wait either. Awesome stuff. Thanks, Yvonne. Hey, Mike, that was a real nice setup there, buddy. Appreciate that one. And uh, it was a really nice uh, sort of way to bring in the fact that we are, of course, uh, giving something back to a very needy cause in the Quad Para Association of South Africa. And to have somebody of that uh, caliber, and, uh, and, and I say caliber because not only is she a great racer, lovely person, but also an Olympic athlete. Unbelievable stuff that we've got involved here in this event. So, Clarky, we're into the race again here, buddy, and uh, things are starting to heat up a bit. As I said, we've, we've kind of concentrated a little bit there on uh, the maneuvers of of um, the Taro team coming through, but we're going back into the field here, and uh, some battles starting to happen in the in the mid-pack as well. Uh, I, I always love to watch mid-pack battles i mean I, just to me it seems a little bit more exciting because uh I, I, they're not really fighting for I, I don't know what you would call it but they're, they're fighting like so hard because they don't need really need to and there's the mistake that uh quail wanted to happen so i guess that's that that's that battle is probably over your bear uh, getting off, going off the track at the cheetah uh corner what's happened here is he just yeah he's touched the I curb Mm. Uh, that's one that's one curb that is your enemy you may not and i can tell you from experience watching it live as well as uh seeing it from the sidelines on some of my teams coming through that corner i've got photos of polos on two wheels through that corner when they clip the curb you don't want to hit that curb at cheetah it will damage your car dramatically yeah that's uh, when i was uh when i was doing some acc a little bit of acc i i was so afraid of that curb like if i got anywhere near i just like stop on the track i would just stomp on the brakes and just stop the vehicle because that curb is it, it's really special you know, just do what i do just hit reset and start again <laughs> <laughs> that way you can get a team in again <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. Uh. yeah so fantastic to have yvonne there how nice was that insight but he uh somebody that has a, a disability in life that's not holding her back in any form or me yeah, uh, it's incredible because she she could basically continue on with her daily life. Uh, as I said, you come back stronger. Now she's competing to get into the Olympics for, for archery. I mean, I, I can barely withstand 50 laps during just one hour of 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 uh, swap cops and a mini enduro. So that's that's amazing. Yeah, you must know it takes a, a lot, and uh, they are very special people. As I said, I'm going to try and get hold of Mark Whittington when. Uh, I finished up the stint and uh, maybe we can get him oh. to come and jump in and chat about uh, his plans. Oh, big problems there. A shape in the yes, background. I think that may have been the Aston Martin. Yeah, lots of. But, uh, L. No, seven, let's see. Oh, no, it's a. Uh, oh, there we go. Justin Lotus. We'll have a look at it from a, from a replay point of view. Third gear. He comes down a second, comes yeah. in, clips the curb out of shape. And then he just goes inside wall and reverses into the outside wall as well. So. That was a big one. That was a big moment. He was on for a good lap time there as well. But, uh, he's now stricken on the sideline and hopefully he can get going again. You can see, uh, oh, hit, I think he hit R for race there instead of first for going forward. He got going again and he's back on track. We're back live again after a little incident there with Justin Lotus coming out of Cheetah, heading towards Ingwe. He actually got it out of shape there just, just before the pit entrance. So if there was any damage on the car, that was the ideal time to drive into pit lane to get it sorted out. But I don't think he wants to risk losing any more ground out there, which is, of course, how things are going to start to work now. The risk over reward factor starts to come into play now as well, Clark. As you can see, these guys yeah. may try and stay out a little bit longer, even though there is a little bit of damage to their cars, so they don't have to take another pit stop. 
Uh, yeah, it, it really is. They, they, they want to stay out. They want to push. They want to give their best towards the end. And I, th I think that's what a lot of drivers are planning to do. They just push towards the end of the stint. And when they get on that in lap, they just tell their drivers, just go, 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 go. Because you want, you want your driver, you want your teammate to pull a gap from the car that you're battling with. That's exactly what Boothby is trying to do here. Trying to pull away now from his teammate and try and close that still 15 second gap. So Feffa is doing something spectacular in that car, I've got to tell you. Maintain a 15 second lead, got to be for about 30 or 40 laps, is, is something pretty spectacular in terms of, of the ability of the driver and of the team to keep him ahead. I think a lot of times what these guys will be watching for as well is they may be watching our feed, spotting um, uh, where drivers could be having issues. Here's Ulrich Enslin once again, starting to make his way. He's onto the back end of that Bentley. Nice little fight here for uh, eight and seven and eighth place. And Ensign now applying the pressure onto the back of the Bentley. He's been doing that for a couple of laps. And as we saw earlier on, Clark, you'll, you may see the Bentley back out, give him a bit of room to play, let him get in front, and then apply the pressure and return the favor, as I said. And I've said that on numerous occasions, I know, but that's exactly what happens. They, they, they tend to reverse the role. From being pressurized, they become the person applying the pressure. Yeah, I, because I, as I said, I I love the Bentleys, so I just want him to push, push, push. I don't want, I don't want him to give way at all. He's not giving way. He's uh, making that uh, aircraft carrier of his. What do you call it? The battleship, or the boat, eh? The boat, yeah. Boat's pretty. The boat's pretty wide at the moment, and uh, Al Army, the home of Porsche, that Porsche is battling to find a way through on the Bentley. Yeah. Staying on board with him now. Let's have a look and see. Now let's have a look at a lap here from uh, Ulrich Enson's point of view. Our Kyle Army Solidarity E-Race 1 winner. And he comes down to Crowthorn onto the back end. And our home team, of course, uh, the highest home team, other than, of course, the man out front as part of that international team with Jordan Sherritt, part and parcel of the, the lead team at this point in time. But right now, they go through barbecue, through Yuxke, up to the top of the hill, and now uh, onto the back straight away. Nice little run here on the back straight. See, just an ease off. It's not really a break. They're just ease off the pedal and then back onto the throttle halfway through sunset corner uh sunset this afternoon if we go according to plans should be about half past five six ish and that's when you'll start to see that uh, the light come into play we go on the splitter cam here to the s's still on board here with ulrich for the tyro racing team trying to find a way through here on the bentley but, uh Crow is doing such an incredible job i can tell you something nice line heading up the hill there coming out of uh, Ulrich Enslin. It's a good line to come into the triple apex. There's a triple apex left-hander that comes out of Leokop. Gets you up onto the outside of the circuit for the run down the mine shaft. This mine shaft is uh, second fastest part of the track. It used to be the fastest. And uh, in uh, many forms of motorsport that I've seen here at Kyle Army, there's only one person who's gone through that corner flat out. And that was Kevin Schwantz on his uh, Suzuki yeah. in MotoGP. And that was a long time ago that we had MotoGP at Kyle Army. This is what it looks like coming out of Cheetah, running a little bit wide, but uh, just clipping the edge of the grass. And then late on the brakes into Ingwe Corner. For people that are from an international point of view, Ingwe is the Zulu word for leopard. And uh, he completes the lap behind the Bentley again. And pushing hard to try and find a way through, but hasn't found it just yet, as Mike would say. And also we should touch on the penalties because we've got a lot of penalties uh, coming in. Number 42, 20 seconds for blue flags. Um, on lap 61 uh, again number 42 now 30 seconds for blue flags on uh, lap 83 obviously didn't learn his lesson there uh, mm -hmm. number 962 uh, five second penalty for avoidable contact on lap 54 that's the second time he's been given a penalty if i'm not mistaken and he's in the top 10 so he cannot afford to be making those kind of mistakes buddy hey he shouldn't be he's he i guess he's pushing a little bit too hard obviously you need to uh, keep control of your car but uh yeah he's i think he's been uh, 962 has been a little bit all over the place uh number 344 also got another avoidable penalty this time on lap three uh, lap 53 sorry 10 seconds uh number 505 you got 10 seconds for ignoring blue flags and an avoidable contact on lap 60 also on lap 60 uh, um number car number 367 five seconds for avoidable contact on lap 60 as i mentioned uh number 420 20 seconds for crashing into the leader i think uh 
can't remember when that was. I, I recall seeing that. Can't remember on lap. Uh, can't remember on uh, lap 61. Uh, Car number 192, the second time they've been given a, a 10 second penalty for avoid, avoidable contact on lap 69. Number 367, five seconds for avoidable contact, lap, lap 79, also on lap 79. Car number 999, 15 seconds for avoidable contact, and a, number 158 for avoidable contact on lap 49. Lots of penalties being awarded there, and it means that the stewards are working frantically, which means that we are staying within the rules of this race, which is brilliant stuff. That's exactly what we expected to happen. Speaking of the rules of the race, well, we've got uh, some antics in the, the battle for the top 20. Uh, Mark Antle in his Bentley starting to put a bit of pressure on. I also just want to bring in a, a little bit of a shot, if we can, from Mike's side of things, just to find uh, our, our good friend George Boothby out there. Um, if you can just find him out on circuit for me, we've got a, a comment that got thrown at us and it's a really nice comment because of the uh, association we have with our uh, lead sponsor, Pure Storage. Of course, George is the official international ambassador for uh, the Pure Storage Kyle Army 24 hour. And uh, if you want to catch up with him on his personal feed, um, you can get onto the UK OG Monkey uh, personal feed on Twitch. And uh, you can catch up with what's happening with uh, George and probably see some of the uh, the in-car footage that he's got and maybe even see him in his rig going at it uh, as he uh, pilots his Audi in second place. We're on board with him at the moment. I'm talking about uh, these are the kind of things that you can play around on Twitch. You can go and have a look on uh, the various camera angles from his car and possibly even see him in his rig uh, chatting to his team and, and getting the insights that, of course, uh, Ross is picking up and uh, throwing our way as well. So I appreciate that. And uh, once again, a massive thanks to uh, the international um, ambassador for Pure Storage 24 Hour, George Boothby. We're on board with him now. Oof, a little bit uh, on the curb there as he yeah. came out of Cheetah yeah. into Ingwe. No, it is the Pure Storage Car Army 24 Hour Association with Solidarity Race and powered by Raceface. We are into the uh, fourth hour of 24 and it's uh, 20 hours and 43 minutes still to go. It's been a huge amount of action so far on track and a lot mm. more still to come your way as we're getting into the thick of it now. And there's wow. a move from Ensolin as he found a way past, he has. Ensolin has found a way through eventually to get ahead of the Bentley and up into the top seven. So he's got about three positions to make up. Let's have a quick look at that from an action replay point of view. He sets things up coming out of uh, Crowthorn. He's gonna dive on the inside, there it is, on the inside of Barbecue. And makes it stick onto the back straight. Brilliant stuff. Good, good driving there from him, and uh, nice little setup. You can see he knows his way around Kyle Army. Yeah, definitely. That was an incredible move. So heading up to the top of the hill, and a couple more penalties being thrown in there. Looks like uh, Crow has been given a five-second penalty. Silvassa has been given a five-second penalty. In fact, it looks like it may be a little bit more than five seconds on Crow. I think it might be a, a fifteen-second. And my screen is not clear. Clear. Honorati has been given a 10 second penalty as well. So uh, what are those penalties for, Clocky? You can jump in and, and give us the heads up on to what those penalties are for, if you don't mind, buddy. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Three, six, seven. I think that's that was for five seconds for avoidable contact, no? Oh, that's uh, no, it's a 10 second on yeah. that one now. So it could be a slightly different penalty we're looking at on that car. Yeah. Just to say, it doesn't really matter at this stage, because uh, as we heard from Mike, in his commentary uh, when GMAX stepped out. Uh, most of those penalties will be sorted out when the guys come to do their pit stops. So they're not actually uh, kept until the end of the race and added to their race times. They're actually allowed to uh, take those penalties and um, affect those penalties while they're in the pit boxes if they need to. Yeah, that's that's very uh, nice that they give you they give you a chance to just get rid of those penalties, get that extra weight off of your shoulders. It is something that you have to try and avoid, though, if possible, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that is correct. I don't want to make any more of those mistakes. Unnecessary mistakes can be costly, and uh, it's come down to 13 seconds now. Boothby is closing that gap down ever so slightly for the lead of this race. Ulrich Enslin is extending his lead over the Bentley that he's come through on that one. He's opened up almost one and a half seconds there, which is pretty good. Wojciech Zazeki is now in the Lamborghini. A little bit of a technical issue there on their Lamborghini, but looks like they've got that sorted out and are back on track in the th in 37th place. It's about 15 or so positions in there in their attempt to get that technical issue sorted out. So 
hopefully that's all sorted and they can continue on their merry way fighting for a top 40 finish here some top 40s in the past in the solidarity e-race 40 shootouts that went down to top 20s that went down to top 10s we've uh, we've really changed the way things are done i don't I know that Mike's in the background, he can probably hear us, but uh, Clark, the one thing that you've enjoyed and possibly uh, taken from what I've enjoyed the most about being involved with Solidarity e-races in the past and the events that we ran through lockdown is the variation of races that we did. It's not just stock yeah. standard sprint races, it's not just stock standard endurance races, it's not just stock standard races in any form or, or of nature. We've really played around with different options as to, uh, as to how to do things in the sim racing world. And of course, now in partnership with Race Face, our whole broadcast team, first time in South Africa, a 24 hour race in some race. Yes, that is incredible. Obviously, we've, we've, we, it's incredible to see how you can mess around with some racing. And I remember the first thing that I was uh, uh, in was um, the Comte Search, the Nordschleifer affair. Then we did the superhero thing, which I think was arguably one of the best ones to watch. It was incredible and uh the two drivers that i recognize that are here today the the the, the vet brothers or twins if i'm yes. not mistaken are also racing here and then we had the british it with the gt3s and gt4s that was also incredible having uh national heroes and some local uh, uh some uh, local heroes and some uh international and now we're here uh with the 24 hour which is uh, as you said the first ever uh 24 hour east um sim race ever in south africa yeah, certainly working well there we go speaking of south africa that's daniel rowe at the wheel of the south african flag liveried bentley m sport as it comes through the s's the man who's done a couple of laps around kyle army in his race career that is for sure and of course uh, one of our top contenders in the world of global touring cars here in south africa he is a teammate to the current champion in the global touring cars uh, wayne uh, keegan masters i beg your pardon so those two teammates in the Volkswagen Golf GTI 8s and hopefully get to see them on track uh, in a few weeks time as they head down to East London Grand Prix circuit here in South Africa as part of round two of the South African Endurance Series. Those Golf GTI 8s are going to be involved in that uh, race meeting as well. We don't have any Golf GTIs or any Volkswagen products out on track, but we do have some Volkswagen associated products on track with Lamborghini and Bentley and of course Porsche, all out of the AG group. At this point in time, it is a uh, Audi that leads things out. Also, another member of that magnificent uh, array of motor cars from the AG Group. And there he is, right on cue. Oh, I think this Mike Jones is pretty good in terms of listening to our commentary. Eh? Seems to pick up on exactly what we're talking about, eh, Clock? How does that work? Yeah. <laughs> I don't <want> no clue. <laughs> uh... Tobias Pfeffer in full flight to the top. And it looks like he may have a little bit of clear air here for a while. He comes out of... Uh, Triple left hand at Leokop. There's not a car in sight heading down the hill. That gives him this is this is exactly what the leader needs at this point in time. He needs some clear air, open up the lungs of that little Audi and just give it everything he can to try and open that margin again over Boothby in second. I think he's the only car that has fresh air in front of him. Uh, I think he's also uh, looking at the track map. Yeah, it's obviously oh he's into the pits. So he's uh, about to do a driver change. When was his last time he went to the pit box lap 78 was the last time so around about 30 laps or so was the last time uh, they went into the pits and uh George here's Boothby the lead change lead. Yeah. yeah lead change about 40 laps ago so uh, coming across the line and boothby will take the lead of the race um i do believe that uh, there's a possibility we may be chatting to george a bit later on this evening i think uh GMAX and Mike might have set that up, but I'm not going to take away any of their thunder, but that'll be a really nice interview to pick up on. And if you are watching now, you may want to tune in for that later on this evening to pick up on the man who now leads our uh, pure storage car, Army 24, George Boothby, in the Sidemax Motorworks Audi. And that is the car, of course, who started in pole position. So they've now returned to the front after a long time away from the front end of the field. But uh, as he comes back on track, uh, Giorgio Simeone coming back in. Interesting. I wonder if they're saving Mr. Sherritt for the night sessions. There is a strategy uh, we need to look at as well, because we haven't seen Jordan Sherritt at the wheel of the car yet, have we? No, we haven't. Uh, obviously, we were talking about earlier about uh, they want uh, some drivers want to. Uh, we were talking about Jordan Sherritt maybe just being thrown in just to uh, catch up a little bit and 
just maintain that gap to uh, the, the Sidemax Motorworks car. Uh, I, yeah, I think John Sherritt may go for the night stint because he's he's a very consistent driver. It's, it's something that I've seen in various forms of motorsport, particularly in endurance racing. You have a guy who is a night specialist, and particularly when you are racing at night, and I'm talking about the Kyle Army 9 now, I'm talking about the the, uh, the Bike SA and uh, um, Motor Rider World 24 hours that I've been involved in. The night specialists tend to be kept on their own and left aside to get as much rest as they can, so they can basically pump in the laps overnight where the guys battle with visibility, where the guys battle with concentration levels. A little race replay here of Honorati coming up on the uh, back end of the Aston Martin. Mantinsky about to be overtaken, and there you have it. Great bit of maneuvering, great onboard shot as well. Thanks for that one. Nice to see it from an onboard point of view heading down. And then, of course, the rear wing shot showing that uh, that has been cemented and the pass has been done. Sherman Tinsky and Honorati swapping positions out there. 10 second penalty still to be applied onto Honorati's car when he comes into the pit lane. And now he's uh, moved up one position inside of the top five. So that's always a nice position to be in. Top five is always good to be in, but inside the top five, your first four cars on track, there is where the battle could lay by the end of 24 hours. Yeah, and also, uh, interesting um, uh, information here. Finally, um, Ricky is came into the pits to uh, driver change. Obviously, the, the driver in the top uh, four, that didn't, that didn't the last pit stop for the team was lap 38. So he's finally come into the pits for that driver change. I think he eventually got hold of the team principal and said, listen, I've had enough. Can I please come in? I need to do what Mike did a couple of hours ago. Need a little relief break, please. <laughs> <laughs> but he's yeah. back on track and uh, out of the pit box. So it looks like those pit, the pit lane activity has been pretty uneventful, I've got to say. Only in races like yeah. this, when you're in the real world, things tend to get a bit frantic in there. But of course, fortunately, with the, the way that the sims work, and let's have a look at it as, as we're seeing a, a move here from George Boothby to come into pit lane. Boothby would have uh, tried to get as many fast laps under his belt as he could see if they could overtake this car and keep that overtaking maneuver remember he's come in now having taken the lead of the race he's got about a quarter of the lap to get that pit stop done before Simeone comes through and retakes the lead is there going to be enough time yet this is going to be very tight between the two of them keep an eye on both of them I can see the chopping and changing between the shots of the car coming for second place possibly to first the man in pit lane We'll have to keep the pit lane limiter on, remember, until he exits the pit and goes into that white line. He's going to lose the lead of the race here, but it's going to be by only a couple of seconds. So that 15-second interval he had to make up as they went into the pit box. He leaves the pit box now and gets into pit lane. Exits pit lane. Let's have a look and see. Yep, yeah, there we go. Simeone's just gone through and heads down to Crowthorn as he gets on the power and out of the pit lane. So it's probably going to be about a 10-second uh, gap there between the two cars as they chopped and changed in their pit box and their, their scheduled pit stops that were required for the two Audis at the front end. And I don't think I don't think the Cymax Motorworks team, it seems like George Boothby is also still in the car so maybe just it's added some feel. Call there. Could possibly in for a little splash and dash but I think while he was in there he did everything he needed to do. Otherwise he may have been out a bit quicker than that. So let's have a look and see what that gap will be like by the time they come through one of the interchange. Okay, it's 13 seconds. So they didn't really make up any time or lose any time doing the top two. Other than a couple of laps, where we had a change in the leadership. But the leadership remains between those top three Audis. And in fact, the four Audis at the front now, with Honorati moving ahead of the uh, Aston Martin, is now making it uh, four. Uh, four rings of four Audis at the front end. Literation yep. aside. Very, yeah, and also uh, fourth play, from fourth down to eighth place, everyone flooded into the pits. Cornell and Steel Vase and uh, taking their penalties as they just disappeared. So they're going to be wait, having to wait in the pit box for a little bit longer. May drop down into maybe like maybe 11th or 12th uh, Cornell, but uh, it's still here. Everyone now flooding out the pits. Who's that coming out? I think that is, I can't see. Is that, yes, it is uh, um, Radloff. Chris Radloff, Chris Radloff, yeah. Chris Radloff from uh, East London. He's, uh, of course, an uh, East London local. 
and has mm. spent many hours around the East London Grand Prix circuit. A couple of uh, times he's been here in real racing, I'm sure, at Kyle Army Grand Prix circuit. But as you said, good pick up there in terms of the top 10 all coming in at the same time to do their, their pit stops together to try and not lose any ground to the men or uh, ladies involved in front or behind them. I think a couple uh, of changes yeah. in the drivers as well. Sorry, Clarky. Uh, yeah, Bettini in the Audi 9 4. Uh, yeah, there's there's a couple of different strategies here because you can see some car, uh, some teams changing uh, driver and some of them coming in for some fuel, maybe some tyres. And Enslin is going uh, is going to be put under pressure from uh, Honorati. Yeah, Honorati now applying the pressure onto the back end of the Porsche, as you can see, and a little bit of pressure now coming from Jan Honorati on Ulrich Enslin. Kraus dropped down into seventh. Keeble now in the. Uh, Second of the Aston, or the first Aston Martin, I should say, there into eighth place. Vessels in ninth in the Audi. And uh, Villain up into uh, the top ten, just ahead of Krunwald and the Van der But uh, side by side action here with Keeble. Took to find a way through, and uh, it looks like he may have just to uh, hang tight there for a bit because it didn't quite work out for him. Maybe giving way to that driver a little bit more easier than what he wanted to. But uh, in the background, he's got some back markers. In fact, he's going slower. There's a problem here on Simon Keeble's car. He's just about to be passed by the Lexus. Now, that's a back marker that's closing in on him and passing him at ease. So Simon Keeble's got a problem on that Aston Martin. I'm not quite sure what's gone wrong there. Can we go on board with him? Just see if it's Stuck in fifth. Yeah, They're stuck in fifth good. gear. That's not good. So he may have to go in for another uh, unscheduled stop to try and get that car sorted out. Yeah, you don't want to be stuck in gear because that obviously, not only is that going to make you slow and have have you have to make a uh, um, an unsche uh, unscheduled uh, pit stop, it's also going to damage the gearbox a slight bit, which is not good for the long run. If he rolls in, he does. He does indeed. Oh, look at that. Look at that lap time. Four and a half minute lap. He can't. Oh, oh no, this could be a problem here. Yeah. He's going to battle to get the pit lane limiter engaged as well, which might give him another penalty, which he may have to incur. I think if he does speeding in the pit lane, if I'm not mistaken, according to my understanding of the rules, would be a, another drive-through. Drive-through penalty. So, okay, okay. Even, even worse, a stop go of 30 seconds. That's a huge, huge loss there. So he's going to try and bring it in and, and stop it if he can. On fifth gear. It would have been over five-minute lap. He's been able to stop the car. I don't, I don't think he can stop the car. There we go. There go. Nice. He eventually brings it to a rest. Simon Keeble dropping down 11th place, though. He loses six positions in the uh, the uptake of that maneuver that he tried to pull there. And unfortunately, getting stuck in fifth gear with some work to do now for his team and the setup on that car to get it right and hopefully get that gearbox sorted out. Uh, yeah, I hope I hope that issue resolves. Uh, and I want to see another retirement. Uh, maybe sw swapping the drivers may solve the issue, but I don't know. Uh, we don't know what's happening uh, behind the scenes there with uh, um, with Keeble and all of his teammates. Honorati and Enslin still pushing each other to the absolute limits. They are so close together, and I I'm gonna I'm gonna give kudos to whoever. Uh, who? Yeah, it is a driver's state change. It wasn't? Oh, okay. So Keeble's so Steyl Vason came into the pits for a driver change for Keeble's. He's just changed back, but. Keebles didn't do a full lap, did he not? Oh, there's contact. Look at that, he runs contact. wide and contact. And here comes oh, Honorati no. on the inside. Honorati trying to find a way through. He just squeezes through between those two cars. And very lucky to avoid uh, the, uh, the stricken Aston Martin on the outside. I wonder if that car still got problems. It looks like it may still have the same problem. Stuck in fifth gear. No, he's stuck in fourth. Oh, not that... Whether or not it is stuck in fourth or not. But uh, it looks like there's a gearbox issue on this car. And uh, that could be... Okay, he's fine, he's fine. Oh, no, he's got full gears again. He's got full gears again. He's just getting back into the rhythm. That is the lead car, if I'm not mistaken. No, second place. Boothby's just gone through on him. Boothby. G6 just squeezing through and getting ahead. But just up the road from Boothby, I don't think it's... Oh, no, it's a lot more than what I thought. I saw a second black Audi, and I was just caught up with the wrong black Audi. It's going to be only there, 14 seconds up the road. So the lead car with 124 laps about to be completed here in the Pure Storage Kyle Army 24-hour. Oh. Winner. Okay. Uh, the rail getting out of shape. Yeah, Let's cheetah. Have a look at it. Probably gone the car. It comes in much. here. Oh no, you're just going out of shape. And there you go. You clip that curve, you're gonna, gonna end up in tears. And he ends up in the kitty litter. Fortunately, he didn't hit the wall. So he'll just have a bit of uh, brie underneath the car and possibly some uh, dirt on the tires, which will take about half a lap to get uh, back up to 
optimum working condition. Honorati once again on the back end here of Enslin, coming across the line to complete 124 laps of action. Yeah, that is, wow, 20 hours left of this race, 124 laps completed, that is brilliant. I think George Boothby, the two cars that are in front of him, is Honorati on Enslin, and Honorati is going to go down the inside of Enslin. Quite a late move, but I think he may just make it stick going into turn two, Crawford. Uh, a very uh, famous oh. one, and Enslin doesn't look happy with it because he's flashing his lights. Oh, uh, a little bit of a... Uh, that may go to the stewards. I don't think Enslin's happy with that. That was a very late move, though. I don't but think there's anything wrong with it. Ooh, a little Gave bit him a little tag there. coming on the exit. You know, a little tag yeah. on the exit, and that's why the lights were flashing. Um, it's a pity we can't see the gesticulations on board, hey, uh, Mike? That would be really cool, hey? Because I think there may have been a few gesticulations that uh, normal motor racing, real-world drivers would have made at that point in their career, telling uh, how, how happy or unhappy they were about a certain maneuver being pulled on them. Yeah, we're on board with Honorati. Yeah, he's not going to make any gesticulations. He's going to try and keep it as smooth as possible as he exits the uh, YXK and barbecue section, heading up into sunset. The move has been made, and Honorati is now up ahead of Enslin into the top five. So great bit of driving there from Jan Onorati to get ahead of uh, Enslin. And look at the gap he's pulled already. You can see that there was some, some maneuvering happening there. And uh, has he given the position back again? I think he may have. I think he may have. I don't know. I think he's given the position back not to, to possibly avoid the penalty. Uh, maybe. Oh, someone just caught Cheetah there. There was a lot of grass and I think a car cutting through. Yeah, I think uh, we saw... Onorati, I saw uh, just on the end of that race replay, he was pulling over to the side of the track at sunset. So I, I guess it, it didn't look like nothing. It didn't look like anything was wrong. Maybe there was a yellow flag that he didn't want to get an illegal overtake, but he's given the place back. And Onorati is so far behind now. He's 1.4 seconds behind. But he's also got uh, second place Boothby in between him and uh, Ulrich Enslin. So he's got to find a way through on the second placed car and also try and find a way back ahead of Enslin in fifth place. So, uh, interesting times here, getting into the last part of our stint of commentary, buddy. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that this is the kind of action we're going to be seeing for the next 20-odd hours. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I just, I, I don't know how, I don't, I just don't get how, what was wrong with that move. I still can't put my finger on it. Oh, well, we, I guess we, we may get... Uh, you know, you know, you know what you, what you're going to find here is these guys are so pro at what they do, buddy. They, they realize if they've made a mistake and whether they're going to get penalized for it or not. And if they do know that they're going to get penalized, the best option to do is to give that position back almost instantaneously. That way you avoid the penalty and avoid being taken out by the stewards and given that additional five seconds or ten seconds for an illegal move or for a tap that may seem to us as commentary and as spectators as something that looked like a racing incident but could potentially be something a lot worse when you see it up close and personal from the stewards' point of view. Yes, I, I do agree with you there. And Byron Walker from the uh, White Rabbit Gaming Academy, uh, he's starting to claw in a little bit of a gap to Fandom Ava, so we may have to uh, keep our eyes on mm -hmm. that uh, a little bit later into the race. This is G this is GMAX's team, remember? Yeah, it is. Are they uh, not in the car that GMAX wanted them to be in. You, of course, would prefer yeah. the uh, 911 Porsche. But uh, I can tell you, um, GMAX might eat his words here. Aston is going really well and they've made up a massive amount of ground to get into the top 15. 14th place at the moment and what is it, 1.1 seconds down to uh, the 13th place car there of Fanamadva. Enslin and Onorati going at it again. I think Enslin had to give that, they had to let uh, Boothby through because Boothby was behind Enslin for quite a long time. Um, maybe a little bit too long. Uh, blue blue flags would have been waving so he has to keep that blue flag rule, doesn't he? Yeah, exactly. So I think he w he may have been a, a ahead of Boothby for a little bit too long. Uh, Stewart's may be checking on that. But that's uh, allowed Onorati to get within three tenths of Enslin. And this battle is not over yet. And this is certainly not over. Now that you've got the second place car ahead, there's a good possibility, like we said earlier on, if you get a faster car ahead of you, like Enslin did earlier on to get up to this position he's in right now, He's going to use Boothby and the pace that Boothby's got, as well as his blocking ability. Remember, the blue flags will start waving for Boothby before they do for Enslin, which means that the cars that they're catching and needing to pass are going to get out of the way a lot easier than if Enslin was on his own. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I do see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I and again, I was mentioning this last time. Uh, going through mineshaft and diving into the crocodiles. Kudos to anyone who does a move through there, because that is a very scary part uh, to overtake. And on Arati, maybe the first one, because he is, he is faster than Enslin. It seems like in the sort of middle sector. Yeah. Definitely looks a bit better and a lot more planted as they go through the S's, uh, Leocop and down into Crocodiles, that is for sure. But, uh, the Porsche seems to have the grunt on the straight, which is what is keeping him at the front of this little battle at the moment. But by keeping it at the front, have a look and see what's happening behind. All of a sudden, we're getting uh, a little bit of a concertina effect. And, and yes, that might be still Varsen who's uh, just behind them. But of course, he's using uh, the advantage of having a faster car in front, as we've mentioned. He's using him to pull him through the pack and make up the ground that he needs to to try and catch um, Krunwald, Villain, Vessels and Kral. Yeah, that is... Uh, I, I think he, I, I think he's being really intelligent. He's right on the back of Honorati. And Honorati, as I said uh, the, uh, when I just came in, uh, you don't want drivers to cut into your bubble. And Steel Basin may just be cutting into Honorati's bubble because he's he may... He may you can see an odd skidding here and there and he's blocking him from getting past. Diving into Lukov, Eve wants to take Enslin before Steele can take him. I don't think he realizes that uh, that uh, Steele Varsen is actually not fighting for position. Maybe they'll get onto the uh, communications and let him know. Listen, let him through. Don't don't uh, don't fight with him because he's not involved in the battle with you at this stage. He's just trying to make up the laps and make up the time that he's lost. So why risk the chance of making a mistake? Fastest lap of the race there coming out of Steel Varsen as well to try and make up that ground. And that's why he's putting the pressure onto the back end and realizing that if he can get through on Honorati, he may be able to use both Ensign and even George Boothby to pick up some more ground on the on the cars that he's trying to catch. So of course, it's the Audi, uh, the Aston Martin, and the second Audi there are vessels that he's trying to make up ground on. Yeah, I think it's a good idea that um, Honorati lets him through because um, he, uh, uh, he may get a little bit of... Uh, a toe from Steel Vesson to just claw up to uh, Ansler. There's no doubt about that, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. Byron Walker still going at it, a super run so far from the White Rabbit Gaming Academy car. Aston Martin in full flight and uh, making up the ground now. He's uh, closed the gap down a little bit on Funamava. It's come down to 1.3 seconds between the two of them. Not too much of a, a gap that he has to watch out for. He's actually just up the road. You can see uh, the, I think it's a, sort of a mustardy coloured. Aston Martin is closing in on the back end of. That's the car he's got his sights firmly set on. Just up the road from that, of course, the leading Ferrari now with Muscat at the wheel. Come on, yep. Ferrari. Don't let me down now. Come on, guys. I want, I want, I want Mark Jones to uh, be shouting in my ear at the end of this one. <laughs> no. We, we, we all have our hopes and dreams. You know what I'm saying? Hopes and dreams, hopes and dreams. Yeah, come on now. Come on. A Ferrari on the podium would be amazing, but a Ferrari winning would be incredible. It would get the be. home of Porsche. <laughs> then I can have a real go at G-Max, eh? Then I can have a real go. Uh, Other Muscat, there's the man we're talking about. The leading Ferrari at this point in time. 258 on the side of that car. And uh, running up into the crocodile section. Up the road from him. Just up the road from him. You can actually see uh, uh, he's got some work to do to try and close that gap down. It's a big margin over uh, the Aston Martin he's got to try and bridge big gap he's got to try and bridge as well a couple of uh, guys starting to run off the circuit on a few more occasions than uh, we've seen over the last couple of laps but uh, keep an eye just behind that ferrari because we've got some faster cars coming through once again back to the battle here we go Ooh. Marati now getting through on some of the back markers and uh, using those back markers as advantage give himself a bit of breathing room there over steel a lot but uh, it's about two or three car lengths and that's might be enough just to get away from him yeah uh, it's it's a, it's like they're fighting for position. They are uh, on a route. He's pushing extremely hard. Enzo's pushing extremely hard. And then Steel vason has got um, people behind him. He had to get past the, the Le Lexus for Lexus that came out of the pits. I'm not mistaken when Steel was uh, trying to catch up to Honorati. He's starting to fall back a little bit. I think he was pushing a little bit too hard or maybe the Lexus just ruined his run a little bit. Uh, any, running, any runs that are ruined at this point are uh, crucial. Can't be uh, looking to lose any ground or any time because it all starts to uh, tick into the overall times for the race here at Kyle Army 24 hour. 
Your story each car, Lomi 25. You just joined us. A big welcome to uh, all of our fans on YouTube as well as on our live stream feed on the Facebook feeds going around the world. It's a courtesy of Racing Club International, our broadcast team, and a massive thanks to Pure Storage, our lead sponsor and our associate sponsors, NEC Corporation, Data Sciences Corporation, Oxide, TC, Supermicro, and AMD all in the house for this event. It's uh, Greg Maloney, the voice of choice, and uh, my young protege that we found that uh, incredible commentator search we did in our lockdown period of Solidarity E-Race. Clark King, Mike's side with me here today, looking at George Simeone leading things out. Are your official standings at the moment? Simeone, 130 laps completed now, ahead of George Boothby, who is there in uh, second place, ahead of Crazer in third. The two uh, side max cars doing a super job for second and third. Bettini's in fourth. Enslin is up to fifth place, fighting with Honorati. It's a battle we've been watching for the last couple of laps. Crow up to seventh. Vessels in eighth, and Villain in ninth, ahead of Grunwald. Then the second of the top ten, you've got, of course, Steel Varsen. Muscat fighting hard there for opportunities to come through as well. Ahead of Byron Walker for the uh, GMAX team. That, of course, is the White Rabbit Gaming Academy team. And then a bit further back, you can see even right down to uh, 46th place on track. Still some fights out there. Ferrari 488 GT3 of Heidemann and uh, Henny Otto fighting hard there with him. Steve Koenig, fellow commentator, is at the wheel of the uh, 44th place car there. The AMG AMR V8 Vantage. And of course, I don't know if we can pick up on that car at some point. Just give him a little bit of a time in the sunshine if we can there. That's the number 76 car there, Mike, if you can find him for us. It'd be quite nice just to pick up on our fellow commentator. There he is, running Aston Martin green racing colors with a little bit of purple livery on the side. It's that a little bit of a touch of Hulk I see there, hey? Full and green, that's the Hulk colors for me, bud. You can't go wrong with that, Steve Koenig. Love your work, buddy. Love your work. <laughs> we go on board with him as well. Oh, how is this shot? The drone shot from our uh, producer. Oh, I love your work, Mike Jones. Lovely stuff. <laughs> this is an official. This is an official AMG V8 racing drone, following the AMG AMR V8 Vantage around the circuit. <laughs> this is a proper cool shot, Mike. You, did, you kept this one just for me, didn't you? This is beautiful stuff. How's this? How's this shot, uh, Clark King? Oh, that is wonderful. It's crazy to see um, how much angles and stuff you can get on on these uh, uh, video games. Amazing stuff here. The uh, broadcast ability, as I said, of ACC is probably unmatched in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. I think we've got about 230 odd camera positions that Mike can play around with in the background. So, yeah, massive thanks for that one. And I'm sure Steve Koenig will love this shot. This will probably be up on his uh, Facebook page right after his stint. He's going to go and uh, re-record all this <laughs> and uh, put it up as, a, as an official tag for us. So there you go, Steve Koenig. You asked for a bit of airtime. And have somebody great job keep up the good work down in 44th place but need to stay still in the race mm. and a long way still to go with oh a little touch von Lockerenberg coming together there in the bentley and uh pretty tight stuff there between the bentley and i think that was is that shuman tinsky who's down there it is it is shuman tinsky just got through him why has he dropped all the way back down to there he's lost a lot of ground buddy something has gone wrong there on shuman tinsky's car be a little bit of tech yeah. issues uh, hearing in my in my ear so uh, that is a massive uh, loss. I think at one stage he was in about oh, fifth or sixth place. Oh, oh and uh, there you go. Kermitinsky spinning out. Looks like he might be battling with a couple of technical issues. Let's have a look at the replay. Yeah, he comes out of Crocodiles. And, uh, we're going to go on board with him. Ivan Kermitinsky going into Crocodiles right now. Part of the circuit to uh, get right in any form of motorsport, I can tell you. Run wide, clip the curb. That's perfectly done. Nice line from him there. So no issues so far comes through also just a little touch of the curb there running wide yellow flags into the final quarter that might have what caused him a little bit of an issue as he comes out there he is oh i didn't pull him out to pull the other car but not needless to say a small mistake coming out of the ingwear corner and yet again sherman tinsky drops back even more he's down to 30th place now there's a huge drop he was in the top 10 at one point so there's definitely some kind of issue on that car clock oh I de yeah definitely that's that's obscure because we, we didn't notice him drop down at all. We were too busy looking at the uh, Anselin and uh, Onorati fight. We didn't even realize how far he's dropped down. And now he's dropped, uh, now he's fighting for, 30, uh, for 29th. That's, that's not a good uh, place to be when you were just in the top 10. Just looking at the way that the car seems to be ghosting a little bit, maybe having a little bit of issues with uh, connectability onto the server. I don't know. I don't know all the technical side of things, but there's definitely some kind of tech issue there on that car, which they're probably going to try and drive around. 
if they've got the ability, they can still stay in the hunt for the front of the field if they can get through and back to the to this kind of action, the kind of battle we're seeing right now. Well, it's heating up here big time. Marathi wants through and Ensign saying, well, you're going to have to work harder than that if you want to get past me. And uh, I can tell you something, if there's one man who knows how to place a car to keep the rest of the pack at bay, it's Ulrich Ensign, particularly here at Kailong. He's also, he's also started to claw in on the kind of muscly gold uh, car of Bettini, the Audi. Yeah. So a, a three, a three race, a three horse uh, race here uh, in, for fourth, which is very oh, interesting. For fourth place. Yeah. Exactly. And in fact, just ahead of him is Boothby. Boothby's just got through there on Bettini. So you've got Boothby, Bettini that we're looking at straight back into the eyes and uh, the grill of the Porsche behind him. And the Audi just tucked in behind that. So you've got two Audis in the Porsche. The meat in the sandwich is the Porsche at this point in time. But the second placed Audi is just ahead of them as well. And as I said, he's starting to uh, put the uh, the gaps in there. Ooh. I'm just looking oh at... Oh, there's a big one. It's a big moment Very there. Nice. That was some very Running good reactions out. from them. It's a Ferrari. Could possibly be uh, Sean Ferrari. Ferrari. Ferrari who got out of shape there. So Sean Ferrari getting out of shape there. He of course is part of the. Ooh. I think he's part of the Power Rangers team. Let's have a look and see if he. Uh, if this is him coming down here. Um, no, he's the Audi. It's the Audi. I beg your pardon. It's the Audi. Triple Seven Audi. Of Sean Ferrari comes through there. And as he comes out, he's got windscreen wiper on. I think he might have hit that by accident. Maybe he was looking down oh, to try and find something. No, there you go. It's actually not in there. Triple like, eight yeah. was the car involved. That is okay. That is massive. Everybody very lucky to avoid that car. Yeah, I saw lucky. that happen though, and I just want to get confirmation of it. Um, as we saw that incident happen, I was looking at the timing monitor. This is Vivian Richards in uh, the Marinello machine. That was the car that was involved. That was the. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. Look at here we go. Did it run again? It is. Sherman Tinsky. Sherman Tinsky wow. going up the back end of the Ferrari and tagging him. Oh dear. And very lucky to be avoided there. He's gone back into pit lane. In, in the pits. Um, I think that's Batis Hugo on the pit wall, actually, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, <laughs> just going back to what I was saying here between these guys and the fight that's happening here. As I was watching, I, I'm right. There is Ulifant. He got that Porsche back onto the track. That is oh, definitely wow. the 101 Porsche. So the retired is. Porsche is back on circuit. Um, I don't know if we can get an overall standing at this point in time, just to see what the gap is and how many laps they've lost. I'm right at the back of the field if you can, please, Mike, that'll help us out. In 47th place, so what is the gap? Okay, as he crosses the line, we'll be able to know that. Look, Heidemann, Heidemann is down in 86, oh, well, 84 laps back. Um, so, oof, a lot of work. If, if, if they're even going to get close to the top 10, it'll be an amazing effort from Uli van team it is yeah. fantastic to have the second Porsche back on track though that's all I'm gonna say I picked up on us I, I thought to myself I'm sure I just saw the yellow Porsche then I looked on the timing yeah. monitor and he, he came up and then of course the crash happened and we had to go to that immediately but uh it is good to see that Porsche back on track I wonder what to go ahead of Ensler when did that happen maybe that was ahead of so, oh my boy that's a lot of traffic he is indeed and of uh, Patini <gasps> Oh my. That is, uh, yeah, that is scary. So that's, that's where Onorati got through. Onorati used oh, the yeah, opportunity right. of the car's crashing to get through, and I think uh, Ensign chose the wrong line. Whoa. With Ensign choosing the wrong line, oh, that's yeah. where uh, he got through. Onorati giving it back to him. He's giving it back to him. I think young Onorati realizes that he passed under a. a, a a oh, yellow yeah. flag scenario and, and possibly have to give that one back uh, because of the unintentional pass that was made yeah he cut the curb and instant gets through on him again so a little bit of a fight on here a big fight in fact between these guys so just to give mike a heads up i'm just getting a couple of guys who's saying that there is a bit of uh, buffering and some jumping on the feed i'm not quite sure what you can do in the background though but a couple of guys are just saying that there is a little bit of uh, jumping and buffering in some of the feeds that are going out this is a heads up. Uh, I know we can't do much about, about it right now, but I'm sure you, you can work your magic in the background there, Mike, and see what we can do. At this point in time, we are in a pretty epic battle here for the Pure Storage Car Longy 24 hour.
Hello? Okay. Sorry, my microphone wasn't working. Yeah. Alright. Um, anyways, uh, Bettini is now dropped behind Enslin. And I think the reason why Honorati had to give that place up was because he was around, he was trying to go around the outside of um, of um, Bettini at the Crocodile. So that's why he gave way and then he lost his momentum and got caught on the curb. And there goes Bettini on the, into the gravel at Cheetah. And that's not good. He's going to lose all of his places. He was just in fourth. Now he's down into sixth. He's behind Stair Vason as well. So that... That, uh, as you can see, 24 hours is, was always going to be a mistake here and there. Ensign is now flying away in fourth place. Honorati, he's going to try and catch up. Honorati doesn't want to give up. He doesn't want to give up. He wants that fourth place. He is extremely hungry for it. Um, hopefully, he doesn't push too hard to the, to the point where he gets a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of fatigue. I think he's going to want to stay out for a little bit longer just to claw up with... Um, Alaric Enslin and a lot of traffic as they're going down through sunset almost we're just uh, about the 20 hour mark now look how much traffic there is there's, ma there's so much traffic I, I'm surprised that there hasn't been a crash yet I mean we saw the pile up well, not really a pile up uh, going through barbecue uh, uh, luckily no one was caught in that there wasn't a severe damage to that uh, Enslin and Honorati and uh, um, and so, uh, and uh, Bertini battle. And uh, is, is Greg back? I think he is. Is he? I think I'm back, yeah. Sorry about that. I'm not okay. quite sure we went down there, but we're back up here. Yeah. Uh, All right. So we're into the fight here, of course, between Bertini. Has he gone out again? I think he has. All right. All right. Um, so here we go on board with Honorati. He's, he's getting, trying to get the split stream of the back mark of Ferrari ahead of him. Just going to try and stay on the outside. Just going to try and cleanly get past him, diving into turn two of uh, the Crawthorn corner, very famous corner uh, for a lot of reasons. Still trying to catch up with Alaric Enselin. He's 1.3 seconds behind, so it was originally 1.3, uh, 1.7 at one stage, about like a lap or two ago. But now he's starting to close in just uh, ever so slightly on Enselin, but it seems like Enselin is pushing. He doesn't need to push, but it seems like he is pushing and uh, uh, quite, uh, quite a lot as well. But Honorati is pushing extremely hard We's still on board with him, going through clubhouse, running out, just sticking on on that curb, not trying to run too far out wide at clubhouse. Now, off camber, through turns eight and nine, the S's. Now you get a little bit of a short straight going over the hills, almost a blind breaking point going into Leucorp at turn 10, the triple apex Leucorp uh, for some reference. Sticking to the inside, just t t not trying to run out to, to run out uh, too hard. Just tries to line himself up perfectly uh, for turn 12 at Mineshaft. Not quite for the second fastest corner on the um, Kailami circuit. Now going through turn 13, Crocodiles. Now through the, uh, f uh, it doesn't really affect the con. Turn 14, and now turn 15, Cheetah. You don't want to get anywhere close to that curb, or else you'll go flying. And now diving into the last corner, turn 16, Ingwe, which is Zulu for uh, Leopard to complete a lap of the Kyle Army circuit. He's dropped behind uh, Alaric Enslin by, I think, about two tenths as well, because it's just, the gap's just gone up to 1.4 seconds. And that is about four hours done. Mike Jones here, been behind the cameras for the past four hours, joined Greg Maloney just a brief uh, while ago while G-Max took his break, and Clark King, of course, joining us for the past couple hours. Clark, uh, your first comp stint in this 24-hour race, uh, you know, this Solidarity 24-hour. How's it been for you, bud? Is it, it fantastic racing going on? Yeah, it, it, as you said, it's been fantastic. Obviously, uh, 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 this is this is this is the start of uh, so, uh, where some drivers may get a little bit of driver fatigue and start to fall back, just ever so slightly. 
uh, it's been in fantastic racing. I mean, we've, we've seen some crashes, uh, some mistakes here and there, but I, uh, this is this is heating up to be an incredible race. It's so just four hours in. If we're going to have incredible li racing like this for four hours, we should have incredible racing for the next 20. Well, guys, this has been about first the first four hours here at the 24 Hours of Kyalami. We're going to go ahead and toss over to broadcast team number two. We're going to go audio up here for a couple minutes. The screen will go to black briefly, and then we will be a back up. Ryan Gill and George G. Max Smith will be joining you for the next few hours along with broadcaster Stewie. We appreciate you guys tuning in and keep tuning in for the remainder of the 20 hours. It's been an action-packed race. It will not stop to be an action-packed race. We're going to stay on board with Yanata Roddy for the Racing Line Motorsport 192 Audi R8 LMS Evo and see if he can catch up with Enslin. Commentary will be back in just a couple minutes. We are back. It's uh, commentary team two in the box. Uh, my, my name is George Smith, also known as G Max. And of course, I got my good friend, Rai Rai, Ryan Gill, joining me, both of us from the Racing Club International side of things, taking over from Greg Madoli and uh, Clark King, doing a great job at bringing the action to all you guys. Ryan, uh, we've got uh, a nice little commentary stint ahead of us here. We do. It's uh, it, it, it's been well four hours of uh, Team ZA, uh, should we call it? And uh, I tell you what, they, they they sailed that flag pretty well for the first four hours, and uh, well, exciting to uh, to pick it up for for another few hours. And of course, after our stint that we're going to be doing this afternoon, we'll be back later on uh, tonight as well. And Team America, I think, will be on later on as well with Jesse Lee and Mike Jones getting back in the box. But George. Four hours into the race, and uh, GTWR lead. GTWR lead, and uh, I couldn't be happier to see that uh, there's been some good racing out on the circuit for what we have been able to watch so far. And I think, um, you know, Clark said it best before he handed over to us, is that uh, if with only four hours done and 20 hours to go, we have so much for more to look forward to. I think a lot of teams here having to adjust out their strategies, weatherman predicting out that, uh, you know, we're not going to see rain coming down. So it's going to be a dry race for what should be the duration of this event. And I think um, that's going to also just play a little bit of havoc into the way that some of the teams have set their cars up, you know, maybe expecting a little bit of rain, but uh, getting confirmation through that uh, it is going to stay dry. Uh, we, we do know that weather people often get things wrong, but, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we can kind of uh, just, just let people know that uh, from what we've had confirmed, it is going to look to be dry. And that should favor a lot of the teams here that may be not too confident in the wet conditions. 
Well, I can tell you that uh, a lot of the Audi drivers, for a start, are going to be very, very glad that it's not going to rain because, uh, you know, the, the Audi, notoriously not great uh, in the wet, very similar to the Lamborghini. Some of the Aston Martins on the grid probably going to be a bit sad that uh, they've been informed there will be no rain, but we've got to make do with what we have. And, uh, well, I tell you what, there's still plenty of competitiveness left in this grid the Audi's looking pretty dominant at the moment. I'm looking here at four Audis in the top five. But George, the Tauro team, number 696, they're still waving the Porsche flag for you pretty well in this race, sitting fourth place at the moment. Alaric Enslin at the wheel. And, uh, I mean, only four hours into this race, there's still plenty of time for that Porsche to make up a couple more positions. You know, I'll uh, I'll keep my my hopes high for the Porsche to get up towards the front of it. So I, I, I'm a little bit Porsche biased, and that's okay. Uh, out here at the home of Porsche in Kyle Army, so uh, I feel like it all kind of fits in with that narrative. But uh, plenty of teams having some trials and tribulations along the way, being pushed to their limits in terms of just having to uh, you make adaptions to how they are going to finish out this race. And with 19 hours and 54 minutes on the clock. We're just riding on the back wing of Schooler as uh, we just see them dealing with a little bit of the lap traffic that is out on the field. We've got uh, Alice also just putting some pressure onto them uh, in terms of the timing sheet. A little bit of uh, a gap building up as they make their way down at the mineshaft, trying to negate and deal with the traffic themselves. But as things stand, things are still looking to be very good for a lot of these teams out on the circuit. Yeah, and of course, a lot of these teams, you know, going to be quite familiar with this circuit as well. We have, uh, obviously, a, a, a majority of South African teams uh, out on the circuit and quite a few big international names. Of course, we went over a couple of those in the Super Bowl session, uh, which happened last weekend. But... Uh, you know what, George? Um, I'm looking up towards that timing table at the moment, and I see 96 and 97, both of them, in the top three. And I just I just think to myself, it's four hours into the race. Sidemax Motorworks have two cars in the top three. They're, I mean, I mean they're, they're sitting pretty, aren't they? Oh, Van Lachlanberg uh, going to be pushing the limits there, going side by side with the 810 as they come down into the braking zone for the Crocodile. Still going to almost stay side by side for Cheetah, electing better of it. And uh, Eugene Van Lachlanberg just going to get the edge as they come down into Ingwer, that 969. Bentley looking strong, trying to make their way through the field. Of course, team number 30 or, or currently placed in 32nd position getting that move done on the 810 and it's uh oh it's gonna be a crazy race for the duration out here yeah crazy race indeed i mean a, a 24 hour race is always going to be a, a crazy race no matter what gets thrown your way and uh some good driving and good overtakes being put on display here so far just about four hours into the race and some nice liveries out on show as well uh george i i'm, I'm not sure if within the first four hours if liveries was ever discussed at uh, I mean, a, at any point but i know it's one of our favorite subjects it is it's uh, it's like talking colors with uh rai rai and gmax at this point but you are not wrong. Some uh, good painting skills coming out. Of course, all the teams here just running in the in-game custom livery editors. No uh, full custom liveries being supported just for the fact that uh, we know that uh, it can cause issues for some of the drivers with driver swaps and things like that. Uh, but nice to see some good paintwork being uh, pushed out. We see Sean here in that 777 and a nice uh, bright sky blue accented with black and red still just keeping that pressure on at the back end of a bentley here the number 24 of Mulder in view and in sight and this is an on track position for uh, or battle for position as they uh, make their way into the braking zone for crowthorn it's a nice short lap here at kyle army compared to a lot of the uh, circuits that we get in the calendar and that also means that you don't have a lot of time in between laps to get things done you've got to sort of plan it out and just make sure you find, uh, you know, the, the right overtaking opportunity. And we can just see Sean getting a little bit loose there on the exit of barbecue, costing him 
couple of car lengths on to the back of that number 24 Bentley, making their way down into Sunset. Greg talked about it. Uh, this corner, when we see it go a little bit later on, we should get a nice uh, sunset view from the cars and uh, stunning, stunning scenery when it does get to that race time. Currently 4.15 in Sim, and that means that we still have quite a few hours left of daylight before we go over to the nighttime switch, which I, th which I think, Ryan, will add quite a bit of variability into uh, where these teams are, especially for the, the, uh, the traffic and having to negate and, and, and make your way through uh, all the, the slower blue flagged cars. You can just see drivers doing their best, just stay out of the way of battles that are not uh, for them on the same lap, just making sure that the uh, leaders can get themselves through. And when I say leaders, just cars on a lap that's uh, ahead of yours in this circumstance. Around the outside tries Lerario and uh, oh, going to get that move dialed in as Mulder very heavy on the brakes coming down into Crocodile, going to almost over slow that number 24 Bentley down and will allow Sean to get through. So the 777 getting past the 24 nice and cleanly. Oh, loops it oh. around. And um, that's a bit of an, ex an excited uh, throttle pedal right there. We can just see catches a little bit of the uh, apex and too much curb is going to be facing the wrong. And that's not a nice place to actually be once you are trying to recover the car because it's a completely blind exit out of Ingwe and other drivers uh, not going to just be expecting, hopefully just adhering to the yellow flag warnings, letting them know that there is something on track that they need to be careful of. Yeah, I just had a, uh, I just had a momentary flashback to when I did that in a race in a Lamborghini uh, once and uh, can hold my hands up and say, yes, it's not really a convenient place to have your car turn sideways or the wrong way around, which is what happened to me. It's a bit worse in that situation, but yeah, not uh, not great there for the Bentley, but hopefully going to get it turned around and get it pointing the fake, well, facing the right direction as safely as possible. But it's a good point you mentioned as uh, seeing Audi rejoining on the circuit rather abruptly there. And uh, a good point you mentioned on the darkness as uh, the light will start to fade. I believe sunset is around 6 p.m. local time uh, in ACC for the Kyle Army circuit. Uh, quite a few clouds out at the moment, though, so we're not entirely sure if we will get to see that sunset. Hopefully we will. But uh, the, the night element... I mean, to me, it's one of the most exciting parts of the race. Uh, you know, they're, they're, there's something quite cool about racing under the lights and, and in the dark, but it kind of feels like something that you shouldn't do uh, in, in that sense. It kind of feels like you're breaking the rules, but uh, I always love to see the night racing. It, it adds a new element of difficulty for a lot of the drivers. And uh, of course, you know, you've got to be confident around the circuit to race it in the dark because a lot of your braking references, you won't be able to see them in advance like you usually can. And, uh, well, of course, that leads to a lot of mistakes sometimes. So those that you see quite consistent at night, usually some of the really, really consistent drivers during the day as well. It's uh, it's quite a dark circuit out here as we see Giulio Bettini feeling that pressure now from Sebastian Kralau as they make their way up to the top of the hairpin of Lukop the Bentley, trying to uh, just uh, see if there was a way around the outside, carry a bit of momentum down, but the defense on hard for the number 11. We go to the splitter cam from that 367 Bentley. Probably one of my favorite uh, camera angles that we do get, just uh, shows you where you can go and oh, brilliant way to uh, apex in to the crocodiles very wide goes the audi outside you're gonna have to uh, pay extra fees to get back on to the track and for the bentley that is done and dusted yep bentley making its way through and up into sixth place that will update on the timing board just like that and uh, the highest placed of the Bentleys that we have here today. And uh, we do have quite a few of them out on track here. It is lovely to see, especially after Bentley in the real world uh, SRO championships have unfortunately pulled out of, uh, of GT3 racing. But they'll forever live on in ACC, and that is great to see. We're watching uh, Sean Lero at this point in time in the 777 chasing down the Lexus. The 334 or 344, sorry, down towards turn two. And uh, is that windscreen wipers 
that are currently going side to side on the on the triple seven. I'm I'm pretty sure it is the the windscreen weapons going on for the triple seven, hoping for rain. But uh, as George said earlier, we have had it confirmed that it won't be coming. So uh, maybe, maybe the triple seven just uh, using the windscreen wipers as some in-car entertainment. <laughs> uh, I mean, when you when you're out here, you got a lot of hours to to grind in the car. You know, sometimes you just hit the wrong button. You're so focused on. Uh... Um, you know, just, just grinding out those lap times that sometimes you just hit the wrong thing. You know, you're, you're trying to adjust your traction control, or maybe your ABS, and you suddenly have, uh, you know, your windscreen wipers going, and it might take a little bit of time for you to realize that, that that's even happening because you're just so focused on, on what's happening out there. Or alternatively, um, you know, for them, maybe just driving in an alternate view, not quite aware that they've even uh, toggled those on. I know for me, it would be something that was more of an irritant than, uh, you know, anything else. Definitely not going to put the, the other drivers on the track off. It doesn't work the same as the flashing of lights. And uh, I think maybe perhaps uh, Sean's POV that he's driving with uh, might just not show him that uh, he's got those windscreen wipers toggled on at the moment. Speaking of Bentleys earlier, 30th and 31st. And this looks like teammates. Oh, Lexus up the inside. Was that Mulder? Just that making was... their way through at the crocodiles. No, I think uh, that was Seda that uh, slots in between them there. And you are right, the Black Widow Sim Racing team in their matching liveries, making sure that their cars are easily identifiable out on the circuit. Also running an identical car, so uh, both of them just running out in those Bentleys. And uh, quite a, a firm favorite when it comes to endurance racing, these Bentleys. Ryan, uh, do you want to provide some insights as to why... A car like this would be would be picked in a 24 hour well the, the the bentley has quite a few reasons for why it's a good pick for an endurance race uh first of all you have an enormous fuel tank in this car i believe it's 136 liters or 135 something around that so massive fuel tank in this car uh which means if you do need to extend a stint to its maximum if you have stints that go over 65 minutes or even 75 minutes, the Bentley is, well, pretty much the car that can, can go over that. It can go 90 minutes at some circuits, I've been told. And uh, it's quite good on its tyres as well. It's not too keen on the rain uh, from the most recent BOP updates that ACC has had. I know that when RCI hosted its own 24 hours of uh, Kai Alami, the, the, the Bentleys didn't do too well in the rain. And... Uh, I myself drove a Bentley at Donington Park in the rain and it didn't really enjoy it too much. But it is a very, very nice car to drive. Um, and it's very, very smooth as well. It's good on the curbs. You don't really have to push the car to get the most out of it. You just need to be nice and smooth with it and uh, and, and the car will pay you back nicely. And uh, it really is uh, it, it really is a, a, a nice car to drive. And, you know, it, it, it's no wonder it's quite popular in you know, all sorts of parts of the world. I know it's quite popular over in uh, in Australia for the Bathurst 12 hour. They have uh, quite a lot of support for Bentley out there. And uh, of course, a lot of people in ACC like to take the big boat out as well because uh, of how good it is in the endurance stint. Correct. And uh, I think you touched on that as well, being quite, uh, quite comfortable using the curbs, lots of curbs here at Kailami. Uh, of course, uh, some big, scary uh, anti-cut curbs as well that you do not want to find definitely in the midsection of the Yuxke sweep there, those big yellow uh, anti-cut curbs. And of course, uh, on the, uh, the the entry apex to Cheetah, you've got one of those big, nasty anti-cut curbs as well. So uh, although you, you, you can't really abuse those in the Bentley for everything else curb-wise, it's a nice, stable car to come through. And uh, I, I, I've seen just a lot of Bentley choices in the endurance racing side, probably more around uh, the fuel side and, and the way that it can handle its stints there, but also very transferable over between drivers in terms of uh, something that's nice and balanced for everybody to be comfortable with. Yeah, it's a car that uh, w when I... Uh, took it out for a couple of endurance races. It got, uh, it was a bit difficult to, to get used to driving a racing car on the other side because obviously the Bentley, unlike every other car uh, that is on the grid, has the driver on the right hand side of the car as opposed to the left. That obviously being a British manufacturer, even though they are German owned, I believe, at this point in time, 
Uh, they still make their race cars with the driver on the right hand side of the car and it takes a bit of getting used to if you're if you're used to driving on the left um but if you can put past that it really really is a joy to drive it's such a nice car and you know for for a car that is labeled a boat people say it looks like a brick it's a very nice looking car as well and uh I have to say, some of the best liveries I've seen for GT3 cars have been on a Bentley as well. I mean, I've 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 often given a, a little bit of grief out to the Bentley drivers. Uh, a lot of my my co friends and and teammates and things, uh, you know, in the race phase side too, they've often picked up the Bentley. I've always given it a bit of flack, um, so I would I would be a little bit uh, biased to say it's a lovely car. Um, but it, it's something that I haven't had a lot of experience with driving, and it probably comes down to that. We're having a look at a uh, an Audi, of course, the GTWR entry the number 157 Giorgio Simonini currently at the wheel and these guys have been having the uh, the ideal race for them getting themselves up into P1 and just continuing to hold at that yeah GTWR a very very strong team we've seen them in plenty of different championships across uh, RCI's World Tour SimGrid's World Cup and uh, I believe it was in the, the first ever season of Sim Grid, Ooh, going up the inside of the 505 and making their way through. Um, I, I believe it was in the Sim Grid World Cup, the, the first season. They won four or five races, I believe it was. And uh, I mean, the, the names that are in that team as well, uh, Tobias Pfeffer, Giorgio Simonini, and of course, the local hero, Jordan Sherratt. Uh, racing in that car as well and they have plenty of other very very quick drivers and this is uh th this is fast becoming one of the top teams in acc obviously they uh they, they only really showed up i would say on on a massive scale towards the end of uh 2020 and uh prior to that I think a lot of people weren't really aware of them but fast becoming uh one of the truly elite teams in ACC, very much like uh, Sidemax Motorworks that uh, are sitting in second and third at this point in time. And that 96 car specifically, the one we're looking at right now, driven by George Boothby, is looking for a hat trick of uh, race wins in ACC 24 hours of Kyle Army, George. And uh, as achievements go, they don't get much bigger. I mean, I can't, I can't uh, work out if they just, uh, you know, enjoy the uh, the pain and the pleasure of 24 hours, or they've got a special recipe sauce mixed up that allows them to to come into these Kyle Army 24 events and uh, assert their dominance. But uh, if any team has the experience out at knowing what it takes to win, it certainly would be the Sidemax Motorsports uh, Motorworks number 96, as they uh, make their way through a little bit of blue flag traffic. Of course, George Boothby. One of the highlights of drivers and, and streamers that partnered up with promoting this race. Uh, always good to see that that international support coming down and, and helping to drive through entries. Uh, probably from the international perspective, quite a lot. Just uh, adding a little bit of validity into the event that was being thrown here today. And uh, good to see George Booth be in the car and uh, doing a good job. His teammates have, have put him in a, a good position for them to to you know now hunt down onto the back of that GTWR Audi but it's a very Audi dominated race so far if you're looking at the podium position spots and the, even just outside at those podiums uh, as Boothby just uh, flashed the lights as well making sure that uh, lap traffic is aware of his presence yeah the Audi is a very very good car around here especially in the dry similar to the Lamborghini in that sense. Both of these, those cars sharing very, very similar traits as George Boothby making his way through. The traffic and traffic management is going to be a very, very important thing in 24-hour races. and Well, it always is in any endurance race, really. You have to be able to manage the cars that you're going to be lapping all the cars that are going to be lapping you, it works both ways, and uh, you have to make it as easy as possible for each other. This is the other side Max Motorworks car, driven by Lucas Kraser at this stage in the race, and uh, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to get 
at least one of the Sidemax drivers in here later on. I, I, I did speak to Killian Ryan Meenan earlier, and he said, uh, if you want uh, any of the drivers to be thrown in for an interview, he said to give him a shout, and uh, maybe he'll come in here himself and speak to us a bit, as uh, he was out in the number 96 earlier on, I believe, George. So uh, that, that is exactly right. Started the race off for them, got them into a good start. Uh, as far as we understood, they just had a little bit of a struggle with their setup that they had, which uh, found them dropping back and allowing that GTWR team to get the entrance through. But Lucas Crazer just trying to uh, drop that gap down, of course, to the back of their sister car, that number 96. And uh, Boothby also just trying to close down on GTWR, like every lap just, uh, you know, take couple of tenths off where they can that eight second gap can quickly go down if uh, you've got a driver that is finding a little bit more pace out on the circuit we see Antoine Radu in that uh, number 88 just putting some pressure on as well I think uh, that's Christopher Radloff in the number 87 entry for the Aston Martin so a bit of a bully going on from the Bentley entry as they come down the mine shaft going to be trying to find a possible passing zone here at the bottom of the hill a little switch back going to go for the inside line and radu in the all-in racing entry this is a team that is trying to make up a lot of spots they haven't uh, had the best timed pit stops and they haven't uh, been able to have the best race for things to start off with but with 19 hours of racing to go it's heads down focused on making sure that they can get themselves into the best possible position by the time the race is done and of course, Ryan, uh, just a shout out to our sponsors, Pure Storage, NEC, Data Sciences, Oxide as a Service, AMD, Super Micro, for all getting on board and uh, helping make this event possible. Of course, it is the Pure Storage Kyle Army 24 hour in partnership with Solidarity E-Race and Powered by Raceface. And of course, all the broadcasting and commentary coming across with a bit of a mixed team. We've got uh, our broadcasters out from Racing Club International, our fellow commentators that we've done events with, and then a nice little mixture of some South African local talent. We saw Greg Maloney uh, starting this race off. I joined him for a little bit. And then we had Clark King coming in, the young, talented superstar. Just got to keep an eye out on him. He's got a whole lot of progress to make in this world. And uh, he's, he's already taking it by the horns. And talking about by the horns, Toro in this 696, trying to get themselves up to a podium sitting position. Also, just uh, trying to, to read out and, and make the best calls that benefits them when it comes to their strategy. And it's glorious, oh so glorious, to see a stunning Porsche up within the top five. Uh, my fanboyism is always going to show. Well, your, uh, your fanboyism is going to be joined by our broadcaster. Uh, we have uh, Stewie. Uh, in the well in the box with us at the moment he is bringing you the pictures from around the circuit he's also a very big porsche fan george so i i kind of feel like the odd one out in the box at the moment don't hurt me ryan the, Rye Rye Gill. the, the lone don't. lamborghini fan uh, in in the box and i i have to say though i've you know i i've gone a bit softer on the porsche lately um obviously my my commentary debut was with the porsche cup and uh I, I will be driving a Porsche in uh, an endurance championship this season. So my, my feelings towards this car have softened slightly. Um, but my heart will always be with the Italian Stallion. But I have to say the, the Toro Porsche, absolutely loving the livery uh, on that car. The white, the black, and of course the, I believe that's satin metallic red uh, that they've got on the front of that car as well. Absolutely gorgeous. And, uh, well, flying the flag pretty well so far, as uh, I have a look down the order. I believe they're the top of three Porsches that we have here today. The other two down in 25th and 36th. So, Ulrich Enslin and the Toro team, they're, uh, they're, they're flying that Porsche, South African Porsche flag quite high, George. They are indeed very proud of the team for what they, uh, they've accomplished. And just touching on their, their liveries, I mean, that's just the one that they're running in the race. But they have a stunning actual custom livery for that Porsche, uh, which has been flashed out over on the social media pages. And uh, I got a little glimpse of that, mm. which uh, sent all kinds of feelings through me, uh, I, I must be honest. 
it's always good to see teams putting time and effort into you know creating a, a pro profile for themselves and uh, you know there's there's nothing better than being able to uh, slap some some awesome customness onto your entry uh, even if it's not permitted in in the race just from a admining point of view it's it's cool to see that uh, you know such things can be used on the social media side of things to just promote your team and uh, you know get 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 a showcase of the design talent that is out there in the world definitely plenty of uh, design talent out there and I often find that some of the custom liveries that uh, that people make in the sim actually look a lot better than the real world ones. Uh, there are some teams in the real world where I kind of look at the liveries and I think, you know, maybe may maybe you should look towards the sim racing scene. There's some talented graphic designers out there that could make some liveries, some stunning liveries uh, for for a lot of these uh, real world teams. And uh, I know that that is something that. Uh, wasn't it the Renault Formula One team actually hired? Uh, they, they hired a graphics designer who had previous experience with making custom liveries in one of the Formula One games. So it kind of just shows that, that there is some sort of progression path there for everyone a involved, of, a even, even if you're not a racer. A bit of a, a crossover for designers and drivers. Uh, Sean just uh, going to move out of the way for those blue facts and you know it's 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 always good to just get off that throttle pedal allow the other competitors to get through if you are getting blue flag but it does cost you some time when you are um you know trying to make progress up and we saw that sean in this triple seven was doing a good job at uh, getting closer and closer to that bentley that he was battling with and uh, he hopefully thinks to himself that that opportunity will present itself again when uh, the bentley has to yield those positions out to the front runners and for them, it's all about just uh, just focusing out and doing what you can do, putting in those consistent lap times uh, time and time again. Have a race replay here. Oh, into the final corner. Oh, that's not a good place to lodge an Audi either. But fortunately, we'll get it off the curb by the looks of it and back going again without getting into anyone else's way. But a late dive down towards the final corner and uh well the, the, we have seen some penalties given out uh earlier on in the race as the gtwr team have made their way back into the pit lane we, we've seen some penalties given out george um for, for incidents earlier on in the race and there will continue to be some penalties given out over the course of the next 19 and a half hours of the race as we also see the number 97 car make its way into the pit lane, but the 96 will now inherit the lead for the moment. Indeed. So it looks like it looks like there is going to be a, an almost crossover similarity between the side works uh, teams, making sure that they're getting into the pit box uh, on the same laps, just uh, following a strategy that uh, will maybe work out for both of them promoting gtwr back uh, or sorry just uh, promoting um at the at the moment we're just looking at robert hart in the number or in the number 70 i know that robert hart racing here with his wife kelly hart both of them uh, representing hart racing i think that they've also got uh, well they did have a third driver entry but as it stands it looks like uh, robert hart just letting a lot of the traffic come past him at the moment in that number 70 entry a very striking uh, traditional racing levy lots of whites with a dabbler red on the car and i think uh, you know I've, I've said it before not always a fan of the aston martins uh, i think they've got a little bit of a boring looking front end i'll probably be hated by the aston martins fans in in the chat box but um you know from a side profile the car looks uh, pretty good i'm not going to hate it for everything and there's quite a lot Ooh. of those entries out, out here. got a Lexus off after Cheetah. Um, we've got a yellow flag down there. I'm not entirely sure what car that is. It's the 344 Martin Jobert. And we're going to get a replay here. Oh, just catching it. Must have caught the back end of the anti-cut curve. Ooh. Ooh, a bit eager on the a throttle as well. Yeah, once you've uh, once you've lost traction and you you're on the uh, the grass and you, you're trying to just uh, get the car facing the right direction again, a little bit 
without uh, too much power putting being put down and uh, looping it around a second time. Also, big contact with the wall in that, so they're going to have to monitor that damage, see what uh, is actually taking place. And Martin Yobert in that 344 Lexus, one of the few cars that, uh, you know, just has to have a very default livery oh. coming down, and we get another replay of a 8110 Aston Vanna here just uh, parked off in the sand, maybe building a couple of sand castles. But also a treacherous corner that is coming into sunset, out of sunset, and uh, now getting back onto the circuit. But got to be careful not to impact the racing. If you look at the track guide on the right side of the screen, you can just see how chaotic the track is. There's not a single part of the circuit that doesn't have cars on it. Maybe a, a breathing second coming down towards Cheetah. There was there was no entry, but the number 100 going through there will uh, quickly end that. So there's a small breathing room to uh, to get back onto the track and you've got to be careful of uh, where you do re-enter you don't want to impact somebody else's race don't want to pick up more penalty points from the stewards so all about managing that uh, that expectation emmanuel carter gets here in that 158 going to cruise through going to uh, get past radloff radloff and rydell also in shot together as uh, you know there's just a lot of traffic on the circuit cars on different parts of their race journey uh, different pit strategies and you're just going you got to oh oh dear so we find more struggles for the 8110 entry just getting a bit of a slide going into the mid part of ingwe and looping it around and we talked about a dangerous place to be facing and uh, now, that now is now this, the wrong this... direction this looks like my Lamborghini from a few months ago, um, rather unfortunately, but I have got it pointed back around in the correct direction and oh, going a bit deep into turn two. That Aston Martin team, uh, Retro Esports Bravo, definitely they're facing some challenges at the moment and ooh, that card does not look Doesn't look happy, does it? It for for an Aston happy. Martin as well, which which is typically a very comfortable car to drive. Definitely some issues going on for that team. Struggling maybe with their tyres at the moment as well. Um, the car doesn't look visually damaged, but just look at that coming into the left hand of Clubhouse as well. Having to correct on the wheel, catch the, uh, the back end. It's a corner that you normally don't find too much instability. And then through the higher speed corners like here, the S's, probably a little bit more tentative to get onto that throttle going to cost them lap times and uh, it, it's certainly not a good position to be in if you are struggling uh, with that that setup you don't want to be uh, making moves overtaking people on the circuit if you are in that sort of situation so uh, also just making their way through trying to uh, you know best their position but at the same time it's 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 a battle with the uh, the car's setup at the moment from what we could see from the onboards our producer as well, just making a very good point that it could also be a tyre issue. Uh, could have ruined the tyres because of the first spin. Oh, there's another accident down towards the final corner. This time the Audi doesn't get spun around. Bit of and, a uh, bit of a, a strange place uh, for a lot of these uh, big dives to, to happen. I mean, it's a place that we've seen it happen before, but... Uh, Drivers maybe just uh, having a, a little lapse of concentration, missing that breaking point coming into Engwe, and then uh, immediately heading for the inside apex, which with the left-hander, as its nature is, isn't going to uh, to really be the best option to avoid contact. So I think the Stewart's going to be kept busy in their box. You can see uh, penalties still get handed out to drivers on the circuit. That's, of course for all the incidents that take place and with 19 hours 21 minutes on the clock there's a lot of time and margin for error to still take place so drivers need to need to be careful when those start to stack up you can quite easily lose a positional battle with yourself uh, purely from being in that situation Danny Erasmus then uh, going to try and get past oh, sorry Danny Miller trying to get past uh, the likes of Erasmus I think They've, uh, they, they're catching up to them, but uh, as things stand, a lot of traffic for them still to deal with. Traffic management, we said it when the race started, Ryan, would be something that these people have to factor in. 
Yep, you have to factor in, uh, in in any kind of endurance race, really. And, you know, sometimes not even in an endurance race. If you have a sprint race as well, and uh, it, it gets to the point where you catch up to the back of, uh, of, of the field, you know, you, you need to manage that somehow. And it, it is a skill. It, it's not easy to do all the time. And there is a, an element of luck involved in it as well. But you've just got to keep yourself safe. And uh, I believe that was Daniele Miller just getting past Erasmus there. That has updated on the timing sheet. So the 999 into 25th. But back on the, back on the topic of uh, traffic management, it, it doesn't matter if you're in a multi-class race, single class race or, or whatever, you know, endurance or sprint, your ability to get through the traffic safely and effectively is going to be a very, very important part of the race. And of course, it becomes even more important the longer the race goes on. And uh, that's what you'll see from some of the teams up at the top, like you've got GTWR, Sidemax Motorworks, uh, Toro, Racing Line Motorsport. They're, they're often masters at navigating this traffic safely and effectively over the course of a very long race. And, you know, they'll make mistakes occasionally, but for the most part, 95%, 99% of the time, they'll get it spot on, they'll get it done, and they'll be, well, on their way. And that's how they build these gaps over the course of an endurance race in such a short space of time. Getting a replay here of something that we didn't quite catch on uh, a live feed, and that will be Danny Miller. Uh, oh, there's a, a little bit of chaos coming through. The S's on the way up to the top of the hairpin. You saw Alaric Enslin coming through in that Toro Porsche. But for Danny Miller in the Odin Racing 999, I think this is the only BMW entry we've actually got on the grid, if I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken, Ryan. Is that... Uh... Am I that right is, in that? That is correct. It is the only BMW we have on the grid. And that's kind of a shame because in, in, in a similar sense to the Bentley, I guess, it, it kind of looks like a brick, but it's a very it's a very nice looking brick, uh, if, if that's what you <laughs> want to call it. Ryan's explanations of the big cars, it's just like a brick. That one's a little bit prettier as a brick, but still a brick. Well, and, uh, look, you, you, have, you have three bricks. You've got the Bentley, you've got the BMW, and you've got the Nissan. They're all... They're all bricks. They're all just slight variations on each other. But they're well, all actually, equally beautiful. I was actually wrong on... Uh, it wasn't Alaric Enslin in the Toro uh, Porsche. It, it's actually Corne Strauss who's taken over as the uh, co-pilot in that team. And it looks like David Chisia in that racing line, Motorsport 192, starting to put some good pressure onto the South African, the 696, uh, doing well to sit into fourth place, Corne. Uh, probably one of the uh, the drivers in the team now that's uh, been putting in a lot of time and effort. Uh, good to see the pickup from Toro to, to get him into the, the seat. And time to prove his worth and his time and effort has been worth it. Against the likes of David Chisier will be a good test to see where the measure up is. I'm pretty sure that uh, the word from the team will be to, uh, you know, not push too hard, not not feel the pressure. If they're faster, let them by. We'll make up the time later on. Chris Heineke in that PWSR Porsche. Oh, that's a big spin coming out of the exit of the UXK sweep just before getting to the entry of barbecue and having to just park it off on the South African flag as the runoff waiting for the ability to enter the circuit. Yeah, inconvenient there for Chris Heineke in the Porsche. And that's the last of the three Porsches down in 36th place at this point in time. But switching back towards the front of the field, Corne Strauss and Davide Chiesa going to go side by side down towards turn two. And Corne Strauss isn't going to fight that too much. He's going to allow the Audi to go through and going to think to himself that it's better at this point in time to just play it safe let the audi go on through and we'll make up that time later on in the race no point battling with just under well just over 19 hours to go and uh you know i i can i can respect that decision george when you know you're outpaced when you know you're outmatched it doesn't really make sense to risk anything you have no idea what the other team's fuel loads are like. You don't know, uh, you know, what what sort of pace they're going to be sitting at. You can only guide 
your decisions based on uh, you know the data that you're getting through to your, uh, your you know the rest of your team and i think that for strauss uh, it definitely was a, a wiser thing don't want to lose too much time on the circuit uh, battling unnecessarily you also don't want to put yourself at risk of uh, you know a contact coming into it so when you are outpaced against another driver um there's absolutely nothing wrong with accepting that, letting them get by, giving yourself your own bit of fresh air again. You can start to focus on your own lap times. When you're feeling that pressure from behind, someone just sitting on your bumper, uh, it means that you are feeling overly pressured in that scenario. You can't really do what you need to do. And at this part of the race, it's all consistency based. It doesn't matter what lap times you're dropping. Um, you, you're trying to just get that consistent lap time in. So, you know, if you're pushing one or two laps and then making mistakes later on, finding finding yourself on the side of the circuit, that's not going to pay off compared to drivers that uh, have themselves with a little bit of uh, a smooth run coming out. Talking of smooth, Jordan Daly in uh, Ryan's favorite manufacturer, the Lamborghini, as they make their way to try and see if they can uh, get themselves further up in the finishing positions i love that team name ryan it's I, I i was just about to say this 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 entry is almost perfect it's got my favorite number it's got my favorite car the team name is <laughs> ambitious but rubbish it is great and uh, the only thing i dislike about this car is i'm not too keen on the livery um have to be honest i would have gone with something a bit different myself uh but you know what? Sitting 30, 30 second at the moment, are they at this point in time? The lone Lamborghini in this field. I'm quite surprised about that, to be honest. The Lamborghini so is very good around here. Basically, you, you're not allowed to actually dislike the livery. You have to be a fanboy and uh, just oh, approve dear. of it. I don't. I mean, I don't see too much wrong with it. I, I quite like the uh, the bright uh, the bright I'm not sure on the green. greeny. That, I, I mean, that was the part that I liked. Um, I'm not. I'm not too. <sighs> I'm, I'm not too sure about the green. I it like adds, the purple and it the adds more. It adds more uh, more horsepower. <laughs> we'll go it's, with that then. It's true. Like if you go with like a bright metallic Strategic green like decision. that, you, you, you get extra horsepower for free coming down. So uh, on board with Jordan Daly coming down through the left-hander, down the hill through Mineshaft and into the braking zone for the Crocodile. You can just see the ambitious but rubbish team. Uh, definitely not uh, not rubbish. I, I think that they sort of sandbag their name a little bit there, calling themselves <laughs> rubbish. Try and get into the heads of their competitors and uh, right now doing a good job at keeping the lone Lamborghini flag waving nice and solidly. This is the Kyle Army 24-hour brought to you by Raceface and, of course, in partnership with Solidarity. Big shout out to our sponsors, Pure Storage, NEC, Data Sciences, Oxide, AMD, and Supermicro. And a shout out to our commentary team and broadcasters from Racing Club International. It really has been a collaborative effort to get to this phase of the race. And with 19 hours left to go on that clock, there's still plenty of time and uh, there's still plenty of things that can take place. We know how quickly a race can go from good to bad. You know how quickly a race can go from bad to good. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's whether you're an optimist or a pessimist and how you're going to look at things. We know that we've got our uh, American broadcasting team. They're going to be doing majority of the night portion of this race, which I'm a, bit, uh, I'm a bit envious of. Ryan, you mentioned it. Nighttime racing, something that you're a fan of. But uh, with daylight still on the cards for us, good sights, good uh, view and visibility from the commentary box. It's nice to see all these teams still giving themselves a good go, regardless of what position they find themselves in, whether it's a battle up in for those uh, prize paying spots or just in the mid pack or even down towards the back of the field, trying to get your entry over the line. As we see from Chris Heineke's point of view, some flashing of the lights as the, uh, the car coming to lap them once to just let them know that uh, they want to make that move done. Heineke not quite uh, in his mind close enough to just yield that position, going to uh, keep on uh, pushing it down. We, we had a, a driver's briefing earlier on. I managed to just jump myself into that just to um, you know, get myself familiarized with the rule set that was being run out. And that flashing of the lights, just letting uh, Chris Heineken know that uh, they want to make the pass. And, and Chris doing the right thing, coming down to the entry of the crocodile, just uh, running it out wide. 
and leaving that inside line nice and open. Being predictable on the circuit as a blue flagged car, so critical in, in a race like this. It is. Uh, be, being lapped or lapping a car, it's, uh, you know, it, it requires cooperation from both sides uh, in, in a sense. And you've got to make it easy for one another. And just a, a prime example there, the Ferrari catching up, just giving a flash to say, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm on, on your back end. I want to get through. And uh, like you said, Chris Heineke, just choosing the perfect place to do so. Just go a tiny bit wide into the corner. Just allow the Ferrari through. Doesn't compromise either of them. And, uh, you know, minimal time lost for both of them, which is the ideal situation when you're lapping a car. Uh, the, there's a lot of drivers out there that, you know, maybe, maybe don't see it that way. And they try and make, you know, it as hard as possible for someone to lap them and it just costs both of you time and the reality of the situation is it's not worth it most of the time so you've got to work together make sure that you make it as easy as possible for both of you to get the job done and speaking of getting the job done Daniele Miller had the job done on Erasmus earlier on in the race then made a mistake on the following lap and uh, now finds himself behind the Aston Martin again. And I have to say, George, I've, I've been in this situation before. You've got past someone. You've made a mistake. You then back behind them. It's full position. They're under no obligation to let you back through. And you just feel like all the work you've done over the last few laps was wasted. You, you do. And uh, as the car that's sitting in front, in this case, Erasmus, in that number 85 Aston Martin, you're kind of looking in your mirrors, thinking to yourself, well, you know, you're so aggressive. You, you push, you, 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 you're overcooking it and uh, you're losing positions out there. So I'm just going to stick to my guns, just going to stay consistent. And I'll wait for you to make that mistake again. Even if you get past me, I might uh, get that position back when you go and bin it somewhere else. So, you know, it's a, it's a place that both drivers here just have to keep the focus coming down. Oh, Miller getting a little bit upsetty spaghetti on the entry to the S's. You saw a lot of curb being used on the entry, but the big BMW M6 managing to just deal with those curbs. And a good run from both of them at the top of the hill means that there's going to be no positional change through the mine shaft. And uh, still the chase continues from this 999 Odin racing BMW M6. Um, but the pressure stays on. Both, uh, both look quite daunting. I think uh, the all blacked out BMW looking quite spectacular mm. for the only BMW entry. It's got its own, uh, it's got its own speciality when we look at things. So uh, the triple nine going to look for the inside. The Aston going very deep out of Ingwe and a little bit of oversteer coming out from that M6 is going to mean that it wasn't the ideal exit and will put them down into a drag race through the kink and on the way to Crowthorn. And down into Crowthorn turn two. BMW will have the inside line and looks like they've got the move done as they go up the Yuxke suite. And the triple nine is back ahead of the 85 as a couple of the faster cars further ahead on the circuit make their way through. But I have to agree with you, George, on the comments of the kind of stealth black BMW. I really, really do like that. I like stealth black on a lot of cars, to be honest. Um, but but really does fit the, the, the BMW in this situation. And the lone BMW as well, as we've already mentioned. Flying the flag for all the BMW fans out there, of which, from Europe specifically, there are quite a few of them, uh, George. When we did, uh, we did some broadcasting work for G2, uh, I believe it was, last year. And uh, th there was quite a lot of BMW fans out in that series. For sure, it was uh, it was very cool. That was that was a very awesome series. Having a G two, and of course BMW partnered up with of the manufacturer coming through in that. Chandre Brits in the uh, 274 Power Rangers Racing Ferrari. Uh, that is that is a livery that we talked about colors. We talked about liveries. This is certainly a, a very interesting way to paint a Ferrari. I think um, they're, they're, they're going to be haters. There's going to be some lovers of it. 
Uh, I know Ryan is already going to hate it because it has uh, too much bright green on it. But uh, for, for a Power Rangers themed entry, I think they, uh, they're living up to their team name by uh, painting it in, in such ways. I think we're just missing the pink Power Ranger off, off that livery. Possibly. Could have, could have maybe done that on the wheel rims, you know? Do the Mike Noble and uh, get, get the pink out, spray it on the rims a bit. But, uh, I mean, you know, li livery choices, it, it is all personal preference, isn't it? Uh, it's, you know, pe people, people love to, to paint their cars however they like them, and to each their own. Um, like George kind of just mentioned, the uh, some of the fluorescent greenish yellow color that they have there is uh, is not really to my taste, but you know what? It's it's fitting in the theme with the name of the team. And uh, I mean, who who also? I already know the answer to this question, but who doesn't like a Ferrari? Um, do you want me to be honest, or do I, I, I know I know you don't, this? George, but. I... <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go there. I think I think it's just going to come out in this this over the next twenty four hours that there's only one manufacturer that I really do like, and that's the Porsche. So, uh, looking looking at the, uh, the the entry list, there's there's a lot of cars here that I I can't uh, say that I'm I'm a big fan of, but that's just because of my allegiance to Porsche. I uh, I have one goal, and that is one day for Porsche to reach out to me and say, you know what, George, we've heard what a fan you are. Here's a GT3 RS for you to just cruise around London. I'm I'm awaiting the day that Lamborghini send me the same email, George, and uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that that day will come sooner rather than later. But uh, approaching five hours into the race, nineteen hours, four minutes and a half still to go. Five p.m. or just past five p.m. local time. Twenty-five degrees ambient, thirty degrees on the track. GTWR lead from both of the Sidemax Motorworks cars. And we've got uh, Ollie Wahlberg here for the Red Line Racing League in 221 Aston Martin, looking to find their way past the number 91 Aston Martin at the moment, Battle of the V8s. A good battle on track between the two of them for sure as uh, coming down in the number 91 of Luke's. Just making a uh, bit of a mistake coming down, but uh, Wahlberg keeping that pressure on. Both uh, painted phenomenally to identify the difference between them, but a gold on, of course, the number 91. And then we've got the predominantly black with white accented. Is that white with black accented 2-2-1 uh, entry uh, for the Red Line Racing League? Good to see the Astons uh, keeping each other honest. They are probably the, the, the most picked up manufacturer in this race. So uh, expect to see a lot of Aston Martin racing. You would be forgiven at times for thinking that we're not doing uh, an all Aston Martin league in, in some of these shots. It is a very popular car. And uh, well, alongside the Bentley, it is another very, very good endurance car. Um, and, and it's a great beginner car as well. Is, uh, is one of the things that I found out. Uh, I drove this car last year in uh, in an endurance championship, and uh, it, it is a great pick. It, you know, it's not very aggressive on acceleration, which is often one of its down points, but uh, it, it works very, very well in those kind of mixed changing conditions, and even in full wet conditions, that kind of works in its favor. Um, but it is a very, very comfortable car to drive. It's good on its tires. It's not terrible on its fuel either. And uh, it, it, it's just a really comfortable car to, to get started in, in ACC. And I mean, it, it, if you're unsure what car you should take for an endurance race, you can't go wrong with the Aston V8. That's fair. I think uh, touching on some good points there in, in being that it's uh, a good entry level car, doesn't have uh, any, any quirks that you really have to worry about. You just have to make sure you are nailing your racing line and getting into the right place. Exactly what that 221 is doing. Oliver Sahi here in that 404, going to be trying to pass on the likes of Radloff. But Radloff reads that move onto the inside, forces uh, Vasaki to go out quite wide, allowing the number 87 of Radloff to cut back through before they make their way through the Yuxke sweep. So a nice little battle for position for P19. Vasaki, of course, trying to uh, take that position off of the kinetic sim racing pulse entry 
Number 87 feeling the pressure coming down into Clubhouse. Going to defense down the inside. Try and force the Bentley to go out wide. And they will stay side by side. It's a nice racing between the two. But the Bentley with a nice exit coming out of there. Going to uh, have the ideal line coming into the S's. And it will go the way then for Arno Versace as uh, they make their way through the field. And a wonderful move there by Arno Vasahi as well, sticking to the outside line through two corners to eventually get the inside line and make the most of it. And they move themselves up into 19th place. Still looking back here, though. Here's the battle for 22nd. And uh, Lucas has got past the 2-2-1 at this point in time. So obviously that happened whilst we were watching the battle between Radloff and Arno Vasahi. I think, uh, I think actually it's still Warburg trying to get past Lucas here at, at this point, Ryan. Remember, it was the gold-themed uh, Aston up at the front on the previous lap. So it I think it's, it's still Warburg trying to uh, find a way past. And the timing sheet just showing that they are keeping themselves... Uh, busy with one another in, in, in that uh, battle, but a good defense coming out then from the likes of Lucas as they make their way in to the Uxke sweep and one Aston Martin length between them at all times over the last four laps. So this is certainly starting to brew up to be interesting. Ooh. Oh dear. So that was the triple six Audi. Not the first uh, going time a bit we've... too deep into Lukop. And uh, at that place where, where they did go a little bit too deep, just uh, too many cars for a narrow part of the circuit and uh, coming into contact too. So not the first time we've seen the triple six in a situation like that. The stewards, we know they like to wag the, uh, wag the finger when things go wrong. So uh, I'm sure that we'll see something come out of that if they determine that that was, uh, you know, punishable. But the two of these two, they have now switched out those positions. It will be Ali Wahlberg to get the jump coming down through the mineshafts, all wrapped up through the top of Leocorp. And will be Lucas to try and see if they can just get that position back. They, they were ahead uh, for that time being. And uh, ooh, side by side, two Ferraris uh, sharing the same bit of circuit as well. A little bit of rubbing is racing as well, just exchanging paints. You know, that's the only way to uh, to update your livery on the fly, I suppose. Uh, just drag a, drag a door of somebody else. Daniel Jose Jorges making his way through in the 258 Ferrari. Smooth Operators GP. Now, that name gets points from me. And uh, I, I, I give that one uh, a, a very good thumbs up from uh, from Daniel Jose Jorges. And uh, sitting in 12th place at the moment, they're the highest placed Ferrari on the grid. And judging by that replay that we saw, was that a move being done on a back marker? Because there aren't any other Ferraris around them. I think you are right, Ryan. I think uh, it must have been a, uh, a, a back marker getting caught up there. So um, indeed, interesting bits of racing going down sometimes uh it, it's also difficult you you got to keep an eye out to see that you're not in a situation fighting with a car that that's not on track for the same uh, bit of uh, lap time or, or on the same lap as you should i say and uh you know if you if you've uh, got it in your mind that somebody's coming through you think that uh, it's for position you might be a little bit overly defensive and force those kind of uh force those kind of incidents to happen Looking back here at Erasmus. And just been informed by the producer that they were passed by the 969 a few corners ago. And that's one of the Black Widow racing Bentleys that we've seen out, seen a couple of them on the grid here today. And I have to say, George, I, I said before that I wasn't too keen on the green. I think the green works here. Personally, yep, yep, on, but I, on, on I've started. Degree. I've started to realize that it's not green in particular that you have a thing with. It's it's high res ve like high high vis vest green that you don't like. You know that fluorescent isn't green. my taste. 
let's, no, let's no. just put it that way. We're just identifying these parts. So green is fine, as long as it's not something that's going to be day glow when, when a bit of light is shone on it. So I think uh, the buyer's coming in from our British commentator, for sure, Ryan. Uh, some British racing green, always going to be allowed on a Bentley. Well, looking at another Bentley, number 88 all in racing, and that's another very good name. Always go all in and uh, see what you come out with. And Runart sitting in 18th place at the moment. They're ahead of Arno Vasahi and they're chasing down 17th place. Another Aston Martin, the number 89 car. At this stage in the race. And looking at this mid-pack mid area, George, a lot of Bentleys and a lot of Aston Martins filling up that area of the grid it does seem like most of the most of the audis filling up the the top 15 positions and then a lot of the aston martins and bentley's filling out the rest of the midfield this is jordan daly I believe making up making up a position on the aston martin ahead so go team lamborghini making up uh, a place and making up very nicely indeed not much fight there from uh, the Aston Martin behind and you rather think that that was uh, a move that they kind of expected was coming and just allowed it to happen you know sometimes you you do just not have the run you've uh, you've 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 had a good exit out of Ingwe but not as like, good as the guy behind you they're sitting in your slipstream they're making a chase down and you're just not able to, uh, to to really contest it coming into a braking zone. You don't want to be in the wrong place coming into the XK sweep. So I think, uh, you know, it, it is all part of the, the deal out there is to make sure that you're getting the best opportunity for your team by just avoiding things that, that are avoidable. Not turning in, not going overly defensive. You'll lose more time battling it out, especially at this phase of the race. This is where things just have to settle down. You know, at the start of the race, it's all chaotic. It's crazy. It's always fun. Um, and then during the mid, mid part of the race, it's, it's all about consistency and just trying to see uh, where you can get your entry in this time slot and, and see if you can force errors out from other teams. That's where you're going to make up the most positions. So uh, it's, it's always a good idea to just have one of those eyes permanently checking on the rear view mirror see that there's uh, you know an opportunity for you to avoid contact they've had a better run you're not going to lose out in the long run by uh, losing one position on a on a lap like this they could be on a, a different fuel strategy they could be running a lot emptier when it comes down to it you've just put fuel in so many factors to consider when uh, when looking at these entries and where they stand yeah there is uh, a, a lot to consider and Quite a few people might also be, you know, off strategy as well. Could have picked up damage and needed to pit earlier on. And of course, everyone's ideal situation for strategy is that you only ever pit when you need to. But I think we all know that racing doesn't work like that. And sometimes you do end up off strategy and that mixes up the places a lot. And it, you really don't know where everyone is until you get to about the last hour or so of the race. And I think that's something we'll see here as well, George. Um, you know, a couple of teams will probably still get involved in incidents over the next uh, 18 hours. And I think until we get to, you know, the last hour, last 52 minutes of this race, we're not really going to know the full picture about where everyone is at this point in time. The, the one consistent thing we do know is that some of the teams up at the front are still on their original strategy. One of those teams is the Toro team, the 696 Porsche. They were passed by Davide Chiesa in the 192 earlier on. We caught that on the stream and now being chased down by Chartier as well in the 367 Bentley. And here's a replay. Is this a passable position? As the 88 getting past the 89 through the final corner, going to the inside line and move down well before the braking zone. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's almost like a, a two-phased uh, move that you you get a better run into Ingwe, which means that you set yourself up for the uh, the straights away as well and get a nice uh, run on your opponents behind that. So the 367 all-in racing entry. 
Uh, this is their, their other car, currently sitting in sixth place, starting to just build that pressure up and try and see if they can find something more, and that would be to take that fifth position away from Toro in at that 696 Cornet Strauss. Of course, at the wheel, he's looking to just have a uh, consistent streak out. He's got uh, good, fast teammates uh, that are able to, uh, to, to to drill down onto lap times. And we've seen them both, Jason Absmeyer and Alaric Enslin, coming into that car and doing a good job to get their entry towards the front of the field. Now they've got some consistency that they have to worry about. Just make sure that they do stay consistent and just have the race that they need to have before, uh, you know, Cornet gets out of the car, hands it over back to his teammates. So Kevin Chartier keeping the pressure on. The Bentley, uh, the big Bentley, as I like to call it in my head. Uh, I, I don't always like to say it out loud, but uh, it is a big car. Uh, Ryan calls it a brick. Uh, I like to call it a big brick and uh, doing some good stuff to, to just start to put the pressure on, get some variability in the, uh, the competitive manufacturers that are sitting within that top five. We saw a very dominant Audi uh, front end of the field, and uh, if Bentley can get themselves up there, they are going to try their best to do so. As we see, it will be start boards in the retro eSports Alpha. Um, Bentley to just get past Clinton Rydell in the White Rabbit Gaming Academy, Aston Martin. So again, just uh, mid, par mid parts of uh, the starting phase of this race and just allowing other drivers to uh, you may maybe be a little bit more confident on the circuit. Keep the car out of the wall is going to be the name of the game for a lot of these drivers out there and just avoid the chaos that, uh, that can come down. Yeah, avoiding the chaos is uh, going to be important for pretty much the entirety of this race. And one of the best ways to do that, you need to keep yourself clean, keep yourself out of trouble. It's easier said than done in these endurance races because not everything is under your control. And well, the longer the race goes on, you, you quite quickly find out that very little of it is within your control. And you're kind of just depending on other people around you. To not make mistakes. But uh, not a bad stint so far from the likes of Cornet Strauss. They're doing a pretty good job at this point in time. 14.7 seconds behind Davide Chiesa. And like you said, has some very, very fast teammates in that car. And uh, all they're going to be wanting from, from Cornet Strauss at this point in time is just, you know, go out there, have a comfortable stint. Don't damage the car and just, you know, bring it bring it back in when you're comfortable and uh, we'll, we'll see where we are at, uh, at that point uh, in, in the race. And it's not always a terrible idea to have someone who is, uh, you know, should we say a bit off the pace of, uh, of the other two drivers, just allows everyone to, you know, calm, calm everything down at, at one point during the race. Just got to uh, manage your expectations from the start. I think uh, I, I've touched on it a couple of times here. There's there's entries here of drivers that have never participated in a race of this kind of length, and I've uh, you know made it very clear that for them, just finishing uh, an event like this is going to be a win for them. So maybe outside of the points, maybe outside of the uh, the prize pool side, you've got some very competitive teams coming into the mix that want to get themselves. Uh, all the way up to the top of the, uh, the, the the winning prize pool, which is fair. But for a lot of these entries, it's a mixed skill grid. I think that's why uh, the the call coming in for the weatherman to just keep things nice and static and, and non-dynamic for the drivers for what should be the rest of the race. I mean, if things change up, they change up. But uh, from our understanding, that's the way that uh, it's going to be. And it, it, it's all about just getting it to, to the very end. You don't want to put yourself at risk yeah i mean it, it, how many times in an endurance race have we seen at george where one risky move is, is is it that's the win down the drain it's a podium down the drain it's a good result down the drain it's hours and hours of work down the drain and um you know you just need to keep it clean you need to keep it safe and it's harder said than done in an endurance race and of course the difficulty of doing that varies by circuit as well. Um, but, you know, out here at Kyle Army, uh, heard people say, oh, it's not the greatest track for, you know, for being able to lap people, make some overtakes. I don't know if I agree with that. I think there's 
quite a few good spots on this circuit where you can easily lap people and easily make some overtakes if uh, if you have the pace. But you know what? I I, I think you know t talking about the you know the, the keeping it clean and making it mistakes kind of thing. It's just going to come down to to that driver experience, and like you said, a lot of drivers here have probably never done a race of this scale before, and it's going to be a very very big learning experience for all of them. Uh, but but I can tell you myself from you know having raced in a 24 hour race before is you will you'll never quite understand or appreciate the preparation that goes into these races until you've actually gone and done one you can't uh, you can't knock anything till you've tried it that's for sure and we do know that uh, all of these drivers putting themselves in these positions today are undertaking a very big commitment in not just their own uh, own driving but doing so having to partner up with other teammates and and knowing that uh, your entire team's race is in your control for that control period that you have at the wheel so work that uh, other drivers have done to get you in that position can be undone just by your lack of uh, concentration for even a split second. So Rydell still just going to chase down, going to be behind the likes of Sean Buck. And uh, sorry, uh, that's going to be Buerta that he's uh, chasing down. He's got Buck behind him by 12 and a half seconds. So quite a big uh, you know, gap behind that he can work with and, and wants to just stay on the back end of that 738 Bentley in front currently finding themselves in p15 nicely in the middle of the field slightly in front of the middle of the field and with a lot of drivers and, and stints still to go just keeping the car in a good condition you don't want to hand over a damaged car to a teammate makes it super difficult for them to have to do what they need to do and uh, you don't want to really spend too much time uh, having the, the mechanics fix it up in at the pit box that's almost like just getting a penalty from the stewards which just doesn't go the way of uh, improving your race conditions so we said it just keeping it clean keeping it consistent is is the way that you want to be and uh, as things go a lot of these drivers have been doing that we've seen some incidents come down but that's racing isn't it ryan you do you do see these things occur yeah, you do it's uh i mean it, it... I would say it's impossible to, to to go through a race like this without having some sort of issues. It's probably not impossible, but very improbable. I think even the even the teams up towards the front of the grid come across their own set of issues during the race. Speaking of issues, the number forty-two finding some issues on the exit of Leocop and just tapping the inside barrier oh just waiting for the bentley to get going so that they can rejoin the circuit and uh oh we've seen or i've just seen the triple six uh which is in 10th place just had a drive-through come out for track limits abuse so what one of the one of the staples of uh, acc endurance racing has uh, made its presence known and I don't think that's the last uh, drive-through for track limits that we're going to see in this race, George. Nope, it's uh, it's certainly not going to be. And uh, this triple six was certainly uh, starting to get to the place where I thought that they were, you know, maybe pushing the limits when it came to what the stewards would think was acceptable. But uh, drive-through penalty coming out, and they've got three laps to serve that. That's going to put them down and allow the likes of Keeble, who is. Uh, he is still trying to chase down and, and make up positions so you know these are these are like the self-serving um equalizers that uh, other teams will be relying on yeah and it, it, it's so difficult in a 24-hour race to not pick up was it four track limit violations and here we have a replay with robert hart and the number 70. Allowing some cars through. And I believe both of those cars were uh, were cars that had already lapped the number 70 Aston Martin. Not entirely sure if that was the case. But uh, yeah, it's incredibly hard to, you know, to, to go through 24 hours without picking up three or four rather uh track violations i mean i struggled to do it in an hour george i don't know about you but um 
<laughs> it, really, it really is a challenge. And of course, when you have different drivers in the cars as well, some of them may be more aggressive on the track limits than others. You do often find yourself in a situation where someone can go through three, four hours perfectly clean stints, and then one driver picks up three warnings in the space of five laps in their one stint. Oh, it's uh, it's the worst thing that can happen to your entry, you know, and especially as a driver, the, the guilt and the responsibility on you sort of feels like you've let the team down. Uh, when you when you are exceeding the track limits so it's it's all about uh keeping positive and i think um you know if, if you are getting to that point where you are getting uh you know a little bit fatigued you're making mistakes picking up uh picking up those warnings it's, it's always better to just uh, have someone calm in your ear letting you know that you know it's going to be okay just sort of take it a little bit easier there's no need to to push 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 all the time we have a long race ahead of us and when you do find yourself uh, exceeding those and, and getting those drive-through penalties, it's costly. It doesn't it doesn't stop itself. Once you've exceeded it, you've exceeded it, and it's very frustrating to to know that uh, you you have to then stay within those racing limits. I mean, that's part of racing. We talked about regulation early on when it came to rule sets, but uh, the drive-through side of things that the that the sim. Uh, regulates is, is there for a reason you know make sure that people aren't getting an advantage that's unfair and uh, if they are they are punished for it so on both edges of that coin it's uh, both a sucky thing to have happen but also a great thing because it means that that you are regulating it up in ninth place no heron at this stage in the race, chasing down Grobler in the Audi. Ooh, a bit of jostling for position coming into Cheetah and the 87 Aston Martin having to take to the grass. Probably not appreciating someone trying to uh, lap them <laughs> through Cheetah. Definitely not the ideal part of the circuit to be lapping a car. And, I mean, uh, I mean, like lapping them, lapping them at that part, and trying to get a positional move done on that number one hundred Audi. Certainly going to be a moment where all the drivers involved were going ooh in the background, and uh, I'm just glad to see that everyone got through that okay. Heron allowed to be set loose onto the back end of Krabler in that number 100 Audi and we've seen them uh, we've seen all in racing doing some good things in the other entries and right now just uh, trying to make sure that they can get one of their cars as far up the order as they can the Arashi racing number 100 currently piloted out by JC Krobler doing a good job to just keep themselves within that top 10 will also be wanting to hold on to that position and uh, you know again do they let this driver through? Are they uh, are they worthy of uh, you know being let through, or do they decide to to hold it on a little bit longer, or oh, oh, trying to go a little bit uh, on the outside? A bit of uh, rubbing coming in the number thirty four and the eight hundred seven making contact towards the top of Leo Corp. And it's always nice to see drivers getting out of that without too much impact to their racing. These GT three cars quite sensitive when it comes to aero and uh, very setup specific. So if you are uh, bumping bumping rides and uh, picking up those uh, those sort of um, I, I mean rubbing is racing is one thing uh, elbows out is another but if you are damaging your car it's just going to be costly to both of you later on in the race uh, that's true and uh, I mean these are GT3 cars which you, you can see the enormous wings on the back of them uh, you know they they do use a lot of uh, a lot of aerodynamics to help keep the car secured to the ground through some of these fast sections. Obviously, nothing near what the prototypes or Formula One or Formula cars in general would use aerodynamically. But they still do use a significant part of the you know the overall chassis and the rear wing and splitters to try and use that aerodynamic force to grip the car up to the ground as much as possible and you know the more elements of that that you start to damage you know the, the worse the car is going to feel it's not going to grip to the track as well and uh, it, it's one of the issues that we we see uh, in say for example multi-class racing where you have gt4s for example with gt3 cars the gt4s because they're a lot less aero dependent you can kind of bash them up a bit more and they won't really care i mean i've had about 10 15 seconds of damage on an alpine before and the car doesn't really feel it that much because it's, you know, it's mostly aero damage, which the car doesn't really care about. But you pick up 10, 15 seconds of damage on a GT3 car and, well, 
pick it up on the wrong part of the car as well, and uh, the car's not going to enjoy that. You're not going to enjoy driving it either. No, it's uh, it's something that takes away from that consistent predictability. The more that uh, you, you are damaging that, oh, that is uh, that is a bit of an unfortunate situation as that uh, Ferrari getting it all wrong, coming down through the mine shaft, picking up the grass and then acting uh, what, what would be just as a passenger as the uh, car came back across the track. Ryan giving me the, uh, the big eyes of ooh as we watch that as well. And um, it's not nice to be, uh, to be taken out or to just have a car veering across in front of you. I was, I, I was midway through having a drink when I saw that incident and um, I did have to pause for a moment. Um, but, uh, yeah, not, not great to see, but what is great to see is, uh, the battle going on here between Buck and Runart, Aston Martin and Bentley, the two British manufacturers going toe-to-toe -to -toe out here at Kyalami, Arno Vasahi, and this is going to be a replay of Arno Vasahi, and this is an overtake, this is another version of, uh, British versus British, and, oh, that was rather... Easily done for the Bentley, making its way through the Aston Martin, deciding didn't really want to fight that one, and it's going to allow the Bentley through. But um, unless my eyes deceive me at the moment, George, that Bentley seems to be facing some issues. Uh, just uh, just a little bit of uh, a couple of uh, fuel fuel uh, injection issues. You know the the stutter and spluch as uh, a carbureted uh, VW Beetle would feel, but uh, it looks like they are still going to be uh, going side by side. Reynolds trying to get that move done onto Sean Buck. Maybe Buck uh, seeing some issues with that Bentley, deciding let them let them go on by. But uh, Alexander Reynolds getting getting things done. Well, the 88 Bentley definitely didn't slow itself down through those uh, fuel injections and uh, makes its way up into 16th place. And we can see the 96 car, the second place car, Side Max Motorworks, trying to make its way through now. 9.2 seconds between themselves and the leader. So not too much between them. It was 16 seconds, I believe, George, when uh, when we initially came into the commentary box between those two cars. So Michael Kundachoglu has uh, definitely closed the gap to Giorgio Simonini. And in fact, now it's down to 8.7 seconds. So I wonder if the GTWR Audi is just struggling to clear traffic at this point in the race. I mean, it could be they've uh, they've been out and, and pushing also for a, a, a fair amount of time. Uh, you know, they've uh, seemed to have one goal, which was to come out, not just uh, take things nice and easy, but try and make up positions where they could. Michael Condachaglio just uh, showing us that uh, there are some blue flag conditions out there and just navigating the inside line through Ingwe. Space being given on at the outside, making it nice and easy to navigate that. But it's not like that throughout the whole circuit. And the balance that these drivers have to find, it's, it's almost like a timing game. You need to make sure you're at a place at the track where the driver in front of you uh, has a safe place to let you through. Some dangerous parts of the circuit, tight and narrow twisties, something like the uh, Yuxke is not, not a place you want to get that kind of thing done. But this uh, little back stretch down past the old uh, the pit lane, that's, uh, that's certainly a place that you can find a little bit of space given out to you before you make the right hander of sunset. This number 96 certainly flying out there, Michael, in the Sidemax Motorworks number 96, just doing as much as they can. But you saw even that little bit of traffic that they got caught up with there kind of cost them sort of uh, almost four tenths of a second in, in getting that done. Yeah, I said with traffic management before, it's a skill, but it does also require a little bit of luck. You can catch cars at the wrong place at the wrong time, and there's realistically nothing you can do about it. Oh, but that's probably something could have been done about that. The 129 Aston Martin. Oh, just misjudging it, I think they're expecting that the Ferrari wouldn't turn back in, but the 255 fully entitled to come back in as they were and unfortunately turned around and 
maybe a couple I think, of uh, I think it, the bank car. I think it was it was it was a misjudgment coming in. They they coming to lap that car, and uh, thinking that maybe they're going to to leave the space at the top of Leocorp and just stay sort of out wide, not come in towards the apex. And Sean Buck just uh, possibly just seeing a space and a gap, trying to you know get get the the clearance done on the back marker, and not able to to quite time that the way that they wanted to. Just one of those miscommunications that you do see on the track when lapping cars. And was that a car exit stage right just for a moment there um, that I saw on board? And we're going to get a little bit of a replay on that. This is car coming across. Watch the Lexus in front. Oh, does it get tapped by the Bentley? It looks like it does. You didn't quite see it from this angle, but um, w without being able to see all the evidence, George, that kind of looked like an incident. Oh, looked like contact, and that wasn't contact, but not much better down towards turn two. Oh, that's, uh, that was a, a scary situation for that Aston Martin. Uh, it looked like a little bit of a slap coming on, and just losing the rear end, bouncing off of the outskirts of the track, picking up some damage and then coming back and getting contacted almost uh, in a T-bone-like fashion. So not going to be an ideal situation to be in. I think uh, Nigel Richardson then going to have a lot of damage done to the front end of that Audi. The downforce at the front going to be compromised and that's going to force the number 57 to have to consider what they do when they come in for that pit stop, going in for repairs and seeing if uh, you know they, they need to manage that damage as best they can. If it's not something that's affecting the, the area variation on the car, they, they, they still feel that it's turning in okay. They feel that their time is, uh, is doing okay. They're just going to, to stay away from you know, having to unnecessarily repair the car. But uh, I struggle to see how that wouldn't be something that, uh, that feels a little bit off now whilst driving. Yeah, I have to agree there. And we're looking at uh, Jaco Nord at this point in time, 19th place, the number 89. That's quite nice, Esther Martin Livery George. I quite like the sort of mixture of black and very dark grey. Let's put some yellow accents on there as well. I mean, Ryan, uh, Ryan saying that something with a bit of yellow looking good, but uh, I guess it's done in in it's almost like highlight accents, not not too much on the car, and definitely not too lumo bright colours. It's uh, it's quite subtle, but it works well with those daytime running lights down in the uh, the front scoop of the air intake as well. So accented quite nicely, and uh, grey on an Aston Martin does look good day in day out. So Giorgio Simonini will continue onwards in the lead of the race at this point in time. The 157 GTWR Audi, 10.3 seconds up the road. And uh, Michael Kondrachoglu, who has decreased that gap since he got in the car, will be hoping that he can maybe decrease it a bit more before they come back into the pit lane. And then it's Owen Wenlock in third place with Davide Chiesa in fourth and Kevin Chartier in fifth place. Taro dropping out of the top five for the moment, but still plenty of the race to go. And in fact, uh, we haven't even reached a quarter of a way through this race as I just look up towards the clock again. and realize that uh, we haven't hit the six hour mark and these endurance races, George, you know, they they, they, they kind of feel that they, they have different flows to them. At, at one point, you kind of think, man, the, the race really is it is a long time, 24 hours. And then before you know it, you, you've arrived to the last couple of hours of the race and you're wondering where all the action's gone. <laughs> it is it is a, a window that suddenly finds, finds itself closing rather quickly. You, you're kind of uh, trying to time things out and you, you find yourself running out of time to get things done. You feel like, oh, we've got a long road ahead of us. 
and then very quickly you've got to get your yourself into gear to to try and see how you're going to close the race out triple seven having a spin out the final corner seeing quite a few people full victim is this the inside curb again no it was very wide actually on the outside and just looping the car but quite a few drivers caught out by that here today definitely a couple of drivers uh, being caught out for gtwr they have had a good read on the race as things have been they've uh, managed uh, whatever sort of struggles they've had to manage and uh, done so to keep themselves out at the front end of the order and ryan we have a very special guest uh, joining us up here a friend of mine and of course uh, has been joining us out at racing club international to do the gt4 series uh, season two on thursday it's my pleasure to welcome sam wright into the box hey g hey ryan Happening, guys tell me what, what's the news here i've heard I, i've been able to watch a little bit but but i've also heard there's been some action that i've missed as well so fill me in so i mean uh it's it's been uh, complete chaos for a lot of the teams they've uh, they've found themselves in a situation that they don't want to be in but up at the front end it really hasn't been too too despairing as uh, gtwr they didn't start in pole position but they've made their way up towards it. Sidemax Motorworks, their number six, uh, number 96 entry. They have uh, pretty much started on pole, found themselves sitting down in second place. Now GTWR looking to take a victory here. GTWR in the SimGrid 12 hour uh, for, for Kyle Lamy. They found a, a race win there. And then that Sidemax entry, the number 96 six, sitting in second place. They've had two back-to-back -back victories in 24 hour uh, events hosted at other communities so they're looking to almost make it a hat trick here and gtwr kind of uh, the narrative here is that they take away that third win from them it's a pretty exciting stuff still early in the early in the race right we still got a lot of time though so they got to just try and keep it going up at the front there and, and maintain that position indeed uh, a lot of um a lot of racing still to go a lot of uh sort of driver swaps to take place a lot of uh, pit stop strategies to still come into effect uh, drivers need to of course uh, manage those tires they've got infinite amounts of tire sets that they can uh, they can kind of have at their disposal so if you are finding that your your grip's running out then you can go into the pits and make a tire change but Obviously, that's costly um, to your team, having to do those unnecessarily. So it's a bit of a balance between pushing and managing your tires, as well as uh, just making sure that your fuel levels are set up. So I think there's uh, room for strategy changes. And of course, the infamous uh, the, the, the side of, of, of sim racing, you know, if, if someone has a major crash or, or, or they find themselves uh, into the wall, that can just change up the, the order entirely. So, so far, really, really in impressive racing. And I mean, I have to say, like, I've come in here, Ryan, G, you're two of my favorite people to listen to. But also, I'm just really excited about how much support this 24 hours got. Like, look at all these sponsors, which is absolutely incredible. All the support from the community. It's really exciting. It's great. I mean, it's uh, it's something that uh, we've been kind of working on to, to try and put together for a little while. Uh, a big shout out goes to the sponsors, Pure Storage, NEC, Data Sciences, Oxide, AMD and Supermicro uh, for getting behind the cause. It's uh, it's cool to see RaceFace and the Solidarity E-Race uh, partnered up to bring this event. And it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just limited down to local drivers and talent. It was expanded out. We've got the international teams coming through the best of uh, the best of Europe, for example, and We've also got the best of our of our South African drivers out here as well. So it's a nice a nice mixture coming out into the field and a big collaborative effort to to get this uh, this event going. So who am I watching? We're watching um, the the GTWR racing team. This is the one G that you're saying is is to watch potentially trying to take the victory here. For sure, it's uh, like Ryan mentioned up uh, a team that sort of formed up towards the back end of 2020. And uh, since starting to enter into events, they've got a really strong driver lineup. One of their, their local drivers or the, the local South African talents, of course, Jordan Sherritt, who has come into ACC and taken sort of the, 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 the sim by storm, has incredible pace 
uh, when it comes down to hot laps, has some great driving uh, abilities and good consistency as well. And his teammates have all been sort of complementary in there. It's always something difficult trying to build up a team and find people of uh, sort of equal talents to be able to um, all deliver on the same level all the time. And I feel that GTWR is one of those big contenders for sure. Taking a look as well uh, at that racing board, George, only two Porsches. Is that a little bit upsetting to you? So far that I've seen, I'm sure maybe there's more. Uh, there's three Porsches, only three, George. Well, what's that about? I don't like that all of you come here and bully <laughs> me about this. Like, uh, it, it feels like everyone just uh, comes in, bullies me unnecessarily. Um, but, but you are right. It's something that hurts me slightly. So uh, I've got a little bit of uh, an inner bias that's screaming for the Porsches. Uh, to do well. I know that Toro has, uh, has, has mentioned it on Twitter in their social posts that they, they want to have a good race. Uh, PWSR here, they've unfortunately been plagued with difficulties in this race. They find themselves down in 36th and trying to make their way through the order catch up once again. But yeah, it hasn't gone the way for the Porsches. The Audis have been pretty dominant and um, that in itself doesn't make me sad because it's uh, it's good to still have a German manufacturer up in the uh, the leaderboard side of things. We knew that coming into this, the Audis and the Porsches were quite strong. And it's been interesting to see where the other manufacturers kind of stack up alongside them. So we're now watching, uh, I think, Michael Appleton here doing a quick replay. Ryan, George, walk us through what we're taking a look at. Oh, uh, well, this kind of just like looks like Michael Appleton getting it all wrong down towards turn two and looping the car around, but getting it turned around quite effectively and not in anyone's way either. So a nice safe rejoin from the number 70, which is always good to see. Sam, you'll, uh, you'll actually be familiar with that uh, with that team. Of course, uh, Appleton driving the car at the moment, but it's the Hart Racing team. That's got both Robert and Kelly Hart uh, driving in the car for, for the race. Oh, wow. so Rob Ang is Kelly driving as well. Look at that. Yes. I like this. I like this commitment. Of course, two well-known people in the South African esports world uh, and excited to see Kelly getting behind the wheel with her husband, Rob. Um, they also have a, a small baby, so they can start training him up young and then they have an extra driver. One day when she's uh, old enough to drive, I'm sure <laughs> that uh, Rob will make sure that uh, she's behind the, the sim racing rig. And it, it's just cool, like you said, to see a husband and wife uh, entry coming through into into an event like this and there's plenty of uh, teams that do have I know the uh, the Monday night racing entry Eddie Francis they've got uh, Taryn driving in in their car as well as far as I understand I think that's uh, Eddie's sister um, in law or I, I might be wrong on, on where these things come out but it's just good to see you know there's there's a wholesome level of competitiveness up towards the front of the the order teams wanting to take on that prize pool but also throughout the mid pack there's uh, there's plenty of other uh, entries that just want to um, get themselves uh, to to the checkered flag you know for sure and i think it's just also great for for some of the south african drivers to be involved as well like you said this is an international event there's such incredible commentators working on this i feel a little bit overwhelmed i've got to watch ryan drive and i've listened to him before and now i'm in a box with him oh as i say that a little bit of a bump going on there a little bit of a bump and uh, sending them off track. You're right, Sam. We, uh, the two of us on Thursdays, uh, we, we commentate on that GT4 championship with uh, Racing Club International, and that's been a lot of fun. Ryan uh, driving out in, in the lone Alpine representation, um, and we, we often call him the, the little car on, on the track. So now he's in the box <laughs> and he's allowed to shout at us. He's the cute little car on the track. You forgot the cute bit, uh, but that's, that's our fun in the GT4 championship. This oh, is quite... What is happened to to Woods's entry here just um mm. stationary on track the Mew racing works uh, 242 unable to get started again and having to uh, get immediately towed back to the pit box i was gonna say the the signs there initial thoughts from what i have seen in the past potential hardware failure perhaps I mean, it could be that not being able to to get the car get the car going again. Something ha happened. Uh, ended up 
slowing down after the corner and coming to a complete halt. So we'll have to get some more feedback on that. I mean, sometimes it's nice, you know, to just stop in the track, watch all the fast cars come past you, get a really nice view. <laughs> I mean, obviously you shouldn't do that, but maybe, you know, just for, for fun. You've still got 18 hours to go. I, I think, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, that's not a place you want to have a nice view. It's, it's very scary as the cars make the exit out of barbecue here. Um, a very fast-paced uh, portion of the track to be stopped behind. And we saw on screen briefly Daniel Rowe there, and now we're looking at Christopher Radloff, and the two of them just uh, also making moves on the circuit. Daniel Rowe, of course, real-life uh, driver for VW, and the head of the hybrid sim racing team. Also, talented driver lineup in their car, so uh, keep an eye out for the hybrid uh, academy and uh, just making sure that uh, as many talented drivers get their way into a, into a seat and, and able to drive. So Sam, when it, uh, when it comes down to it, the important question that uh, Ryan and I always uh, spend a lot of time talking about is, is talking about the colors of the cars and <laughs> the, favorite, uh, the favorite livery. So maybe Stewie, our broadcaster, can give us a run through of our order from, from first place. We'll go through and pick, uh, pick our favorite livery. You know, you, you have the, the very prestigious spot here at being able to decide with us as we, uh, as we run through. I want, I want feedback on each car as we go through it. Is that fair? That's fair. I mean, do you want me to, to give you some insights into the side Max Motorworks car we're looking at now? Yes, I want to hear I thought it looked, this reminded me of how to train your dragon um, because the, the sort of red and yellow in the front there makes me think of fire. So okay, okay. It's a so I feel like this is an angry toothless. I'm a fan. <laughs> it's uh, intimidating. Uh, a lot of black on the car as well. Always like Dark Knight-esque. Um, Len looking at the GTWR entry, of course, uh, Jordan Sherritt's in that car now. And uh, they've obviously just come into the pit box. That's why they find themselves in second. But uh, very similar sort of paint schemes going on bar the, uh, the yellow. Bar the yellow. I'm such a fan of, of Jordan, though, so I feel like I'm going to be really biased. Yeah, I quite like it. Um, I think it looks pretty cool. I'm trying to think of what it reminds me of, and I, I can't quite place it. Uh, but I, I quite like those color combinations. I gotta be honest though, I'm probably gonna be in trouble for saying this. Uh, the, the Toothless was still my favorite. Favorite so far. We haven't gone through the entire field just yet. So just giving all the viewers a, a rundown of all the, uh, all the entries. And of course, Sidemax, uh, the, the second car going to be flavored the same way that the number 96 was. So I guess uh, based on that feedback from the first, uh, the first Toothless car, they, uh, they get themselves a a thumb of approval from Sam. Then looking at the Racing Line Motorsport entry, the number four, David uh, Davide Kissia. I always say his name wrong. Uh, Ryan Ryan is the pronunciation legend around here. Uh, Ryan, what, just give me the, the, the right way to say their name. It's Davide Chiesa. Oh, it's so so fresh. I love Ryan's you're voice when he comes in there. I was about to say, you're very lucky you have Ryan to, to help you with this pronunciation because otherwise you'd be upsetting a lot of drivers today. I mean, it happens all the time, and uh, thankfully, Rai Rai has got my back when it comes down to it. And once we're getting some flack from the uh, from the drivers, Ryan is there to to get me back. So, what do you think of the Racing Line Motorsports number one ninety currently out in fourth place? I think it's quite nice. Uh, I quite like the the one behind though, that white and red as well. Oh, I shouldn't jump away here. One nine two looks really good. There, there's a nice sort of blue steel look to it. That can be Ben Stiller. Shall we call one nine two Ben Stiller? <laughs> we can indeed uh, Kevin Chartier in your all in racing Bentley both Ryan and I have already sort of voiced our, our like for the uh, the Bentley in the way that they have uh, their, their sort of default liveries that get painted up but what is your feel on this one I quite like the I like the look of the Bentleys as well on the track so this looks quite nice uh, I like that that pretty sort of baby blue. I, I quite like the way it fades into the black. I also wish that I could do these designs because I, I think you could have tons of fun with these cars. That looks really nice. I, I, I mean, I'm, none of them look ugly, right? We haven't been through all of them, but I'm not going to say if they do either because that would be a little bit unfair. But I'm no. You have I'm, to be fair. You have to be honest. To be fair. Um, this is cool though. I quite, I quite like the blue fades black. Okay, so I mean, Sam likes every car that's either oh. 
Okay, now we get to the best looking car on the grid for sure. Is this uh, just because it's a Porsche? Um, I have no comments. Save me. <laughs> wow, George just called out on stream. Oh, wait, I see the number as well. Okay, I've got it. Uh, fair enough. Porsche 696. I approve, George. Doesn't even matter what the livery looks like, right? <laughs> it's, it's a very good looking car with a very good number. That, of course, is... Uh, it, it goes up there with my favorite racing numbers. So, uh, Corne Strauss in the Toro 696, just uh, doing a good job at uh, keeping the car in the position that he that he had it. To, you know, maybe dropping one or two positions since handover. Uh, then the Rigoli Racing EGA entry. They had a really nice uh, poster made uh, before this event, and uh, certainly something different. Different reminds me of a snake. I just want to touch on on the the car we just saw, the Porsche uh, number six nine six. I actually think I know that team, if I'm not mistaken. Obviously, it's Strauss, and I'm pretty sure Alaric Enslin is driving for them as well, as well as uh, Jason Absmeer, some of our South African drivers. Correct, correct. The Toro Racing team. You are right. Look at that MP six, number six nine six. Okay, cool. I approve this right here, though. Uh, this, the car we're watching right now, number 11, to me, this looks like a snake. For some reason, it reminds me of a snake. So, there you go. I have no idea why. I don't know how my mind works. Um, but I thought it had like a, a snake look to it. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Going over to another South African team. So, a lot of these teams, obviously, international up in at the top 10. But another local team, Arashi Racing, in at their number 100. JC Krobler behind that. Um, what, what, are, what are the feelers on this one? It's like a little forest color over here. Look at that green and blue. I mean, I, if people are watching, you can give your names as well. Let's just completely throw the commentators off for the rest of, of the 18 hours left of the race. Give all the cars weird names and just spam those in chat. So it'll be really confusing to them, but we'll know exactly what we're talking about. This one is, I'm going for forest vibes. So is, is forest vibes good, good or bad? I mean, it's not bad. Oh, this is quite nice though. Hold on, we're just jumping right on over um, to to nine six two. I like this. So there is a. I, I'm probably going to get into trouble. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be talking about other games, but there actually is a, a gun skin in, in a game I like to play called Rainbow Six Siege, called Black Ice. And this this livery reminds me of of the Black Ice gun skin. So, Keeble, good job. Thumbs up. MSV Racing. I like it. I like it a lot. Sam is 100% less critical of liveries than Ryan and, our, and, and myself. So, I mean, <laughs> Wait, I think are you the, guys all... quite critical? I, I mean, I'm trying to be nice to everyone because everyone's going to be driving for 24 hours. When they watch this back, I want them to all be happy because everyone thinks their car looks great. You don't want to be like, actually, that looks horrible. George, um, George, George, George and I are not like that at all. <laughs> um, we, we do try to be nice about people's color schemes, but Ryan doesn't like a lot of them. And then, you know, we play good cop, bad I'm cop. I'm just not a fan of fluorescent colors. <laughs> Ryan I mean, is very boring. He likes it. He likes I don't bland. like the high vis colors. <laughs> Hold on. So I'm very confused. So, so Ryan says he doesn't like fluorescent colors, but drives a neon pink bubblegum blue car. Well, hang I mean, on I've now, seen right? your liveries. I, I drive that because that's the team's obligation for the season. <laughs> I like that uh, I like that you call him out on his his, his lies to the viewers. Uh, yes, Ryan drives in a high res a high vis uh, fluorescent car on 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 the times that he's not commentating. So it is slightly biased that he uh, he hates them in this sim. But uh, going on to you no know, Heron in the number uh, thirteen, currently in ninth for All In Racing. Uh, quite. Uh, I would say quite uh, standard in terms of, of the livery, simplicity at its best. A lot of white works out well for a racing livery and uh, accented by blue. Sam, your, uh, your take, I know you're going to say it's lovely. Um, no, I was just going to go with subdued. Subdued. We've got some good, uh, some good adjectives coming through for descriptions now. So uh, Heron not going to get the, the best, uh, best vote coming out. Daniel, go say Georges in the 258 the smooth operators GP, the Ferrari that is uh, at the front end of the Ferraris in the pack, just outside the top 10 as it stands. How do we feel about this one? I mean, it's also, I'm, subdued is going to be my go-to when I'm kind of like, oh, it's a little bit boring, but I understand that the colors work. I still think Ferraris should always be red. I just don't think you should put any other color on a Ferrari except red. Ryan, uh, 
<laughs> Ryan just gave me this very like mm, look in the in the commentary <laughs> box. Ryan, how do you feel about such comments? I think I I, I think a Ferrari only being red is um, I don't I don't know what the the correct term is. Is it modernist? Clichéd. Uh, Clichéd. It's um, yeah. It, it is. I mean, for, Ferraris never used to be red. Their their original color was yellow, um, which a lot of people probably don't know. No, Lamborghinis are yellow. Ferraris are red. I'm too well, young La to Lamborghinis remember yellow be, Ferraris. La Lamborghinis can be an all assortment of colors. <laughs> At this point, with Ryan's favorite manufacturer being Lamborghini, you could make it high vis uh, vest yellow, lumo green, and and he would still say it looks lovely. So um, it's because it does. That, that, that is very pink. interesting. Fluorescent pink Lambo, and he'd still be like, I'm okay with this. Look, I would drive it, all right? Look, you're never going to see me say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on uh, a little bit, we get a little replay as well. Gary Richardson going to be featured in the race replay. Of course, we're just taking a little bit of, uh, oh, a, bit of a dive bomb coming down into the uh, barbecue left-hander. And for the car he hits, getting away pretty much uh, unscathed, but for... Richardson to, it didn't go the right way. I missed that for a moment because I was trying to see if I could find a fluorescent pink Lamborghini. That's okay. We, uh, we're going to look at the 666 uh, BBR racing entry here. Of course, an Audi. Lots of Audis on, on, on the grid and on the field. And uh, Fazekas in this 666 entry. I mean, we, we called uh, some, some subdued entries maybe a little bit uh, subdued. This uh, is probably going to go the same way. It's got a splash more uh, interesting in in terms of the livery selection. You know, you've got the the red roof that fades over the top, going onto the uh, onto the bonnet slightly. Some accents with the red. Ryan, your feedback before we go to Sam. Um, I think it's nice. I think it's <laughs> a cup of I, tea I, is I, nice, I, Ryan. A cup I of tea it, is nice. I, 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 I mean, I, I said before, I like I like the stealth black look, but judging by judging by this race, I kind of feel like black and red is a very overused combination. I I, I feel like I've seen this the, the, this color scheme too many times this race. So far. I mean, I mean that's that's quite fair. I mean, uh, when I was growing up, whatever color little remote control car I could I could choose. I always went with the black and red one or my scooter or whatever it was. So uh, it was a favorite color scheme of mine, but maybe being uh, used a little bit too much here. We're going to, uh, of course, hear from Sam. What did you think of the uh, the black and red uh, detailed Audi there? I'm very much in agreement with Ryan. I think there is a lot of sort of black and red standard look. Um, also, I wanted to jump back, you know, Ryan made the comment about the Ferraris, but I have a, an equally controversial opinion that all Jaguars should be in British racing green. So I, I, maybe I'm just a, a weird, but cars have certain colors and certain manufacturers should only be in those colors. That's how I feel about that. I mean, I think it's it's linked a lot to the aesthetic and the way that they see. And I mean, luckily we don't have any Jaguars on the grid uh, today. They, uh, what do they you mean been... luckily? Ryan, I know that it hurts you when I say that, but luckily we don't have any Jaguars on the grid today. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm personally, I'm not a fan of Jags at all. Which, coming from a British person, probably sounds like heresy. But um... that, that, that threw me for a six. I'm not gonna lie. The moment I hear a British person <laughs> say I'm not a fan of a Jag, I always said that when I reached the point in my life where I, I could afford nice things, I was gonna buy myself a Jag, and everyone said it's an old man's car. And this upset me greatly because I was like, no, 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 one day I'm going to have myself a little jag. <laughs> they're, quite, they're quite cheap in the UK secondhand. Um, they, they they age quite nicely, but I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm just not too much of a, I'm not too big of a fan. I see too many of them on the street. They have low mileage because they're always broken and go get, don't get driven. So uh, that's <laughs> that why their fair. price is so good. So, you know, I'll just I'll just shoot some shots there. Uh, looking at the uh, Ida Pro eSports entry, the number 158 Bentley. Uh, I know I'm not even going to ask Ryan for his opinion because there's there's high uh, Lumo yellow on it already. Wow. Um, <laughs> so, Sam, uh, is, is this one a little bit muted? I, I think uh, you, you might call it that way. It's not too crazy. No, as I have a new nickname for this one. So 158 is going to be the cartoon Batman because I remember there was a Batman that had yellow accents at some point. 
Okay, the, the cartoon Batman comes through, and to you guys who are joining us in the chat, so we've got Sam Wright in at the box with us. She's uh, very prominent in the South African esports e uh, e industry, does a lot of uh, international work as well, and she's getting herself into the sim racing side. I like to say it's my good influence. I, I told her that she needs to come and uh, do some more stuff with Racing Club International, and she's, uh, she's definitely been showing that... Uh, this side of, of esports is very interesting. So uh, it's good to have her in the box with us. We're just running through all our competitors, giving everybody a bit of screen time as well. Uh, you know, when, when a field is, is sort of spread out and, and quite busy at times, uh, not everybody gets their entry shown up on the screen. And uh, I think it's nice to just kind of highlight all the competitors that are taking place. So we, we're having a little bit of a fun sort of session here, of course, the Pure Storage Kyle Army 24 hour in a partnership with Solidarity E Race and. Uh, powered by Raceface. A big shout out to our sponsors, Pure Storage, NEC, Data Sciences, Oxide, AMD, and Supermicro for making this all possible. And a big shout out to the crew at Racing Club International for uh, helping out with the broadcast and, and the live stream, of course, uh, our commentators for coming through. It is so lovely to be here with you guys. Wherever you're joining in the world, it's probably a, a different weather condition for you. I know that here in the UK, it's very windy and gray and overcast outside. So it's perfect time to uh, to be kept indoors. Could be different wherever you are in the world. But we're looking at Daniel Rowe in the uh, 404 Bentley. They've, uh, they're running with a stock standard livery that comes in the game. And of course, uh, that, that's got the, uh, the South African flag on it. So I feel... As South Africans are going to say that this one is lovely. I'm obviously a huge fan. I mean, can't, I'm not going to fault this. I'm, you know, born and bred. So the Bentley team, you get a, a thumbs up from me. I approve. Thumbs, <laughs> thumbs, thumbs up comes through. Ryan giving the thumbs up. I think uh, we've we've converted him to being half South African anyway. Uh, he was joining. Ryan joined me for a lot of the race face stuff that we were doing uh, last year. And, uh, you know, we, we joked about it as him being a little bit South African now. So Sean Stratum for the logistical nightmares. They come in and, and I mean, this is a team that, that is very much identified by their color scheme on their cars. They run a lot of custom liveries uh, and, and have some good designs on their customs that come through. The orange and white comes in and then we go over to Yako Nordia in the, the the jacks entry this is a, a nardo gray number 89 aston martin it's got the accents of yellow this one ryan actually approved of at the time so uh he's he's quite a fan of it sam yeah, I quite, is it yeah i mean i quite like this as well but i just don't think any color looks bad on an aston martin to be honest i mean if you I try mean, hard enough, that... you, you probably can no, <laughs> no. <laughs> nothing looks bad i really like this um but I am a big fan of the car, so there you go. <laughs> and there I can't we go. criticize we... an Aston Martin. I just think they look quite nice. Except that, wait, what is that? Oh, I was about to say something very mean. That's like a bit. That's of a the Power car. Rangers. That's the Power Rangers Ferrari that I know it you. you a little, yeah, you that turn is a your little, nose up. I was gonna say clown car, but fine. Power Rangers sounds a lot better. Let's go with with Power Rangers. Of course, uh, Ian McKenzie, currently at the wheel of the 714. This is the White Rabbit Gaming Academy entry. I voiced my distaste at my team uh, not picking a Porsche and going with a yuck, Aston Martin. Hurts Hold on, when you say say Academy, it. is this the team that has someone with the name Turtle in it? Yes, this is uh, this is the team with Byron, <laughs> Byron can, we just have a, can we just have a conversation about this? Why would you give yourself the nickname Turtle as a sim driver? He, he wasn't Turtles a sim are driver. extremely slow. Except if there's sharks chasing them and they have to go no, fast. This, I still think that they're pretty slow. But but it does look very nice. I was surprised to see that it wasn't a Porsche. I, I, I actually was a little bit shocked and I wondered who was getting kicked from the team. No um, one's, for making no one's, this decision. No one's getting kicked. We just have a, a severe management meeting later on to discuss it. We'll go on to the uh, Kinetic Sim Racing Pulse entry. Chris Devet at the wheel of that number 87. Uh, we see some Aston Martin in some Aston Martin British Racing Green with a splash of... I'm really bad with the you know colors when it comes down to... Is that orange or is that red? Uh, to me, that looks a little bit orange. Orange. I think it's orange as well. Ryan, oh, can, can we call it orange or is it red? I think that's I think that's more red to me, um, at least on 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 my end. It, yeah, de definitely. A, I, I'd call that a, a a more red color. Just a comment quickly. 
Um, <laughs> I mentioned on the turtle. On no, the turtle we're conversation. Not, stop it. Uh, no, I've I had to quickly Google the top speed of a turtle, and uh, I've been given. Uh, Google has answered me with a leatherback sea turtle can reach speeds of 35 kilometers per hour in the water. That is fast. That so is to fast. say that a turtle is slow is. Uh... <laughs> there I mean, we have go. you ever seen? Have you ever seen a, a turtle on the Kailami racetrack? Because once we see the turtle drive, we can make a call here. But I'm concerned that it might be slow. Ooh. I'm sorry, Ooh. Byron. I am Sam, sorry, Byron. It Sam, was for the Sam. joke. It was for the joke. <laughs> Sam shooting shots here at my my team. I've uh, I've made it very clear that I am the uh, the team principal for White Rabbit Gaming, and I'm very proud of my team. Even if we have uh, we have turtles in there, we, we're doing well. And of course, uh, the entry currently being fielded, the academy team, all coming out from different esports, not uh, not really uh, prioritarily focused on on just doing sim racing. So when it comes to other titles, they're all very talented, and uh, I'm just very proud of them. Even if Sam keeps calling them out for being slow. Oh, no, it was just for the joke. I mean, it was just for the, the giggles. No, for sure, for sure. I, I, didn't, we... I didn't mean it. Unless he is slow, then, then we'll all chuckle <laughs> off. <laughs> we, will, we will not chuckle. I will be sad. But uh, we go down to the Red Line uh, Racing League 221. Again, I think this one is going to get the same vote from all of us. Too much red and black on a, on a grid that has a lot of red and black. They've got a bit of white in there as well, though. Yeah, I think it's too much. We're seeing a lot of this. It's a, it's a very, this color scheme seems to be everyone's favorite, the, the black, red, and white. I think it's a very, uh, a very popular color choice coming out. Gold. Lucas, yes, this is gold. Oh, I like this. Is, this. Uh, this is, this is, uh, you've got, got a lot of the chrome going on. So you've got the, the chrome silver, the chrome gold, and then the uh, accented matte black at the back. So quite a, quite a few different uh, elements going on. I personally am a fan because I like that bling bling, so I'll I'll give it my uh, my thumbs up of approval. Ryan, it's <laughs> no I when he does well... that when he does that high pitched like reply. It's I know he's <laughs> not a fan. <laughs> I think it's fine. <laughs> I I think I think there are better cars on looking cars on the grid. I think there are worse cars looking cars on the grid. I would, I would say that if you're going to do black and gold, there are better ways to do it. Brian is, is quite That's a shade, critical eh? artist. That's shade. A critical artist. I'm a he's graphic, a graphic designer. designer. I have he's to a, be. Oh, he's, gosh. So you see it comes why. out. Oh, yeah. Dear. He's <laughs> in standard dance. <laughs> my my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go, Sam. You, yeah, you actually asked about, about the... Yeah, you asked about the Black Widow Racing team and uh, the BWR Vipers here, Kevin Barber. Ryan has already commented on this, saying that that green is okay because it's British racing green. Sam? So I'm, this is really fun for me because this team is actually driving to raise money for breast cancer. So that's something that they're doing, um, which is why you can see those pink ass accents. And I really like it. Uh, I, it was supposed to be all pink. I'm glad they didn't do that. I quite like the pink finishes with the green. I think it looks fantastic. And also, what a great cause to be driving for. So a big high five to the Black Widow Racing Vipers. I, I like this. I think it looks sleek. I think it looks pretty cool. Um, and I, I like it. I thought the colors were good. And also, I have mentioned that I have a, a small taste for British racing green. So I like that we mixed it in with the pink. So uh, getting the, the thumbs up all around then. I'm, uh, I'm just going to let my co-casters vote that one as, uh, as a thumbs up. And of course, with our teams, we uh, we have a good we have a good variety of uh, entries coming through. Different paint schemes, different cars, different colours. We're just doing a uh, an hour of of liveries at this point. We've got Sam right in the box with us, right? And, and I have been taking things very seriously up until this point. So uh, just taking a little bit of a, a less serious side. But of course, the racing still continues out on the track. When we do have some action, we do switch to that. We, we try and pick it up on the replays as well. But we had that phase of the race where, where things are sort of just settling down or have settled down. And uh, it's all down to to where these guys uh, managed to get themselves. Looking at the triple nine, the, the only BMW M6 on at the grid, the blacked out or, or the murdered out odin racing at bmw I, i'm a big fan of the way that they've uh, they've painted this car to be honest even though it, it looks like they haven't painted it 
black I, I like it as well i just think it looks quite sleek i'll feel sorry for the commentators later when the lights go down because uh, obviously the the i know ryan hates the fluorescent colors as he's told us but they stand out quite nicely when, when you need to spot those and you've got those tired eyes and from the common from the comms box it can help but i actually like this i i quite i just like the look of it right i think it suits that that all black look on the bmw be aggressive be be aggressive that is the the, the song that is playing on the inside of that BMW N6 and talking about murdered out paint jobs, the Square Racing team. Oh, I mean, is that a is that a good looking Porsche? Is that a good looking Porsche? I would have added more color. <sighs> Can you guys just approve Porsches for like five <laughs> minutes? Like just. I, I just think a... I think it's nice. I think it's but, nice. I, Ryan, I like... when you say it's nice, that means it's it's not nice. No, no, like... no George, George. I mean, it's not it's not that. It's not too different to the BMW. It's got, uh, obviously, it's got the, the the back end is, is that like a very dark kind of blue? Like light it, I was going to say lightish dark blue, but that doesn't make sense. Um, it, it's got some form of bluey gray on the back end. I hadn't um, noticed that. It actually, I quite like that. Like it just enhances the, the back end of the Porsche. Oh, a little flash to the light that is as well. Yeah, just like uh, letting us know okay. that they, they, they can see us and they, they want us to continue to talk about how good Porsches look. It doesn't matter I what do. color they are painted. I take, it, I take it back, George. I do actually really like the the, the, the slight change that, that I'd missed that Ryan pointed out on the back. Just enhancing the, the booty a little bit. I, I actually think it looks quite good. I dig it. Yes, yes. A little, uh, little bit of the hazard lights as well, just approving uh, of our approval of their, their entry. The, we have already seen this uh, KSR entry, but this is, of course, a battle for position. We are half a second behind Chris DeVette, trying to put some pressure onto Ian McKenzie in the White Rabbit Gaming Academy, number 714. That uh, time deficit closing down over the last couple of laps. And Stewie just uh, letting us know that uh, he wants us to focus on the racing every now and again, which, of course, the, uh, the viewers will appreciate very deep into the uh, entry of Crowthorn. That's going to put them side by side as they make their way through the Yuxke sweep. And the KSR team, Pulse, looking to make a move. Uh, it's going to be McKenzie on the outside. He's going to be very deep out of barbecue. And that is going to be the position done. Just uh, keeping nice and wide. Just making sure that, uh, you know, they, they weren't going to come into contact. Ian then will lose that position up. But uh, with 17 hours on the clock still to go, it still blows my mind that we've got 17 more hours of racing to go. And uh, a little race replay as well. Daniel Jose George's little tap coming on to that. Aston Martin sending him onto the grass and gravel. Flash of the lights in disapproval coming out from the Aston Martin. Just saying, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a fan of the way that uh, you got past there. And we can see that Bettini in that Audi that we talked about, the uh, the snake, as Sam called it, starting to put pressure onto the back of Toro in at that 696. I really like the driving from uh, Devet that we saw earlier on. I thought it just looked really sleek and smooth. Uh, a nice move, obviously, McKenzie dropping that spot. But like you said, we've got, you know, 18 hours to go, but it was really, it just looked really good around the corner there. Um, and it just, it's always nice to watch those little moves. It's a long race, so it's exciting when someone jockeys for position like that. Bettini just uh, keeping that uh, distance between himself and Strauss in a position to strike at some point. A uh, difficult circuit to, to get overtakes done, but we have seen them get done in, uh, in some strange and interesting places as well. So you, you can't kind of discount where a move is going to be made and uh, with the fact that the pressure is starting to come onto Strauss the Porsche a great car here at Kyle Army we know it's great it's also quite temperamental when it comes to driving style it's very sensitive to its inputs uh, it can it can teach you a lesson very quickly so Strauss having to manage that pressure and doing a good job through the S's putting a couple of car lengths between themselves and uh, Bettini there in the Rigoli entry so right now, Toro versus uh, Rigoli EGA trying to jostle it out for positions. We get to go down through the duration or to, to, to carry on checking on some of the liveries. But at the same time, we see a battle on track. It's still Kevin Barber in that BWR Vipers entry. They're on the back of Lucas. And Ryan wasn't a fan of the gold and black of that uh, Aston Martin in front. He was a fan of the paint job that came through for the Black Widow Racing Vipers. 
So I know where, uh, where Ryan's cheering at the moment. How, this one's a... how dare you assume <laughs> that I, I am cheering for a car just for, because of its livery, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> what? I, I thought that's what we do here. Ryan actually can't speak. He's, uh, he, he was trying to sip on his water and uh, I caught him I caught him off guard. So uh, we get back to our livery walk. We're almost done. I know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're wondering how long it can take three commentators to go through the entire field of cars. And I can guarantee you it's, uh, it's a long period of time, especially when we put the time and effort that we do in describing the way that they look. The Flying Gypsies entry, the number 85, Francois Erasmus, currently sitting in 26th place. Ryan uh, still unable to to join me for the commentary as he as he laughs himself into a very watery mess. I don't think Ryan should uh, should drink water whilst we whilst we do commentary. No water allowed for Ryan. I like this livery. Uh, I kind of I think it's like a baby blue that they've mixed in there. I, I like it. it. Looks cool. I I also do like it. Uh, it's almost metallic as well or chrome, so you get that uh, sort of chrome like feel. The retro esports alpha entry. Um, Jason Isherwood, of course, the man piloting this car. He is the the head of the retro esports organization there in South Africa. They've got plenty of drivers, plenty of teams, and the 738 comes out. I always give uh, Jason Isherwood a bad time about his liveries because they always uh, they always look very old to me because obviously you know retro. Um, you know, we, we talked about good looking Bentleys. Jason, just for you, this is not a good looking Bentley. What are you talking? There's something about this. So, okay, so in all fairness, when I first saw it, I went, mm, not sure. And now that I've watched it, I kind of like it. There's like a pixelate feel to it. Um, I dig it. I, the more I watched it, the more I was like, it's kind of cool. Look when it comes around, there's like this weird pixelation type feel to it. Um, uh, it reminds me of retro Ryan video is, games. Ryan is shaking his head approve. so hard that he is going Thank to knock goodness. himself out. Thank goodness he can't talk because his mouth's full of water. I think it's a cool Bentley. There you go. Ryan, Ryan, get yourself in here. What, what do we? What do you think of that Bentley? It's um to uh, to use the oh as we see uh, a bit of a race replay here. This is Kevin Barber, and this is the BWR Bentley still trying to find a way through on the Aston Martin. But to to comment on uh, Jason Isherwood's Bentley. Um, to use the uh, creative uh, reviewing terms, I would say it it sparks that that creative energy. It, it, it to, to to me it just kind of it doesn't pop, kind of like how how some of the other cars do. And oh, triple nine is um, given our other rude punt up the rear end and the top of Lukop and. The stewards are not going to be impressed. They're not with going that. to be happy about that. No, that was a that was a big shunt that came down the Odin Racing team. Uh, oh, I mean, not not the place they wanted to find themselves. And as it stands, Amrish Sinaran in that Odin Racing Triple Nine back on the circuit, facing the right direction. But we were talking about this Bentley. Uh, Sam said it was great. Ryan said uh, not great, along with me, he said it was not great. I, I just like to tell Jason Isherwood that his retro esports are a little bit boring. Um, you know, if I was going to order cutlery for my house when I was 60, I'd order in that color scheme. You guys are mean. I think it's different. It's fun. Something fun. I not like mean. It. We're just we're just expressing ourselves. We're allowed to express ourselves in 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 livery discussion here. Um, we have high standards. <laughs> Ooh, I'm spicy. Cool. Once again, Ryan, we've seen the car you drove. No, I'm joking. I'm just joking. Look <laughs> <laughs> this battle well, happening again. Yeah, so it looks like uh, Barber is going to get past the likes of Lucas as uh, we were just following on some of that controversy at the top of Lukop. And of course, uh, just tracking through the rest of the liveries. But uh, that job is done and dusted. Our producer seems to like Jason Isherwood's car because we keep going back to it. And, uh, you know, that upsets me because Jason Isherwood's livery needs more work and uh, Sam will be upset for me for saying that but we can move on swiftly this RMC Dev 1 entry the 777 here Flip Van Sale is uh, at the wheel of that and uh, that that is a different looking Audi so I feel like uh, the baby blue accented with the red uh, maybe not the uh, the best uh, colors to all work together on the same livery red and black going to be sort of featured in a lot of the cars here today 
but uh, the baby blue, I think, uh, is going to be hurting the inner designer of Ryan. So before we go to Ryan, uh, Sam, what do we what do we feel of the triple seven? For some reason, this reminds me of you know when you go to an esports LAN event and the the esports shirts come out. That reminded me a little bit of, of that. So I, I don't know if I'm the biggest fan of it. And this is the pressure coming on for Rigoli on at the back of Toro. Get a uh, race replay here. Hopefully it's not a collision that, that came down. It's going to look like it's going to be the past Toro. Just, uh, you know, they, they, they saw that move coming, just giving the space, being uh, able to loop back and just try and uh, cut back on the Exeter Ingwe. And it will be Strauss to follow through. But that means that Giulio Bettini, Bettini is going to get on by. Uh, Ryan, you, you have to add some some flavor onto uh, onto this Audi. It's uh, it's it's a no from me. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, uh, Ryan, even making signs for me uh, in the comms box uh, to to show me how he truly feels about things. So uh, you know, this is a, a new level for us. Luke's trying to get past the BWR Vipers again, running very deep there and giving that position back up. So Barber into the pits as uh, Lucas from the Sonic Sim Racing Aston Martin continues around. After Flip and Sail in that triple seven, I think next up to go another BWR Griffins uh, entry. I think we've talked enough about these teams. We, we think that they're raising for a good cause. Um, just another Bentley. Um, I, I'm sorry to all the Bentley fans that, that I've said this to, but uh, the BWR Griffins entry, uh, very similar paintwork to the other BWR cars. Very, uh, very good to spot them out on the circuit at the same time. Very, I like the I like the paint job. I like the cause that they're racing for, um, and I think it looks cool. But we have spoken about them a lot, so possibly worthwhile to move on to uh, the next car that that we're going to be looking at. I like the fact that I, I came to say hi and I just get to look at pretty car colors and talk about that. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, we uh, we dragged you in here. We we said that uh, it would be nice for you to just pop in and, and have a cup of tea, and we uh, we did a cup of tea and a couple of other things as well as we uh, we do livery of the day. And after all of this, you have to choose which one uh, which one wins. Look at Ryan's eyes; he lights up. The only Lamborghini on the field, the Italian stallion of the ambitious but not rubbish sim racing team. One of my favorite team names to ever <laughs> enter into a sim racing event. This is number 23, Lamborghini. I've, uh, I've kind of heard how Ryan feels about it. So, Sam, give us your immediate feeling before Ryan comes in to add his bias. Uh, it looks a little bit like Need for Speed. This is the car that you choose um, when you just want to, you know, show off to your friends, right? These are the colors you go with. Stands out, super loud. I wouldn't expect anything less from a Lambo, though. It's got to be a little bit over the top. Uh, that's me being nice. Ryan's going to come in and say it's, it's not great, right? Is, is that his response? I think he this never, looks cool. He, he never says bad things about a Lamborghini, so if anything, it's going to be fine. Whoa. No, I did say before, I'm not too keen on the green, especially on the rims. That I, was like, I, and that was my I, favorite I, part. I, I think that's a bit too much, personally. But I like the I, I like the rest of it. I like the black and purple combination. I mean, I would have even called it blue because I'm not a designer and a graphic designer. So to me, it was like bluey purple. But I thought uh, it was. I honestly thought it was like a blue and a yellow with like some black accents and a bit of a chrome on the yellow. So I clearly got that very wrong. Still think it looks I also, cool though. I also think it's got a bit of a blue esque vibe, but not like a a dark blue, I suppose. So the ambitious but not rubbish Lamborghini gets. Uh, I, I guess two thumbs up and half a thumbs up from ryan but it's a lamborghini so he makes it a full thumbs up uh the bot squad of jason mcgregor that baby blue accented with the black and uh, white i think this one looks quite nice especially with with the matte finish i'm taking a look to to make my decision um as he comes around here 807 quite like that as well i do like the matte finish as well it's it gives it gets a thumbs up I, I quite I quite like this. I like the the separation between the blue and the black on the uh, on on the livery, and we're switching ever backwards now to P32. And this is the retro esports Bravo team. This is the team we saw having some issues earlier on in the race, George. This is true. We we did see them uh, perhaps overcooking the tires a couple of times and then struggling with that grip on the circuit. 
and right now uh, looking good to uh, just keep themselves in the right direction. Obviously caught up in a lot of traffic at the moment as they make their way through the field. But uh, as things stand, I do approve of their, uh, their, their team livery and uh, I do like the colors that they've picked out, out for it. So uh, we're on team 32 of, I think, 44 teams that have uh, taken to the field. So we've almost made our way through the entire grid. And it's only taken us half a day. <laughs> it's been pretty insane going through all of these cars, right? But fun. It's, it's also cool to see because, I mean, obviously everyone puts a lot of effort in to make sure that they stand out on the track uh, for those full 24 hours. Uh, look at Apple. Appleton's just decided to do a, a little bit of rally racing down the grass there. Unfortunately, uh, turning that Aston Martin into a very expensive lawnmower, and uh, Aston Martin will not be happy with such a such a use of their car. That oh, that looks. That car is concerningly that... slow. Turtle slow, or it doesn't look damaged though, which is the confusing thing. Because ju judging by the way he was driving, I would assume that that car has damage, but there's no. Oh, this car is very damaged to me. I mean, it, uh, the way that it's accelerated, you thought like maybe it's run out of fuel and just coasting down the pit straights, but uh, something has gone something has gone drastically wrong there. It's not even turning in. Um, they're trying oh. to make their way to... Oh, that was scary. I, I, I felt the fear in myself as that Audi came past. Well, the car will make it back to the pit lane, fortunately, and doesn't seem to have hindered anyone else's race, which is great to see, but definitely some serious issues for the number 70. Doesn't look severely damaged, though. Well, that's it the thing, right? You doesn't. can't see the damage, but the way that that was going, uh, something's definitely not right there. Limps, limps itself into the, uh, the pit box there, and... Uh... Perhaps, perhaps uh, they, they were on the, 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 the verge of running out of fuel and uh, had to try and save as much of it as they could. I think that's a very fast stretch out because the, the turn-in was wrong. Everything else looked wrong uh, looking at it. So a uh, very strange occurrence taking place there. I got a, I got a, a, a message actually from Appleton messaging me saying that uh, they got a puncture. So... Oh... I've never, I've never really encountered such a serious puncture as that one. Maybe, uh, maybe all the, maybe all the tires get themselves probably, deflated. That would probably explain why the front right tire wasn't moving when we saw it pull into the pit lane. I believe it was on the replay. The front right tire wasn't, it wasn't spinning. So potentially a puncture there could be the reason or the explanation for that. Not a nice place to find yourself, especially in a part of the circuit where so many cars are passing you at pace and, and just having to do a good job at just staying out of the way of all of that. Grant Finlay in that uh, number 344, currently in 33rd place, just running one of those Lexus liveries that we are so accustomed to seeing with the Lexus entries. Um, I mean, I, I do like this, this Lexus uh, choice and I, I do like the Lexus entry. It does look very race car-like. Um, very different to all the other entries because, of course, they've got all the sponsors on them. Uh, but a standard default livery for the Lexus, you can't really do too much with the with the car. You're locked into choosing it, and uh, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's it's a good livery regardless. I know we've given the 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 black, red, and white so much. We've given them a bit of grief. Uh, all the cars that we've seen, but there's a reason there's so many with those color schemes because they do just look race car -y, right no matter what so uh, and it, the same goes for this I, I mean i think it looks good alan patterson the uh, the head owner of pwsr racing is currently in their number 101 entry alan's team not having the uh, greatest uh, start to the race and oh, almost uh, almost catching it wrong coming out a cheetah there but uh, kind of in their team colors the, the yellow and black not too many cars entered into the field with this, so quite easy to uh, spot from a, a mile away. You can spot it from a mile away, nice and bright, um, standing out. I, I'm not the biggest fan of, of yellow in general, but I like what they've been able to do here with the yellow and black. And it's a Porsche, George, so we all know how you feel. <laughs> 
Is I'm there the wrong even... color? I mean, is there a wrong color for for a Porsche? There, there isn't. The the only wrong thing is to not have a Porsche entered in, especially when you have a team and your team is racing in an event and they they pick an Aston Martin, which hurts your soul. Then then there's a wrong color, and that's because you didn't choose a Porsche. So Do uh, Gaba in that team try hard racing 505 Bentley. The uh, orange and black, kind of their staple colors. Um, bit of a burnt orange coming down. I think a bit of a satin or matte finish on the actual paintwork. They currently find themselves in 35th place, but uh, still looking good for the rest of the race. They're not quite at the back of the field, and they're not quite at the front, but just caught up here towards the back end and uh, trying to make their way through traffic. Sam, colors, are we, are we happy? Are we, are we not happy? Is it bland? I, I mean, I do think that for the rest of the race, I'll be very disappointed if the commentators don't refer to Gaba and that 505 uh, as pumpkin for the rest of it. I want him to be referred to as such. Uh, but I'm a big fan. I like orange. Orange is my favorite, uh, my favorite color. So pumpkin over there, I approve. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to the Mew Racing Works team, we saw them uh, struggling a little bit. They got T-boned out of one of those uh, corners. I think it was out of barbecue. And the 2-4-2, two, two, sitting in 36th place. Um, that is that is that, that kind of gives me a very traditional racing uh, vibe looking at it. Ryan, uh, is there a reason why? Is that uh, was am I just uh, am I just off on it? What 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 is this kind of copy? I'm not entirely sure, um, to, to be honest. I'm not, I mean, I, I, I'll, I don't like it. I don't, <laughs> I just, I mean, no, no. I, do you know what I was, I was going to, I was going to try and be politically correct and just say it's okay to each their own. I, I just don't like it. I mean, I'm so sorry, Mew Racing Works, because I'm, I'm going to say this, but it honestly makes me think of the South African cricket team when they come out for their photos, because it's like the same <laughs> color scheme. Um, that's what I, the moment I saw it, I was like, oh, it's the South African cricket team. I'm sorry, uh, I'm Mew Racing Works. That was what it made me think of was, was Cricket South Africa. So there you go. <laughs> this is probably where it uh, We're going to get some actually... angry emails tonight. <laughs> I will never be allowed to, to commentate a, a race first pro event again. Um, that'll be me done. That was a very brave uh, move coming in. Almost nice. three wide into uh, Crowthorn, but very nice indeed. As uh, we continue down the uh, Maranello Motorsports, Triple Eight, another black and red Ferrari. We know that uh, apparently Ferraris are meant to just be red but they're not always going to be that way. We get a race replay as well of Thorn Mijos. We think there was a move being made here. Oh, 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 a big dive on the inside. Uh, oh, in, and the uh, catching it. Ooh, Ferrari threading the needle coming through there as well. So a wild entry coming into sunsets. And whilst we go through the, uh, the liveries of the day, we also start to run out of actual daylight as the sun starts to uh, dip its way uh, in, in, into uh, darkness here at Kyle Army. 637 oh in the race. This, oh, on the grass. Oh, and that's quite hard into the barrier. That is very hard into the barrier and, and needing to just get the car out of the way uh, because obviously that, uh, that exit out from Cheetah is very narrow for once you you've come through there you're kind of uh, running out to that outside curb so very hard to keep your car in 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 the in the right line if there's a car in the way so doing a good job Tar uh, taryn francis just uh, moving the car out of the way making sure that they are uh, not too much in trouble ignatius pulsa here in the 32 hawks racing team another aston martin we said we were going to see a lot of astons uh, ryan doesn't like lumo colors so i'm not even going to ask him what he feels of that but as the as the light disappears in the darkness uh, we, we can actually see the benefit to having a brightly colored livery here we can see the benefits to the brightly co colored liveries um, and as the light goes you won't be able to appreciate these as much um so it's fun to look at them i have to say even with uh taryn francis's little oopsie there i thought the livery was very nice but it wasn't the right time to say that right so i was like oh i'm quite a fan of that color scheme yeah, it was, uh, it was just caught out in the replay, uh, but, uh, you know, 
new drivers coming through to the grid. We've, like I said, we've got skill groups across uh, all boards. And we'll jump on to Mihas here, just getting lapped out by Toro in the uh, triple eight, just making space on the right side up the hill. A good thing to do when uh, blue flags are waving and leaders are approaching. But uh, we, we talked about this uh, this black and red being a theme of the day, and Ferraris apparently can only be red. So this this one has red, but uh, not enough of it probably for Sam's uh, favorite side. I mean, like I said, I, I like Ferraris in red. I do kind of dig it. It makes me think of Tiger King because, I don't know, it looked like claws. Then we've got the uh, the Belgian Audi uh, Club Team WRT in the number 57, currently sitting in 38th place. And uh, I believe, is this is this a, a standard livery, Ryan, that they're running? Uh, this is a, uh, this is a default livery, to my knowledge. Um, this guy, ooh, slow Aston Martin coming around the corner. A cheater. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is one of the default liveries. It's quite a nice default livery as well. Um, for the, uh, for, for the Audi. I'm not too keen on a lot of the default liveries for the Audis, but, uh, but this one is actually quite nice. This one is nice, so uh, we give it the thumbs up and, of course, uh, an official livery in the game. Now we get the Power Rangers Racing Team. I wasn't joking about their team name. Uh, I can hear Ryan uh, groaning already as we, we switch to it. And I think even the fact that it's getting darker here, Kyle, you see the headlights coming on. The circuit uh, not going to be too well lit out, uh, except for the fact that the Power Rangers Racing Team is, is on the circuit. So they bring all the light to the yard. Actually, that was the name team i was calling it the clown car and then when you said the power rangers car i saw it and i was like oh that makes complete sense and now with the name i'm gonna give it to them they, they can take it uh, i thought it was what? a little bit of a i thought it was a fun clown car but now power we're gonna call it the power ranger and i kind of dig it i mean it, it links with the name i wouldn't i think the team i, I think the team is just that but like i, I think that's it's kind of cool i get it it's fun I think the team is just going to be happy that you stopped calling them the clown car, you know, on the, uh, on the live broadcast. They're like, they're yes. fairly, fairly rude. <laughs> yeah, they're like, yes, we've made it. We're not the clown car. We are the Power Rangers, and they've called us that. So uh, then we've got another great team name here in 40th place. Or make that 41st as that move was already done. Uh, team Gravel Trap. So uh, I've, uh, I can relate to this. I found myself playing in the sandpit more times than I'd like to admit. I mean, I should probably join this team. I like what they've uh, what they've done, to be honest. Just with um, just with the rims, because that was the only time the thing that they could really change. The liveries on on the Lexus very limited out, and uh, they've just gone with a very bright rim color. So we we lose darkness or we lose light every time we we move down the order here, and we make our way through the order. Of course, we'll be back towards the normal racing broadcast as soon as we've run through all of our, <laughs> our competitors here today. The hyped we'll, we'll together get there, racing. And gentlemen, don't worry. We will, we we will indeed. Matt Densham behind the wheel of the number seventy-six, the heaped together racing team. And uh, right now, the the thing that stands out most is obviously that burnt orange daylight, uh, daytime running light in the front air scoop. But uh, accented is the British racing green with a bit of purple, and uh, it looked like a, a nice little metallic-y purple as well. So I'm quite a fan of that one. We talked about Jaguars needing to be green. I think this Aston Martin delivers on all the British fronts. I'll take it. I'll take it as well. I approve. I quite like it. I think it's nice. That's that's a that's a I do approve. Nice, George. Not one of your, not one of your. It's nice, but I don't like it. Nices. I have I have no idea how to read you, Ryan. You're not a you're not an open book at times. <laughs> so it's nice can be many ways, like this cup of tea. Look, like, I like nice to be week. mysterious. <laughs> and mysterious you are. We look at Heron here for All In Racing in that number 13, closing down onto the back of Lewis. Lewis uh, taking over in the Arashi Racing Audi, that number 100. They've uh, dropped just one position down from the last time we caught up. Still sitting within the top 10, but the likes of no Heron for All In Racing looking to try and take that if they can. And uh, for them, it's all about uh, just making up those spots, even as the darkness starts to fall down. 
and we can just see how dark it gets here. We thought we'd get a nice little sunset out here, and we could show people why the corner was called sunset, but the, uh, the cloud cover out here today, partly cloudy, has prevented us from seeing such a beautiful sight. We've had to just deal with things as they are. Taking a look now at uh, number, the car that you're seeing there, 70 and P43 at the moment. I can't comment on this because these are my friends. I mean, that's that's not fair. <laughs> what no. are they? A, okay, so they're, they're jumping in here, hard racing. Uh, it's a little bit of white. Uh, is that orange? The orange accents? It's probably red. Like, as soon as you and I see orange, we know that the inner designer in Ryan is telling us that it's red. So uh, I'm going to assume that it is red. Just a, a single racing stripe. All racing stripes are important. Red, of course, making your car go faster if you put it in. So, you know. A, a racing stripe adds a couple of uh, horsepower to your car and then of course uh, red as a color because it's a fast color adds some horsepower as well so if you add a stripe and it's a red stripe uh, you're doing good in my books that that was completely sarcastic please don't destroy me in the chat um, but I, I do like the racing stripe Ryan was it red or orange I feel it's red I, I think oh. I think it's red I want it to be orange, but okay, we'll go with red. <laughs> Emmanuel Cardinali here on the back end of that triple six entry, trying to, oh, 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 that door closing down from the triple six, the one five eight, feeling like they wanted to make a lunge and uh, finding themselves uh, in contact then. That's going to put them back just a smidge and uh, not going to be happy about that. We're going to see Scott Heidemann. This entry has just been plagued with bad luck in the race. And oh, not a great place to have lost it. Out of Cheetah, T-boned. A lot of damage being picked up. And that one to one Just look at that. That's not the way to treat a Ferrari. Ouch. Ouch indeed. F's in chat. Uh, that's not the place that you want to find yourself. Eddie Francis in the wheel Ooh. taking over from Taron. In the, that, was uh, the, that was the side max 97 that collided with them. Oh, it was. That, that was the uh... third place car, Owen Wenlock, having to bring that back into the pit lane. You could see the damage on the front of that car. That is that is catastrophic for a team running up at the front, colliding with what is essentially a car that is 127 laps behind. So it's uh, it's good to see a team sort of trying to, uh, to, to stick with it and try and finish a race off. But uh, if your team comes into contact with race leaders like that, it's not going to be a, a nice place to feel. Ryan biting his lip alongside me. We've uh, we've been in similar situations, causing havoc in races before. Not always in our control, but it's it's not a nice feeling, is it, when that happens? No, it's uh, it's 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 not great. And obviously, a lot of the time, it's not your fault if you lose the car. You just keep yourself stationary on track. You you, you try to not be an obstacle, but sometimes there's nothing you can do. And. Uh, you know, and sometimes you're just at the wrong place at the wrong time. But uh, that 97 has got itself in. It's got its car repaired and it is back rolling again under its own power. So I believe Owen Wenlock will be taking that car back out. Meanwhile, the 121 is still stationary in the pit lane. So I wonder if that car has a lot more damage than what the number 97 sustained. Oh. I just, uh, I just feel really bad for for that uh, number 97 Sideworks car. Not a nice place to be in. We're almost done with our grid walkthrough. Our uh, our, our friends uh, Eddie Francis and, and the rest of the Monday Night Racing team racing out in the uh, the green and gold little South African flared livery for their Aston Martin. Uh, I'm a radio fan. I'm biased. I like Monday Night Racing. I like Eddie Francis. And uh, if Sam was allowed to be nice to other people that she's friends with, I'm going to be nice to my friends, just staying out of the way of the traffic as we see them coming through Clubhouse. But with the sun fading down very quickly, I'm glad that we pretty much wrapped up our whole grid walk. We said it before, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't just finish in 30 minutes when we get started talking about paint jobs. Definitely not in 30 minutes. I too was a fan of the Monday Night Racing liveries, not because they're my friends, but because I thought the green and gold looked really cool. So there you go. So we get a, uh, a nice little look here from 
cheetah. Of course, there's that uh, that scary anti-cut curb, the yellow sausage of death. And you hit that, you find yourself in a bad place. So you can just see teams trying to hit that apex on the inside. It's only about a tire length wide that you have a margin for error. And if you do mess that up, you find yourself in a very difficult place. So we are done with our livery chat. We are going to take ourselves a small little commentary break. We're going to leave you with the view from here at Cheetah. This, of course, is the Pure Storage 24-hour Kyle Army in partnership with Solidarity E-Race and partnered by Raceface. Big shout out to all our sponsors, NEC, Data Sciences, Oxide, AMD, Supermicro, and of course, Racing Club International coming and bringing you the broadcast action. We will take a short break and we will be back with you with the action in just a bit. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back, welcome back. A little bit of a break up there for us to just get ourselves a fresh uh, glass of water, a little bit of a snack uh, to go alongside with what has been a great, uh, a great race so far. And to be honest, this has been a lot of fun. Of course, uh, the last little hour we had, uh, or maybe even a little bit longer than an hour, we had Sam Wright in the box with us and we went through all the team entries, gave all the teams a little bit of time on the uh, on the stream for us to go through. Maybe a little bit critical we were on their car liveries, but as things go dark, that becomes less important. You start to just see the headlights of the cars feature up there. My name is George Smith, uh, leading the commentary alongside Ryan Gill. We are about to continue with our stint before we hand things over to our next commentary team in just a little bit. We saw in that little race replay that uh, got brought up there just how close the GTWR team got to uh, coming into contact with a car that had lost it out of, of Cheetah. And as things go dark here, yeah, you can start to see that there's not a lot of track lighting for the drivers out here. Is there, Ryan, at Kyle Army? No, there isn't. And uh, it's going to continuously, uh, well, get worse for the drivers as we continue onwards. Of course, we were supposed to have a sunset around six o'clock in the evening. The clouds denied us of that, unfortunately, and it's now almost seven o'clock local time. But uh, yeah, getting quite dark around here at uh, Kyle Army, but you can still see some light in the air. You can still see that the sky is not black and uh, well, it will continuously get darker over the next couple of hours until we descend into, well, pitch black darkness around here. And for me personally, that's going to be the most interesting part of the race. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, we didn't see the, the variability of the weather coming down. But as soon as the, the light dips down, you start to just see that visibility is so difficult to track along with. Uh, you've got your, your head beams, your, your headlights to, to light up. Uh, a little bit of the road in front of you and that's about it uh, for what you're able to see and it does get darker of course just past the sunset now and uh, you know it is going to get darker out on the circuit if you're joining us for the first time right now we are broadcasting you the pure storage kyle army 24 hour race of course in partnership with Solidarity E Race and powered by Raceface. Big shout out to all of our sponsors, NEC, Data Sciences, Oxide, AMD, and Super Micro for getting behind us. This is going to be a lot of fun, especially if you're only joining now and, and things start to get dark and uh, dangerous. Riding on board with the Sidemax Motorworks number 96, currently uh, leading up the race. Of course, uh, pit stops and things still needing to be served out. We saw GTWR up at the front of the order for what has been a majority of the race. Those things change and chop around, of course, just because uh, if, you, if, you, if you remember, every single driver and team here has their own strategy that they're playing at. So we get to just see some of that action taking place. Uh, of course, positionals will get swapped up due to those circumstances. And we've seen some good on-track battles throughout the field, throughout the day so far. And as things go into the nighttime, I, uh, I'm a little bit sad that we will be departing in just a bit. We don't get to see too much of the nighttime racing. But Ryan and I will be back again a little bit later on to do another stint together before we hand back over to the Americans to uh, to handle what is going to be the majority of the nighttime portion of this race. Uh, I kind of envy it a little bit, but also at the same time, I'm glad because it is so difficult to see out there and eyesight needs to be 2020 at all times. Well, we still got 65 ish minutes until that point. And this is a replay of Robert Hart and Taking it fairly carefully through Cheetah, coming through the final corner here, and is there anything in particular we're looking out for at this point in time? Oh, we'll continue to watch the replay, and oh, that seems to be the end of it. So not entirely sure what happened to uh, Robert Hart, but uh, our producer just told us that there was yellow flags around uh, the area of the track he was in. 
so not entirely sure what was going on out there. Before we came back, uh, everyone would have seen that the uh, GTWR Audi had to take some evasive action after Cheetah to avoid a car. We saw the Side Max number 97 car just uh, not uh, not get as lucky uh, in, in that situation. That was just before we broke up for our break. But as it stands right now, it is the number 96 car leading of Michael Kundachoglu for the Sad Max Motorworks car, although GTWR of Tobias Pfeffer should take over that car, or should take over the lead when the number 96 car comes back into the pit lane. We get a little replay here from the top heli cam view. Two Ferraris battling it down, coming through Mineshaft. And oh, a little bit upset goes the Power Rangers car. They found a little bit uh, of a, a bump in the road at the bottom of Mineshaft. They're upsetting themselves slightly, but uh, getting control of the car before having to break for Crocodile. So managing to see the best of a bad situation out of that. Seen it go wrong before. And that time wrong, uh, that time around, not uh, not going the wrong way at all. But this is Reinhardt Gaber in that Power Rangers racing number 274. Still very uh, visible out on the circuit with their, their paint job coming down. And uh, an easy car to spot amongst all the other cars in the field as it stands. But they are currently finding themselves back in position 38. So towards the rear end of the field. Plenty of time for them to make up those positions. 17 hours and two minutes still indicated on the race clock. Of course, this race ending tomorrow on Sunday at 12 o'clock South African time. So for the drivers, they, uh, they, they've done a lot of racing, but they've got a lot of racing still to do. Yeah, of course, 17 hours of this race still to go. And I'm sure that uh, you and I, George, will, uh, will be quite surprised when this 17 hours does go by fairly quickly. Of course, the race will be concluding around about uh, midday South African time. Ooh. That's, uh, that car shouldn't be there. And Ooh, that's number 48 Porsche. We were talking about earlier with the kind of dark kind of light grey blue on the back of it and that car has unfortunately found itself facing the wrong direction but they have got back on the track safely which is good to see Zachary Royal in the number 97 side max uh, motor works entry they find themselves in P3 at the moment still some time to make up to catching up to Pfeffer in the 57 of course uh Right now, the side Max Motor Works number 96 is going to be, or was going to be in at the lead. They are going to be going into the pits. There we go, George Booth be going to be jumping back into that. So GTWR uh, resumes their position up at the front. And the likes of Zachary Royal will uh, get past them. Well, not quite past them there. They pass them in at the pit box, but uh, being a lap behind, uh, need to make up that time if they want to get themselves up into a position. Uh, but right now, finding themselves in a good place to uh, just see where this race pans out to. We've seen some controversies take place throughout the grid, and that can happen to any team and driver. But as that night continues to set in, you can just see that onset of darkness making things even harder and harder for drivers to track out on the circuit. And the nighttime portion of this race is going to be a very dark one indeed. I'm very glad that we've got the well-lit comms box to uh, keep us uh, awake and on our toes. These drivers have a lot of concentration to do with the dipping of lights. So there may not be rain on the cards, but uh, the portion of the race taking place in the evening is certainly going to push drivers to their limits. And I wonder if teams and drivers sort of had planned out who's going to be driving in at the night time or if that's just something that was given up to chance based on uh, where they fit into their slots. I mean, it's. Uh, I think there's multiple ways to go about it. Um, I think depending on your team composition, um, you can definitely, uh, how would I say, strategize it. Um, in, in, in a particular way, if you have 
uh, for example, for some of the international teams, if you have European uh, and, say, American drivers, you'd probably want to allocate the American drivers to the point where in Europe it would be nighttime. So as we're coming close towards, uh, you know, 10, 11 o'clock UK time, which is about, you know, close to 11 midnight South African time, that's when you probably want the American drivers in the car. It's going to be dark out here, but... You know, they're going to be fully awake. They're not going to be tired. It's going to be, you know, just uh, pretty much normal service uh, for them. But, you know, for, for some of the teams that are, should we say, mostly South African around here, uh, you know, they're, they're probably going to have certain drivers that have just practiced specifically in the dark. I know uh, my team did that for the, the Nordschleife 24 hour. Uh, we had uh, two drivers that specifically trained to do stints in the dark, and uh, it was up to myself and another driver to pretty much do all of the daytime stints. It's not it's not uncommon for for teams to be able to practice those kind of things. They knew that this would be a, a nighttime race, and and as such, uh, would would have to adapt to the conditions of Kyalami when the sun dipped down. So I would be surprised if uh, people were just leaving it up to chance. I mean, you, you do have the option to, to change up your strategy as time goes by, but I'm sure that a lot of these drivers uh, had made those sort of provisions and, and made sure that they were uh, well up to speed with driving the circuit in the dark. I mean, it's one thing being able to spot your braking marker. Uh, it's another thing having to do so in the dark, doing a, a lot of this by feel, and of course, uh, just uh, getting used to that consistency in the darker conditions, something that you have to factor into your training and preparation coming into a race like this. Definitely, there are so many things that you have to prepare for in a 24-hour race. And, uh, of course, night racing or racing in the dark is one of those elements that you do have to prepare yourself for. And I'm sure plenty of these guys have had some practice around here in the dark. Here on the onboard with another 91. Look at the sky. Lovely scenes around it's here. It's nice. It's nice to look at. And uh, Dirk Berta, Berta just uh, catching up to the back end of Richardson in that number 57. A little flash of the headlights to just say, I need to uh, make this, uh, this, this overlap. And we'll do so, of course, uh, coming across the blue flags, the driver just being predictable, coming into Clubhouse, holding it on the inside, allowing Boeta to go around the outside. And the Sonic Simulating team making their way up to the field. I think uh, Lionel Clue next Bentley that uh, they're, they're trying to chase down and get a position off. Yeah, 1. 1. 1.8 seconds behind them at this point in time. I always find it easier to chase someone down, George, uh, when you can see them right in front of you. 1.8 seconds down to 8 tenths of a second, so that timing board was just slightly out of date. But I always find it easier to chase someone down when you can see them ahead of you, when you can see the gap closing. It you know, kind of kind of makes you feel a bit better about yourself. You can see the, the, the progress visually, and I don't think I'm going to be alone in, uh, in in that particular argument where... When you you are chasing someone down, you can see that gap shrinking. It kind of kind of inspires some confidence in you. Correct. It's uh, it's it's almost like seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. You've uh, you've been just chasing down a delta time, uh, looking for the update. Your team just updating you as well. You're getting the the feedback coming through from the sim, uh, letting you know that you are catching the driver as soon as you start to see them. Especially if you know that you're a couple seconds quicker and you are eating away at that gap. Once you see them. It's time to start planning that attack, and that's kind of the view that we get looking back from Lionel Clue's uh, 969 back wing on board with the Bentley, the Black Widow Raising Vipers. And they can see Buerta in their wing mirror, and uh, it's just a lot of headlights that you'd be seeing at this point, and, and the closer and closer they get, the, uh, the more ominous it becomes. You start to uh, almost take your eyes off of the, the racing line if you uh, are concerned about the mirrors. And you're keeping yourself, uh, you know, in a, in a bit of a, a weird space. You, you don't want to, to do something that's unpredictable, but you don't want to just give up a space uh, immediately if you are uh, a lot of time off of the car that is chasing you down. We've said it before, let them through and uh, you, you can take some time following them. A lot of time on at the clock for you to make up positions if you have to. 
but uh, unnecessarily you don't really want to just give those kind of things up you want to keep pushing and you want to hold your position for as long as you can definitely so and as they continue onwards the Aston Martin continues to chase down the Bentley and the 969 car Currently, just uh, finding themselves quite a fair way off of the car in front. In fact, they don't actually have a, uh, a deficit to them on the timing board. That would assume that they are at least a sector behind them on circuit. So I believe the, uh, the 969 Bentley has quite a ways to go before they'll start to make up a couple of places. And there is... That confirmed, Sean Mumford's Aston Martin is in fact almost an entire lap ahead of the Bentley at this point in time. It's about two, two thirds of a lap, give or take. Yeah, about, uh, about two thirds, so uh, still a lot of time for them to make up. And we know that once you're in a on a track position with another car, it's hard to make your own progress in a race. You know, the, the two of you almost... Uh, we say it so many times when you're in this situation, whether it's uh, chasing down the leaders or just the next car in front of you in the mid pack, you almost have to work together to catch up to them, not cost each other too much time in your defense and your attack. And uh, right now, it does just seem to be the case. Boats and Clue uh, working their way through the field. Clue hasn't really found himself under too much pressure at this stage. Boats uh, has been there in the mirrors, but not a point where Clue has had to adapt that racing line too much. You're obviously always going to try and force the car to go around the alternate racing line. You're going to stay as defensive as you can. And the 969 at the moment, just keeping that car length gap or two between themselves. But uh, Dirk Boerter being in a good position here means that you just can start to read the driver in front a little bit like a book. And from that perspective, that allows you to be able to see where they're making mistakes, where they're breaking, and uh, where your potential opportunity to make a pass will come in. You see the Bentley just kind of uh, going defensive early on, going onto the inside line, then drifting to the outside for Crowthor and trying to sweep and carry a lot of uh, a lot of momentum up through the Yuxke sweep but uh, Dirk Boerta through that particular section is looking very good closes down what is a much bigger gap uh, to, to a very small gap and uh, this is maybe where the pressure starts to come on for Clue so Dirk, Bo Dirk Boerta for the Sonic Sim Racing team doing a good job at just uh, keeping that pressure up hold turning the dial up all the way and making sure that uh, they, they, they're just not letting that 221 BWR Vipers car get out of the way. And uh, of course, they don't have to move out of the way. Fully entitled to fight for these positions. And judging by the looks of it, oh, there's a Lexus off the track there. And that car looks like it's gone backwards into the barrier. Three four four car, so uh, that's down in thirty second, I believe. So not the way and that, that car they would is have still wanted. Stranded there. It does look still stranded. They has to wait for uh, the rest of the field to kind of get pa past them before they can rejoin. Not sure if uh, something more has happened or if they are just waiting for the uh, the right place to be able to rejoin. But we see. Just at the top of the Corp on our indicator on the track map, we can just still see them uh, stranded out there waiting to, to get back on. I think they it's may been towed. have. Uh, you know, it has been towed back. So uh, maybe a bit bigger of an impact than we were able to see, Ryan. And that means that uh, for them, that's going to be a long time sitting in the pit box. It is. It's never great to get your car towed because, of course, that gives you. Uh... Well, it locks you into your pit box for a certain amount of time, and that unfortunately does mean that once, well, even once you've uh, you finished that, you have to uh, you have to then wait for your car to be repaired. They were spun around. I've just checked uh, on the replay myself. We've uh, the three four four was spun around by the two five eight car. And the car kind of just rolled back into the back of the barriers, but I don't see 
I don't see any obvious reason as to why that car couldn't get back going again under its own power, so... It's quite interesting. I wonder, I wonder if it was, uh, it was something more catastrophic, you know, sometimes you can find yourself in that situation where uh, the, the, the best thing that you can do to not uh, impede other racing cars coming around is to make that call to jump back. Uh, of course, you get yourself locked out for a little while doing that, and uh, it takes a while to get going again. But uh, we've still just been seeing Boerta and Clue being sort of the, the closest on track battle as the, the two of them. Uh, haven't even really been entering into the arena just yet. Just uh, been following closely sub one second from one another. And a good read for one another's driving styles at this point will be starting to be built up by both teams. I'm sure the race engineers will be uh, looking into this and, and trying to add some advice where possible. Uh, some drivers don't like that kind of feedback whilst they're trying to drive. You know, just kind of let me do it, let me focus. Um, but for, for other teams, I know that uh, it's a big it's a big aspect of it, just uh, having somebody there to guide you, especially when it gets dark to the nighttime portions of the race. Uh, you start to get very much into uh, a dangerous sort of almost, you've got the, uh, the blinkers on, you can't really see too much around you, and you just uh, lap in, lap out, doing the same thing. So that rhythm can build up. You can start to lose your edge on being able to make overtaking opportunities. And... Um, it can be a difficult place to be in, but uh, here we see, oh, that was a big dive coming on and uh, going to pick them up. The PWSR Porsche spotting that out, getting onto the anchors early into Ingwe, but that was Robert Hart in the number 70 being uh, dove into. And unfortunately for them, uh, that is going to slow their progress down even further. Well, the 344 car, which was at the top of Leocop stranded and had to be towed has repaired its damage and has come back out but they've sped in the pit lane on pit exit and that's given them a stop and go 30 penalty to add to their trouble so as soon as that car got repaired it now has to come back in to serve a uh, well quite a hefty penalty and that that car doesn't the car doesn't look right. No, there, there seems to be a, a very big gremlin plaguing them at this point, and uh, we're just going to have to keep keeping a track on it. But you can just see the, uh, the turn in, not the way that that Lexus should be handling itself and finding themselves getting caught up with a lot of cars. So obviously navigating the circuit more at their race pace and Adrian van Sale at the moment just uh, just struggling to get to grips with what is happening in 344 entry. Well, it's one of the elements of endurance racing is that problems can happen and it uh, unfortunately Looks like it's gone from bad to worse for the 344 car. The good thing I can at least say, judging by what I'm seeing here, is that they are trying their best to not... Well, to, 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 to not intentionally hinder anyone. They're trying to stay out of the way as they bring that Lexus back around and into the pit lane. Need to make sure you don't speed coming in. You've already got a stop and go 30. You don't want to be adding another drive-through penalty onto your tally as well. Uh, but they will come in and looks like they will serve that stop and go 30 now. But the car looks fixed. It doesn't look damaged. So that damage has definitely been repaired. But there are definitely some issues going on in that car because it doesn't look right. No, it's certainly not tracking the way we'd, uh, we'd usually expect the car to be going. So those drivers are uh, probably trying to identify what has gone wrong. Try and see if they can fix themselves up. Final clue has uh, built oh, up a nice. We have uh, we have from the chat. Sorry to cut you off, George. We have from the chat. Um, Xander Kliergen is uh, just said uh, technical failure for the gears in car three four four having hardware issues. So that would explain why the car doesn't quite look right when it's gone back out on track. They finished their stop and go penalty, and they are coming back out on track now. And we can only hope 
that whatever hardware issue they have had has fixed itself. This is true indeed. Uh, we're just going to have to keep an eye out on that. Still doesn't look like they are uh, having the very best experience out in it. And we can just get a little bit of a feed from their, uh, their, their, their HUD and get a little feel for what's happening. You can just see just uh, kind of over revving the car stuck in, in gear trying to get it through. And that is not going to be doing the gearbox any favors. Not going to be doing the engine any favors either as uh, they are certainly struggling with the hardware side in that vehicle. I've had a gearbox fail before in ACC, but that wasn't a hardware-related issue. Um, but this definitely does... Yeah, it just, just seems like when, when they get to the point where the car would shift, it's, it's either not picking up the input from the wheel or... Or something along along those lines, but we the can only hope that they fix that. I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of shifting and changing, and uh, you know, hardware use in a race like this. So, if if anything is going to to have a failure, it would be in endurance racing of these sort of uh, of these sort of stint lengths. But for this team, it's not going to be a great place to be, knowing that they've got 16 hours and 43 more minutes of racing still to continue with so for the number three four four they're going to be trying to diagnose that while staying safe out on the circuit they are going to go back into the pit box and oh it's not something you want to see ryan is it no it's it's never it's never great to see and that car has come back into the pit lane now so i wonder if a change of driver is in order for that car now just to just to be able to get the car back out there and lapping around the circuits whilst the uh, the other driver looks into fixing the issue somewhat. Um, but that car back in the pit lane. Desmond Pullen in 17th place at this moment in time. The 129 Aston Martin for the Logistical Nightmare team. And on the topic of great names that we've had for teams so far, George, that's got to be... That, that, that's up there for me, Logistical Nightmare. I'm a big fan of the Logistical Nightmare crew. I, uh, I kind of uh, discovered them back in my day of, of doing a lot of the uh, sort of community-based driving, especially uh, on the, uh, the PlayStation format. I, I got very involved with the guys out at EKZ, another cool team and uh, introduced me out to the logistical nightmare team they've obviously moved over into the world of uh, pc sim racing and uh, getting themselves involved with accs uh, across the board we we are going back on board with that 344 uh, of course trying to see if this lexus has now uh, had the driver it doesn't it doesn't seem that it's uh, it's really fixed up uh, for them so it seems that there's still a lot of over revving happening in their in their cockpit view and you can just see that struggling second gear just kind of uh, being delayed out strung along uh, eventually it does shift up but uh, that just changes all the predictability that you've got going with you i wonder if it is some form of damage to the car then we know that engine failures in acc are a thing engine wear is definitely a factor i've like I said, I've had a gearbox fail on me before in ACC. I had it on a race start where you just couldn't shift up and down throughout the gears. So I do... I do wonder if there is a hidden element of damage in that car somewhere because they have changed drivers now and it doesn't seem to have fixed the issue. Although shifted fine there, but... It just seems on a couple of gears that it's a bit, a bit delayed. Unless that, unless that's in, intentional now, but I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully things get better for the the the, the three four four team because uh, they have unfortunately had to spend quite a bit of time in the pit lane over the last few laps. And every visit there just cuts them on track position uh, in in this twenty four. And of course, uh, this is the pure storage Kailami twenty four hour in a partnership with Solidarity E-Race empowered by Raceface. All our sponsors on board, you can see them at the bottom of the screen. If you guys uh, do feel like going and sharing a little bit of love 
Arts on the social media platforms. Uh, please have a, a look to see if you can tag them up. Of course, NEC Data Sciences Oxide as a service and then AMD and Super Micro. So to be honest, uh, it wouldn't have been possible to, to have this race go forward without the sponsors getting on board. And it's, uh, it's always good to see everybody getting involved with it. And whilst you were going over that, George, P3, Zach Royal, that uh, is a drive-through penalty next to their name. And uh, that's not going to be what the Sidemax Motorworks number 97 needed. And that is a drive-through for track limits. So it's not for any particular incident that they were involved in. But track limits abuse has been punished. And uh, unfortunately for the 97, well, they've got one lap left to serve that. They're going to have to uh, have a trundle down pit lane or, uh, well, face an ACC disqualification. Fefa, on the other hand of that, up in that 157, just going and uh, setting his quickest lap of, the, uh, of his stint. So interestingly, as the temperatures uh, sort of cool off and, and the daylight fades, Tobias Pfeffer for GTWR just capitalizing on everything that they can. So where it goes bad for Sidemax in that uh, number 97, things go well for the 157, just a three-man team. Chantal Hansen in that triple eight, looking like uh, they've parked the car on the outside of the uh, the exit to Leukorpen. Oh, oh, from bad no. to worse. PWSR uh, coming through there with a lot more Oof. momentum, catching the triple eight and then the 101 looping themselves around uh, afterwards as well. But that was a big hit onto Chantal Hansen. And for them, that won't, uh, won't be the way that they wanted that to go. Alan Patterson is actually behind the wheel at the time that's taken place. And for the leader and the owner of that team, not going to be too happy with uh, themselves for, for coming into contact there. And it's an unfortunate corner for, for instances and incidents to take place on, isn't it, Ryan? It's so blind, it's so fast. Uh, you, you're going through there on the limits. And when a car is just in, in the wrong place there, it's, uh, it's, so, it's so hard to avoid, especially if it's, there's not a lot of time uh, between that happening for you to react. Yeah, it, it's always difficult, and it's a it's quite a sketchy part of the circuit, should we say, um, for an incident to happen, and unfortunately, just you know, both cars caught up in that, and uh, both of them losing a significant amount of time as well. You can only hope that the damage sustained on those cars isn't too significant. Um, but uh, I think both of them did go into both of them did go into the wall at some point, so we'll have to hope that the damage isn't too much. But it's just it's just one of those things, isn't it, George? In endurance racing, no matter how much you know you, you try to be careful, no matter how much you prepare, no matter how safe you are as a driver, things can always go wrong around you, and sometimes you just don't have the time to react. No, for sure. It's uh, you know, it's 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 one of those split instant things that uh, can catch you off guard, especially I think through one of the the trickiest parts of the circuit. There, cheetah, uh, you you are sometimes just a passenger in your own car. Uh, you know, you've picked a line to come through. You either uh, right on the outside of that outside apex, on the verge of uh, running onto the grass, losing traction there, or you've taken a much uh, safer uh, route in but compromised your speed at the same time. So. You, you've got sort of that balancing point and, and an update just from our producer in my yeah the GTWR racing team, not just uh, setting the fastest lap of their stint, uh, but will also be the quickest lap of the race. 141.172 coming out under race conditions and race pressure as the sun is set and the darkness starts to roll in even darker. Well, with uh, 35 minutes of our commentary stint remaining before we hand off to Team America, as we've dubbed them for, uh, for, this, uh, for this race. George, I mean, you, you've, been, you've been around uh, for, 
for for the majority of uh, of this race so far. Obviously, had to dip out momentarily uh, earlier on in the race, but uh, we're almost a third of the way in now, uh, approaching up to the eight hour mark. Has uh, have, have have the three cars at the front been the ones you've expected to lead the race, or is uh, is there anyone up there that surprises you? No, I think uh, I can safely say that uh, I was expecting to see a good performance coming out from those three teams. I think uh, for myself, it, it would be just a dishonest truth to, to, to say that uh, I wasn't expecting them to be towards the front end of the order. I think as the uh, as the race progresses, you know, it's going to be down to them to, to really take those uh, those sort of positions that they've got themselves up to in this point to, to see it to the end. Uh, we always talk about the, the leaders having a race that they are in control of, and if they uh, throw it away, then it's their loss uh, at the end of the day. So I think um, it's, it's been unsurprising to see their performance coming through, especially knowing that uh, in, in terms of experience levels in these kind of endurance races across the different communities and things that we've, uh, we've all kind of been a part of in the uh, global sim racing scene would be unfair to say that they don't have a lot of that experience on them. Rodenbach versus uh, the likes of Palin. Palin pulling into the pit stop uh, to, to serve that drive through penalty then for the 129. But no, I think um, up towards the front of the order, sort of uh, very much expected to see the, uh, the side max teams up there. I think GTWR coming in strong. Um, not, not a surprise entry for me, and, and you mentioned it a lot to say, that they've been just taking the sim racing world by storm. Very powerful driver lineup, even though they've only got three drivers in there. But uh, George Boothby in the uh, in the car for the side Max Motorworks number 96. They of course are you know leading ahead of their their sister team entry in the number 97, who has got a five second time penalty against their their name. But uh, for the side Max teams, I think they're going to be happy with with where they sit, especially at this sort of point in the race. And um, it would be interesting to see just uh, where things go from here. Car 121, by the way, that did just receive a 15-second penalty. They've apparently been given a final warning for ignoring blue flags. So that car, obviously not having a great day at the moment anyway, they find themselves, is it 128 laps down, I believe it is? Uh, I mean, have have not had an ideal time, should we say? No, and um, you know, sort of been plagued out quite a lot with uh, unfortunate mishaps and the stewards uh, just wagging their fingers even more at saying, you know, if you if you continue to ignore the blue flag side of things, then we are going to have to take further action out there, which is needed, you know, Ryan. It it, it can't be uh, it can't be just looked at. Uh, from from the top of the tower and just ignored you know if drivers are causing havoc on track whether it's uh, dangerous driving or just not adhering to what those marshals are are signaling on the outside of the track circuit then uh, it's to me it's it's to be sort of expected that uh, they are going to get themselves into trouble Still looking at uh, George Boothby then going to go on board. We can see that uh, that internal night light on, the little glow inside the cockpit, just uh, indicating that it is getting pretty dark out there. Not much lighting for usage here at Kailan. We talked about that before. Coming into Ingwe in the nighttime, very different looking corner to what we saw during the day. It's George Boothby using the maximum usage of the track that he can, extending out to the outside apex and taking a run down through the kink at night and then coming down the long start finish straight to come into the braking zone for turn two at Crowthorn, keeping the car on that inside apex, extending itself out and then a quick little uh, transfer of weight through the Yuxke sweep, avoiding all the uh, anti-cut curbs before taking that left-hander at the end of that sector at barbecue a nice run then again start a, a straight part of the circuit to just uh, get the car up to speed and then throwing it in for the right hander at sunset again using whoa, a lot of the track there almost uh, ran out of runoff to use caught a bit of the grass saw, saw george boothby just uh, a quick uh, little correction on the wheel to get that round through clubhouse 
and then in through the S's, the track dips away as you go through here and you do that in a real car on the circuit, you can just sort of feel your stomach disappear and then you start to climb up the hill to the top of Leocorp, the highest part on the circuit and uh, you get a nice little view out at uh, Midrand from the top view here before you then dip down, take the uh, what goes up must go down through Mineshaft, the quickest corner that you encounter here at Kailami, that very fast left-hander, flat out. Uh, unless it's raining and you, you need to maybe be a little bit more cautious but uh, here doing a good job at just showing us a nighttime lap through crocodile the right hander and of course the uh, the tricky cheetah which has caught a lot of people off guard as well just making sure not to uh, clip that inside anti-cut curb getting space from the blue flag cars as uh, george booth me makes it through and across the line to end that lap in the dark Lovely on board lap around Kyle Army. Move George Boothby. Now we're looking at Roman Utiel. He's chasing Galen Dimol at the moment in the Racing Line Motorsport Audi. The battle for what would be. It says fourth place on the timing board, fifth place down in the bottom right. But. Uh, I'll assume that this is a battle for fourth place. There we go. It has updated on the uh, on the bottom right now. We have four Audis in at the top five, and the Bentley, of course, to round them out. And the best of the Porsches in seventh, and the best of the Ferraris in tenth. There is have an Aston Martin in ninth as well. Still, Vaison's Aston Martin for MSV. They've been they've been quite quietly. You know, just going up about their business, haven't they, George? The uh, the MSV car. Correct. Uh, you know, it's it's consistency. We said it. Uh, it. It plays off in these longer races when you just got a short little sprint. You maybe have to uh, kind of dive in and 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 put a little bit more pressure on early in the race. But here, it's all about uh, making sure you can get to the line with the least amount of troubles, if uh, if you can avoid them. And for them, just getting themselves nicely into P8. Galen Dimov, then still under pressure from the likes of Roman Util in that Bentley. But uh, a, a complete lockout coming from those Audis all the way down to P4. And Galen Dimov uh, is feeling that pressure. The Bentley of Util wants to take one of those front sitting spots where they can. You can just see the racing line motorsport 192 here uh, did get very defensive out of clubhouse kind of forced util to back off slightly giving them some breathing room as they come up to the top of the hairpin but that bentley has a good read at the moment and uh, looking at the pace that they've been bringing through here i wouldn't be too surprised to see if uh, they did continue to keep that pressure up the 192 of course racing line motorsport a big competitor in the international sim racing scene and uh, they, they'll be uh, they'll be used to handling these kind of pressure situations pressure makes diamonds and uh, they want to cash in we still just see them uh just following along, a good exit out of Ingwe then, Ryan, has allowed them to uh, get a couple of car lengths closer. But that Bentley is looking so daunting, so intimidating. I do not at all uh, envy the likes of uh, Dimov as he has to stay ultra defensive. Of course, uh, they're just trying to make up positions to try and catch up to the podiums in his spots. But that's, that's a good speed and momentum coming out of barbecue. It is, and Roman Utiel will have a look on the outside line. Is he going to have a go? Oh, a slight bit of contact. But it hasn't prevented the Bentley from getting the move done on the outside of Sunset. And that's definitely worth a replay again. We'll have a look. We're on board here with the Bentley. You'll see, oh, just a bit of contact there, but not enough to bother the 367 Bentley. And, well... I mean, one of the overtakes of the race, George? 
I would like to I would like to put it up for consideration for sure. For me, that was uh, that was a ballsy move, and I really like to watch that go down. I think uh, we said it was being scoped up. We said that uh, it was trying to uh, be be sort of lined up to be uh, a move coming down, and certainly a good effort coming through. So I think we can accept that for nominations. Looking at uh, Richard Grinwald in the BBR Racing Triple Six. They are catching up to the likes of T-Villain in that number 13 Audi, just uh, 1.1 seconds behind them. Seems like a big gap at this phase, but uh, one small mistake, one breaking zone mistake, uh, and mishap can quickly close that gap down. As the get night comes in, we, we talked about it getting darker. It does continue to get darker, and uh, it's only just gone 20 to 8 in South Africa in the sim. So for these guys all trying to uh, trying to get their positions done, you know, maybe the nighttime is a good place to catch other drivers off guard. Hope they haven't put the preparation into adapting to a circuit that is essentially just not lit up at all when nightfall comes in. You've got to rely on your instincts. You've got to rely on uh, your specific braking points that you've kind of learned through muscle memory driving it during the day and then translating those over tonight. And those temperatures continue to drop down as well. 22 de degrees on the track surface, which means that uh, your tire pressures that you started the race with uh, won't be the same sort of tire pressures that you would be running at this phase of the race. It's all those small little things that go into making a successful sim racing team. And all those little niches uh, need to be planned out and adapted to. Very true. And triple six car at the moment hunting down the number 13 Aston Martin so just 1.4 seconds up the road and it's uh, another one of the very common red and well black and red cars that we've seen out here today if uh, anyone joining us now missed the livery chat that we had earlier with uh, Sam Wright, who was joining us as a guest in the box. We uh, we went over every car on the grid, all the liveries, and uh, determined that black and red was the most common combination for this race. We did, didn't we? Uh, we went through them in detail. So uh, every team getting a little bit of representation out on the, uh, on the stream, at least, in the broadcast which uh, goes a long way for these teams that uh, have their own sponsors and, and people that are, are supporting them and may not be able to see them up towards the top of the uh, the running order. Very wide goes car in the background there as uh, we see Richard Grinvolt continue to chase down and try and get that position. Uh, getting closer and closer to the likes of Villain as uh, we see some traffic coming and impeding them just a little bit. It's traffic, it's navigating the traffic, it's not something untoward, it's not something we haven't seen before. And uh, for a lot of these drivers doing a good job at respecting those blue flags, to the drivers that aren't respecting the blue flags, uh, you know, all I can say is shame on you, bringing shame to your team and your driver list, uh, but to the, the teams that are respecting things out there and doing things the way they should, uh, I, I tip my hat. Yeah, of course. And uh, I mean, what is what is one of the things that you know we we love to see out here the most? We love to see people, probably a following the rules, <laughs> it's because you know that it's it, it is part of why they exist. They are they are meant to be followed, and we love to see good sportsmanship. And uh, you know it's uh, it, it's it's one of those things that goes a long way in uh, in, in real racing and in sim racing as well. And uh, it is always nice to see people that act in in a sporting like behavior and the people that uh, follow the rules as they should be and i'm especially you know especially happy of people that you know if they break a rule or they make a mistake you know they put their hands up they say look it was my bad didn't mean it apologize for it and you move on with your race I mean, it, it's just that, isn't it, Ryan? You, you, you get to a situation, some of the teams uh, haven't had the best day of racing. They found themselves, uh, you know, down towards the bottom order of the pack for whatever reason it is that they've come into it. Um, but but you, can only, uh, you can only look at people who, who don't respect 
the fact that other people are out here without those same issues, having been racing for the same duration of time and, and are respecting those rule sets. The people that, uh, you know, just have that attitude of, well, you know, what, what is the point of us doing anything? You know, we're not going to win. We're just going to, uh, you know, impede traffic and, and whatnot. That's that's just not the right attitude to have. So I think there is a, uh, a definite uh, skill gap difference in this race particularly uh, the entire point was obviously to raise as much uh, money for the charity as we could with driver entry so he wanted to have a lot of cars on the grid that unfortunately also meant that we did get a big skill gap coming through we have some very talented international drivers joining in here it's only an honor uh, for me as a south african of course i've moved over to the uk but it's only an honor for me to see such big names and teams uh, participating in a South African event. And it does bring uh, a little bit of sadness to me to know that there are drivers out here that uh, aren't respecting things as they should and, and perhaps ruining the race for others. Well, moving on from uh, a slightly negative subject we can switch back to some positive racing and uh we've got the audi the triple six audi which was closing in was hunting down the number 13 aston martin has now closed in and within a few tenths of a second as well gonna come up towards cheetah trying to look for a way past but making the sensible decision and not going to try a move through one of the final few corners, but into the final corner. The Audi has a look on the inside, not quite able to get the nose up on the inside and find a way through. But now on the run through turn one and down towards turn two, the Aston Martin will go to the inside line. The Audi forced onto the outside, but we've seen people go around the outside before here at Kailami. Is the triple six about to do the same outside? Oh. Become inside. Oh, oh slight contact. Oh, and the triple six goes off, but they come back on. And, and they uh, will keep the position. I think uh, Tommy Villain, they also realized that there was uh, a slight little bit of an overlap, a little tap coming in there, just easing off of that accelerator pedal. We'll get a view from inside the, uh, the, the, the cockpit view as we go around. You can just see that little door just slightly. Oh, there's the little tap that comes through. Manages to do a great job of, at avoiding contacting the wall there and the Aston Martin just uh, sort of easing up and just giving that position back over to the triple six. I think it was a, a fair move being attempted. The, uh, the the space that was given just wasn't quite there. Drivers are going side by side, but uh, that was a great bit of sportsmanship coming out from the number 13 Aston Martin and the triple six with a very brave move. And you said it, you've seen cars go around the outside there. Then you put yourself onto a very precarious point of uh, where you're going to be. And you, you don't want to be on the right side of the track coming into the Yuxke sweep. So you kind of need to be more in the middle of the road. And uh, the two of them just, just pushing it to the limit, maybe just uh, pushing a little bit too far, but villain uh, doing the right thing, just easing off as well and uh, allowing uh, Grinvolt to get past. So, oh, that was a, that was a, that was a scary moment, but uh, also a happy moment. Uh, a moment of uh, jubilation will come out from the BBR racing team. I think they saw the uh, the lights flashing at the end of the tunnel, like the danger lights of death. And uh, that gap, I mean, you're running over sausage curb, you're going across gravel and dirt, and on the inside you've got a wall, and on the outside you've got two other cars that uh, you're trying to stay away from. So uh, a good job from the triple six to to manage to thread the needle to keep it back on the racing surface, and uh, they started to put a little bit of distance between themselves and that number thirteen behind. If I was one of the teammates for the triple six, I think my heart would have been in my mouth throughout the entirety of 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 that moment, but. Tell you what, fantastic move around the outside, wasn't it, George, to, to, to take the place initially. And then the slight contact that followed afterwards was unfortunate, but thankfully nothing serious happened. And uh, they can continue on as, uh, as usual, but that's going to have to go down as... I mean, I I ignoring the slight incident afterwards, I think that, you know, th those moves around the outside at turn two absolutely fantastic stuff and uh, we we saw quite a few of those in the porsche masters cup that rci ran um earlier on this week and uh you had uh you had plenty of joys commentating uh on that race and uh well we can only hope that over the next 16 hours and 15 minutes we see a few more overtakes like that 
Oh, those those are the kind of moments that we we kind of sign ourselves up for as commentators. I mean, there's a lot of the the race where you don't have too much action happening on track, but when you do get uh, sort of glimpses of of people pushing it to the limits. It is always a treat. We did see exactly those kind of things in the Porsche Masters Cup that took place on Monday. And we were here at Kyle Army. So a bit of a, a bit of a, a warm up for me uh, coming into this 24 hour. And of course, uh, this 24 hour has been nothing short of exciting. Um, we had a good little run through of the liveries and the teams. So that's of course, probably the, the biggest downtime uh, we've ever spent going through uh, a whole bunch of cars. But I think uh, we did some some good justice to all the competitors that have come through and of course uh, raising money for the quad power association of south africa with the entry fees it's always cool to support a good cause and a cause close to uh, my heart i've done a lot of the quasa based events quads for quads being the one that uh, always sticks to mind i got to ride my motorbike all the way down from uh, carnival city in Joburg down to belito uh, many many kilometers in the dirt and uh, many, many kilometers of fun, uh, just socializing and, and having a good time raising money for a good cause. So uh, looking at Tommy Villain now coming into the braking zone at the top of the hill. Splitter cams being selected out by Stewie, our broadcaster. And uh, we get to kind of appreciate the amount of headlight uh, light that these, these cars uh, throw down. Went to the Kyle Army in real life, got to see these cars doing things in the nine hour. Uh, sort of in the flesh got to experience the, the power and the roar of what these motors don't just sound like but feel like and uh, also got to appreciate just how bright these lights actually are on these cars so we see it uh, looks like villain is going to get uh, past Grinvold probably going into the pit box yes so what was a uh, good little battle on track for position between the two cars BBR racing and of course all in racing is going to be put on ice be uh, put in the chiller as uh, Tony Villain is allowed to now take that position back whilst their rival goes in to serve their pit stop. Maybe a driver change, maybe uh, something to do with the fuel in their car, slap on a set of tires, maybe repair some damage. So many variations of uh, what, what the pit stops here are going to be all about. And switching over to the triple seven then of Flip Van Sale as uh, they make their way over the timing line. Chasing down on the likes of Peters and just trying to stay ahead of that Lamborghini behind him, the number 23 of Sakiri. Uh, oh, and the triple seven. This is a car we've seen facing backwards a couple of times, and we're about to see why it's facing backwards again. Oh. Oh, just clipped by the Lamborghini. And uh, that's rather unfortunate for the 777 car. To find themselves facing backwards again, but I... So the Lamborghini's still gone up the road. It hasn't slowed down to give the place back, I don't believe. Although the timing board... Not updated to reflect that, but yeah, the 23 is ahead of the 777, so they haven't slowed down to give that position back. Although I believe they are a lap down to them anyway, but uh, unfortunate for the, 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 the 777 getting caught up in that incident, but... Still a long way to go, and uh, for quite a few of these teams, even though they haven't had the greatest start to their race, what you've got to consider is, well, you know, we're, we're just about a third of the way into the race, there's still two thirds to go. Anything can happen and a lot of places can still be made up. That's that's uh, kind of what separates the, uh, the greats from the averages, is really just having to mitigate the amount of time that you're spending uh, dealing with, with race car issues. You have to have uh, a good race car day to to be able to to have a good endurance race you know if if things go bad they can go very bad uh, you kind of need the contribution to come out from everybody to do their very best and uh, it really does come down to who has the least amount of errors in the racing world and looking here at Milton Steel Vicin in at that 962 the MSV racing number 962 currently find themselves in eighth place you talked about it very early on 
just at uh, how these guys have just been uh, trundling through, just making making positions coming through and uh, being the front running Aston Martin as well, doing a good job to keep themselves within that top 10, currently just sitting in eighth place. They've got Shell Wilkin and Toro in at that 696 ahead of them. Quite a gap uh, for them to make up there. But uh, for Shell Wilkin, he's going to be focused on, on keeping that, uh, that Toro Porsche ahead for as long as possible, trying to make up time uh, to the likes of today in that number 11 Audi and uh, well, it's just been a good race coming out for the 962 keeping their heads down keeping things uh, nice and uh, well organized for themselves we see the number 97 Sidemax Motorsports team coming into the pits of course uh, Royal being the driver at the time to make that put entry not really going to change up the positions too much uh, they, they are uh, you know, a couple of laps ahead of, of some of the pressure. I think uh, Util actually just 28 seconds behind. So we might see some closing down coming through 367. Bentley was uh, looking very, very strong as they do then make it through up into third place under the pit stop changes. And uh, we see Dimov also getting through there. So the number 97 still in the pit stop. You can see that uh, the driver's down to P5, all in contention still with 16 hours to go of this race, that uh, being able to find higher paying points and prize money positions. Oh, we've got a car off the track. I believe that's number 57. Has gone off after sunset. Yellow flags in that part of the track. Not entirely sure what has happened to that car. Uh, number 57 down of 35th place. It has got moving under its own power again, but uh, that car was off the circuit. And, oh! So we didn't catch what exactly happened to the 57, but we've caught why there were yellow flags that are off the circuit. Either way, Ryan, um, going to 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 have to uh, now return to the racing circuit, uh, slightly more worse for wear, and that number 57 Audi uh, going to have been impacted quite heavily from that hard impact too. So you jump and look at the number 57 here, try and just uh, see how uh, the car is tracking. At the moment looks to be back up to speed. But uh, certainly not a great place to be in. Finding yourself pointing the wrong way is one thing. Uh, contact with the wall and the very sensitive nature of these GT3 cars in there or, and the, uh, the aero. Two different things. Yeah, we spoke about it earlier. The damage that you can get, the aerodynamic damage on these cars can have a serious effect on their pace. And uh, that's just... One of the disadvantages that you get with the more aerodynamic dependency that these cars have. And of course that scales up as uh, you go through different forms of, of cars as well. The, the prototypes are much more aero-dependent and the same with formula-style cars. The more aero-dependency you do, the more significant that any piece of damage can be on the car. And uh, the GT3 cars, whilst... Uh, definitely not the most dependent on their aerodynamic elements. They do start to suffer once you pick up a few seconds of damage. And it's interesting, George, because with some of the some of the cars as well, it it's uh, you know, it's at different different parts of the car can have significant effects as well. For example, if you if you get a few seconds of damage on the front of a Lamborghini, it's not going to affect your car as much as if you've got five seconds of damage on the rear of the car. True, true, and uh, you know those are those are factors that uh, need to be considered in. And for the drivers out here, it's all about uh, making sure that you get that car across the line in one piece. I've seen uh, a lot of the chat kind of uh, highlighting that that's a goal for a lot of these teams. For GTWR though, that is not just what they want. They wanted to come home and take a victory in a 24-hour race. We've seen that they are capable of doing so in a 12-hour. He had Kyle Army, of course, uh, not hosted by us, but uh, something that was done over 
with the uh, the sim grid side of things and uh, you know across the communities everybody's got uh, something that they want to get uh, under their belts and i think a, a 24-hour victory will go a long way for gtwr they are trying to uh, take that away from what will be a hat trick of kyle army 24-hour races from the car in second place at number 96 of the uh i mean it's been a good it's good been, been a good entry uh, and a good drive coming out for side works and 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 side max should i say uh, getting a little bit caught up in my my own words been a long uh, long commentary stint as it stands but booth be at the wheel and uh, wanting to to get his team over the line uh, to get a hat trick finish and gtwr just uh, trying to say nope and not let them do so so uh, i kind of like narratives i, I kind of find that that's the the fun part of doing sim racing is being able to highlight talent and and find these sort of uh, individual stories and, and team stories that come through but uh, for GTWR, it's just been it's been a great start. It's been uh, an awesome race for them. They've just been showing their pace throughout, uh, whether it was daytime or now when we've dipped down into the darkness, also just bringing the fire and the heat. And that Audi has certainly impressed me. I'm a big Porsche fan. Thought we'd see a lot more Porsches coming out here. And uh, to be honest, the Audi just, uh, just showing exactly its metal and uh, doing a good job at, at securing down a very high manufacturer finish uh, as we get down into sort of that 16 hour remaining mark. Bray on the inside then of Buerta, that will be Retro Esports trying to get past on uh, the likes of the number 91, 738 with Jason Gray at the wheel. Uh, big fan of Jason Dr Gray as a driver too. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, seeing him sort of progress through sim racing and you know we've had some some interesting mean moments at times but uh, certainly got some some real talent when it comes down to the driving as long as he's keeping the car on the track not uh, send, sending it up to space using the sausage curves whether it's uh, here or out at uh, I think it was monza where i i, I first come, came to know jason gray and that was because he, he put his car almost a car length up in at the air uh, after taking through some of the curbs, I think it was even the <laughs> second chicane. It was uh, it was quite a, an amazing thing, almost a whole car length or, or height above everybody else. So, uh, yeah, good to see the retro esports uh, alpha team here. Good to see Jason Gray coming through. I, I ripped Jason Isherwood off about their, their livery colors, but as the uh, as the sun sets, it, it becomes a little bit uh, null and void to to talk about those things because you can't really see. Uh, what they're doing until they're highlighted up by the uh, headlights of their competitors. But Gray doing a good job closing down onto Buerta, uh, the, the third sector then of the track, kind of going the way of the Aston Martin. Gray getting a good read sort of through this early phase and, and mid part of the track. And we'll be probably trying to, uh, trying to get something done at this phase. Uh, you know, just close that gap down, use the advantage that you've got. Very good through the corners goes the Bentley. You can use a little bit more of the curb as well. So we see Jason Gray continuing on, and uh, I don't think. Uh, that pressure has got past the likes of uh, Buerta behind, and now we'll start to make progress up towards the likes of. Uh, oh, it's not. It's uh, Buerta here. Just uh, currently is down just a little bit, getting caught up with the timing sheets. It's uh, Gray and Giovanni then that come through. Here we get a race replay of. Uh, just past where the overtake was, but oh no, there's a big, uh, a big send coming up the inside. I think Gray uh, also just giving the space coming out, a little tap coming round, and uh, unfortunately then the uh, two. It's, it's sad to see when two drivers come into contact in the darkness. The stewards going to be kept uh, very busy as they have to look at all of these penalties and what needs to be done to apply things to uh, the relative drivers. But a, uh, a good showing and a good, uh, a good drive coming through. I believe that uh, for a lot of the drivers here today, it's, uh, it's been a, an interesting race. I think there's, there's some new entries into uh, doing these kind of uh, endurance races. Of course, uh, a nice partnership between Raceface and Solidarity 
getting together. And of course, uh, Pure Storage, NEC Data Sciences, Oxide, AMD, and Super Micro for all getting behind the initiative. A 24 hour race event, uh, you know, in excess of 40 cars on the grid. I think we had 44 or so to start. Uh, over 200 drivers making up those teams. So uh, when it comes down to numbers, it's, uh, it's a very big event to be a part of. And no event is going to be completely flawless. There are going to be things that we are able to work on going forward uh, with, with the structure and the way that uh, you know, maybe the dynamic weather could have come in. It would have been nice to see a little bit of uh, rain coming down. Weatherman Simon Gear in my ear just uh, telling me that we've still got clear skies predicted up at the top of the track. Uh, the wind at zero, degree, at zero kilometers an hour and the track temperature still sitting at 22 degrees. Yeah, track starting to cool. And so uh, it was about 34 degrees, wasn't it, earlier on in the race. It's fairly hot out on the track. It was 27 degrees air temperature, but uh, or ambient rather, and uh, now coming down to 22. And it will get cooler as the race continues to go on as well. We get uh, at its coldest point around, I believe it's one in the morning, two in the morning. But, indeed uh, indeed it is ryan so uh, is that is that a little bell ringing in the background what is what is that bell that's ringing i uh i think i think that is the sound of team america walking into the box i can see Je jesse lee is almost pushing me out of my seat george that ain't that ain't, that ain't a bell that's uh that's a that's a horn <laughs> it's a little bicycle bell mike jones is uh, is barged in here <laughs> Team America going to be joining uh, for their stint in the commentary box. Mike, how long are you guys? Uh, how long are you guys in here for? Uh, we will be here for two hours, uh, and then you guys are back for a couple hours to wrap up the remainder of the evening. Uh, and then me and Jesse Lee and Mr. Nick Setnick are going to take ourselves a long six-hour block during the overnight <laughs> and early morning out here in South Africa. Well, it's, uh, it's always so nice to have uh, the entire international crew joining us all in at the same place at the same time. Uh, but we will be, of course, handing over then to Mike Jones and JC Lee to take over. Ryan and I will get a little break in. We'll be able to go and just get ourselves fed and watered. By that time things are done, we will uh, we'll see you guys again for a little, uh, a little stint before we leave the Americans. Uh, sort of, can we call it America Untamed for that six-hour part? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, that is, uh, that is promising a lot there, George. But I think maybe we can get away with it. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll pretend, even if we're not allowed to call it that, that uh, it will be America Untamed from then. Uh, but from myself, George Smith, Ryan, uh, Ryan Gill, it has been a pleasure to broadcast this race for the duration that we have, and we'll see you guys a little bit later as well. Mike, uh, are you guys ready to go live on your side? I think we are good to go. Uh, we will see you guys in a couple hours, and uh, I will take over your seat and uh, let Stewie gesture wildly at us for the last, uh, for the next couple couple hours. Well, Jesse Lee, you have not been here yet today. I, of course, was here the first four hours, um, and this race was non-stop action for about the first two to three hours. It was absolutely insane uh, watching these guys fight from about P5 to P15 all the way to the back of the pack. We're currently watching a fight that's ongoing at the back of the pack, uh, almost quite literally. This is a fight near P40 that's going on even eight hours now into this 24-hour race, and this is kind of exactly what we've expected out of a 24 hour when we did our 24 hour Kailami uh, out in the European region not too long ago. It's the same thing there. We came in around this time for our night stint, and what was it? It was fights all the way up and down the field. Yes, indeed. And uh, hello to everybody out there on Race Face. I am Jesse Lee, and that was the sultry voice of Mike Jones. And can I just say, this race has been very interesting from the drop of the green flag. We've continued to see fighting throughout the sort of top 15 area down in the middle of the pack. And we'll get into some of the other things that I've noticed in this race a little bit later. But you're, you're so right. You are, Mike. We did see so many 
different cars come alive in the night portion of the race. We're getting there. It's 8.10 p.m. Uh, in sim time here. And all of a sudden, you're starting to see maybe some of the other displacement cars, the other layouts that maybe weren't so great in the heat of the day. Now they're starting to come back into their own 22 degrees C. And obviously, that is going to continue to go down as well. You're going to see a lot of different cars that are going to all of a sudden come alive here. And it's just due to the atmospheric conditions. Speaking of coming alive, Muscat trying to get the move done here for the Smooth Operator GP team and uh, just about gets it uh, gets it there. Uh, that's, that's sort of what I'm talking about in particular with the Porsche, for instance. Yeah, I mean, this was a car that we were watching earlier. Muscat are one of our couple Ferraris and, of course, the lead Ferrari through the race. Uh, uh, Greg Maloney, who I was commentating with a little bit earlier, as well as broadcasting Ford at the start of the race, Clark King and George G. Mack Smith, uh, you know, he's a, he was a big Ferrari fan, and he wanted to see these guys up uh, near the top of the grid, and they have continued to climb a little bit. Up into P10 now is Muscat. Now, he is at the back end of his pit, so Wilkin out ahead has already made his pit. Wilkin pit about five laps ago, uh, but that Taro team with Wilkin currently on board uh, is is looking a little slower at the start of this stint in comparison to Muscat at the end of the stint. And that's that weird balance that I think you find, Jesse, because in the end, you know, that Ferrari at the moment definitely has, you know, you know almost no fuel in it, right? So so there's no there's no fuel on board. He's about ready to pit. He maybe has 20 liters left if, if, if we're throwing out an estimate, right? But he's got tires that he's been running on for an hour, uh, and he's still looking a little faster than that 696 Porsche. And, you know, I'm wondering if they've, uh, the 696 has kind of thrown their slower driver in for this evening stint, or if Muscat is just that quick. I mean, even looking at the times, Wilkin, he's definitely running a little slower on his last lap. It was a 144, which isn't, uh, isn't what we've seen consistently through the top 10, top 15 through the race. Uh, but, you know, some of these driver's times have definitely been in the 143s uh, as we're obviously watching back uh, from another one who's been fighting this entire race with somebody or another. And a lot of the times it's been this number 100 Audi. Uh, earlier, it was Grobler versus Milton Steel Vassen. Now it's the 100 driven by Brian Lewis and Milton Steel Vassen. And so, you know, these guys, again, have found each other. They are roughly on the same pit strategy, only about 10 laps off. And so, you know, these guys that were fighting six hours ago, still fighting here eight and a half hours into this race. Uh, and it's just it's just interesting to see this, uh, how how the how the different pit strategies are working uh, for for these teams throughout this race. And 16 hours ago, plenty of time for uh, for for more pit strategy help here. And I think we're getting a replay. I think this is uh, one of the oh, that was Muscat, I think, Ooh. one of the race. Richardson again, 57. I don't know if you caught it, Jesse. There was a Richardson was caught up in a major, major incident earlier. He spun himself around, and Leo Cop uh, did not hold his brakes. Came back across the track and uh, came in contact with multiple cars through that action. And then subsequently, after we caught back from the replay, he was down in the crocodiles doing uh, uh, coming off track again with all the damage he had uh, coming down through crocodiles and cheetahs. So. He has not had the best race in that 57 car. Richardson has not. Um, and it looks like a little bit of a contact there with, with, uh, the, with the Ferrari is still going on here uh, about five hours later. But they're holding on, <laughs> that 47 is, trying to, trying to get to the finish at least. Yeah, indeed. Uh, that 57 has certainly been in their share of incidents today, and that just adds to the pile. You have to wonder as we see Sheldon Muscat coming in to the pit lane for the uh, 258 Ferrari Smooth Operator GP team, pitting out of the 10th place position. And that will delight Milton Stilvaston, I think, as now he will lose his caboose for just a short time. But I expect the 962 to come in as well sometime soon. But hopefully he can uh, get some sort of uh, pressure off his back. Still Vassin, of course, no stranger to being defensive. He's got uh, one of the right cars to be defensive today, I think. But uh, nonetheless, I figure that he will have just about the best uh, a bet to hold them off. 
but I'm not used to seeing him defend that much. Though, honestly, I'm used to seeing him come through the field still, Vassin. Yeah, and, you know, there's there's guys out here that are, I think, just straight up quicker than that 962 field or car in this case. And also, uh, there's, I think, part of the fact is the 962 is in the Aston Martin. And here at Kyalami, at least inside ACC, it is almost impossible to beat the Audi, which is just obvious and apparent. Just take a look at the, you know, the, the left side of the screen there. We've got uh, six of the top seven cars in an Audi, and the other one is a Bentley. Below that's a Porsche, a Milton Steel Vass, and the lead Aston Martin uh, by by a large margin as well, ahead of the number 13 Aston Martin. And if you keep going down the list, what do you see? Bentley, 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 Aston, 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 Bentley, Aston. <laughs> so, you know, the, the Aston just doesn't do quite as well uh, here at Kyle. I mean, I think that ha definitely has a bit of factor, uh, or a bit, of, a, a bit to factor into it, at least, you know. Um, these Audis doing really well. Simonini, obviously, for GWR, unsurprisingly, uh, either number one or number two was going to be my prediction for them. They're in number one. And who was my prediction for number one or number two, the other one? George Booth, me, and the Sidemax team. And that's exactly where they find themselves, in their Audis. And you know they picked the Audi for a reason. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's no sort of surprise that you see the top ten mostly dominated by the Audis, it's just, well, it is just one of the favored cars. And do, they're going well. I don't think this fight is done. Keep in mind, we have just a little less than 16 hours as Michael Appleton has went off the track. What happened to that Aston? Just losing it on the curbs and clunking the outside wall. Holds the brakes, though, sits there, making sure everything's clear. Oh, he's thinking about reversing and just about gets it going the right way a responsible way to rejoin the track in my opinion but that damage clearly done the hood flapping away mm. on the heart racing aston martin now yeah one of those astons at the back of the pack just not having a not having a good time um you know it's something that we see time and time again here at kailami catch a curb in a wrong spot and uh cheetah hello uh, and you throw yourself, and every step of the way, you're going to spin yourself, and that's that's just how it's going to be. Uh, and you know, if you're not careful, you can really go here. And if you, if and when you do go here, and this is part of the problem, it's not a big runoff area like say Paul Ricard or maybe even Silverstone, right? It's a lot of grass on Silverstone, but it's still a reasonable way to the wall. You know, here on Kailami, there's not as much runoff on most of the corners. And so if you do catch a curb in the S's, a cheetah, uh, wherever, you're very likely to just throw yourself into a wall and get quite a bit of damage. And, uh, you know, that's that's really what we keep seeing. There was, I think, three or four cars that we just tracked even just on camera uh, earlier during the first four hours of the race that threw themselves onto the curb of cheetah and subsequently off the track. Uh, but, you know, here's an ongoing battle kind of in the mid pack again. We're still keep an eye on this one. This is Radloff out back out in front. And uh, I believe that's a lap car behind and in front with the Ferrari. So, you know, we got uh, a little bit of lap cars going on here with the 89 and 87 Aston Martins at the mid pack. So far doing a good job keeping it on the track. Uh, but you can definitely see, uh, see, see how dirty they are and how much grass that everybody's keeping. Look at all that dirt in the back of that Aston. Well, they have been racing for quite a long time as well, but even still, the dirt, the grime, mm -hmm. and speaking of which, going off the track, uh, Radloff, Chris Radloff for the KSR Pulse team, having to basically take it to the dirt here in South Africa to potentially get that pass done. But more to your point, Mike, that's exactly what they have been having to do and willing to do to potentially get passes done. And some cars very obviously more dirty than others, and that is a direct relation to how often they've been either off the track or in the walls in some cases, and that's sort of what you expect. This is the mid-packs where I, where I say the scrum occurs. I don't, I don't usually say that word, but that's what I think of in my head. I think of it like a rugby scrum, and that, that's what it is. Everybody here, you've got teams that are higher than they otherwise normally would be, because of accidents that happened in front of them with faster cars and you've got cars that are faster behind that are trying to recover from accidents and they all come together in the middle of the pack and 
that's usually where you see your most energy in a race like this. It's also where you normally see most of your incidents as well. And I think that all is related to how dirty the cars already are, even though we're, uh, you know, not even halfway into this thing. And I feel like some of the other 24 hour races we've seen, they're pretty much as dirty as they were at the end of the 24. But uh, I just, uh, I think it's a product of how hard they're actually racing each other out there. Speaking of which, case in point, down in turn uh, turn two, actually, in fact. Yeah, I've got an idea, Jesse. I, I am afraid. <laughs> I was waiting to see if you'd ask. Uh, so you know how we get, just gave George the boot out of the um, uh, out of the comms box for a couple hours. Well, 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 I mean, I don't, I don't think we gave him a boot, but he he voluntarily left, which is a dangerous maneuver to leave us in here alone. But go on. It, it is. However, I've got another job. For him. He could be our wipe damn boy. He's gonna clean the cars off. Just come down the pit lane. I'm not participating in that. Um, if that's a thing that you want George, George G. Mac Smith to do, that's up to you. I'm not going to uh, do that. I, I will gladly in my let's, break in a few let's, hours. Let's, I'll let's, gladly. Let's hear the chat. Come on. The chat can come in and be like, hey, we support George going out and wiping down the cars in the pit lane. Come on. You guys. Let's go. I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get one of those uh, pressure uh, hose things. And I'll, uh, I'll stick pressure washer. That's the word I was looking for. Washer. I, and what I'm going to do is I'll, uh, I'll I'll spray them as they exit pit road uh, on my break because I think they do. They need a little bit. They need a little bit. Close out the window. There you go. I, it remind it reminds me of what uh, I don't remember what was. Oh yes, it was uh, Sebring years ago when Corvette wrecked really hard, but all they really did was damage. Uh, I think it was something electrical in the front end and the bumper of course and uh what they did is they came in and they fixed it under a safety car period as i think we're about to have a pass here not quite yet but what they did was they came in this was really late in the race they came in under safety car replaced the front end and the front end was as yellow as it as it usually is with a corvette but the rest of the car was a dirty color but the front bumper was so pristine yeah. It, it literally looked like a cartoon and uh, that that's uh th that's what uh, some of these cars actually look like now some of the body panels don't look like they have too much on them as others do as uh radloff and uh, rautenbach still engorged in this fight here for 17th place overall it's a good fight though they're keeping it clean so far it is a fair fight as well aston on aston yeah, of course, we saw Radlov go a little deep into T2 on last lap, uh, but Rautenbach not able to capitalize enough as he fell back a few tenths. And it looks like that's pretty much what's going on here for the most part. That 89 car has fallen back just a little bit through Sector 3, uh, makes it up in Sector 1, and then, you know, has to, has to try and get up and make the pass, but has not been able to do so so far. Also, he just doesn't look like that he's necessarily got more pace than the 87, I don't think. So, you know, staying behind him isn't necessarily the worst thing at this point. Maybe he does have some more in him, and that's why he needs to get on pass. But, you know, it, it, with, with such long races like this, the simple maneuver of just getting past somebody isn't always necessary if they're running the same paces, unless they're holding you up in some way where you think that you can go faster, et cetera, et cetera. You know, sitting behind somebody isn't necessarily the worst thing you can save a little fuel because you can coast a little bit granted with the 70 minute stint timers i don't think the aston's gonna have to save any fuel uh but you know the cars that do and and might i mean we saw this yesterday at the nurburgring uh jesse with our friday championship uh over at rci was was there were a couple cars including the car that ended up leading the race for almost the entire uh, back half and then came in and lost because he had to take slightly more fuel than the other guy who was george boothby uh by the way so boothby is very used to being in second at this part of the race uh, this week um <laughs> see what you did there boothby, boothby came in clutch though he made the pit stop he saved a little bit of fuel he was fine in his 720s and he made the pit strategy work for him and that could be what you know rotbach needs to happen here if he can come in and save a little bit of fuel take two seconds less on the pit stop well 
there's a 1.6 seconds that he comes out ahead of, of Radloff in front of him, right? And just to look at uh, just to look at the top of the field, you know, there's two Audis at the top of the field in Simonini and Boothby. Boothby's not going to play that pit strategy quite as much today as he was yesterday, I don't think, because he's not going to have a fuel difference to deal with. My favorite thing about talking to George Boothby after winning the opening round of the GT World Championship yesterday, I asked him, when did you know if you ever mm. knew that strategy was going to work? He laughed nervously and said, <laughs> the last minute of the race. And uh, that is a race car driver for you right there. It's like, I had a plan. Didn't know if it was going to work, but I had a plan. And he stuck to it. And the same thing could be said about Radloff and uh, Routenbach here. It's the same thing. You don't know necessarily what the other is doing a second in pit lane would put either of these drivers a second up the road from each other at this point mm -hmm. since they're so close i got to say i am very impressed with routenbach they're not forcing this move here there is the 70 that we saw earlier into the barrier as uh, they stay well clear and traffic could play a factor here is it going to be an inside move into leah we're not Leah Cup. We're not there yet. In fact, uh, excuse me. Uh, my apologies, dearly. The uh, the darkness of the racetrack is confusing me. Now we are at Leah Cup, but I gotta say, it's very, it's very nice to see. Neither one of them look phased. Is my point. Radloff does not look like he's playing Routenbach's game, and Routenbach's not willing to make a move that he doesn't think will stick. That's very nice to see, especially where they are. Of course. They obviously, as you just saw in this lap, they are also working through lap traffic. And what has happened to Richards now? Oh, well, let's take a look here. So this is the other Richards. This is car 888, uh, not the car 57 uh, that we saw. But yeah, there it goes. So you don't hit Same the inside curb, earlier. Machita. You don't hit the inside curb. You hit the outside curb. He stopped there. I think he wanted to go into the pit lane. Uh, but I mm. don't think, if I'm not mistaken, no, yeah, he came back out. Uh, and stayed out on track, realizing that maybe he was too far from it. So that means he's got to make a whole what? How, how, how long is this track? Uh, is it, it's like three kilometers or something like that? I'm look that up, Jesse. It, it, it's not the. It's off, not man. the. Yeah, it's not the longest track in the world, Kyle but it is a very twisty one, and I think that was the right idea. Instead of turning hard left, trying to make the pit lane and creating an, uh, an incredibly dangerous situation for Vivian Richards. This is the only thing they can do Four and is a half go hours. around the track again. And, well, you saw the hard contact, folks, and now you're riding in the visor cam of Vivian Richards and a lot of scuff marks on that windscreen that should not be there. And that is a result of the accident. So for Marinello Motorsports in the Triple Eight, it's uh, they're making actually pretty good time as well. So that tells me the steering isn't completely destroyed, but there is quite a lot of bodywork damage on that car. I'm thinking anywhere between 15 to 30 seconds to fix that triple eight. Yeah, he's getting flashed from behind. Uh, oh, no, sorry. We switched back over to Rattenbach. I, I thought that was the Ferrari. Oh, no, it is the Ferrari there for a second. Yep. No, yeah. So they're out ahead. He's getting flashed from behind. The two Aston Martins want to come past him at this point. Um, so realistically, we got to get... Probably got to get into the pit lane. He's definitely looking slow. Coming through the S's, he was in third gear uh, in that Ferrari, and that's probably somewhere where, and there he goes in the pit. Probably somewhere where you're going to probably be in, in fourth gear at, so you know you're losing time. But uh, Very interesting. we did get, uh, I, I think we just got our first uh, major, very major stewarding decision uh, in the race. We do see a disqualification coming out. There has been plenty of, uh, of course, penalties. Uh, and contact uh, warnings that went out, but we did see our first uh, uh, disqualification in the race. Car 1-2-1 uh, was disqualified uh, out of out of the circuit for repeated dangerous driving, ignoring blue flags, and other penalties. Pretty much the whole bucket list uh, from the look of the uh, table where we keep all the uh, stewarding decisions at. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a little bit more organized and boxed here jesse i noticed we usually just get paper thrown at us i've got like a, a little electronic tablet i was just going to say a few things about our host race face this weekend and by the way thank you very much to race face for having us here in their home and uh in in all south africans for having us 
in their uh, in their country as well. You've been very welcoming all weekend and everything. And I was just going to remark on that, Mike Jones, for a, for a moment. This box that we're in is a lot better than ours. Uh, the the case in point, the the chairs that we are provided, we are we are seated uh, a safe distance apart, of course, but they have padding on them. So so so, Mike, why don't our chairs? in our boxes have padding on them. And uh, instead of the normal saltine crackers that we normally have for lunch, I was actually, uh, I was actually presented a spread. So uh, I'm actually quite, uh, quite pleased with that and uh, honored as well. So thank you to, well, to race face for uh, the hospital, the hospitality. I've, I've got a good idea on that one, Jesse Lee. I'm betting that it was in fact, uh, some of the amazing sponsors that are out here today. Uh, that have provided us with this, of course, Pure Storage, the title sponsor here, for the 24-hour Kailami. This is the Pure Storage 24-hour Kailami, and of course, partnership with Solidarity E-Race, empowered by Raceface. So, realistically, you know, we we really have to thank Pure Storage, Solidarity E-Race, NEC, Data Sciences, Oxide, Super Micro, and even Jesse Lee AMD, uh, who's uh, well. Not only do we have them to thank for sponsoring, we have them for thanking for powering uh, uh, quite a few of our computers. Uh, I've got myself an uh, AMD processor in mind. Uh, I believe you do as well. And our broadcaster currently, Stewie, running off an AMD processor. So, uh, you know, these guys out here providing uh, providing some of the money to put on this beautiful vent. And, of course, the proceeds from the driver registrations are going out to a charity today, the Quadrupara Association of South Africa, uh, in benefit for that. Uh, Greg Maloney earlier, by the way, uh, had the chance to interview somebody that you're probably very familiar with at this point, uh, Mr. Lee, which is uh, Yvonne Vandenberg, uh, out from oh, our yes. DDC series, who is, of course, a, a, a um, I don't, I, 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 I would have to ask her specifically, because she was an Olympic archer um, before, uh, you know, lockdown and everything, um, but I don't know if she competes in the Quadrupara or, or uh, the, the, what's the, what's the word for the Olympics? Um, Paralympics, I think. Is Paralympics. What you're Thank say. you. That is the word I'm looking for. Uh, I don't know if she competes in the Paralympics or, or, um, uh, or just the you know Olympics, Olympics, I guess. Uh, but they are uh, uh, they are a fantastic archer and a fantastic driver. Uh, and for having you know no feeling in her feet, it's it's really amazing. Here's the move, by the way, that finally came off uh, at the at uh, turn two here. Radloff finally falling to Routenbach there uh, slightly, and then the cutback happened, and there is uh, Routenbach out back behind that 87 again. So still not making a stick, uh, Jesse, but uh, in the end, it's something that he's going to keep trying. He's got 15 and a half hours to make it, but uh, final thoughts, uh, yeah, Pure Storage NEC, Data Sciences, Oxide, AMD, Super Micro, big thanks for putting on the spread, giving us these really nice comfy chairs. It really makes it worth it when you're out here for, oh, about 25 hours or so in the comms box uh, during the day to uh, have some nice comfy seating. When we want to sit anyway, Jesse and Lee and I generally tend to commentate standing because we get excited. <laughs> Folks, this is this is as calm as you're going to get us. <laughs> I hope you do enjoy us because if you, if you don't, it's going to be an interesting night. Uh, we've got six hours of commentary coming up for you tonight. If you don't have anything else to do this evening we'd like to invite you to stick with us because the overnight the long haul portion of this race throughout the night is going to be hosted by mr mike jones and myself and well like like the man put it we're likely not to be sitting for very long we uh, we get into it a bit uh, not with each other, obviously. We get into it, the passion of racing, and Martin Rattenbacher is Rattenbach is going to have a self-induced spin coming out of the final turn. I don't, wow. I don't know if there was. I don't think there was a touch there. I just think they tried to turn under a car, and it didn't come off, and that is going to set them back in a big, big way from that 17th place position, and that is not what they were looking for at all and yep. what has happened now happens to the again. two well, let's see the 810 coming in through Chia, it's part of the pit lane yep there it is runs wide oh my goodness it's you, so easy so, mike jones to do that it is you so, have to hit it perfect if you go too far left of the or, of the of the right. mark 
yes, or right, you will miss it. You will clip the curb in such a way that it spins the car. That's what's happening. It's not necessarily the traditional loss of grip through adhesion that's happening. It is almost like the, the curb is so large that it's making the car sort of porpoise or jump up into the air. And then all of a sudden, uh, well, you know, four tires grip more than three. And when you have three and you're turning and one of your drive wheels isn't touching, well, you're going to spin. And we've seen that three times already in 30 minutes. And I don't think that's going to change. And also the other big thing, the darkness is not helping anyone. And when it gets dark at Kailami here, it is properly dark. Yeah, it really is. I mean, just looking at the uh, at the at the dashboard cam that we have here. Let's switch over to that helmet cam very briefly, Stu. I want to see uh, straight from the driver's perspective. Look at this. I mean, the only the only lights that you were seeing are from the headlights, and that is it. You're catching a little bit of the billboards off in the distance, a little bit, but you've got to pray that you can see the flag posts on the on the left. Uh, most of the time and hope that you can see them but that is literally the only thing that you are going to see through through your through your windshield is the lights coming off your headlights this looks a lot like uh, uh le mans like a lot of the live pictures just see out from the mons where you know especially at the back half of the track it's just pitch black and you can't see anything out there as you're doing you know 200 plus miles an hour uh down the down the straight at le mans but you know in the end these drivers are so experienced at Kyalami that they could probably drive this track without their headlights on. George Boothby out here just casually running, you know, running mid 41s. Same thing with Simonini out in front. Turn the headlights off. I don't know. What do you think, Jesse? I think high 41s instead. Yeah, I think so. By the way, just to clear up uh, some loose ends of some questions we asked the chat earlier. Apparently, they are in favor of George Smith getting down there and spraying the cars down with a hose. I'm not sure if the teams would agree with that. Teams are <laughs> notoriously fickle about other people touching their uh, machinery, and uh, I can certainly see why they would be, but it would be funny nonetheless. And we're going to bring a little bit of uh, what we're used to to the box tonight, folks, starting now to any point that we, Mike Jones and myself, are in the box. Oh. You can you use the hashtag ask the, ask the box there we go. and uh, you can, you can ask us questions. We're going to respond. We're going to interact with you in chat as always, as the race is going on. And once again, uh, I was reading chat and uh, they, uh, you guys are way too flattering. You're, I'm going to, I'm going to leave here. I'm not going to be able to leave the box. My head's going to be so <laughs> big, but uh, you're, you're way too flattering and hospitable here. I, I, I think I'm going to stay in ZA a little bit longer. I think. Uh, you know, I have made my way down here once before uh, for 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 the Silverstone. George will have to correct me here. I don't remember. I think it was the Silverstone 10 hour. Uh, I just happened to not be able to sleep one night and I was up um, tuned into George's stream uh, with a couple of his guys out from South Africa at the Silverstone circuit. And uh, George looked over at me in chat and said, Mike, why aren't you in the comms box? And I said, you know, George, that's an excellent question. And I somehow found myself in the comms box. Uh, and it was a fantastic experience casting that uh, for a few hours with Race Face. Uh, I believe it was um, uh, George Allen and... Um, George, I, I, I do not remember who else was in here. I'm sure George, George will be able to let us know in the chat uh, who else was in here. But it was a fantastic experience racing with those guys or, or casting with those guys. And it's something I look forward to doing. Uh, again, at some point, even besides this, is obviously today we're we're casting mostly with our RCI team, uh, who are who are doing this. But obviously, ooh, there's another ooh. car off there. One of the Aston Martins hit the grass, uh, and Stewie's trying to track him down at the moment as he is not going into the pit lane. Uh, it looks like it looks like he will come uh, come back on track. By the way, that other car, the last one that went off, Deventer, he is still out on the track, uh, or in the pit stop rather. So he never went into the pit lane. Uh, or left pit lane. Oh, I yes, talk you're, talking about this. Yeah. you're talking about that the 70. The, yeah. I am, and that was the number 13, by the way, who was fighting for P10 uh, that was off track there. Uh, so that was Dylan. Oh, dear. Uh, so he was he was up uh, fighting at the back of Muscat, and that was him that was off track. Uh, and I'm going to try and find out on the replay machine what exactly happened to him, Jesse Lee. Uh, but uh, this is a really interesting camera here watching these guys come through Cheetah, especially as we come down into it. 
you can really see like how how perfectly and consistently all these cars have to take this corner they are pretty much all you know pro am silver doesn't matter what they're pretty much all having to hit that same exact line because you cannot deviate from it and it's so interesting because it's one of the few corners i think in gt world challenge europe icgt and british gt you know in these gt3 cars that i think you have to do that that consistently yeah there's no argument with this particular corner you're going to see everybody come in and hit just about the same apex you know whenever you learn how to race you're taught that there's different kinds of apexes well around this particular corner that is not the case if you miss this too far to the inside folks you're going to uh, well you're going to join the right brothers you're going to be the first in flight and if you go too far to the right you're going to end up in a gravel trap you're going to hop a curb and you're likely going to spin back towards the outside of the track just look how inhospitable that curb is and that's what i was talking about earlier with how high off the ground the curbs are and that is why whenever you lose traction in the left rear wheel you just go spinning because one drive wheel turning not going to work it is not a motorcycle and uh, you will end up in the wall quite heavily uh, camo za in chat says uh, it's not dark at uh, kailami by choice it's load shedding i love that bringing the uh, <laughs> south african humor bringing the oh, south african humor i that's love good. it i love it i i understand that joke because i work with george smith and uh, shawnee at some point uh, and, very and, Cameron and, and uh and tabastos that's very correct uh, though i i don't work with him so much as i commentate on him racing most of the time since sure, uh, he's, you'll be doing uh, a little bit of that tomorrow did you know i will be indeed uh, case and point both are trying Ooh. to get a position back flashing the triple nine and position gain Lindsay ray giving up that spot but perhaps not happy about it a little bit of a reflash there was that sort of a out of frustration or appreciation i don't know i'll let you all decide what you think about that meanwhile jesse we have our first ask the box question and i think it's an Let's interesting it. one it's maybe a bit of a trap Though uh, maybe we'll consider that most of the South Africans maybe have went to sleep at this point. <laughs> Either that or Go they're on. watching us as they're going to bed and they're going to tune off here very shortly. Uh, Jared mm. Dempsey wants to know, where do you think Kailami ranks as a track in the world? Like, I'm, I'm going to imagine, like, as, as a top track. Like, what do you think of Kailami? Mm. And I think I have, I, I definitely have an answer for that because I already know. I already know. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. For, for me, it's very simple. I don't want to rank them in actual order, but Kyle Lamy for me is a top five track. I The first version of this track I raced on was in a, I think it was F198 or something like that. Or, or, or was it? No, it was a GP something. I, anyway, that's not the point. The, the point is it was the 1993 or 94 variant that they would have raced on in Formula One. And I fell in love with the track. It was obviously fairly similar layout but very different uh, uh, all things considered fell in love with the track rediscovered it a little bit later on and when they did this particular renovation as Vivian Richards has had a, another spin and it was due to contact slow was the triple eight and into the wall deposed they now sit and that is a very hopeless feeling there, letting everybody go by, getting the car pointed the right direction and continuing on. But yeah, for me, it's a top five track. It, it, it's, it's in there with Spa. Oh, no, and more contact. More contact between a Bentley and Craig Hunter in the Flying Gypsies 85. Question is, is that Peters uh, to the right of him? I'm not sure. We'll have to check once we get back live, but... Stewie, Stewie now giving me the thumbs up that it is Peters indeed that was fighting them for position. Yeah, the Bentley. Ooh. That's that is that is an interesting little incident there because at the same time you're very used to running a little bit off track at that point coming out of the corner. So I think the Bentley thought that he had a little bit more room than he did actually have. Catches the back end of him and just throws him around, but he's in the pit lane now, uh, which isn't surprising in the 85 car. Uh, let's see. When was the last time the 85 pit? He pit on lap 276. 
which is about 20 laps ago, 25 laps ago. So he's definitely short pitting, but at the very least, it's not new. Uh, and he definitely like has the right to pit at this time. So it could work out for him. He'll lose a little bit of time repairing the damage, obviously, but uh, hopefully he'll get back out on track and, uh, and, and be all right. Um, <laughs> but I suppose that puts me back on the spot about Kyle Lamy, doesn't it? Uh, I actually totally agree with you, Jesse. That's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, Kyle Lamy, I think, is one of my one of my top five favorite tracks to drive. Um, it's it has it just has a nice flow to it. It really does, and and it's technical and it's tight, and you really have to pick your moments to pass. There's plenty of passing opportunities like this one right here, uh, coming into the crocodiles. This is obviously a, a back marker. Uh, being past the 999 is a back marker to that car ahead, but uh, yeah, it's just a really good track to drive. I know, I know my favorite track, which is will always be Watkins Glen, uh, at least the GP version of it. But uh, I think Kailami's definitely at, at minimum in in the top five. Um, so I'm I'm on I'm on the same page. Yeah, for me, it's definitely top five. I can't say where it ranks specifically in the top five. It might be top three if I really thought about it. And I think most people, that as uh, Brian Lewis comes in in the number 100 Audi, pitting out of the sixth place spot, looks like a routine stop from here. But if I had to guess, most people that don't know about Kyle Ami might not get it. But for me... It's definitely top five. I, I love this place. I any excuse to race on this track, and I even conned several friends of mine into running an endurance race here, a nine-hour race, a few years ago, simply because I just wanted to run around here. And uh, it's got one of the most interesting sort of setups as well, not uh, completely unchanged from the original Formula One layout, but still pretty good as the 24 off into the inside wall there. And that, I think that's going to be Derek Peters and is what happens here. Contact, I imagine. Contact confirmed. Yep. And oh, yes, indeed. A chain reaction, but no other damage done. Did not get to the wall. So not the worst case scenario for the 24. Well, they will need to get the car fired going in the right direction. And they do. But I don't know. Kyle, I mean, is just such a fantastic circuit. It, it, it's got everything. It's got elevation change. This is what you have to do to be a great track for me, folks, in case you're wondering. Not that you were wondering, but elevation change, sweeping corners, tight corners, and the ability to be punished for going off the track. Uh, I, I'm always a big fan of, of walls that are quite close to the the racing uh, surface uh, as it were and this track pretty much has it all and it's got a good flow to it as well and that, that's sort of what uh, commends it to me and I think most of my tracks in the top five are the same Watkins Glen is in there the Nürburgring Spa of course and they all have pretty much the same things in common they have the same qualities so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question Jesse mate um what is, I have my own ask the box question. What is your favorite feature of a track? Like, like if you had to put one feature on a track, let's say, you know, you got um, your long sweeping corners, uh, a long straight, um, a, uh, a, a chicane, um, S's. What is your favorite track feature? I like a carousel. I've always been a fan of those. Uh, it, it, to take in consideration, a carousel is typically a a corner that turns in on itself but at a extreme radius uh, for instance consider oh this could be dangerous here and is going to be more contact being had as uh, the triple eight has just found themselves in uh, into a lot of fenders here in the past 25 or so minutes yeah he's but, uh, definitely been struggling so basically anything like the, I forget what the name of the turn at Spa is, but of course it's sunset here is sort of a carousel. I, I love a sweeping turn Talk about power. Uh, as far as a, 
the it long, might be the pool. long, the long double apex one that comes out of. So you come, you come out of the, uh, the first chicane at the end of the camel, and then you come around the right hander, uh, in one, in basically that one where you go into first gear, and then you go left into no name, and then Puan is that long sweeping left hander. Right, you are. So yeah, that's what I like, and again, that's part of the reason I like Kailami is because uh, it has one of those, and I think it's called Sunset here. So I, I love those corners because it, it's actually not the hardest corner in the world to get right, but if you get it wrong, you are going to hemorrhage time, and also you can set up passes in those corners quite nicely, and that's also a reason I like them because they're passing zones. Uh, and also, it, it's an older style of, uh, of corner as well. I think that's what I associate with. I don't have a camber preference, mind you. I don't care if it's off camber or... Uh, or positive camber personally, but uh, either way, a nice sweeping corner is quite nice. How about yourself? Uh, I'm gonna have you guess. Oh, what would what kind of corner would Mike Jones like? I'm gonna assume it's a corkscrew type uh, corner. Uh, so Jesse Lee, there was a very particular, uh, very particular spot that that you I, I remember this because you were you were casting this race, uh that I was on and you commented to me after um, that I I made a couple good moves into the corner and it is at Suzuka uh, at a corner called Spoon which is interestingly not what I'm going to say uh, though it's like my, my I, I, I have I have two favorites one of them is a, is a corner like Spoon or Leo Cop those long sweeping double or in Leo Cop's perspective triple apex I really like those they're very difficult to get correct but once you hit them they're so satisfying to to hit those markers correct on those you know at leo cop at, at spoon at wherever right um now that said my favorite is a bus stop hence my love for the D daytona road course and walking clan all right all right i'll take that but uh yeah so it's been uh it's been interesting uh you know kailami obviously has a lot of that no 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 chicanes or bus stops here uh at the um uh at the at, at the kailami circuit but either way still a fan got a again I, I think overall from an overall perspective the most important thing for me is flow um like the the, the tracks really have to have a good flow to them and kailami really has that Uh, another hashtag ask the bot question. Uh, will we be making uh, Braibrikis today, which is a South African sandwich? And the answer to that is no, because uh, I don't feel like neither one of us could do that justice. Uh, just like me saying the, the name of it. I'm not I'm not very good at uh, pronouncing some of those words. And uh, that's not one I'm particularly good at either. But uh, I'm aware of what uh, of what it is. But do I think I could make one? Probably not. Uh, yeah, we had um, cooking with Jesse and Mike on the last 24-hour night stint stream that we did. Uh, we decided we wouldn't be doing that today as we're seeing Villain make the move on Muscat here. He caught back up to the back of him, coming into turn two, but isn't able to get it to stick on the inside. Muscat able to get it back as they come out, but here it is. Ooh, ooh, ooh little bit of a contact there as the Ferrari kind of sneaks onto the left, and a Villain really poked his nose in, doesn't able to get it done and must get a great hold from that 258 Ferrari to hold on to that car. And uh, he's still back out in front. I don't think there's any damage done there. Just a little bit of hard racing uh, that we're used to seeing Jesse Lee uh, here in the States. That's really what, uh, that's really what the States is. Ooh, look at him go <laughs> drifting again, drifting coming in. Oh, and it's gonna, through, oh that's so and close. Through. Here he comes. They're coming up to Leo Cop at the top of the hill here. The Aston D, one of the brakes, catches a bit of the grass, though, and that's going to lose him all sorts of braking power, and that's going to throw him way back as one of the leaders comes on past. One of the leading Audis out ahead slides past him, and Villain now has dropped back almost a second. That that Small mistakes. Small mistakes will cost you so much, and there it is. Villain touches the grass ever so slightly, and you lose that braking power, and all of a sudden you find yourself back a second, second and a half, two seconds. Catches the oh. curve and cheated, though. What a oh. hole from that. That's not something you see often. Can I just say 
the villain team, the number 13 all-in-one racing Audi team, as we're going to watch him catch some curb and catch some air. Oh, my goodness. That is, folks, that is so hard to catch. He could have easily walked the car out to the left and been in trouble, did not do that. But all-in racing is the name of that Aston team. And after that half of a lap we've seen, I can confirm that they are indeed all in and going all out as well. That was an incredible I'm, sequence of corners. I'm going to interrupt this process of thought really quick to uh, point out some unfortunate news uh, that uh, I was just looking it's for. It's about GTWR. The, the chat, yeah, the chat mentioned it. I was already looking for it. I don't see a 157 on the track yes. at the moment. Our so, race leaders have had maybe a disconnection. We think, we think possibly that the uh, uh, that the active driver may have had a disconnect or some sort of internet issue. Yes. And that's yes, promoted indeed. We're, we're having an internal discussion what had happened to GTWR, and then uh, you and chat confirmed that uh, the driver's stream went mysteriously offline very suddenly. Now, they did not have a pit stop. That wouldn't have been normal, and we're just guessing here, but by process of deduction, we assume that the leader of the race, GTWR and the 157, has had a internet-related disconnect and that is unfortunate. George Boothby will also be wondering what's happened to GTWR, but now Boothby finds himself in the lead of the race again, but absent the GTWR team to race against, and that is the loneliest, most frustrating and deflating feeling that you can ever have in racing, having something happen to you, your car, your team, that was not self-inflicted, out of your control, and there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. That is the absolute worst. I, I mean, realistically, it that's what happens in real life motorsport as well. Here, here on the online space, we get our uh, uh, we get our uh, Stewie has information for us. We're going to be quiet for a second. Stewie, go ahead. Dewey is informing us right now. Stand by. Okay. So, Simonini uh, had a power outage, apparently. Um, now, the 157, of course, driving with minimal drivers in that car. Unfortunately, George Surratt, who's the uh, one of the other drivers for that car, uh, needed to get back into that car first before anybody else can connect into the server, which is unfortunately one of the uh, couple limitations by Kunos for a set of course competizione. Uh, so after Simonini lost stream, Jordan Shirat needed to connect and was not able to as he is gone for the moment. He is not at his computer. He is out getting a break, getting some sleep, something along that lines. So the 157 will remain disconnected from the server and our race leader is gone. And Jesse, as you said, I mean, it's it, it, issues like that completely out of your control. Frustrating. But in the end, that's what happens in real life motorsport. You have powder outages. You have you have um, internet outages. Whatever you happen to have in real life motorsport, you have uh, you have mechanical issues. Maybe you blow a tire. Maybe uh, maybe your gearbox goes out. Maybe your engine blows. Something like that. Um, we uh, we actually have uh, um, uh, one of the someone who might have a bit of experience with that. Uh, Greg, I saw you pop into the booth. Are you is, is your microphone on? There's uh, there is Greg Maloney. So you have a little bit of experience with that. Jesse Lee, I'd like to introduce you to Greg Maloney, who I had some experience with earlier. Uh, Greg, my co-commentator, Jesse Lee here from RCI. Did you just hear the news? Y yes, I did. Um, it's a, it's a bit, dis bit distraught to, to hear that kind of news. And of course it does, as exactly what both of you were saying. Um, there's a possibility of that happening in the real world as well as in uh, online. And when it does happen, it's quite, uh, you know, mind blowing to the team and mind blowing to the amount of effort that's been put in from everybody. So I think um, having seen what's just happened now and hearing the news, uh, there'll be a bit of a distraught uh, uh, Jordan Sherritt sitting in the sidelines going, why didn't I just jump in, you know, just before that and, and try and get uh, the feed up and running so that I can continue going on. 
we saw it earlier on as well um, with Ulifant. He had some issues and uh, they also yeah. had a bit of a technical issue, but he was able to get that back up and running. So hopefully they can make some kind of a plan and jump back in. But, um, you know, the amount of time that you lose while you're sitting on the sideline in any form of motorsport, particularly endurance racing, is, is so costly and you cannot afford to make a mistake like that. Jess, it's great to be online with you, buddy. Really cool uh, job that you and Mike have been doing. I've been listening in the background. I actually had a big listen over, over dinner time this evening as well. Things are turning around here in a big way in this race. Yes, indeed. Things have changed very, uh, very wildly here in the past 30 minutes or so, Greg. And it's uh, nice to make your acquaintance as well. And um, I, I got to say, if you're George Boothby now, you know that you're in control of this race in the 96. What? How does that change, Greg, for you? How would that change your strategy now? Because clearly Boothby was running on a specific strategy, but now he is the one that is leading. So what, what do you do? Like, do you, would you change anything or, or not? I don't think I'd change anything myself. I think you'd probably stick to your, whatever your guns are for that uh, particular outing. And, and in this session with Boothby behind the wheel, they would have had a plan for him to be in this session for a reason. Um, I think the same would have, would have applied. Um, we spoke about it earlier on with myself and Clark and with, with Mike saying that, you know, uh, with Jordan not climbing in the car, are they saving him for the night sessions? Because he may be a night specialist and driving at night might be his, uh, you know, his ideal thing to do. It maybe hasn't worked out for them with that technical difficulty. But in terms of the teams that are out front, I mean, this is a team that's won twice at Kailami on a 24-hour event. So they know exactly what they're doing. There's no doubt about it that they're in the, the prime position they want to be. They've got their teammates right on their tail. And, and, and running a tail going to roll there for, for the team. So a possible one-two here for that team is, is definitely on the cards should everything go according to plan and the way that they've put it all together as well. Well, Greg is right. That 96 team is absolutely lethal. They just have a formula that seems to work in South Africa better than anybody else. And they have dominated these races going for a third one. Absolutely incredible thought who would have ever guessed when sort of these long endurance races were incepted in ACC that we would ever see a team quite as dominant at a specific track. I don't think I thought we would ever see anything quite like that. During that announcement, we were watching Sheldon Muscat, who nearly lost it uh, coming into Cheetah uh, about a lap and a half or so ago. And they have regained that and now are on the back of the 13 again. But a very scary moment. Nearly lost it. No contact, but nearly lost it on their own under braking. The car was shaking and swaying sideways. They were trying to get that thing stopped very quickly indeed, but they still missed the corner. Nearly uh, had a car run into the back of them off the corner, but no harm or foul. And now back onto the back of the 13 as we go to the in-car cam through Leah Cup, down through Mineshaft now. But Muscat has the pace to get into the ninth place position. But uh, you got to be careful. This is exactly where they almost lost it. Not here. It's at the next corner is where they nearly lost it a lap or so ago. Seeing some hashtag ask the box. How about some uh, some reports on the back half of the field? We will indeed do that at some point. But uh, obviously our goal is to show the best battle on hand at the time. And this very much is a battle for the top 10. And yeah, of course, guys, use that live timing plank. Yeah, Greg, I was talking about that earlier, in fact. Uh, but real quick, guys, use that live <laughs> timing plank in the chat. Uh, you guys can pull up the live settings. You can follow along with us, see the live timings board uh, as well. So you can absolutely see everything. But, Greg, I was talking about that maybe about 30 minutes ago. I was I, I told Jesse Lee, I said, Greg was in here earlier saying that he wanted uh, that 258 Ferrari up near the top of the field. He was in, I believe, P13 when we were yep. looking at him earlier. He's made himself up to P10 and was in P9 there for a minute. And realistically, they've still got a shot to continue working their way up the board a little bit. This 258 Ferrari uh, has done really well so far. And I know that you're going to be celebrating with it uh, if he stays at the top 10 for the remainder of the race. Yeah, I'll be pretty happy with that if that's the case, I can tell you, with the Ferrari being up there. But uh, as you can see, also uh, a little bit of a turnaround in terms of the Bentley. Um, we saw Utiel with some, some maneuvering up in the sort of the top 10, now in the top three. So that Bentley certainly has got a, a great turn of pace and uh, is now sitting pretty for a possible podium and even a possible win if uh, things uh, don't go according to plan for our top team. 
Well, there you have it. Movers and shakers. And when we came on the air one hour ago, we mentioned that it would be the case because of the evening temperatures coming down. In fact, in one hour alone, it has dropped one degrees C and now 21. Some of the cars coming alive and those that maybe have had early issues here now trending back into the right direction. And of course, the 97, one of those, the third place car, Royale with the 97 came in as second, but was passed on the entry to pit lane. Routine stop for the 97. So for the moment, Boothby's going to lose their tail gunner. And here's Souza in the 48 back in 28th place, trying to run down Bentz in the 777 for 27th position. Talk about battles throughout the field. They certainly are happening. And talk about the Porsche perhaps liking the cooler temperatures. We've certainly seen a few Porsches late tonight that have been moving through the field a little bit as well. Yeah, the Porsche, you know, that, that Porsche we were just talking about, Alphant uh, and the PWSR team, they were doing really well early in the race and had that uh, had that disconnect. We are confirmed, by the way, that the 157 will not be able to rejoin the server at this point, so they will be out for the remainder of the race. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the end, it's, uh, you know, that unfortunate thing that happens uh, here, of course, in racing, mechanical, technical, doesn't matter. An issue is an issue, more or less. Uh, but these Porsches are uh, doing pretty well. This is one of them here, back in the back. Souza definitely fighting for that mid-pack battle. Uh, as Greg and I talked about earlier in the race, Jesse, we, even though all the cars are labeled as silver across the left side, we do have a big wide gap of skill here. Obviously, we have, you know, the, the top cars, you know, Boothby, Simonini, Utili, uh, the, the Racing Line Motorsport guys, you know, all these guys are definitely your alien, your pro drivers, you know. Uh, but you also have cars like this that are more of your silver and amp pace. And even though they're looking like they're fighting for an overall position, if I'm Sousa, if I'm, you know, Zazarek, if I'm Benz, I'm sitting here looking at this field going, well, I'm probably fighting for, like, where my victory is around P20. And so these Porsches, if you're looking at it, is realistically probably around P8 in what would be considered class if these guys were properly sorted out. And that's not a bad way to be living, uh, eight, you know, eight, nine hours into this race, I don't think. And that's something me and you talked about a lot a lot about earlier, Greg, and, and the skill differences here and how good the packs, uh, the packs of cars have been and the battles have been even through the back of the pack. The cool thing about it, Mike, is it's, it's very similar to what we see at the Kyle Army 9 hour with Intercontinental GT. You've got your, your silver your silver class, you've got your pro-am class, you've got your, your pro class. And the pro class drivers, as you said, the same as what you're seeing here, you know, they're in an alien world and a completely different set of skills compared to everybody else. But this mid-pack battle is exactly what we saw with one of the South African teams who made a massive resurgence from a, a 1960s team that uh, David Piper actually was involved in, uh, the Team Perfect Circle Porsche. And uh, Andre Basodino and his whole team put uh, something together there pretty spectacular to run and get onto the podium in their very first outing and then win the class in the second outing at the Kyle Army 9 hour, being a pro-am uh, set of drivers. You know, they brought in a, a pro driver from overseas. They had a silver driver from the uh, Porsche Cup in, in the United Arab Emirates. And Andre Basodino, as a, as a as sort of a, an amateur slash pro-am driver here from South Africa. And, and held their own amongst some of the best drivers in the world. So what these guys are doing in this mid-pack sort of uh, 25th to 35th place, they certainly are doing exactly what they would be doing if they were classified correctly, as you said. Yeah, and that's really what it is. And what I'd like to do now is I'd actually like to take a little bit of a, little bit of a couple onboard laps with someone that is down in our AM field. I'd like to go on board with the number 23 Lamborghini back in P29 overall. Uh, that will go on board with Zarzecki. And this is, of course, the Ambitious But Rubbish Racing, a, a very interesting team name. <laughs> so let's take a little bit of a ride around the circuit with some of the AM class cars here at Kyalami, and your commentary will return in just a couple minutes.
All right, guys, well, welcome back to the action here at 24 Hours of Kailami. Pure storage, 24 Hours of Kailami, in fact, uh, brought to you by Solidarity and in, in partnership with Raceface, of course. And uh, we much appreciate you guys here. That was a couple laps around the circuit with Zarzecki in the number 23 Lamborghini Ambitious But Rushes Racing Team. Uh, ambitious But Rubbish Racing Team, rather. And now we're looking back at a fight here with uh, with Jonathan Bentz in the 777 Audi R8 LMS Evo. Looking back at Souza, one of the Porsches behind. We're going to catch a bit of a replay here. This is the 57 car. Ooh, that dive. Oh, and a little bit of a tap for good the, measure as well. Blue, one of the blue Audis that we've been watching most of the race here, I think. I think that's a bit of an overlapping car uh, on that 57. Bit of an ambitious dive into the crocodiles. There it is right there. Jonathan Bentz. Uh, is the one who we think made that move a moment ago as that is about the track position he was at. So, uh, yeah, that 57. Uh, Greg, we were watching that earlier, by the way. Uh, we were watching that earlier, by the way, with, with the 57. They were struggling at the beginning of the race, and they definitely have continued to struggle, but they've made up a few positions. Certainly have, yeah. Gary Richardson and Nigel Richardson having a couple of uh, ding dong battles and a couple of ding dongs themselves at the top of uh, Leokop. We saw that car stricken in the middle of the circuit, and of course uh, the top ten had to come through at that particular point in time. And evasive action and uh, diversive driving was uh, called for. Um, uh, some, <laughs> some maybe some <laughs> exotic type driving as well that led a couple of cars off the track and onto the grass. Uh, and then of course uh, he was called into the stewards' room for a, a couple of penalties, which were. Uh, uh, then uh, put in place for him but uh, still staying out there and yes 100 percent right when you said that up to uh what is he up to 34th position so he's come out of the 40s into the 30s so there's definitely some maneuvering and maybe they're just getting into a rhythm they're starting to feel uh, a little bit better in the car but a bit better in the setup knowing what they need to do when the quicker drivers come through staying out of harm's way although uh <laughs> he won't say that about mr benz in the in the no. 27th place and he's overtaking maneuver he just <laughs> attempted well, what I can tell you is that Benson and Sosa have been going at it for a little while now. It's been incredibly respectful between the two of them, but uh, some of these lap cars that they're going through have provided the both of them with a little bit of uh, extra danger and requires a little bit of higher skill than they would have liked a pass on a back marker to be. But besides that, it has been clean between the two of them and neither one of them willing to make that mistake. That, that's a sign of a good racing driver isn't it? One that's patient and one that's fast enough to be able to make passes, but patient enough to know when to pass. And talking about Bince and Sozo both, because Bince here is having to use patience trying to get around this lap car and they're not doing anything crazy. Look at this snaking down the straightaway here in the sunset. It's going to happen. It's going to happen eventually. Bince is going to get around them. Big wide berth completely off the track is the Aston perhaps tired of being sort of in the way or, or realizing that two cars were battling right behind them and not wanting to be the linchpin to a pass here. And folks, that is one of the most, uh, one of the most empty feelings you can have as a racing driver. I can tell you that is accidentally and artificially changing the natural course of the race or the competition. So getting out of the way there, the right call. And now Sosa can continue to try and track Benz down. Literally nothing in it between the two of them for the past, I think, seven or eight laps it's been. Yeah, it's pretty much just been this consistent. It's been about a half a second for quite a while, Jesse. And just looking at this splitter cam again, we can just see how how dark this circuit has gotten over the past couple hours. And um, we're going to catch a bit of a replay here. This is Lionel Clue. Guess what Clue did? Nine. Uh, guess what Clue did? It's going it's gonna to look Jesse. familiar. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, it's not a cheetah. But he's, is he going to catch a bit of the curb? Let's find out. Is, coming uh, coming into Leo Cop here. Uh, and unfortunately, just not a not too much happened there. Yeah, I think Stewie, uh, Stewie, Stewie was trying to catch a replay, uh, but unfortunately it was not that car, so no big deal. There was car off uh, kind of in that section. We're going to try it one more time here. Here's Richardson. Uh, we just watched uh, we just watched him come into contact with the other. Uh, ooh, ooh, that was hard on the brakes. Was that for our, I think that's the triple eight. And it almost looked like the triple eight stopped on the apex there. I don't think Richardson Richardson had really anywhere to go uh, in no. in that maneuver, Jesse. He, he had he had nothing. But um, you know, so 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 Greg, I I have a question for you because you're the only one of the four of us, of course, uh, that have been at the actual Kailami circuit and and have I, I have, I'm going to assume for a second uh, that you've maybe been out here at night and and how dark is this track? 
when you when you're when you're out maybe honest, as affected or potentially out on the track to be honest with you it's it's a lot lighter than it ever was in the past um when we used to have the Kyle Army nine hour year in the 60s and 70s, of course, Ooh. there was. Oh, 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 that's oh awesome. my that's goodness. Solo cars splitting in sunset, getting it done. That was a oh. very dangerous look, but somehow splitting the seas like Moses. I can't believe what <laughs> exactly. I just saw. That looked like a crash. It just never happened. Very lucky to be avoided there, that is for sure, particularly in Sunset Corner where it can get out of shape. And usually what happens there is if you get it out of shape in that way, you'll end up going onto the inside wall as opposed to the outside wall. And that can be at like sort of 200 k's an hour. So you can do some serious damage. The Ferrari, as you can see, stricken on the sideline there. Not what I'd like to see, that is for sure. And hopefully Viv Richards can get back on there because he's got uh, uh, a little bit of maneuvering tap and he's going to kind of wait for a, a clearance of some nature. It's not always easy to do because he's now stuck on the exit point of uh, the corner and can't see any of the oncoming cars so there'll be a bit of timing and hopefully not uh, anything that will cause him to cause Ooh, any stuck. more damage or any more he's stuck there but he's eventually got going um but yeah going back to that point after that little incident and how difficult it is to drive in the dark here in the 60s and 70s there was no built-up area around the circuit so it was exceptionally dark now you've got uh, a, a suburb of, of uh, sort of high class uh, housing around it there's also an industrial park around the, the circuit too and there's all the artificial lights, of course, of the actual circuit where the pit lane facilities are. Up here at Leocop, a little bit darker than most, but as you can see on the left-hand side, and with the Seta Corsa Competizione, the cool thing about it is it's very similar to what's actually at the track in terms of not only what's happening on the surface and the racetrack itself, but the surroundings of the track as well are spot on. So the artificial light that comes from the buildings around it definitely help out with a little bit of visibility but i can tell you right now having done a couple of laps around here in a 45 minute endurance race that ran into the dark in a, a mini cooper production car uh it gets exceptionally dark very quickly and uh, you certainly have to have your wits about mini you coopers at kaya lami yeah. jesse is that not the most project cars 2 thing i've ever heard in my life <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about i don't know about that but i, I now uh, wish to go out on a date with greg i think that is uh, that like a match made in heaven personally that that's absolutely brilliant mini coopers around here Do, oh my goodness track completely blocked contact and that's going to be the 23 and i don't know who that blue car was that was involved or that excuse me that was the 23 i don't know who yeah. the car that was stricken on the track was coming out of leah cop but uh, the track completely blocked almost nowhere to go and contact made and that is a blind corner downhill it, it could have been the lamborghini i think eh? lamborghini yes, was, was one of the cars involved but i'm not sure the second car that was involved that was actually stuck in the middle it, i don't know if it was still the ferrari trying to recover but we saw him get back on track so highly unlikely it was the triple eight ferrari of Viv richards maybe a possibility of yeah he was stuck on the sideline there so i don't think it was the ferrari there was another car in the middle of the track um, I'm not sure if it was maybe, no, this is a bit further up the field. So I don't think it was these guys that was involved. Going back to that comment about uh, the, the, yes. the, uh, the light factor. Um, the, the one cool thing about uh, dry conditions here is uh, it's a lot easier to drive in the dry. Uh, I think you guys mentioned the fact one of the events that you had, you had a little bit of rain. Now I can tell you at the Kyle Army 9 hour, the first uh, edition of the, the return of the 9 hour to Kyle Army with Intercontinental GT, we had three and a half hours under safety car because of the torrential downpour that came here at Kyle Army. And, and on numerous occasions on various forms of motorsport that I've commentated at this uh, track with World Superbikes, with um, the Italian superstars, German touring cars and uh, sports cars. Uh, when, when it rains here, this place becomes a whole nother ball game. It really is, it's, it's a treacherous circuit to be on. And, and anything that, uh, that you do right or wrong can, can, can turn into something pretty spectacular or, uh, or race ending. So uh, we've been very lucky with the weather, fortunately here for the 24 hour of uh, the Pure Story 24 hour. But uh, I've, I've been watching that weather monitor above us all weekend or all day long so far, and just praying that nothing happens in terms of rain coming along. Well, I think that's completely opposite of what George G. Mac Smith wants. He says he wants a little bit of rain in this race, perhaps because he's not out there in it, I guess. <laughs> uh, by the Let way, me tell you something. Just, uh, just getting a little bit of word from that Lambo from the incident we saw a couple minutes ago, by the way. Uh, the Lambo has about nine seconds of damage, maybe a little bit more from that contact. Uh, they're, they're stating that it was unavoidable. 
uh, contact when they uh, came into the number 23. But, yeah, it's unfortunate for that Lambo. Um, we, we didn't get as good of a look at it as perhaps we would like to say the stewards will. Uh, but that's what the stewards are here for as well. So, uh, yeah, de definitely damage on that Lambo. Lead car coming up on the back end of some of the back markers here as well, trying to avoid uh, any contact between them. Gary Richardson once again involved <laughs> in another bit of uh, tap. There you go. <laughs> Yet again, another tap there from the Arden. Just a bit clumsy from the car on the outside, I think. You can't be doing that too much. You, you got to have spatial awareness. I know it's dark out there and all that, but uh, come through Mineshaft, you just got to know where you are and trying to work your way back to the middle of the track isn't going to work when you have somebody down the inside but all things considered no no real harm or foul i don't know if there would even be any real relative damage for an incident that small but uh, here is the 23 who we saw sideways at the top of the hill earlier they've got it going back the right way they do have a drive-through penalty though yeah, I'm kind of curious. Uh, Jordan Daly is in the chat. Uh, curious to see if that's something that came through as a track limit, because uh, I did not see a penalty come out on the uh, uh, fancy stewarding computer uh, that we have here at the Race Face Com Box. Uh, but uh, unfortunate for them, that is not what you want to see. But that said, I mean, you know, we are you know, almost nine and a half hours into this race at this point. It's realistic that we could be starting to see some drive-through penalties. And that looked like a bit of a potential connection issue there. Uh, we just saw one of the Aston Martins uh, uh, cause some contact there flashing around the circuit a little bit. That's one of those little technical issues that you can get here uh, when you're racing online versus, of course, racing in real life motorsport uh, is that potentially that. So that's something, of course, the stewards will have to keep an eye on. That was car 42 uh, across the line on uh, lap uh, leader lap 324. I know Burtis is listening. So uh, they'll be uh, they'll be keeping an eye on that. And uh, uh, did just get confirmation for 23. It is for track limits. But w what I was just trying to say is, you know, nine and a half hours into this race, just about that's probably about the time you're going to start seeing track limit DTs. We might see a few of them could start coming through here yeah. in the next couple hours, boys. A hundred percent. So you're going to start seeing it. And, and the worst part is, as we see Eddie Francis, who's back, appeared to be backwards there. See exactly what happened here. Between Eddie Francis and the 404. Oh my goodness. Now that right there was definitely a, a, there is what we're assuming is an invisible car on the racetrack. We've only ever seen that. I think Mike and I have only ever seen that a handful of times. That happens whenever a car is not visible but is racing somewhere out on the circuit. And that's what we're going to go with. We don't know that for sure. The only thing I know, Greg, is we need uh, ZA Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely time to call. <laughs> Who are you going to call exactly that? Uh, because there is a couple of ghost cars out there. And, of course, the technical issue that you've got with that ghost car means that you could possibly be running into a situation like we've just seen where you'll be coming up and there's nothing in front of you and next thing you're in the wall and you don't know what's happened. And of course, it's a technical glitch or, or sort of a gremlin that comes in via the... Uh, the uh, computer that you might be using or possibly just a drop in signal um, all of that comes into play as well so uh, it, it makes it very difficult and there's even more difficult when you're running off circuit on your own there's already a track uh, a car in the kitty litter uh, makes it uh, exceptionally difficult to avoid if you if you've run off on your own and already somebody is on that uh, that kitty litter or off the circuit completely let's have a look at that one more time this is daryl Mulder coming into cheetah he runs wide and there is the oh aston martin stricken yeah. on the sideline He's, How he missed him between, he got between the wall and that Aston Martin by millimeters. He's, he's going to need to come into the pits, not for damage, but for a pants change, I think, after that. <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly man. that. That would have exactly uh, that. That uh, scared, the, scared the living daylights out of me. Um, but luckily, we are ready here at the night, so no daylights left to have for the next few hours. Uh, you know, that is um, not somewhere, I mean, you're, you're always, you're always going to be terrified because we've seen it multiple times during this race where you hit the inside curb and cheetah or you hit the outside curb and cheetah which has happened a lot as well and you throw yourself into the wall so for the bentley to kind of catch that a little bit after he hits the inside inside curve hit the dirt and then all of a sudden have a car parked in front of him i mean you can't even imagine how terrifying that's going to be uh in the middle of the night here 9 27 now sim time here in south africa and we're on board with the 85 car this is the amrv advantage of the flying gypsies Franco Hubert currently piloting around that vehicle back in P24. He's a couple seconds back from Yes. Buck. 
Yes, you know what's so cool about this, Jesse? I can do it for once now. Uh -oh. I, I got called. Go I got called up. I got called up this afternoon about uh, uh, what was it? Jose Georges, hey? What's, oh. it, uh, what's, it, what's it? What's the pronunciation there? Jose Jorge. All right, Greg. Oh. Jose Jorge. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So uh, yeah. So so we're gonna go with uh, Joubert as opposed to Jobert. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely yes! love it. Yes, I got folks. my own back on Mike. Uh, you, know, you did. Don't, don't <laughs> Aren't names funny that way? Don't you just so good? It? Eh? Uh, it's so jo good. I mean, Jobert. Yeah, uh, jo Jobert. 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 So yeah, Franco Jobert. Franco Jobert. All Jobert. right, Fan That's it, fantastic. Yeah. I'll take it. There you go. You got it. Now it's all yours. Just use it because clearly Mike wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you've heard me or Jesse commentate ever, you will know that uh, that, is, that is a very uh, usual thing that happens here. Yeah, yeah. You've you got to have a go about American that. Vocabulary. Don't, don't you just love yeah. being a commentator and then you get the comment about five years later going, by the way, this oh, is how you yes. pronounce my name. Oh, really? my goodness. Five <laughs> years later? Thanks for that, eh? Jesse Lee, I'm going to do it. Um, Greg, I'd like to point you to the uh, live comms chat that we have for a second here. And I'd like you to try and pronounce that name. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> folks, what, what is occurring? Because this is a because this is a visual gag. Uh, oh, we're we're going to post a name in the chat. This is the name. Okay, I'm going to go was... with uh, Chol Mondeli. All right, well, hang on, because I want to see what the YouTube chat has to say now. Okay. The, there uh, has been a name. The YouTube chat. There's been a name that was up for much debate uh, to the point where we had to discuss it with the driver in question. <laughs> the, the, the name the is C-H-O-L-M-O-N-D-E-L-E-Y. I am going to give you a hint, Greg, because I like you. Yep. It is an old English name. Wow, Okay. George okay. wants to know if he can answer. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, George, you just hold tight for a few seconds. I, I, I already tried one. I said Cholmondeli. I'm going to maybe go Which with... is what we initially called him. Yeah, uh, Chol okay. Cholmondeli or Cholmondeli is what we were going with. Okay. Yeah, I, I will tell you if, that you if are... If you've gone with Old English, <laughs> I'm nowhere near it. Yeah, you're way, way, way um, off base. It's going to be one of those Siobhan type things, you know, spelled S O I S O S I O B A H N. That one. One of those. George, Greg, I am going to. Greg, I'm going to give you another hint. I'm going to give you another hint. Half okay. the letters in that name are silent, but not the ones you think that are silent. Oh, okay. Well, George is giving me a clue. Thanks for that, George. I appreciate it. Is it going to be Shumley? Well, close. Very good. That. Yeah. He, he pronounces it Chumley. That whole name wow. is pronounced Chumley. The D <laughs> is silent, as it turns out. Who knew? Okay. I, I, Who I told knew? you English is fun. Yes, it's fantastic. Every, every single commentator that comes in to RCI. Um, give us two of those. Including, eh? oh, I yeah, it, including, including our French broadcasters, because we have a team of French broadcasters that, that broadcast quite a few of our races for us in French. Uh, I always I, I hit them. I hit every single one of them with that name and say, pronounce that. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> when I start feeling bad about not being able to pronounce pronounce words, I give and, them and that and say, hey, try and pronounce that, and, and no, none of them have done it. If you look at that, the, the French should be going, well, yes, that's very easy for me. That will be yeah. some on delay, you know? They will bring in the little yeah. French. Je ne sais, I don't know what, but yeah, they'll throw it in there. And clearly, we were right. <laughs> no way. I mean, I could have gone I could have gone South African Indian um, in that and gone, hey, man, it could be a bit of Chol Mondali there, man, like a Moodley or a Musa, you know? <laughs> you never know. But yeah, Shumli, wow, didn't get, come with that one. No way. Uh, well, apparently, it's an old English name. He's uh, he 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 races under the Chum Chum train, uh, and he is the the man who has the absolute most supporters, other than maybe Cody Pride, uh, within wow. RCI that does not stream Jesse Lee. <laughs> I, I think, I think by the way, <laughs> yeah. By the way, I think what Stewie's trying to do, Stewie, our broadcaster, of course, is trying to give us another name to pronounce. But this one's not difficult. It's Aposta okay. Killis. No, it isn't. I just realized that it isn't, is it? Is this a, is this a oh, South yeah, African you see, you see Shui's throwing in a couple of good ones here. Let's see if I can get a Shui. Throw it up there. Let's have a look and see. It's a Greek name. I think it's a Postalakis. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, a Postalakis. I'm going to bring Arison to come oh, pronounce this okay. one. Okay. 
cheat. This will be good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you are enjoying the uh, the race so far, let me just say this is still the pure storage 24 hours of Kailami here on Race Face. We hope that you're enjoying your evening in South Africa or wherever you are in the world. And we are rounding mm. the 14 hour mark, 14 hours, 32 minutes left to go in the race. We have taken to attempting to pronounce names that we otherwise wouldn't be hey, none the wiser on. We're doing lorries earlier. We're doing names. Yeah, yeah I'm going to have a go with this one. Is this not Evangelus Apostolakis? That's about what we're thinking. Yeah, Apostolakis. Okay. I, 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 Apostolakis, I, I would go with. Rude. But you gotta I don't give mean me a hold to be rude. One. Hit me, Jesse. Hit me. No. But, oh, oh as Patterson okay. seems to be off. There's PWSR. Yeah, PWSR looking like they're coming through. Where is this? This is the end of the S's. Um, yeah, that's always the cup. And he was off there on the inside of the track. So what happens? He runs a little wide and gets himself sideways. Oh, yeah. And yeah. needs to get himself off track. I think he That is so dangerous. Yeah, luckily that shouldn't cause... Ooh, well, it shouldn't have caused him much damage, but unfortunately, Alan hit the gas just a little too... Uh, I, 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 little too I feel like that was self-preservation, Mike, to get off the racetrack. Mm. Again, blind corner uphill. You don't want to be sitting there and get absolutely clouded into, so... Well, just, perhaps just, just want to jump in there if I can. It, it's a slightly Go different uh, version there because you, you've come over the crest at that point, so you're actually about to start the descent. So it's the blind rise that the other cars will be coming at that he's been stuck uh, on the other uh, side of. Good point. And that's the reason why he wanted yeah, to get out yeah. of the way. Yeah. Well, that there you go. Point. That I love. I love having the the extra perspective. It, it it kind of brings it all together, doesn't it? It's very nice indeed. Well, the aforementioned name, Apostolakis, is trying to overtake the triple six Audi for the eighth place position. And of course, uh, Apostolakis has a five-second penalty, but they will not care too much about that. All they need to do is get this pass done for that position. Or excuse me, this is actually for the ninth position, I've just realized. But either way, very close indeed is the Ferrari of the 258 as they yeah, continue to try and make headway. They are. Mm -hmm. This has been going on for more than 30 minutes now. It's been very nice fight between the two of them. And neither one of them has done anything to take themselves out of the fight, but they have literally been stuck nose to tail for 30 minutes. At this point, I might start getting sick uh, at looking at the rear end of an Audi. Yeah, I might a little bit too, in but the cockpit, in the end, uh, sure. that is still where you want to go. Um, you know, regardless, he needs to get out ahead of him. You know, he was demoted back to P10. What about 25 minutes ago or so, give or take. And he wants that spot back, and he's holding on to that position. Unfortunately, he's got that five-second penalty uh, from the contact that happened uh, during that fight with the uh, with the previous drivers that were in this car, because both of the drivers have had a uh, driver change at this point. Both the cars have had a driver change at this point. But that 258, I think that uh, Greg's goal for them is just top 10 at this point, as long as they can hold it there. Uh, I know you'd like to see him at the front, but no, I think a Ferrari in the, the you know, a Ferrari in the top <laughs> ten I'll be happy with for, for sure. But also, while we've been chatting in the banter that we had there, guys, we had a change for second place as well. The Bentley split up the uh, the two side uh, side. Where are we going there? The two teammates in '96 and '97. Side out. Max is what I wanted. Sorry, my bad. Um, the Side Max team have been split now by the Bentley, so a little change up there in the top three. Not too much of an issue right now, but could potentially be. Well, uh, here's a bit of a move there coming in through Sunset, and it looks like that that triple six is going to stay out ahead for the moment. They are not too happy about that uh, back marker uh, uh, pass there. Uh, Bent's flashing the lights, and the Ferrari wants on pass now as well. That contact coming out through Sunset there. Uh, but uh, we'll see now. Can the can, blah, blah, blah. Yes, we are here, the Ferrari can get on pass and it looks like he will be able to more easily slide past Benz there in Leo Cop. So not too much time lost. There's definitely a few tents there, but you know, again, especially with the, uh, so uh Zeki, with the it's going to be a big Whoa! send. Oh, and he spun around too at the end of it. So the big oh. send under the, it looks like he broke really late, went for the dive and that's going to cost him. He's did not go into the pit lane though. So not too much damage on the back of that car, at least not too much more 
uh, as this was the car that received that nine seconds damage of contact earlier uh, that, that Jordan Daly was telling us about. So uh, when was the last time they pit? I am curious. They pit on lap 312. Uh, we are on lap 332. So, yeah, they they have pit semi-recently um, at the very least in about 20 laps. They're, they're not able to pit yet at all. They can't go in. Even if they have damage, they're going to lose so much time. So they're going to have to survive on the light damage. So I think that that's pretty much about it. Actually, there it is right there as well. Uh, he, Daly, Jordan, Jordan Daly is telling us that, he, that they lost the brakes um, and got about six seconds of damage. Uh, oh, no, so there's another car that's got six seconds of damage. So, yeah, Daly says he lost the brakes uh, in in that in that Lamborghini. So, unfortunate for them. Uh, but in the end, you know, they've got uh, they got plenty of time to make it up. Just got to be careful. Um, and uh, at some point, most of these drivers are going to have to make a brake change, which, Jesse Lee, about the time that we take back over the comms box uh, is probably about the time, you know, in about two and a half hours, or we're going to start seeing a lot of those brake changes happen, and that could throw quite a bit of a difference in because that's what we saw in our 24-hour Kailami is that brake change really threw people for a loop depending on when they did and that came into a lot of strategy uh, as during a 24-hour race pretty much have to change brakes uh, you get about 20 hours or so of proper usage out of those out of the pads too probably a little less depending on the track like that's that's stretching it these guys are going to have to pit at some point that's a minute 15 added to your stop and that's a long pit stop. Yeah, it is. I think it's situational, too, depending on who you are, where you are in the field, and how your race is going. If I was in the back of this field, I might suggest putting on the new brakes, the fresh brakes, and maybe going out there and seeing if you can catch some people sleeping. But if you're up front, you're probably going to try and do that sometime in the middle of the night to the early morning stage. And if you're in the middle, then... Well, quite frankly, the strategy is going to be split between the two, but there will be a healthy amount of teams here that do this at the halfway point on their scheduled stop. They're just going to split the race in half. That way they know that, okay, my brakes are not going to get any worse than they are at the halfway point. So they'll change their pads and know what they've got for the final 12 hours. That's a safe bet, but I do think that some of the front running cars will push it a bit and uh, try to delay that, especially if they're either in, uh, if they're not involved in any battles. I think, too, if you are involved in a battle, you're more likely to change them earlier to try and get a leg up on your competition. A lot of strategy that I don't think a lot of people actually pay attention to, the brake strategy being one of those. A major fact I would have to say in this kind of racing, and, and hitting on what you're saying there, Jess, as well, is is the fact that have they been involved in battles in this first nine and a half hours? And if they have, have they used the brakes more than what they would have liked? Because it is quite a flowing circuit. It's not a hard braking circuit. There are about three corners that you've got to really climb on the anchors and get the car slowed down. But most of the time, it's uh, you can slow down on a gear change or on just a lift. Uh, here is a prime example, of course, a lift coming through Sunset. You won't be actually on the brakes, but you will be on the brakes going into Clubhouse. So it's, it's kind of taking how the drivers have worked and have they been in big battles where they've had to hit the brakes a lot more and, and a lot more uh, aggression in their braking as opposed to what they would have liked had they been you know, at the front end with a little bit of clear air. very well put indeed and that is very true you got to pay attention to those kind of things i certainly the teams will be paying attention to that as well camo za in chat has uh, asked us to pronounce a south african surname and i will surely butcher this but i am going to give it a shot uh let's see here let me take a look at it oh uh Coke coca Moore. Moore. No, that's how you pronounce it if it's English, but it's Kokomore, right? It's 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 Z A, so it's a bit stranger than you think it is. How do you actually pronounce that? K O E K E M O E R. Kokomore. Kokomore. So so. Yeah, but that's. Yeah, yeah, Greg, but that's what I said. But I can't, I can't roll R's. You can't roll the R's. That's that's the thing. No, yeah, sir, the, the, R, the rolling of the R is a is a is an art in South Africa. <laughs> it absolutely is. That's the thing. I have told George Smith uh, several times before that I could never be South African. As Eddie Francis uh, seems to be slow off again, perhaps. Um, but uh, yeah, Ooh, I, I, hitting I, the inside wall actually. Hard tag. That's going to be several seconds of damage, maybe about ten to fifteen. That was significant contact. 
But uh, it's like I was telling George Smith before, I uh, I could never be a true South African. I cannot roll my R's. Well, Rizeki here is going to be happy when this stint is over because they have had just about the worst hour of their entire racing lives, I would have to imagine, in that 23 Lamborghini. It has not come up in their favor, and it has been a bit dismal, shall we say, for the past 40 minutes or so. First sideways in the track, having contact with another car when they were stranded, and now two subsequent uh, offs, we'll call them. And battling with that car with the damage on it. That too, yeah, at this mm -hmm. point. I mean, besides for even the contact, they've got the damage on there as well. I mean, there's minimum 10 seconds of damage that they'll need to fix in that car. And, you know, depending on 10 seconds can really mean different things. You know, I mean, it depends on where that aero damage is at on the car uh, as to how much it will really affect you. Um, or if it's even suspension damage, you know, if, if maybe they don't have a ton of aero damage, they get suspension damage, that will affect you pretty well here at Kailami with the big elevation changes, the off-camber corners, you know, suspension is uh, is very critical here uh, here in South Africa, and they could be really struggling with it. They will have their pit stop here in hopefully about another 10 minutes or so, and uh, they can get on into the pit, get some of that damage fixed, and maybe get uh, maybe get the poor man out of the car. Um, I know that Ted Edwards, Jordan Daly, of course, driving driving in there with him. A uh, couple of uh, one, one of our staff members and my teammate for the Night Owl Championship that we have ongoing on on Saturdays that obviously I'll be missing uh, today. So will you, Jesse Lee, uh, as you generally commentate that one. Uh, my teammates will be uh, hopefully jumping in there and getting us some points uh, in between his stints here at Kailami because he's a braver man than I doing two races at the same time. Uh, I do believe Jordan Daly is so. Uh, but, you know, good, good group of drivers, good guys, but just unfortunate luck. Uh, here at Kailami this evening. And we are about 20 minutes or so from the top of the hour. It will be near enough to 10 p.m. sim time. And, of course, about 10 p.m. South Africa time out there for you, Greg, with 14 hours remaining in this race at the top of the hour. Uh, let's, 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 uh, let's theorize here for a second, guys. So, you know, Boothby, assuming nothing happens to the 96, Boothby is in as good a position as they're ever going to be. There's no way anybody can catch them, assuming nothing happens, right? But what do we think is going to happen through the rest of the field? Again, assuming nothing major happens, you know, these battles through the top 10, through the top 15, still ongoing. We've got a couple battles going in for that for that P20 to be P35 uh, kind of throughout. What are you guys looking at? Because, Greg, you're obviously going to be back in the morning for a, for a few hours um, and at the end of the race. Mm -hmm. At the end of the race, who do you think out of the top? Yeah, let's 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 say let's go from P11 to back down to P20. Do you think that any of the, any of these guys, from what you've seen, can make it up into the top 10 through the remainder of the race? Uh, look, I'm I'm going to go down to even to 13th place if I can, and just throw in a, a shout out for one of SA's finest uh, sim races. There, Charles Wilkin in the Porsche. He, of course, his teammates there with uh, uh, Ulifant. And that car, I think, has got a good possibility of, or not, not with Ulifant, but of course he was has been with Ulifant in, in previous versions of some races we've been involved in. But I think with the with the, the talent he has, being a multiple SA saloon car and rally champion in the real racing world, he could potentially make up those five laps uh, in the night sessions if he stays out of harm's way, which is not always easy to do. Uh, Adam Cardinal and, of course, uh, Apostolakis could possibly be moving up into that top 10 should something go wrong. But the, the, what you're finding there in that top 10, if you look at the gaps, uh, if you're in the two to three lap behind, you're not really going to make any uh, inroads to those t the cars in front, I don't think. Um, there has to be something majorly go uh, you know, happen to the car or something major go wrong in your race strategy for that to happen. So that top 10... It's probably going to just, uh, you know, chop and change amongst the guys on the same lap times that are in a couple of seconds of each other, maybe even to 28 seconds, as you can see there with the nine car that we're following right now in ninth place, I should say, the triple six Audi. But there's a very good possibility that some of those guys that are just outside of that top 10 could potentially ruin it the day for some of the single digit drivers at the moment. Oh, there it is. Mm, yeah, it's a drive through there for Apostolakis. Yeah, it looks like a track limits uh, track limits thing. Is I did not see a penalty come across the stewarding sheet, so that means that uh, my theory was right, and we are going to be seeing 
some more drive through penalties here and 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 you know so so let's let's take you briefly jesse do you think that these drive throughs could potentially you know shake out the rest of the race here i mean if you know if we see say let's there as there let's see we see the 962 that msv uh racing team aston martin get a drive through that might drop them back and cardinal might be able to pick up some positions right yeah, I mean, the facts are this, as uh, uh, Pozlakis is going to come down the pit lane immediately to serve that drive through. Now, what that will do for them is that's going to reset it. What will happen is they will get three more warnings before they get another penalty. But they didn't make it to the halfway point, and they already have one. So what does that tell you at home? Well, that tells you that they have a high frequency of going off track. They didn't make it to halfway, which means that it could potentially happen to them again. And as devastating as this is going to be, that's going to drop them at least one position, perhaps two. It's going to take them out of the battle that they were having with the triple six, and they're going to have to step it up again. They are going to have to get back to that position. We watched the 258 race very diligently to get back inside the top 10 and to get to that point. Well, now they're going to have to do that all over again, and that could cause more mistakes. That's the problem. Because now you've gotten your team into this point. You as a team have gotten yourself into the point where you're going to have to make these judgment calls and they're going to have to be a bit more brash. The, uh, the sand in the hourglass is never in your favor. Well, keep in mind, on top of all of this, they still have a five-second penalty. And George Boothby has been spun around, it looks like. No, nope, he hasn't. No, that was George Boothby is coming avoided. through. Just avoided. George, George Boothby is coming around, indeed a spinning car and that's another thing too as this is uh van Zyl here in the 344 lexus assume that's going to be coming together a oh, switchback undercut audi. doesn't work and a couple of tags i thought that was boothby's audi by the way involved with that turns out it was not uh luckily so boothby again avoiding any incident that's the second or third time he's had to avoid incident in the last two hours alone but either way point being that anything like that like let's say boothby has to go off the track to avoid contact speaking of contact buck getting a little bit of a touch there come through mine shaft anything like that you get a couple of those and all of a sudden you have given yourself a penalty you lose your lead you have to re-strategize yourself any of that is going to shake up this race and will we see it absolutely how severe is it going to be? Well, that's sort of up to the teams, isn't it? For sure. It's Buck and Richardson coming together again. Gary Richardson getting involved in another tag with uh, the Aston Martin there of Sean Buck uh, from Logistical Nightmare. And he's having a little bit of a nightmare of his own there at night with that Audi, but fortunately survived that. But as you were saying there, Jess, um, the incidents that you've got to take into account is um, possibilities of the pro-am and amateur drivers making small mistakes on the circuit and potentially right in the way of uh, lead cars coming through like we just see now and almost uh, you know the the lead car being taken out unceremoniously at that point in time if it had happened um by a car that was spinning out all on his own Ooh, look at the bentley take to the curb there aston pushed him just slightly off track and that bentley went all the way on the curb good hold by him to make sure that he can hold on to that car coming out of the s's uh, but the Aston didn't look like he, he quite saw him in his mirror. The Bentley wanted to make sure he went for the move, and he definitely took it. Uh, now we're seeing the, the lights flash from the 258 all the way down the straight. He wants past as well. Aston's going to let him go ahead and get on past. But we do, of course, see after the pit stop, uh, the 258 Ferrari didn't fall too far down. Still in P11. He was, of course, in P10 a little bit ago. So not too bad from him. And it's really showing that how far the field has kind of spread out at this point, honestly, uh, just because, you know, they they did a whole pit stop. They only lost one position and uh, really means that or you can really tell like how far the field is spread out. It is about a minute in the pit lane. Uh, it is anywhere between about 59 seconds to a minute point three from in to out uh, that, that you have to lose. So that means that it's almost two-thirds of a lap uh, around there two-thirds to three-quarters of a lap and uh you know that's quite a bit of distance between these cars at this point that these guys have to make up while we've been talking about you know can anybody make it up into the top 10 and you know to your point craig it's it's going to be difficult for them because of how, how spread out they are 
the one cool factor they don't have to take into account is like we have in our South African Endurance Series here that runs in the real racing world, uh, no safety cars. Uh, that can turn into an absolute nightmare for guys trying to make up time. You know, you've, you've got a certain lap time that you can put in uh, in the day and a certain lap time that you'd like to put in at night as we're watching Sean Buck come together again with another one of the Aston Martins there. He's had a bit of a tough time trying to get through the field there. But going back to the point I was making, um, if we had a safety car scenario in, in this format of racing, it would completely destroy the chances and opportunities of those cars looking to get into the top 10 because, of course, it slows everything down and it gives you less time on track to make up that ground. Yep, but here yeah, is exactly. 367 P2, Jesse Lee. We did, of course, see the 97 Side Max car catching up to him uh, slightly before the uh, last round of pit stops went out. But uh, about three and a half seconds between them now. He's gained a little time here in this 367 Bentley over the past 20 minutes or so. So gap is stabilized, but that's still a fight for P2 in the pit lane with only three and a half seconds between. Yeah, and uh, I'm sad to say, if you are Winlock in the 97, you haven't done anything in the past 15 minutes to close that gap down. In fact, he's actually lost about a tenth, all things considered. It's going in and out the gap, but he had, definitely hasn't done anything. I think the 367, Sebastian, I think they have something for the all-in racing Bentley here. They could potentially, in 14 and some change later, could potentially steal themselves a position here but uh, you gotta be diligent there's a lot of racing left to go but racing for a podium this far into a race you have to commend that two of them being that close in the first place going back to the 258 for a moment we saw them get a drive-through penalty that took them out of the top 10 they did fall down to 11th place but they are gaining on the new 10th place driver of Cardinal. They move on the inside from the Porsche as well. Francois Erasmus coming through there and just finding a way past one of the back markers, just staying out of harm's way. They cannot afford to lose any more ground, having been out for such a long period of time at the beginning of the race. And the, the demise of that car was our first retirement, of course, early on. Um, very lucky to get it back on track and uh, get them uh, back into the race and doing a superb job to try and make up the ground that they lost earlier on. Yeah, and they've done a really good job kind of picking up position, picking up position slowly but surely. They're quite a couple laps behind the cars that they're starting to catch up to. They're another lap behind the 714 Mumford, but, you know, they're quicker, quite a bit quicker even, if you want to get real with it, you know, that 101 team is. So they've got plenty of time to make up that lap and then subsequently go ahead and make up positions to, to the cars ahead. So, you know, that 101, they have plenty of time to get – get those positions up 14 hours and change remaining here with the uh with the back half of the uh back half of the race approaching and of course uh here in a few moments we're gonna get uh, our favorite uh no longer south african and our favorite oh and that was i think the yellow porsche was that the 101 off <laughs> did we uh, just come and take which, him? <laughs> i think i think we did Coming we just in, cursed him by the commentators. Apologies there, Mr. Patterson. Ringway. Mr. Patterson. Yes, yeah, it is. So let's see here. What happens? Oh, he actually oh, got he hit. Oh, no. Yep. It's on us. It's it, had us. It, it had nothing yeah, to do with us. Greg, Greg says, the booth we'll is absolved that. of all wrongdoing, and we will take <laughs> yes, that exactly. indeed. Uh, <laughs> Thank you pa for that. Patterson, <laughs> Patterson getting uh, spun in the final turn. There's a couple of calamity corners here today, Greg. A couple of the yeah, tighter corners indeed where... The braking distances, as you know, with all these cars are different and everybody just sort of getting it a bit wrong. Is is a little bit of that fatigue from the race, do you think? Or is it just uh, the lack of patience? Or is it all just due to the different uh, drivetrain layouts, displacements and stuff like that? I think it's a combination of all of them. You know, you, you're finding guys that have been in, in the, behind the wheel for a while now will start to feel the fatigue a little bit. There's no doubt that the fatigue is starting to come in. It's also the concentration level. The concentration levels are uh, even you know, 10 times higher when you're at night and, and driving in the situations they're in. So it's it's a it's a whole bunch of factors that get brought in. Yes, of course, there are a couple of very tricky corners to get right here at Kyle on me, but the, the entire circuit has quite a nice flow to it. So if you can just find that rhythm, get into the flow, uh, try and stay out of harm's way, um, there's a good possibility that those those times will come down. Uh, the amount of laps that you've got to make up will be ticked off as, as and when. And, and, and you cannot panic. 
not with 14 hours and a little bit to go. You know, 14 hours and seven minutes to go. Panic cannot be happening right now. At 14 minutes to go, different story. But uh, I think uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of there's a lot of time still for Patterson and that 101 uh, Porsche team to to make up the ground they lost early. And here's uh, Antoine Rodokes that we're following along with at the moment. All in racing, 88 Bentley. Seeing him try to catch up to the back of Wilkin at this point. Wilkin, of course, uh, as you mentioned about a few minutes ago, Greg, this is our local South African team that is near-ish to the top of the field since the GTWR team has fallen out. GTWR did is an international team, but it has a local esports driver, Jordan Shirat in the uh in that car before they had their disconnection wilkin has been falling down the order since he got in the car minor mistakes have been costing him quite a bit of pace but that said uh i think that you know overall i think he's the slowest driver in the car which isn't saying uh which is saying a lot granted because you know he's still putting in excellent laps it's more saying about the rest of the quality of the field and wilkin's teammates uh, Enslin, uh, as, as an example, and Jason Asmeyer should be able to jump back into that car and start making up positions again. But that's you know that's how endurance racing is a lot of the time. Ooh, Ooh. there it is. It oh. was a move through, Cheetah, and that is not where you go for a move, boys. That is not where you make a move at all. He goes. He tries to make it down to the inside. Oh. Sends the Aston Martin flying and runs off back down the road. And you can see the Audi behind just going, um. Um, okay, I'm clear. <laughs> because yeah, that is the just. last place you wanted to be uh, when, when you're coming in through Cheetah. That was the leader as well, by the way. So, you know, George Boothby in that Audi, he's got plenty of time to kind of just stop on the track and start looking, but luckily able to avoid that one. We don't want any, uh, any further incidents with the leaders, but I don't think the stewards are going to look too kindly on the 88 for that move into Cheetah. For that particular one, uh, that that might be a pretty harsh penalty for him, and they might drop back at least a few positions for the next pit stops, which should be coming up here pretty soon. Now, all in racing, he was all in for that move. It didn't work out, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, tagging that Aston Martin is uh, costing him a bit of time and possibly the penalty that will be incurred. Yeah, I don't know if George Boothby's religious or not, but all I know is he's praying. He's praying that these uh, <laughs> these these lads settle down. Calm down, because that is, again, in one hour's time, the fourth incident that he has been right behind when it occurred. And he has driven the Sidemax Motorworks 96 through all of those incidences. But either way, you just sort of silently tell yourself, because it makes you feel better. You know, okay, okay, everybody calm down. We're not going to we're not gonna get any more incidents today. But uh, just... Uh, you know what they, they always say, driving. Jess? You know what they always say in, in motorsport is... Um, you're only as good as your last move. So if it was a good move, get on with it. If it was a bad move, get on with it as well. Learn from your mistake, but <laughs> don't dwell on the good or bad move. So if you if you were lucky enough to avoid, and you were lucky enough to avoid and carry on. But uh, if you weren't, well, then you're going to learn from it and next time you won't get involved with that. So very lucky there for Boothby. An exceptionally uh, good driving from him to avoid that incident, which could have uh, sometimes end up being, in the real world, race ending. Yes. Can I, can I just say, I, I, I think you, you nailed it with that comment, and uh, there's no truer sense of racing drivers getting on with it than the old adage of racing drivers have to have a short memory. Because you do, yes. you have to get on with it. You cannot dwell on anything, whether it be good or bad. And that's exactly what all of these different teams and competitors are, are, are willing to do and have to do in a race like this. And it's a long, old race. You better have a short memory. You better have a sharp focus on what you're doing right now and what's up in front of you. And that that's pretty much all you really think about, isn't it, though, Greg? 100%. Um, if, if you are dwelling and thinking about other things, unfortunately, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to catch you out. So, Boothby getting on with the job, um, you know, remembering very little as to what's happened and what's about to happen. So, he just he's just getting on with it, ticking off the laps, lap by lap, time by time, putting in consistent lap times as well. In the nighttime, that is crucial. You cannot be jumping up and down the timesheets and putting in, you know, erratic lap times. You've got to stay as smooth and as consistent as possible. And of course, um, the other aspect that you could bring in from a racing point of view is is the uh, performance of the index of performance. His index of performance has to be right up there in order to uh, continue doing what he's doing and uh, and take the lead for his race team that are at the lead of this race. 
Yeah, Boothby and uh, Sidemax Motorworks team doing fantastic so far through the race. They are P1 and P3. Sister card 97 in P3. They have fallen down a little bit to the 367 Bentley. But it is about that time. Uh, Greg, I believe it is time for you to maybe get a couple hours of sleep for your back early in the morning. And Jesse Lee, it is, I believe, time for us to take a little bit, a little bit of a break and allow the EU guys to come on back in. And, Thank uh, you, gentlemen, for a great time. Um, I'll catch power. you guys in the morning. Yep. Greg Maloney, everybody. Uh, he will be back, I believe, at 0600 CA time. Is that right, Greg? That's right. I'll be back at about 6 o'clock. I'll see you guys in the morning. Thank you. Have a good night. And Jesse Lee, uh, it's been a great couple hours. We'll be back for six more of them here pretty soon. So we'll have uh, plenty of chat time. Uh, Ryan and George will, I'm sure, keep our chairs warm. And uh, you guys there in the chat that will be joining us for the overnight stint, uh, you guys can uh, uh, prep your uh, prep your debate skills for us. As me and Jason leave, we are happy to take more ask the box questions during our uh, during our night stint. And uh, Jesse, any final thoughts before we uh, pass over to the boys? Well, it was a very spirited two hours of racing that have gotten us to the 10 p.m. mark here in South Africa. We've seen our leader change hands by virtue of a very unfortunate uh, disconnect. We've also seen our new leader, George Boothby, have to deal with four separate incidents that very nearly could have taken him out of the top spot. And one of his teammates in the 97 in third place, we have several battles going on at the top 10, battles throughout the entire field and a lot of accidents being uh, played out in some of the tighter corners. And as the night goes on and the track continues to get cooler, the pack is only going to get tighter in some spots, recovering drivers, drivers changing their brake pads and et cetera. It is only going to get hotter, though the track may get cooler. And uh, well, I guess we'll just have to come back in a few hours, Mike Jones, and do it all over again. And by the way, boys coming in, we talked about how to pronounce South African names. We know that you guys did a livery roundup earlier in the day. I look forward to listening to what you got next. All right, guys. Uh, final note, by the way, um, as GMAX just posted out in the chat, uh, keep in mind that uh, the stream will go down for a couple minutes here, uh, as well as uh, we will post in a link to the new one. Uh, once we're back up, we'll have Burtis post that out in the chat. Uh, as YouTube, of course, requires the switchover before the 12 hours, and we'll be back up on Solidarity's Facebook page once we come back up as well. So keep an eye on the chat for the new chat link, or, of course, just go to raceface.pro's YouTube channel if you're following along on YouTube to make sure that you uh, pick up part two that will be up in a couple minutes. However, uh, let's go ahead and jump on board here with... Uh, why, don't we go, uh, why, don't, why don't we go with Corral there in the 367, Stewie? Let's jump on board there with the Bentley for just a couple moments while we uh, prep the stream switchover. And uh, Jesse and I will be back in a couple hours. George G. Max Smith and Ryan Gill join you in a couple minutes. 